The Forced War When Peaceful Revision Failed By David L. Hagen Introduction Shortly after midnight on July 4, 1984, the headquarters of the Institute for Historical Review was attacked by terrorists. They did their job almost to perfection, IHR's office were destroyed, and 90% of its inventory of books and tapes wiped out. To this day the attackers have not been apprehended, and the authorities local, state, and federal have supplied little indication that they ever will be. The destruction of IHR's offices and stocks meant a crippling blow for historical revisionism, the worldwide movement to bring history into accord with the facts in precisely those areas in which it has been distorted to serve the interests of a powerful international establishment, an establishment all the more insidious for its pious espousal of freedom of the press. That one of the few independent voices for truth in history on the planet was silenced by flames on America's Independence Day in the year made infamous by George Orwell must have brought a cynical smile to the face of more than one enemy of historical truth, the terrorists, whose national loyalties certainly lie elsewhere than in America, chose the date well. Had IHR succumbed to the arsonists, what a superb validation of the Orwellian dictum, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. One of the chief casualties of the fire was the text of the book you now hold in your hands. Too badly charred to be reproduced for printing plates, over 600 pages of the forced war had to be laboriously reset, reproofed, and recorrect. That this has now been achieved, despite the enormous losses and extra costs imposed by the arson, despite the Institute's dislocation and its continued harassment, legal and otherwise, by the foes of historical truth, represents a great triumph for honest historiography, for the forced war, more than a quarter century after it was written, remains the classic refutation of the thesis of Germany's sole guilt in the origins and outbreak of the Second World War. By attacking one of the chief taboos of our supposedly irreverent and enlightened century, David Hagen, the author of The Forced War, unquestionably damaged his prospects as a professional academic. Trained as a diplomatic historian at Harvard under William Langer and Michael Karpovich, with rare linguistic qualifications, Hagen never obtained tenure. Such are the rewards for independent thought, backed by thorough research, in the land of the free. The Forced War was published in West Germany in 1961 as Der Erzwungene Krieg by the Verlag der Deutschen Hochschulerer Zeitung, now Grabert Verlag in Tübingen. There it found an enthusiastic reception among Germans, academics, and laymen, who had been oppressed by years of post-war propaganda, imposed by the victor nations and cultivated by the West German government, to the effect that the German leadership had criminally provoked an aggressive war in 1939. Der Erzwungene Krieg has since gone through 13 printings and sold over 50,000 copies. The famous German writer and historian Armin Muller declared that Hagen had brought World War II revisionism out of the ghetto in Germany. While Der Erzwungene Krieg was considered important enough to be reviewed in more than 100 publications in the Bundesrepublik, West Germany's political and intellectual establishment, for whom the unique and diabolical evil of Germany in the years 1933-1945 constitutes both foundation myth and dogma, was predictably hostile. A 1964 visit by Hagen to West Germany was attacked by West Germany's Minister of the Interior, in much the same spirit as West Germany's President Richard von Wiesacker attempted to decree an end to the so-called Historiker Strait, Historian's Debate, due to its revisionist implications in 1988. More than one influential West German historian stooped to ad hominem attack on Hagen's book, as the American was chided for everything from his excessive youth. Hagen was nearly 40 when the book appeared, to the alleged paganism of his German publisher. The most substantive criticism of the forced war was made by German historians Helmut Krausnick and Hermann Grammel, who, in the August 1963 issue of Geschichte und Wissenschaft und Unterricht, History in Scholarship and Instruction, attacked the book on grounds of a number of instances of faulty documentation. A revisionist historian, Professor Kurt Glaser, after examining the forced war and its critics' arguments in Der Zweite Weltkrieg und die Kriegs Coldfridge, the Second World War and the question of war guilt, found, that while some criticisms had merit, 
it is hardly necessary to repeat here that Hagen was not attacked because he had erred here and there albeit some of his errors are material but because he had committed heresy against the creed of historical orthodoxy. Meanwhile, in the United States, Hagen and Harry Elmer Barnes, Hagen's mentor and the most influential American revisionist scholar and promoter, became embroiled in a dispute over Hagen's failure to revise the forced war in the face of the few warranted criticisms. Hagen, proud and somewhat temperamental, refused to yield, despite a substantial grant arranged for him by Barnes. Barnes's death in 1968 and financial difficulties created an impasse with the original publisher which blocked publication until IHR obtained the rights, IHR's difficulties have been mentioned above. Habent Sua Fatali Belli Whatever minor flaws in Hagen's documentation, The Forced War, in the words of Harry Elmer Barnes, written in 1963, in its present form, it not only constitutes the first thorough study of the responsibility for the seven causes of the Second World War in any language but is likely to remain the definitive revisionist work on this subject for many years. Hagen prophesied well, the following quarter century has produced no revisionist study of the origins of the war to match the forced war, as for the establishment's histories regarding Hitler's foreign policy, to quote Professor H. W. Cook of the University of York, England, writing in 1985, such a major work is still lacking, aspects of the Third Reich ed. H. W. Cook, St. Martin's Press, New York, p. 186. Thus its publication after so many years is a major, if belated, victory for revisionism in the English-speaking world. If the publication of the forced war can contribute to an increase in the vigilance of a new generation of Americans regarding the forced wars that America's interventionist establishment may seek to impose in the future, the aims of the late David Hagen, who passed away in August 1988, will have been, in part, realized. IHR would like to acknowledge the assistance of Russell Granada and Tom Kerr in the publication of The Forced War, both these American revisionists gave of their time so that a better knowledge of the past might produce a better future, for their children and ours. Theodore J. O'Keefe January, 1989 Preface This book is an outgrowth of a research project in diplomatic history entitled Breakdown of German-Polish Relations in 1939. It was offered and accepted as a doctoral dissertation at Harvard University in 1948. It was prepared under the specific direction of Professors William L. Langer and Michael Karpovich who were recognized throughout the historical world as being leading authorities on modern European history, and especially in the field of diplomatic history. During the execution of this investigation I also gained much from consultation with other experts in this field then at Harvard, such as Professor Sidney B. Fay. Professor Harry R. Rudin, who was guest professor at Harvard during the academic year, 1946-1947, and Professor David Owen, at that time the chairman of the Harvard History Department and one of the world's leading experts on modern British history. It has been a source of gratification to me that the conclusions reached in the 1948 monograph have been confirmed and extended by the great mass of documentary and memoir material which has been made available since that time. While working on this project, which is so closely and directly related to the causes of the Second World War, I was deeply impressed with the urgent need for further research and writing on the dramatic and world-shaking events of 1939 and their historical background in the preceding decade. It was astonishing to me that, nine years after the launching of the Second World War in September 1939, there did not exist in any language a comprehensive and reliable book on this subject. The only one devoted specifically and solely to this topic was Diplomatic Prelude by Sir Louis B. Namier, an able English-Jewish historian who was a leading authority on the history of 18th-century Britain. He had no special training or capacity for dealing with contemporary diplomatic history. His book, published in 1946, was admittedly based on the closely censored documents which had appeared during the war and on the even more carefully screened and unreliable material produced against the National Socialist leaders at the Nuremberg trials. This lack of authentic material on the causes of the Second World War presented a remarkable contrast to that which existed following the end of the First World War. Within less than two years after the Armistice of November 1918, 
Professor Sidney B. Fay had discredited for all time the allegation that Germany and her allies had been solely responsible for the outbreak of war in August 1914. This was a fantastic indictment. Yet, on it was based the notorious War Guilt Clause, Article 239, of the Treaty of Versailles that did so much to bring on the explosive situation which, as will be shown in this book, Lord Halifax and other British leaders exploited to unleash the Second World War almost exactly 20 years later. By 1927, nine years after Versailles, there was an impressive library of worthy and substantial books by so-called revisionist scholars which had at least factually obliterated the Versailles War Guilt verdict. These books had appeared in many countries, the United States, Germany, England, France, Austria, and Italy, among others. They were quickly translated, some even into Japanese. Only a year later there appeared Fay's Origins of the World War, which still remains, after more than 30 years, the standard book in the English language on 1914 and its background. Later materials, such as the Berchtold Papers and the Austro-Hungarian diplomatic documents published in 1930, have undermined Fay's far too harsh verdict on the responsibility of the Austrians for the war. Fay himself has been planning for some time to bring out a new and revised edition of his important work. This challenging contrast in the historical situation after the two world wars convinced me that I could do no better than to devote my professional efforts to this very essential but seemingly almost studiously avoided area of contemporary history, the background of 1939. There were a number of obvious reasons for this dearth of Sound 8 published material dealing with this theme. The majority of the historians in the victorious Allied countries took it for granted that there was no war guilt question whatever in regard to the Second World War. They seemed to be agreed that no one could or ever would question the assumption that Hitler and the National Socialists were entirely responsible for the outbreak of war on September 1, 1939, despite the fact that, even in 1919, some able scholars had questioned the validity of the war guilt clause of the Versailles Treaty. The attitude of the historical guilt after the Second World War was concisely stated by Professor Louis Gottschalk of the University of Chicago, a former president of the American Historical Association. American historians seem to be generally agreed upon the war guilt question of the Second World War. In other words, there was no such question. This agreement was not confined to American historians. It was equally true not only of those in Britain, France and Poland but also of the great majority of those in the defeated nations, Germany and Italy. No general revisionist movement like that following 1918 was stirring in any European country for years after VJ Day. Indeed, it is only faintly apparent among historians even today. A second powerful reason for the virtual non-existence of revisionist historical writing on 1939 was the fact that it was and still is extremely precarious professionally for any historian anywhere to question the generally accepted dogma of the sole guilt of Germany for the outbreak of hostilities in 1939. To do so endangered the tenure and future prospects of any historian, as much in Germany or Italy as in the United States or Britain. Indeed, it was even more risky in West Germany. Laws passed by the Bonn government made it possible to interpret such vigorous revisionist writing as that set forth after 1918 by such writers as Montgelas, von Wegerer, Steve, and Lutz as a political crime. The whole occupation program and NATO political setup, slowly fashioned after VE Day, was held to depend on the validity of the assertion that Hitler and the National Socialists were solely responsible for the great calamity of 1939. This dogma was bluntly stated by a very influential German political scientist, Professor Theodor Eschenberg, rector of the University of Tübingen, whoever doubts the exclusive guilt of Germany for the Second World War destroys the foundations of post-war politics. After the First World War, a strong wave of disillusionment soon set in concerning the alleged aims and actual results of the war. There was a notable trend towards peace, disarmament sentiment, and isolation especially in the United States. Such an atmosphere offered some intellectual and moral encouragement to historians who sought to tell the truth about the responsibility for 1914. To do so did not constitute any basis for professional alarm as to tenure, status, promotion, and security, at least after an interval of two or three years following the armistice. 
there was no such period of emotional cooling off, readjustment and pacific trends after 1945. Before there had even been any opportunity for this, a cold war between former allies was forecast by Churchill early in 1946 and was formally proclaimed by President Truman in March 1947. The main disillusionment was that which existed between the United States and the Soviet Union and this shaped up so as to intensify and prolong the legend of the exclusive guilt of the National Socialists for 1939. The Soviet Union was no more vehement in this attitude than the Bonn government of Germany. There were other reasons why there was still a dearth of substantial books on 1939 and 1948 a lacuna which exists to this day but those mentioned above are the most notable. Countries whose post-war status, possessions, and policies rested upon the assumption of exclusive German guilt were not likely to surrender their pretensions, claims, and gains in the interest of historical integrity. Minorities that had a special grudge against the National Socialists were only too happy to take advantage of the favorable world situation to continue and to intensify their program of hate and its supporting literature, however extreme the deviation from the historical facts. All these handicaps, difficulties and apprehension in dealing with 1939 were quite apparent to me in 1948 and, for the most part, they have not abetted notably since that time. The sheer scholarly and research opportunities and responsibilities were also far greater than in the years after 1918. Aside from the fact that the revolutionary governments in Germany, Austria and Russia quickly opened their archives on 1914 to scholars, the publication of documents on the responsibility for the First World War came very slowly, and in some cases required two decades or more. After the Second World War, however, there was soon available a veritable avalanche of documents that had to be read, digested and analyzed if one were to arrive at any certainty relative to the responsibility for 1939. Germany had seized the documents in the archives of the countries she conquered. When the Allies later overcame Germany they seized not only these, but those of Germany, Austria, Italy and several other countries. To be sure, Britain and the United States have been slow in publishing their documents bearing on 1939 and 1941, and the Soviet leaders have kept all of their documentary material, other than that seized by Germany, very tightly closed to scholars except for communists. The latter could be trusted not to reveal any facts reflecting blame on the Soviet Union or implying any semblance of innocence on the part of National Socialist Germany. Despite all the obvious problems, pitfalls and perils involved in any effort actually to reconstruct the story of 1939 and its antecedents, the challenge, need and opportunities connected with this project appeared to me to outweigh any or all negative factors. Hence. I began my research and writing on this comprehensive topic, and nine have devoted all the time I could take from an often heavy teaching schedule to its prosecution. In 1952, I was greatly encouraged when I read the book by Professor Charles C. Tansill, Back Door to War. Tansill's America Goes to War was, perhaps, the most learned and scholarly revisionist book published after the First World War. Henry Steele Commager declared that the book was the most valuable contribution to the history of the pre-war years in our literature, and one of the notable achievements of historical scholarship of this generation. Alan Nevins called it an admirable volume, and absolutely indispensable as an account of American entry into the war, on which the approach is finality. Although his back door to war was primarily designed to show how Roosevelt led the United States into war, it also contained a great deal of exciting new material on the European background which agreed with the conclusions that I had reached in my 1948 dissertation. Three years that I spent as scientific assistant to the rector and visiting assistant professor of history in the America Institute at the University of Munich gave me the opportunity to look into many sources of information in German materials at first hand and to consult directly able German scholars and public figures who could reveal in personal conversation what they would not dare to put in print at the time. An earlier research trip to Europe sponsored by a Harvard scholarship grant, 1947-1948, had enabled me to do the same with leading Polish figures and to work on important Polish materials in a large number of European countries. Three years spent later as an assistant professor of history at the University of California at Berkeley made it possible for me to make use of the extensive collection of documents there, 
as well as the far more voluminous materials at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, California, where I had done my first work in the archives while an undergraduate student at Stanford. Research grants thereafter permitted me to be free from teaching duties for several years and to devote myself solely to research and writing. Whatever defects and deficiencies my book may possess, they are not due to lack of application to cogent research in the best collections of documents for over nearly a decade and a half. In various stages of the preparation of my book I gained much from the advice, counsel and assistance of Harry R. Rudin, Raymond J. Sontag, Charles C. Tansil, M. K. G. Wanowski, Zygmunt Gassiarowski, Edward J. Rozek, Otto Ziustalber Kornigerode, V. Sevalod Panek, Ralph H. Lutz, Henry M. Adams, James J. Martin, Franklin C. Palm, Thomas H. D. Mahoney, Reginald F. Aragon, Richard H. Jones, and Ernest G. Trimble. By 1957, I believed that I had proceeded far enough to have a manuscript worthy of publication and offered it to a prominent publisher. Before any decision could be reached, however, as to acceptance or rejection, I voluntarily withdrew the manuscript because of the recent availability of extensive and important new documentary materials, such as the Polish documentary collection, Polska Zagranica, and the vast collection of microfilm reproductions based on the major portion of the German Foreign Office archives from the 1936 to 1939 period, which had remained unpublished. This process of drastic revision, made mandatory by newly available documentation, has been repeated four times since 1957. It is now my impression that no probable documentary revelations in any predictable future would justify further withholding of the material from publication. The results of my work during the last 15 years in this field have recently been published in Germany, November, 1961, under the title Der Erzwungene Krieg, The Forced War. The German edition went through four printings within one year. Neither this book nor the present English-language edition will exhaust this vast theme or preclude the publication of many other books in the same field. But it will not strain the truth to assert that my book constitutes by far the most complete treatment which has appeared on the subject in any language based on the existing and available documentation. Indeed, amazing as it seems, it is the only book limited to the subject in any language that has appeared since 1946, save for Professor A. J. P. Taylor's far briefer account which was not published until the spring of 1961, the still more brief account in Germany by Walter Hofer the rather diffuse symposium published under the auspices of Professor Arnold J. Toynbee at London in 1958, and Frau N. Lies von Ribbentrop's Verschwörung gegen den Frieden, Conspiracy Against Peace, Leonie M. Starnberger C., 1962. It represents, to the best of my ability, an accurate summation and assessment of the factors, forces and personalities that contributed to bring on war in September 1939 and to the entry of the Soviet Union, Japan, and the United States into the conflict later on. Valid criticism of the book in its present and first edition will be warmly welcomed. Such suggestions as appear to me to be validated by reliable documentation will be embodied in subsequently revised editions. Although the conclusions reached in this book depart widely from the opinions that were set forth in Allied war propaganda and have been continued almost unchanged in historical writing since 1945, they need not be attributed to either special ability or unusual perversity. They are simply those which one honest historian with considerable linguistic facility has arrived at by examining the documents and monographs with thoroughness, and by deriving the logical deductions from their content. No more has been required than professional integrity, adequate information, and reasonable intelligence. Such a revision of wartime propaganda dogmas and their still dominating vestiges in current historical writings in this field is inevitable, whatever the preconceived ideas held by any historian, if he is willing to base his conclusions on facts. This is well illustrated and confirmed by the example of the best known of contemporary British historians, Professor A. J. P. Taylor. 10 Taylor had written numerous books relating to German history, and his attitude had led to his being regarded as vigorously anti-German, if not literally a consistent Germanophobe. Admittedly in this same mood, he began a thorough study of the causes of the Second World War from the sources, 
with the definite anticipation that he would emerge with an overwhelming indictment of Hitler as solely responsible for the causes and onset of that calamitous conflict. What other outcome could be expected when one was dealing with the allegedly most evil, bellicose, aggressive, and unreasonable leader in all German history? Taylor is, however, an honest historian and his study of the documents led him to the conclusion that Hitler was not even primarily responsible for 1939. Far from planning world conquest, Hitler did not even desire a war with Poland, much less any general European war. The war was, rather, the outcome of blunders on all sides, committed by all the nations involved, and the greatest of all these blunders took place before Hitler came to power in 1933. This was the Versailles Treaty of 1919 and the failure of the victorious Allies and the League of Nations to revise this nefarious document gradually and peacefully in the 15 years preceding the Hitler era. So far as the long-term responsibility for the Second World War is concerned, my general conclusions agree entirely with those of Professor Taylor. When it comes to the critical months between September 1938 and September 1939, however, it is my carefully considered judgment that the primary responsibility was that of Poland and Great Britain. For the Polish-German War, the responsibility was that of Poland, Britain and Germany in this order of so-called guilt. For the onset of a European war, which later grew into a world war with the entry of the Soviet Union, Japan and the United States, the responsibility was primarily, indeed almost exclusively, that of Lord Halifax and Great Britain. I have offered my reasons for these conclusions and have presented and analyzed the extensive documentary evidence to support them. It is my conviction that the evidence submitted cannot be factually discredited or overthrown. If it can be, I will be the first to concede the success of such an effort and to readjust my views accordingly. But any refutation must be based on facts and logic and cannot be accomplished by the prevailing arrogance, invective, or innuendo. I await the examination of my material with confidence, but also with an open mind in response to all honest and constructive criticism. While my primary concern in writing this book has been to bring the historical record into accord with the available documentation, it has also been my hope that it might have the same practical relevance that revisionist writing could have had after the First World War. Most of the prominent revisionists after the First World War hoped that their results in scholarship might produce a comparable revolution in European politics and lead to the revision of the Versailles Treaty in time to discourage the rise of some authoritarian ruler to undertake this task. They failed to achieve this laudable objective and Europe was faced with the danger of a Second World War. Revisionist writing on the causes of the Second World War should logically produce an even greater historical and political impact than it did after 1919. In a nuclear age, failure in this respect will be much more disastrous and devastating than the Second World War. The indispensable nature of a reconsideration of the merits and possible services of revisionism in this matter has been well stated by Professor Dena F. Fleming, who has written by far the most complete and learned book on the Cold War and its dangers, and a work which also gives evidence of as extreme and unyielding a hostility to Germany as did the earlier writings of A.J.P. Taylor the case of the revisionists deserved to be heard. They may help us avoid the one more war after which there would be nothing left worth arguing about. Inasmuch as I find little in the documents which lead me to criticize seriously the foreign policy of Hitler and the National Socialists, some critics of the German edition of my book have charged that I entertain comparable views about the domestic policy of Hitler and his regime. I believe, and have tried to demonstrate, that the factual evidence proves that Hitler and his associates did not wish to launch a European war in 1939, or in preceding years. This does not, however, imply in any sense that I have sought to produce an apology for Hitler and National Socialism in the domestic realm. It is no more true in my case than in that of A.J.P. Taylor whose main thesis throughout his lucid and consistent volume is that Hitler desired to accomplish the revision of the Treaty of Versailles by peaceful methods, and had no wish or plan to provoke any general war. Having devoted as much time to an intensive study of this period of German history as any other American historian, I am well aware that there were many defects and shortcomings in the National Socialist system, as well as some remarkable and substantial accomplishments in many fields. My book is a treatise on diplomatic history. 
If I were to take the time and space to analyze in detail the personal traits of all the political leaders of the 1930s and all aspects of German, European and world history at the time that had any bearing on the policies and actions that led to war in September 1939, it would require several large volumes. The only practical procedure is the one which I have followed, namely, to hold resolutely to the field of diplomatic history mentioning only those outstanding political, economic, social and psychological factors and situations which bore directly and powerfully on diplomatic actions and policies during these years. Even when closely restricted to this special field, the indispensable materials have produced a very large book. If I have found Hitler relatively free of any intent or desire to launch a European war in 1939, this surely does not mean that any reasonable and informed person could regard him as blameless or benign in all his policies and public conduct. 11. Only a naive person could take any such position. I deal with Hitler's domestic program only to refute the preposterous charge that he made Germany a military camp before 1939. My personal political and economic ideology is related quite naturally to my own environment as an American citizen. I have for years been a warm admirer of the distinguished American statesman and reformer, the late Robert Marion La Follette, sister I still regard him as the most admirable and courageous American political leader of this century. Although I may be very much mistaken in this judgment and appraisal, it is sincere and enduring. What it does demonstrate is that I have no personal ideological affinity with German National Socialism, whatever strength and merit it may have possessed for Germany in some important respects. Nothing could be more presumptuous and absurd, or more remote from my purposes in this book, than an American attempt to rehabilitate or vindicate Germany's Adolf Hitler in every phase of his public behavior. My aim here is solely to discover and describe the attitudes and responsibilities of Hitler and the other outstanding political leaders and groups of the 1930s which had a decisive bearing on the outbreak of war in 1939. David Leslie Hagen Menlo Park, California Chapter 1. The New Polish State. The Anti-Polish Vienna Congress. A tragedy such as World War I, with all its horrors, was destined by the very nature of its vast dimensions to produce occasional good results along with an infinitely greater number of disastrous situations. One of these good results was the restoration of the Polish state. The Polish people, the most numerous of the West Slavic tribes, have long possessed a highly developed culture, national self-consciousness and historical tradition. In 1914 Poland was ripe for the restoration of her independence, and there can be no doubt that independence, when it came, enjoyed the unanimous support of the entire Polish nation. The restoration of Poland was also feasible from the standpoint of the other nations, although every historical event has its critics and there were prominent individuals in foreign countries who did not welcome the recovery of Polish independence. The fact that Poland was not independent in 1914 was mainly the fault of the International Congress which met at Vienna in 1814 and 1815. No serious effort was made by the concert of powers to concern itself with Polish national aspirations, and the arrangements for autonomy in the part of Russian Poland known as the Congress Kingdom were the result of the influence of the Polish diplomat and statesman, Adam Czartoryski, on Tsar Alexander I. The Prussian delegation at Vienna would gladly have relinquished the Polish province of Posen in exchange for the recognition of Prussian aspirations in the German state of Saxony. Great Britain, France and Austria combined against Prussia and Russia to frustrate Prussian policy in Saxony and to demand that Posen be assigned to Prussia. This typical disregard of Polish national interests sealed the fate of the Polish nation at that time. The indifference of the majority of the powers, and especially Great Britain, toward Polish nationalism in 1815 is not surprising when one recalls that the aspirations of German, Italian, Belgian and Norwegian nationalism were flouted with equal impunity. National self-determination was considered to be the privilege of only a few powers in Western Europe. The first Polish state was founded in the 10th century and finally destroyed in its entirety in 1795 during the European convulsions which accompanied the Great French Revolution. The primary reason for the destruction of Poland at that time must be assigned to Russian imperialism. 
The interference of the expanding Russian Empire in the affairs of Poland during the early 18th century became increasingly formidable, and by the mid-18th century Poland was virtually a Russian protectorate. The first partition of Poland by Russia, Prussia, and Austria in 1772 met with some feeble opposition from Austrian diplomacy. Prussia made a rather ineffective effort to protect Poland from further destruction by concluding an alliance with her shortly before the second partition of 1792. The most that can be said about Russia in these various situations is that she would have preferred to obtain the whole of Poland for herself rather than to share territory with the western and southern neighbours of Poland. The weakness of the Polish constitutional system is sometimes considered a cause for the disappearance of Polish independence, but Poland would probably have maintained her independence under this system had it not been for the hostile actions of neighbouring powers, and especially Russia. Poland was restored as an independent state by Napoleon I within 12 years of the final partition of 1795. The new state was known as the Grand Duchy of Warsaw. It did not contain all of the Polish territories, but it received additional land from Napoleon in 1809, and, despite the lukewarm attitude of the French Emperor toward the Poles, it no doubt would have been further aggrandized had Napoleon's campaign against Russia in 1812 been 12 successful. It can truthfully be said that the long eclipse of Polish independence during the 19th century was the responsibility of the European Concert of Powers at Vienna rather than the three partitioning powers of the late 18th century. The 19th Century Polish Uprisings the privileges of autonomy granted to Congress Poland by Russia in 1815 were withdrawn 16 years later following the Great Polish Insurrection against the Russians in 1830-1831. Polish refugees of that uprising were received with enthusiasm wherever they went in Germany, because the Germans too were suffering from the oppressive post-war system established by the victors of 1815. The Western powers, Great Britain and France, were absorbed by their rivalry to control Belgium and Russia was allowed to deal with the Polish situation undisturbed. New Polish uprisings during the 1846-1848 period were as ineffective as the national revolutions of Germany and Italy at that time. The last desperate Polish uprising before 1914 came in 1863, and it was on a much smaller scale than the insurrection of 1830-1831. The British, French, and Austrians showed some interest in diplomatic intervention on behalf of the Poles, but Bismarck, the minister-president of Prussia, sided with Russia because he believed that Russian support was necessary for the realization of German national unity. Bismarck's eloquent arguments in the Prussian Landtag, legislature, against the restoration of a Polish state in 1863, reflected this situation rather than permanent prejudice on his part against the idea of an independent Poland. It is unlikely that there would have been effective action on behalf of the Poles by the powers at that time had Bismarck heeded the demand of the majority of the Prussian Landtag for a pro-Polish policy. Great Britain was less inclined in 1863 than she had been during the 1850s to intervene in foreign quarrels as the ally of Napoleon III. She was disengaging herself from Anglo-French intervention in Mexico, rejecting proposals for joint Anglo-French intervention in the American Civil War, and quarreling with France about the crisis in Schleswig-Holstein. The absence of new Polish uprisings in the 1863-1914 period reflected Polish recognition that such actions were futile rather than any diminution of the Polish desire for independence. The intellectuals of Poland were busily at work during this period devising new plans for the improvement of the Polish situation. A number of different trends emerged as a result of this activity. One of these was represented by Joseph Pilsudski, and he and his disciples ultimately determined the fate of Poland in the period between the two world wars. Pilsudski participated in the revolutionary movement in Russia before 1914 in the hope that this movement would shatter the Russian Empire and prepare the way for an independent Poland. The unification of Germany in 1871 meant that the Polish territories of Prussia became integral parts of the new German Empire. Relations between Russia, Germany, and Austria-Hungary, the three powers ruling over Polish territories, were usually harmonious in the following 20-year period. This was possible, 
despite the traditional Austro-Russian rivalry in the Balkans, because of the diplomatic achievement of Bismarck. The situation changed after the retirement of Bismarck in 1890, and especially after the conclusion of the Franco-Russian alliance in 1894. There was constant tension among the three powers during the following period. Russia was allied with France against Germany, and it was evident that an Eastern European, a Western European, or an overseas imperial question might produce a war. This situation seemed more promising for Poland than when the three powers ruling Polish territories were in harmony. It was natural that these changed conditions were reflected in Polish thought during these years. Pro-German Polish Nationalism Most of the Polish territory was ruled by Russia, and consequently it was quite logical for some Poles to advocate collaboration with Germany, the principal opponent of Russia, as the best means of promoting Polish interests. Belady Slostodniki, a brilliant Polish scholar with contacts in many countries, was an exponent of this approach. He believed that Russia would always be the primary threat to Polish interests. His historical studies had convinced him that the finest conditions for Poland had existed during periods of peaceful relations and close contact with Germany. He noted that Poland, while an theft to Germany during the Middle Ages, had received from the Germans her Christian religion, her improved agricultural economy, and her flourishing medieval development of crafts. German craft colonization had been the basis for the growth of Polish cities, and the close cultural relationship between the two countries was demonstrated by every 4th 20th century Polish word, which was of German origin. He recalled that relations between Germany and Poland were usually friendly during the Middle Ages, and also during the final years before the Polish partitions. Studnicki believed that Poland's real future was in the East, where she might continue her own cultural mission, and also profit nationally. He asserted during World War I that Poles should cease opposing the continuation of German rule in the province of Posen, which had a Polish majority, and in the province of West Prussia, which had 13 a German majority. Both of these regions had been Polish before the first partition of 1772. He favored a return to the traditional Polish Eastern policy of federation with such neighboring nations as the Lithuanians and White Russians. Studnicki believed that collaboration with Germany would protect Poland from destruction by Russia without endangering the development of Poland or the realization of Polish interests. He advocated this policy throughout the period from World War I to World War II. After World War II, he wrote a moving account of the trials of Poland during wartime occupation, and of the manner in which recent events had made more difficult the German-Polish understanding which he still desired. Pro-Russian Polish nationalism The idea of permanent collaboration with Russia also enjoyed great prestige in Poland despite the fact that Russia was the major partitioning power and that the last Polish insurrection had been directed exclusively against her rule. The most brilliant and popular of modern Polish political philosophers, Roman Dmowski, was an advocate of this idea. Dmowski's influence was very great, and his most bitter adversaries adopted many of his ideas. Dmowski refused to compromise with his opponents, or to support any program which differed from his own. Dmowski was the leader of a Polish political group within the Russian Empire before World War I known as the National Democrats. They advocated a constitution for the central Polish region of Congress Poland, which had been assigned to Russia for the first time at the Vienna Congress in 1815, but they did not oppose the further union of this region with Russia. They welcomed the Russian constitutional regime of 1906, and they took their seats in the Legislative Duma rather than boycott it. Their motives in this respect were identical with those of the Polish conservatives from the Polish Kresy, the new constitution could bestow benefits on Poles as well as Russians. The Polish Kresy, which also served as a reservation for Jews in Russia, included all Polish territories taken by Russia except Congress Poland. The National Democrats and the Polish Conservatives believed that they could advance the Polish cause within Russia by legal means. Dmowski was a leading speaker in the Duma, and he was notorious for his clever attacks on the Germans and Jews. He confided to friends that he hoped to duplicate the career of Adam Czartoryski, who had been Foreign Secretary of Russia one century earlier and was acknowledged to have been the most successful Polish collaborator with the Russians. 
Unwelcome restrictions were imposed on the constitutional regime in the years after 1906 by Pyotr Stolopin, the new Russian strongman, but these failed to dampen Dmovsky's ardor. He believed that the combined factors of fundamental weakness in the Russian autocracy and the rising tide of Polish nationalism would enable him to achieve a more prominent role. Dmovsky was an advocate of modernity, which meant to him a pragmatic approach to all problems without sentimentality or the dead weight of outmoded tradition. In his book, Mislinaus Snego Palaika, Thoughts of a Modern Pole, 1902, he advised that the past splendor of the old Polish monarchy should be abandoned even as an ideal. He recognized that the Polish nation needed modern leadership, and he proclaimed that nations do not produce governments, but governments do produce nations. He continued to envisage an autonomous Polish regime loyal to Russia until the latter part of World War I. His system of thought was better suited to the completely independent Poland which emerged from the war. He demanded after 1918 that Poland become a strictly national state in contrast to a nationalities state of the old Polish or recent Habsburg pattern. Dmowski did not envisage an unexceptional Poland for the Poles, but a state with strictly limited minorities in the later style of Kemal in Turkey or Hitler in Germany. He believed that the inclusion of minorities in the new state should stop short of risking the total preponderance of the dominant nationality. Dmowski opposed eastward expansion at Russian expense, and he argued that the old Lithuanian-Russian area, which once had been under Polish rule, could not be assimilated. Above all, the Jews were very numerous in the region, and he disliked having a Jewish minority in the new Polish state. In 1931 he declared that the question of the Jews is the greatest question concerning the civilization of the whole world. He argued that a modern approach to the Jewish question required the total expulsion of the Jews from Poland because assimilation was impossible. He rejected both the 18th century attempt to assimilate by baptism and the 19th century effort at assimilation through common agreement on liberal ideas. He insisted that experience had proved both these attempted solutions were futile. He argued that it was not Jewish political influence which posed the greatest threat, but Jewish economic and cultural activities. He did not believe that Poland could become a respectable business nation until she had eliminated her many Jews. He recognized the dominant Western trend in Polish literature and art, but he did not see how Polish culture could survive what he considered to be Jewish attempts to dominate and distort it. He firmly believed that the anti-Jewish policy of the Tsarist regime in Russia had been beneficial. His ideas on the Jewish question were popular in Poland, and they were either shared from the start or adopted by most of his political opponents. Dmowski's basic program was defensive, and he was constantly seeking either to protect the Poles from threats to their heritage, or from ambitious schemes of expansion which might increase alien influences. There was only 14 one notable exception to this defensive pattern of his ideas. He favored an ambitious and aggressive policy of westward expansion at the expense of Germany and he used his predilection for this scheme as an argument for collaboration with Russia. He believed in the industrialization of Poland and in a dominant position for the industrial middle class. He argued that westward expansion would be vital in increasing Polish industrial resources. The influence of Dmowski's thought in Poland has remained important until the present day. His influence continued to grow despite the political failures of his followers after Joseph Pilsudski's coup d'état in 1926. Dmowski deplored the influence of the Jews in Bolshevist Russia, but he always advocated Russo-Polish collaboration in foreign policy. Pro Habsburg Polish nationalism Every general analysis of 20th century Polish theory on foreign policy emphasizes the Krakow, Krakow, or Galician school, which was easily the most prolific although the practical basis for its program was destroyed by World War I. The political leaders and university scholars of the Polish South thought of Austrian Galicia as a Polish Piedmont after the failure of the Polish insurrection against Russia in 1863. Michael Bobrzynski, the governor of Galicia from 1907 to 1911, was the outstanding leader of this school. In his Gij Polski W. Zerasi, Short History of Poland, he eulogized Polish decentralization under the pre-partition constitution, and he attacked the kings who had sought to increase the central power. In 1919 he advocated regionalism in place of a centralized national system. 
he also hoped that the Polish South would occupy the key position in Poland as a whole. The political activities of the Krakow Group before the War of 1914 were directed against the National Democrats, with their pro-Russian orientation, and against the Ukrainians in Galicia, with their national aspirations. Bobrzynski envisaged the union of all Poland under the Habsburgs, and the development of a powerful federal system in the Habsburg Empire to be dominated by Austrian Germans, Hungarians, and Poles. He advocated a federal system after the collapse of the Habsburg Empire in 1918, and he supported the claims to the old thrones of the Habsburg pretender. He argued with increasing exasperation that Poland alone could never maintain herself against Russia and Germany without additional support from the South. Polsudski's Polish Nationalism A fourth major program for the advancement of Polish interests was that of Joseph Polsudski, who thought of Poland as a great power. His ideas on this vital point conflicted with the three programs previously mentioned. Studniki, Dmowski, and Bobrzynski recognized that Poland was one of the smaller nations of modern Europe. It seemed inevitable to them that the future promotion of Polish interests would demand a close alignment with at least one of the three pre-1918 powerful neighboring powers, Germany, Russia, or Austria-Hungary. It is not surprising that there were groups in Poland which favored collaboration with each of these powers, but it is indeed both startling and instructive to note that the strongest of these groups advocated collaboration with Russia, the principal oppressor of the Poles. Polsudski opposed collaboration with any of the stronger neighbors of Poland. He expected Poland to lead nations weaker than herself and to maintain alliances or alignments with powerful but distant powers not in a position to influence the conduct of Polish policy to any great extent. Above all, his system demanded a defiant attitude toward any neighboring state more powerful than Poland. His reasoning was that defiance of her stronger neighbors would aid Poland to regain the great power status which she enjoyed at the dawn of modern history. Dependence on a stronger neighbor would be tantamount to recognizing the secondary position of Poland in Central Eastern Europe. He hoped that a successful foreign policy after independence would eventually produce a situation in which none of her immediate neighbors would be appreciably stronger than Poland. He hoped that Poland in this way might eventually achieve national security without sacrificing her great power aspirations. This approach to a foreign policy for a small European nation was reckless, and its partisans said the same thing somewhat more ambiguously when they described it as heroic. Its radical nature is evident when it is compared to the three programs described above, which may be called conservative by contrast. Another radical policy in Poland was that of the extreme Marxists who hoped to convert the Polish nation into a proletarian dictatorship. These extreme Marxists were far less radical on the foreign policy issue than the Pilsudski group. For a period of 25 years, from 1914 until the Polish collapse of 1939, Pilsudski's ideas had a decisive influence on the development of Poland. No Polish leader since Jan Sobieski in the 17th century had been so masterful. Poles often noted that Pilsudski's personality was not typically Polish, but was much modified by his Lithuanian background. He did not share the typical exaggerated Polish respect for everything which came from abroad. He was not unpunctual as were most Poles, and he had no trace of either typical Polish indolence or prodigality. Above all, although he possessed it in full measure, he rarely made a show of the great personal charm which is typical of nearly all educated Poles. He was usually taciturn, and he despised excessive wordiness. 15. Pilsudski's prominence began with the outbreak of World War I. He was personally well prepared for this struggle. Pilsudski addressed a group of Polish university students at Paris in February 1914. His words contained a remarkable prophecy which did much to give him a reputation for uncanny insight. He predicted that a great war would break out which might produce the defeat of the three powers ruling partitioned Poland. He guessed correctly that the Austrians and Germans might defeat the Russians before succumbing to the superior material reserves and resources of the Western powers. He proposed to contribute to this by fighting the Russians until they were defeated and then turning against the Germans and Austrians. This strategy required temporary collaboration with two of the powers holding Polish territories, but it was based on the recognition that in 1914, before Polish independence, 
it was inescapable that Poles would be fighting on both sides in the war. Polsudski accepted this inevitable situation, but he sought to shape it to promote Polish interests to the maximum degree. Polsudski had matured in politics before World War I as a Polish Marxist revolutionary. He assimilated the ideas of German and Russian Marxism both at the university city of Kharkov in the Ukraine, and in Siberia, where hundreds of thousands of Poles had been exiled by Russian authorities since 1815. He approached socialism as an effective weapon against Tsarism, but he never became a sincere socialist. His followers referred to his early Marxist affiliation as Konrad Wallenrod Socialism. Wallenrod, in the Epic of Adam Mikovich, infiltrated the German Order of Knights and became one of its leaders only to undermine it. Polsutsky adhered to international socialism for many years, but he remained opposed to its final implications. Polsutsky was convinced that the Galician socialist leaders with whom he was closely associated would ultimately react in a nationalist direction. One example will suggest why he made this assumption. At the July 1910 International Socialist Congress in Krakow, Ignaz Dasinski, the Galician socialist leader, was reproached by Hermann Lieberman, a strict Marxist, for encouraging the celebration by Polish socialists of the 500th anniversary of Grunewald. Grunewald was the Polish name for the victory of the Poles, Lithuanians and Tartars over the German Order of Knights at Tannenberg in 1410, and its celebration in Poland at this time was comparable to the July 4 independence holiday in the United States. Dasinski heaped ridicule and scorn on Lieberman. He observed sarcastically that it would inflict a tremendous injury on the workers to tolerate this national impudence. He added that it was positively criminal to refer to Wawel, the former residence of Polish kings in Krakow, because this might sully the red banners of socialism. Polsutski himself later made the cynical remark that those who cared about socialism might ride the socialist trolley to the end of the line, but he preferred to get off at Independence Station. Polsutski was active with Poles from other political groups after 1909 in forming separate military units to collaborate with Austria-Hungary in wartime. This action was encouraged by Austrian authorities who hoped that Polsutsky would be able to attract volunteers from the Russian section. Polsutsky was allowed to command only one brigade of this force, but he emerged as the dominant leader. The Krakow school hoped to use his military zeal to build Polish power within the Habsburg Empire, and one of their leaders, Jaworski, remarked that he would exploit Polsutsky as Kavor had once exploited Garibaldi. Polsutsky, like Garibaldi, had his own plans, and events were to show that he was more successful in realizing them. Poland in World War I World War I broke out in August 1914 after Russia, with the encouragement of Great Britain and France, ordered the general mobilization of her armed forces against Germany and Austria-Hungary. The Russians were determined to support Serbia against Austria-Hungary in the conflict which resulted from the assassination of the heir to the Austrian and Hungarian thrones and his wife by Serbian conspirators. Russian mobilization plans envisaged simultaneous military action against both the Germans and Austro-Hungarians. Poincaré and Viviani, the French leaders, welcomed the opportunity to engage Germany in a conflict, because they hoped to reconquer Alsace-Lorraine. Sir Edward Grey and the majority of the British leaders looked forward to the opportunity of winning the spoils of war from Germany, and of disposing of an allegedly dangerous rival. Austria-Hungary wished to maintain her security against Serbian provocations, and the German leaders envisaged war with great reluctance as a highly unwelcome development. Russia, as the ally of Great Britain and France, succeeded in keeping the Polish question out of Allied diplomacy until the Russian Revolution of 1917. A Russian proclamation of August 18, 1914, offered vague rewards to the Poles for their support in the war against Germany, but it contained no binding assurances. Dmowski went to London in November 1915 to improve his contacts with British and French leaders, but he was careful to work closely with Alexander Izvolsky. Russian ambassador to France and the principal Russian diplomat abroad. Dmowski's program called for an enlarged autonomous Polish region within Russia. His activities were for the most part welcomed by Russia, 
but Izvolsky reported to Foreign Minister Sergei Sazonov in April 1916 that Dmovsky went too far in discussing certain aspects of the Polish question. Polsutsky in the meantime had successfully resisted attempts by the Austrian War Department to deprive his cotters of their special status when it became obvious that they were no magnet to the Poles across the Russian 16 frontier. Responsibility for maintaining the separate status of the forces was entrusted to a Polish chief national committee, Naxalnik Komitet Narodowy. The situation was precarious because many of the Galician Poles proved to be pro-Russian after war came, and they did not care to join Polsutsky. They expected Russia to win the war. They might be tolerated following a Russian victory as mere conscripts of Austria, but they would be persecuted for serving with Polsutsky. As a result, there were only a few thousand soldiers under Polsutsky and his friends during World War I. The overwhelming majority of all Polish veterans saw military service only with the Russians. Large numbers of Polish young men from Galicia fled to the Russians upon the outbreak of war to escape service with either the Austrians or with Pilsudski. It was for this reason that the impact of Pilsudski on the outcome of the war against Russia was negligible. He nevertheless achieved a prominent position in Polish public opinion, whatever individual Poles might think of him, and he managed to retain it. General von Bissler, the governor of German-occupied Poland, proclaimed the restoration of Polish independence on November 5, 1916, following an earlier agreement between Germany and Austria-Hungary. His announcement was accompanied by a German army band playing the gay and exuberant Polish anthem from the Napoleonic period, Poland still is not lost. Jezice Polskanie Zygainmal Polish independence was rendered feasible by the German victories over Russia in 1915 which compelled the Russians to evacuate most of the Polish territories, including those which they had seized from Austria in the early months of the war. Pulsutsky welcomed this step by Germany with good reason, although he continued to hope for the ultimate defeat of Germany in order to free Poland from any German influence and to aggrandize Poland at German expense. A Polish Council of State was established on December 6. 1916, and met for the first time on January 14, 1917. The position of the Council during wartime was advisory to the occupation authorities, and the prosecution of the war continued to take precedence over every other consideration. Nevertheless, important concessions were made to the Poles during the period from September 1917 until the end of the war. The Council was granted the administration of justice in Poland and control over the Polish school system, and eventually every phase of Polish life came under its influence. The Council was reorganized in the autumn of 1917, and on October 14, 1917, a Regency Council was appointed in the expectation that Poland would become an independent kingdom allied to the German and Austro-Hungarian monarchies. The German independence policy was recognized by Poles everywhere as a great aid to the Polish cause, and Roman Dmowski, never a friend of Germany, was very explicit in stating this in his book, Politika Polska i Odbudowania Panstwe, Polish Policy and the Reconstruction of the State, which described the events of this period. Negotiators for the Western Allies, on the other hand, were willing to reverse the German independence policy as late as the summer of 1917 and to offer all of Poland to Austria-Hungary, if by doing so they could separate the Central Powers and secure a separate peace with the Habsburgs. The Germans for their part were able to assure President Wilson in January 1917, when the United States was still neutral in the war, that they had no territorial aims in the West and that they stood for the independence of Poland. President Wilson delivered a speech on January 22, 1917, in which he stressed the importance of obtaining access to the sea for Poland, but James Gerard, the American ambassador to Germany, assured German Chancellor Bethmann Hallweg that Wilson did not wish to see any Baltic port of Germany detached from German rule. It is not surprising that in German minds both before and after the 1918 armistice the Wilson program for Poland envisaged access to the sea in terms of free port facilities and not in the carving of one or more corridors to the sea through German territory. There was no objection from Germany when the Polish Council of State in Warsaw sent a telegram to Wilson congratulating him for his speech of January 22, 1917, 
which had formulated Wilsonian Polish policy in terms later included as the 13th of the famous 14 points. The Russian Provisional Government raised the question of Polish independence in a statement of March 29, 1917, but they stressed the necessity of a permanent Russo-Polish alliance, with special guarantees, as the conditio sine qua non. Arthur James Balfour, the conservative leader in the British coalition government, endorsed the Russian proposition, although he knew that the Russians intended a merely autonomous Poland. Tomofsky responded to the March 1917 Russian Revolution by advocating a completely independent Poland of 200,000 square miles, which was approximately equal to the area of the German Empire, and he attempted to counter the arguments raised against Polish independence in Great Britain and France. Polsudski at this time was engaged in switching his policy from support of Germany to support of the Western Allies. He demanded a completely independent Polish National Army before the end of the war, and the immediate severance of any ties which made Poland dependent on the Central Powers. He knew that there was virtually no chance for the fulfillment of these demands at the crucial stage which the war had reached by the summer of 1917. The slogan of his followers was a rejection of compromise, never a state without an army, never an army without Pilsudski. Pilsudski was indeed head of the military department of the Polish Council of State, but he resigned on July 2, 1917, when Germany and Austria-Hungary failed to accept his demands. Pilsudski deliberately provoked the Germans until they arrested him and placed him for the duration of the war in comfortable internment with his closest military colleague, Kazimierz Sosankowski, at Magdeburg on the Elba. It was Pilsudski's conviction that only in this way could he avoid compromising himself with the Germans before Polish public opinion. His arrest by Germany made it difficult for his antagonists in Poland to argue that he had 17 been a mere tool of German policy. It was a matter of less concern that this accusation was made in the Western countries despite his arrest during the months and years which followed. A threat to Pilsudski's position in Poland was implicit in the organization of independent Polish forces in Russia after the revolution under a National Polish Army Committee, Naxpol. These troops were under the influence of Roman Domowski and his National Democrats. The conclusion of peace between Russia and Germany at Brest-Litovsk in March 1918 stifled this development, and the Polish forces soon began to surrender to the Germans. The Bolshevik triumph and peace with Germany dealt a severe blow to the doctrine of Polish collaboration with Russia. The surrender by Germany of the calm district of Congress Poland to the Ukraine at Brest-Litovsk in March 1918 dealt a fatal blow to the prestige of the Regency Council in Poland, and prepared the way for the establishment of an entirely new government when Germany went down in revolution and defeat in November 1918. Polish Expansion After World War I it was fortunate for Pilsudski that the other Poles were unable to achieve anything significant during his internment in Germany. He was released from Magdeburg during the German Revolution, and he returned speedily to Poland. On November 14, 1918, the Regency Council turned over its powers to Pilsudski, and the Poles, who were in the midst of great national rejoicing, despite the severe prevailing economic conditions, faced an entirely new situation. Pilsudski knew there would be an immediate struggle for power among the political parties. His first step was to consolidate the Polish Socialist Party, PPS, of Congress Poland, and the Polish Social Democratic Party, PPSD, of Galicia under his own leadership. Pilsudski had an enormous tactical advantage which he exploited to the limit. He was a socialist, and he had fought for the Germans. His principal political opponents, the National Democrats, were popular with the Western powers. Poland was not mentioned in the November 1918 armistice agreement with Germany, and soon after the armistice a protracted peace conference began. Pilsudski was persona non grata at Versailles. He gladly expressed his confidence in the Paris negotiation efforts of the National Democrats in the interest of obtaining a united Polish front. It was not his responsibility, but that of his opponents, to secure advantages for Poland at the peace conference. This effort was almost certain to discredit his opponents, because Polish demands were so exorbitant that they could scarcely be satisfied. Pilsudski was free to turn his own efforts toward the Polish domestic situation. He made good use of his time, 
and he never lost the political initiative gained during those days. His cause was aided by an agreement he made with the Germans as early as November 11, 1918, before the armistice in the West. According to this agreement, the occupation troops would leave with their arms which they would surrender at the frontier, German Congress Poland frontier of 1914, which was confirmed at Brest-Litovsk, 1918. The operation was virtually completed by November 19, 1918, and the agreement was faithfully carried out by both sides. The Polish National Committee in Paris, which was dominated by Roman Domowski and the National Democrats, faced a much less promising situation. The diplomats of Great Britain and France regarded the Poles with condescension, and Premier Clemenceau informed Paderewski, the principal collaborator of Domowski in the peace negotiation, that in his view Poland owed her independence to the sacrifices of the Allies. The Jewish question also plagued the Polish negotiators, and they were faced by demands from American Jewish groups which would virtually have created an independent Jewish state within Poland. President Wilson was sympathetic toward these demands, and he emphasized in the Council of Four, United States, Great Britain, France, Italy, on May 1, 1919, that the Jews were somewhat inhospitably regarded in Poland. Paderewski explained the Polish attitude on the Jewish question in a memorandum of June 15, 1919, in which he observed that the Jews of Poland on many occasions had considered the Polish cause lost, and had sided with the enemies of Poland. Ultimately most of the Jewish demands were modified, but Article 93 of the Versailles Treaty forced Poland to accept a special pact for minorities which was highly unpopular. The Polish negotiators might have achieved their extreme demands against Germany had it not been for Lloyd George, because President Wilson and the French were originally inclined to give them all that they asked. Dmowski demanded the 1,772 frontier in the west, plus the key German industrial area of Upper Silesia, the city of Danzig, and the southern sections of East Prussia. In addition, he demanded that the rest of East Prussia be constituted as a separate state under Polish control, and later he also requested part of Middle Silesia for Poland. Lloyd George soon began to attack the Polish position, and he concentrated his effort on influencing and modifying the attitude of Wilson. It was clear to him that Italy was indifferent, and that France would not be able to resist a common Anglo-American program. Lloyd George had reduced the Polish demands in many directions before the original draft of the treaty was submitted to the Germans on May 7, 1919. A plebiscite was scheduled for the southern districts of East Prussia, and the rest of that province was to remain with Germany regardless of the outcome. Important modifications of the frontier in favor of Germany were made in the region of Pomerania, and the city of Danzig was to be established as a protectorate under the League of Nations rather than as an integral part of Poland. Lloyd George concentrated on Upper Silesia after the Germans had replied with their objections to the treaty. Wilson's chief expert on Poland, 18 Professor Robert Lord of Harvard University, made every effort to maintain the provision calling for the surrender of this territory to Poland without a plebiscite. Lloyd George concentrated on securing a plebiscite, and ultimately he succeeded. The ultimate treaty terms gave Poland much more than she deserved, and much more than she should have requested. Most of West Prussia, which had a German majority at the last census, was surrendered to Poland without plebiscite, and later the richest industrial section of Upper Silesia was given to Poland despite the fact that the Poles lost the plebiscite there. The creation of a League Protectorate for the National German Community of Danzig was a disastrous move, a free harbour for Poland in a Danzig under German rule would have been far more equitable. The chief errors of the treaty included the creation of the corridor, the creation of the so-called free city of Danzig, and the cession of part of Upper Silesia to Poland. These errors were made for the benefit of Poland and to the disadvantage of Germany, but they were detrimental to both Germany and Poland. An enduring peace in the German-Polish borderlands was impossible to achieve within the context of these terms. The settlement was also contrary to the 13th of Wilson's 14 points, which, except for the exclusion of point 2, constituted a solemn allied contractual agreement on peace terms negotiated with Germany when she was still free and under arms. 
The violation of these terms when defenseless Germany was in the chains of the armistice amounted to a pinnacle of deceit on the part of the United States and the European Western Allies which could hardly be surpassed. The position of the United States in this unsavory situation was somewhat modified by the American failure to ratify the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 and 1920. The Polish negotiators remained discredited at home because they had failed to achieve their original demands, which had been widely publicized in Poland. An aspect of this situation especially pleasing to Pilsudski was the confused condition of Russia which caused the Allied diplomats to postpone the discussion of the eastern frontiers of Poland. Pilsudski was more interested in eastward expansion than in the westward expansion favored by Dmowski. The absence of any decisions at Paris concerning the status quo in the East gave Pilsudski a welcome opportunity to pursue his own program in that area. The left-wing radical tide was rising with Poland, but Pilsudski was not unduly worried by this situation. He allowed the sincere Marxist, Morichowski, to form a government. The government proclaimed an electoral decree on November 28, 1918, which provided for proportional representation and universal suffrage. Pulsutsky secretly undermined the government in every direction, and he encouraged his friends in the army to oppose it. He also knew that the National Democrats hated socialism, and played them off against Morichowski. On January 4, 1919, while Roman Dmowski was in Paris, the National Democrats recklessly attempted to upset Morichowski by a poorly planned coup d'état. Pulsutsky defended the government, and the National Democrats lost prestige when their revolt was crushed. Pulsutsky did not relish the barter of parliamentary politics, but Waleri Slawak, his good friend and political expert, did most of this distasteful work for him. This enabled Pulsutsky to concentrate at an early date on the Polish army and Polish foreign policy which were his two real interests. Pulsutsky won over many prominent opponents, he had earlier won the support of Edward Smigli Rydz, who directed the capture of Lvov, Lemberg, from the Ukrainians in November 1918. Smigli Rydz later succeeded Pulsutsky as Marshal of Poland. There was action in many directions on the military front. Aslask Pomors Poznan, Silesia West Prussia Posen, Congress was organized by the National Democrats on December 6, 1918, and it attempted to seize control of the German eastern provinces in the hope of presenting the peace conference at Paris with a fait accompli. Ignaz Paderewski arrived in Poznan a few weeks later on a journey from London to Warsaw, and a Polish uprising broke out while he was in this city. Afterward the Poles, in a series of bitter battles, drove the local German volunteer militia out of most of Posen province. The Germans in January 1919 evacuated the ancient Lithuanian capital of Wilna, Wilno, and Polish forces moved in. When the Bolshevik armies began their own drive through the area, the Poles lost Wilna, but the Germans stopped the Red Advance at Grodna on the Niemen River. The National Democrats controlled the Polish Western Front and Pilsudski dominated the East. The National Democrats were primarily interested in military action against Germany. Pulsutski's principal interest was in Polish eastward expansion and in federation under Polish control with neighboring nations. On April 19, 1919, when the Poles recaptured Wilna, a proclamation was issued by Pulsutski. It was not addressed, as a national democratic proclamation would have been, to the local Polish community, but to the people of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. It referred graciously to the presence of Polish forces in your country. Pulsutski also issued an invitation to the Ukrainians and White Russians to align themselves with Poland. He intended to push his federalist policy while Russia was weak, and to reduce Russian power to the minimum degree. Pulsutski's growing prestige in the East was bitterly resented by the National Democrats. They denounced him from their numerous press organs as an anti-clerical radical under the influence of the Jews. They argued with justification that the country was unprepared for an extensive eastern military adventure. They complained that the further acquisition of minorities would weaken the state, and they concluded that Pulsutski was a terrible menace to Poland. Pulsutski cleverly appealed to the anti-German prejudice of the followers of his enemies. He argued that Russia and Germany were in a gigantic conspiracy to crush Poland, 
and that to retaliate by driving back the Russians was the only salvation. He tried in every way to stir up the enthusiasm of the weary Polish people for his 19 Eastern plans. Polsutsky also did what he could to stem the rising Lithuanian nationalism which objected to every form of union with Poland. By July 17, 1919, Polish forces had driven the Ukrainian nationalist forces out of every corner of the former Austrian territory of East Galicia. It was comparatively easy afterward for Pilsudski to arrive at an agreement with Semyon Petlura, the Ukrainian socialist leader who was hard-pressed by the Bolsheviks. Petlura agreed that the entire territory of Galicia should remain with Poland, and Pilsudski encouraged the organization of new Ukrainian armed units. Pulsutsky believed that Petlura would be more successful than Skoropadsky, the earlier Ukrainian dictator, in enlisting Ukrainian support. He deliberated constantly on delivering a crushing blow against the Bolsheviks, who were hard-pressed by the white Russian forces of General Denikin during most of 1919. He negotiated with Denikin, but he did not strike during 1919 on the plea that the Polish forces were not yet ready. He dreaded far more than Bolshevism a victorious white Russian regime, which would revive Russian nationalist aspirations in the West at the expense of Poland. While Pilsudski was planning and postponing his blow against the Bolsheviks, his prejudice against the parliamentary form of government was augmented by the first Sejm which had been elected on January 26, 1919. Two coalition groups of the National Democrats sent 167 deputies. The Polish Peasant Party, which endorsed the foreign policy of Dmowski and denounced Pilsudski, elected 85 deputies. These three groups of Pilsudski opponents occupied 260 of the 415 seats of the same. Many of the other deputies, who were divided among a large number of parties, were either Germans or Jews. These election results were no chance phenomenon but they represented a trend in Polish opinion which had developed over a long period. It was evident that this situation could not be changed without severe manipulation of the election system. No politician of Pilsudski's ambitions could admire an election system which demonstrated his own unpopularity. His natural inclination toward the authoritarian system was greatly increased by his experience with parliamentary politics in his own country. Dissatisfaction with the terms of the Versailles Treaty was uppermost in Polish public opinion by June 1919. The Poles were in consternation at the prospect of a plebiscite in Upper Silesia. They had claimed that most of the inhabitants favoured Poland, but they were secretly aware that the vast majority would vote for Germany in a free election. The Poles were also furious at the Allied inclination to support the Czechs in their attempt to secure by force the mixed ethnic area and rich industrial district of Teschen. Adalbert Korfanty, a veteran National Democratic leader, set out to accomplish Poland's purpose in Upper Silesia by terror and intimidation. The French commander of the Allied Occupation Force, General L. E. Rond, collaborated with invading Polish filibuster forces. The Italian occupation forces stationed in Upper Silesia were attacked by the Poles and suffered heavy casualties because they sought to obstruct the illegal Polish advance. It was widely assumed in Poland during 1919 and 1920 that the desperate campaign in Upper Silesia would be futile. The unexpected Polish reward there was not received until 1922. These reverses suffered by the Poles in the West added to the demand for effective action in the East. Interest gradually increased during the latter part of 1919 while Pilsudski continued his preparations. The high nobility from the eastern territories led much agitation, but support for the program also had become noticeable in all parts of the country. Pilsudski concluded a second pact with Petlura in October 1919 which provided that further Ukrainian territory east of the old frontier between Russia and Austrian Galicia would become Polish, and, in addition, an independent Ukrainian state in the east would remain in close union with Poland. The collapse of Denikin in December 1919 was a signal to the Bolsheviks that they might soon expect trouble with Poland on a much larger scale than in the preceding sporadic hostilities which had extended from Latvia to the Ukraine. The Bolsheviks on January 28, 1920, offered Pilsudski a favorable armistice line in the hope of trading territory for time. Pilsudski was not impressed 
despite the fact that the Western Allies disapproved of his plans. Pulsutsky categorically informed the Allies on March 13, 1920, that he would demand from the Bolsheviks the right to dispose of the territory west of the 1,772 Polish-Russian frontier. This frontier was far to the east of the line proposed by the Bolsheviks, and it was evident that a decisive conflict would ensue. Pulsutsky and Petlura launched their offensive to drive the Bolsheviks from the Ukraine on April 26, 1920. The Skolsky cabinet, which had followed earlier governments of Morichahuski and Paderewski, did not dare to oppose Pulsutsky's plans, and Foreign Minister Potek openly approved Pulsutsky's eastern program. The Polish troops under the command of General Smigli RYDZ scored conspicuous successes, and on May 8 the Polish patrol on a streetcar rode into the center of Kiev, the Ukrainian capital. A huge celebration of the Kiev victory took place in the St. Alexander Church in Warsaw on May 18, 1920. Pulsutsky was presented with the old victory laurels of Stephen Bathory and Uladis Lafour. Russia was less prostrate than in the 17th century time of troubles, Smutnoy Vremya, and dreams of Polish imperialism were soon smashed under the hoofs of Budanese Red Army horses. The Russian counteroffensive strategy of outflanking the Poles was completely successful. The military reversals in the East created a cabinet crisis and the Skolsky government was forced to resign. On June 24, 1920, Dolatislaw Grabsky, a National Democrat and an opponent of Pilsudski, formed a government. His first step was to go to Belgium to plead with the 20 Western Allied Command for aid. The Russians had penetrated deeply into Poland from two directions when Grabsky arrived at Spa on July 10. One of their armies had broken across the old Neiman defense line, and the other was driving on Lvov. The poorly disciplined Russians had become totally disorganized by the rapidity of their advance, and the major commanders failed to cooperate because of petty jealousies. Pulsutsky had the expert advice of General Maxime Vagon and other French officers when he directed the Poles to victory in the Battle of Warsaw on August 16, 1920. The famous expression in Poland, the miracle of the Vistula, Kud nad Wisla, was coined by Professor Stanislaw Stronsky, a National Democrat, to suggest that any Polish victory under Pulsutsky's leadership was a miracle. The Vistula victory brought tremendous prestige to Pulsutsky and it solidified his position as the strongest man in Poland, but the opponents of Pilsudski remained in office and the popular dissatisfaction with the war increased. Pilsudski was willing to strike eastward again after the Russian retreat, and to launch a second expedition against Kiev, but he knew this was an impossibility because of public opinion in war-torn Poland. Jan Dabski, who was selected by the government as chief delegate to negotiate with the Russians, was a bitter critic of Pilsudski's policy and was influenced by Dmovsky. Dmovsky opposed the idea of federating with the White Russians and the Ukrainians, but he believed that Poland could assimilate a fairly large proportion of the people from the regions which had been under Polish rule in the past. Consequently, at the Riga Peace in early 1921, the White Russian and Ukrainian areas were partitioned between the Soviet Union and Poland, with the bulk of both areas going to the Soviet Union. Federalism had been abandoned as an immediate policy, and the followers of Pilsudski resorted to Dmovsky's program of assimilating the minorities. The Polish people who had been influenced by the Romanticist ideas of Henryk Sienkiewicz, the popular Polish author, denounced the Riga peace as an abandonment of their ancient eastern territories. Pilsudski himself shared this view, and in a lecture on August 24, 1923, he blamed the lack of moral strength of the nation for the Polish failure to conquer the Ukraine following the victory at Warsaw in 1920. The Dmowski disciples chafed at their failure to realize many of their aspirations against Germany in the West. It seemed that no one in Poland was satisfied with the territorial limits attained by the new state, although most foreign observers, whether friendly or hostile, believed that Poland had obtained far more territory than was good for her. It soon became evident that the post-war course of Polish expansion had closed with the Riga peace, and with the partition of Upper Silesia. Poland had reached the limits of her ability to exploit the confusion which had followed in the wake of World War I. Her choices were to accept her gains as sufficient and to seek to retain all or most of them, 
or to bide her time while awaiting a new opportunity to realize her unsatisfied ambitions. The nature of her future foreign policy depended on the outcome of the struggle for power within Poland. The Czechs during the Russo-Polish War had consolidated their control over most of the rich Teshin industrial district, and the Lithuanians, with the connivance of the Bolsheviks, had recovered Wilna. The Czechs were extremely popular with the Allies, and enjoyed strong support from France. The Czech leaders also had expressed their sympathy and friendship toward Bolshevik Russia in strong terms during the recent Russo-Polish War, and they had done what they could to prevent Allied war material from reaching Poland. The Poles were unable to revenge themselves upon the Czechs immediately, but, when the League of Nations awarded Wilna to Lithuania on October 8, 1920, Local Polish forces under General Zaligowski seized the ancient capital of Lithuania on orders from Pilsudski. The Lithuanians received no support from the League of Nations. They refused to recognize the Polish seizure, and they protested by withdrawing their diplomatic representatives from Poland and by closing their Polish frontier. The Soviet-Polish frontier also was virtually closed and a long salient of Polish territory in the northeast extended as far as the Dvina River in Latvia without normal economic outlets. The Lithuanians revenged themselves upon the League of Nations, which had failed to support them, by seizing the German city of Memel, which had been placed under a League protectorate similar to the one established at Danzig in 1920. It was a sad reflection on the impotence of the German Reich that a tiny newborn nation could seize an ancient Prussian city and it also indicated the problematical nature of Woodrow Wilson's cherished international organization, the League of Nations. The Pilsudski Dictatorship Years of reconstruction followed in Poland, and for a considerable time there was much talk of sweeping economic and social reforms. Poland in March 1921 adopted a democratic constitution, which lacked the approval of Pilsudski. The constant shift of party coalitions always hostile to his policies irritated him, and the assassination immediately after the election of 1922 of his friend, President Gabriel Naratoas, did not improve matters. Pulsutsky, whose prestige remained enormous, bided his time for several years, and he consolidated his control over the army. Finally, in May 1926 he seized a pretext to overthrow the existing regime. A recent shift in the party coalitions had brought his sworn enemy, Wincenti Widows, back to the premiership, and the subsequent sudden dismissal of Foreign Minister Alexander Skrzynski, in whom Pilsudski had publicly declared his confidence, was 21 considered a sufficient provocation. Pilsudski grimly ordered his cohorts to attack the existing regime, and, after a brief civil war, he was able to take control. Fortunately for Pilsudski, Dmowski was a great thinker, but no man of action. The divided opponents of the new violence were reduced to impotence. These events were too much even for the nationalists among the Polish socialists, and the break between Pilsudski and his former party was soon complete. This meant that Pilsudski had no broad basis of popular support in the country, although he had obtained control of the army by gaining the confidence of its officers. He was feared and respected but not supported, by the political parties of Poland. It seemed possible to attain the support of the conservatives, but they required the pledge that he would not attack their economic interests. This pledge would be tantamount to the rejection of popular demands for economic reform. Pulsutski at an October 1926 conference in Nice was arrived at a far-reaching agreement with the great conservative landowners led by Prince Eustachy Sapiha, Count Artur Potocki and Prince Albrecht Radziwill. On this occasion, Stanislaw Radziwill, a hero of the 1920 war from a famous family, was awarded posthumously the Virtuti Militari, which was the highest decoration the new state could bestow. Pulsutsky declared himself to be neither a man of party nor of social class, but the representative of the entire nation. His hosts in turn graciously insisted that Pulsutsky's family background placed him equal among them not only as a noble, but as a representative of the higher nobility. The effect of these negotiations was soon apparent. In December 1925 a land reform law had been passed calling for the redistribution of up to 5 million acres of land annually for a period of 10 years. 
most of the land subdivided by the government was taken from the Germans and distributed among the Poles. This intensified minority grievances by depriving thousands of German agricultural laborers of their customary employment with German landowners. Nothing was done on the agricultural scene to cope with the pressing problem of rural overpopulation in Poland. The Polish peasantry was increasing at a more rapid rate than the urbanites, and the city communities, with their relatively small population, could not absorb the increase. The backward Polish system of agriculture, except on a few of the largest estates, and the absence of extensive peasant land ownership in many areas, increased the inevitable hardship of the two decades of reconstruction which followed World War I. The large number of holdings so small as to be totally inadequate was about the same in 1939 as it had been in 1921. The regime after 1926 increased the speed of the reallocation of the most poorly distributed small holdings, but the scope of this policy was minor in relation to the total farm problem. The peasant party leaders, who were soon persecuted by Pilsudski for their opposition to his regime, were regarded as martyrs in the Polish countryside, where the new system was denounced with hatred. The Polish socialists had sufficiently consolidated their influence over the urban workers by the time of Pilsudski's coup d'état to control most of the municipal elections. The socialist leaders turned against Pilsudski, and chronic industrial unemployment and scarce money embittered the Polish urban scene. The industrialization of Congress Poland had proceeded rapidly during the two generations before World War I, and progress in textiles was especially evident. The Russian market was lost as a result of the war, and Polish exports were slow to climb tariff barriers abroad, while low purchasing power restricted the home market. Profits in Polish industry were not sufficient to attract truly large foreign investments, although much of the existing industry was under foreign capitalistic control. Despite a 25% increase in the population of Poland between 1913 and 1938, the Polish volume of industrial products passed the 1913 level only in 1938, and the volume of real wages in Poland had still failed to do so. As a result of economic stagnation, the new regime was able to offer the Poles very little to distract them from their political discontent. These unfavorable conditions illustrate the situation of the Polish regime on the domestic front, and they offer a parallel to the unfavorable relations of Poland with most of her neighbors in the years immediately after 1926, and especially with the Soviet Union, Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Lithuania. The domestic and foreign scenes presented a perpetual crisis which accustomed the Polish leadership to maintain its composure, and to develop an astonishing complacency under adverse conditions. Roman Dmowski on the home front in December 1926 directly challenged Pilsudski's claim to represent the nation by establishing his own camp of Great Poland. For nearly four years this organization dominated the ideological scene. It demanded the improvement of relations with Russia, the permanent renunciation of federalism, the intensification of nationalism, a program to assimilate the minorities, and a plan to expel the Jews. Pulsutsky retaliated with great severity on September 10, 1930, by means of a purge organized by Waleri Slovak. No one dared to silence Dmowski, but Pulsutsky deprived him of many followers, and adopted many of his ideas. The arrest of opposition leaders, the use of the concentration camp system, and the adoption of terroristic tactics during elections intimidated the opposition at least temporarily. A new coalition of government supporters was able to obtain 247 of 444 seats in the same elected in November 1930. This was the first major election won by Pilsudski. There was much talk about a governing clique of colonels in Poland, and many of the principal advisers and key officials of the new regime held that rank. This situation reflected Pilsudski's policy of rewarding his military collaborators and disciples. These men were intensely loyal, and their admiration for their chief, whom they 22 regarded as infallible, knew no limits. They energetically adopted Dmowski's campaign against the minorities, and they discussed many plans for a new constitution which would buttress the executive power and reverse the democratic principles of the 1921 document. It was claimed that the 1921 constitution had been constructed with a jealous eye on Pilsudski 
and that this explained its purpose in placing extraordinary limits on the executive power, and in providing for a weak president on the French model. The key to the 1935 document, of which Waleri Slawick was the chief author, was a presidency sufficiently powerful to place the government in one house, and to control all branches of the state, including the same, the Senate, the armed forces, the police, and the courts of justice. The president also was given wide discretionary powers in determining his successor. The Polish dictatorship after Pilsudski's death Pilsudski died of cancer in May 1935 at the comparatively early age of 68. This raised the question of the succession in the same year that the new constitution was promulgated, and Waleri Slawek hoped to become the Polish strong man. He was widely regarded as the most able of Pilsudski's collaborators, and the conspiracy of the other disciples against him has often been regarded as a major cause of the misfortunes which soon overtook Poland. A carefully organized coalition, which was originally based on an understanding between Ignaz Moskicki, the Polish scientist in politics, and Edward Smigli Rydz, the military leader, succeeded in isolating Slawek and in eliminating his influence. The constitution of 1935 had been designed by Slawek for one powerful dictator, but the new collective dictatorship was able to operate under it for the next few years. Waleri Slawek committed suicide in April 1939 when it seemed increasingly probable that the collective leadership would submerge the new Polish state in disaster. There is an impressive analysis of the new Polish state by Colonel Ignacy Matyszewski, one of Pilsudski's principal disciples. It was written shortly after the death of the marshal. It reads more like an obituary than a clarion call to a system lasting and new, and its author is extraordinarily preoccupied with the personality and actions of Pilsudski at the expense of current problems and the road ahead. In this respect the book mirrored the trend of the era, because this was indeed the state of mind of the epigoni who ruled Poland from 1935 to 1939. Matyszewski was editor of the leading government newspaper, Gazeta Polska, from 1931 to 1936, and later he was president of the Bank of Warsaw the key financial organ of the regime. Originally he had been a disciple of Dmowski and an officer in the Tsarist forces, but he gladly relinquished both for the Pilsudski cause in 1917. He was one of the heroes in the 1920-1921 war with Russia, and he remained with the army until the coup d'état of 1926, which he favored. He had an important part in Polish diplomacy both in Warsaw and abroad during the years from 1926 to 1931. His book, Proby Sintes, Trial Synthesis, appeared in 1937. It defined the Polish regime ideologically and explained its aims. The author's thought, like Roman Dmowski's, was influenced mainly by the political philosophy of Hegel. Matyszewski declared that it was the will of the Polish nation to secure and maintain its national freedom. He believed that only the condition of the Polish race would decide Poland's ability to exercise this will. He added that the extraordinary achievement of one man had simplified Polish endeavors. He listed 1905, 1914, 1918, 1920 and 1926 as the years in which Pilsudski raised Poland from oblivion. In 1905, during a major Russian revolution, Pilsudski led the Polish radical struggle against Russia. In 1914 he led the Polish military struggle against Russia. In 1918 he returned from Magdeburg to arrange for the evacuation of Poland by the Germans. In 1920 he led the Poles to victory over communist Russia. In 1926 he crushed the conflicting elements at home and unified Poland. Matyszewski ominously warned his readers that the Polish national struggle of the 20th century had scarcely begun when Pilsudski died. He insisted that Poland had far-reaching problems to solve both at home and abroad. He described the 1926 coup d'état as an important step on the home front, and as a victory over anarchy. He declared that the first same had shown that Poland could not afford to surrender the executive power to legislative authority. He extolled the 1935 constitution which invested the basic power in the presidency. He maintained that unless the government of Poland was kept in one building, i.e., unless central control was completely simplified, the country would have civil war instead of domestic peace. 
Matyshevsky argued, as did other advocates of authoritarian systems, that the Polish regime retained a truly democratic character. He praised the government for an allegedly enlightened awareness of the traditional past, in contrast to the Dmowski group, and for an awareness of the traditional needs of Poland. He also argued that the fixed ideological dogmas of such other authoritarian regimes as Russia, Italy and Germany deprived them of flexibility in responding to popular needs, and consequently gave them an aristocratic character which he claimed Poland lacked. He described the constitutional regime of 1935 as a traditional synthesis and not an arbitrary system. It was to his credit that Matyshevsky did not claim a broad basis of popular support for the existing Polish system. He did assume from his theory of statism that it would eventually be possible to bridge the gulf between 23 the wishes of the citizens and the policy of the state without sacrificing the essential principles of the system. Matyshevsky regarded his book his numerous articles, and his editorials as contributions to an educational process which would one day accomplish this. Matyshevsky denied any affinity between Poland and the other authoritarian states or Western liberal regimes. He proclaimed Polish originality in politics to be a precious heritage for all Poles who cared to appreciate it. It was not his purpose to cater to whims and fancies, but to reshape mistaken systems of values. The people would not be allowed to impose their will on the new Polish state, either in domestic affairs or foreign policy. Whatever happened would be the responsibility of the small clique governing the nation. Matyshevsky neglected to mention that there were people in Poland not opposed to the regime who regarded the future with misgiving for quite another reason. They feared that the governing clique lacked the outstanding leadership necessary to promote the success of any system, whatever its theoretical foundations. The new Polish state on the domestic front faced many grave problems arising from unfavorable economic conditions, the dissatisfaction of minorities, and the general unpopularity of the regime. The situation was precarious, but far from hopeless. Within the context of a cautious and conservative foreign policy, which was indispensable under the circumstances, the Polish state might have strengthened its position without outstanding leadership. It was indisputable that foreign policy was the most crucial issue facing Poland when Pilsudski died. If Poland allowed herself, despite her awareness of past history, to become the instrument of the old and selfish balance of power system of distant Great Britain, if she rejected comprehensive understandings with her greater neighbours, and if she became involved in conflicts beyond her own strength, her future would bring terrible disappointments. The new Polish state could not possibly survive under these circumstances. The issue can merely be suggested at this point. Later it will become clear how great were the opportunities, and how much was lost. The situation, despite its problems, held promise when Pilsudski died. Chapter 2 The Roots of Polish Policy Pilsudski's Inconclusive German Policy the Polish government was concerned on the home front from 1935 to 1939 with plans for the industrialization of Poland, and in doing what could be done to gain popular support for the regime. These endeavors were relatively simple compared to the conduct of Polish foreign policy during the same period. There was a mystery in Polish foreign policy, what was the real Polish attitude toward Germany? An answer is necessary in explaining all other aspects of Polish policy. This question does not apply to the early period of the new Polish state because there was no real chance for a Polish-German understanding during the 1919-1933 period of the German Weimar Republic. The weakness of the Weimar Republic would automatically have confined any understanding to the status quo established by the Treaty of Versailles, and Poland made several overtures to reach an agreement with Germany on this basis. These overtures were futile because the leaders of the Weimar Republic considered that the status quo of 1919 was intolerable for Germany. The situation changed before Pilsudski died. Germany became stronger, and relations between Germany and Poland improved after a 10-year non-aggression pact was concluded by the two countries on January 26, 1934. This non-aggression pact failed to include German recognition of the 1919 status quo but the Polish leaders no longer expected Germany to recognize it. It was understood among Pilsudski's entourage that Hitler was more moderate about this question than his predecessors. 
it also was clear by 1935 that Hitler desired more than a mere truce with Poland. He recognized the key position of Poland in the East, and he was aiming at a policy of close collaboration. This had become one of his most important goals. It was current Polish policy when Pilsudski died in 1935 to place relations with Germany and the Soviet Union on an equal basis. This was not what Hitler had in mind. Polish policy seemed to remain unchanged during the following years while Germany continued to recover her former strength. It was questionable if the Polish leaders would permit any change in policy toward Germany. German foreign policy from 1933 to 1939 emphasized the need to cope with the alleged danger to European civilization from Bolshevism. This was less vital to Hitler than the recovery of German power, but the steps he took to revise the Paris Peace Treaties of 1919 were explained as measures necessary to strengthen Germany and Europe against Bolshevism. The position of Poland between Germany and the Soviet Union indicated that Hitler would require complete clarity about Polish policy. Poland's unfortunate geographical position made an ambiguous Polish policy the one thing which Hitler could not tolerate indefinitely. The Polish leaders recognized at an early date that Poland would be compelled to choose between the roles of friendly neighbor or enemy of Germany. The choice was not a foregone conclusion if Hitler was prepared to be generous to Poland, and by 1939 the Polish diplomats were in disagreement about this crucial issue. They wished to treat the problem as Pilsudski would have done, but at 24 was impossible to fulfill indefinitely the intentions of their deceased leader. Conditions continued to change after his death. An American parallel offers an illustration of this problem. President Roosevelt issued instructions for the use of atomic weapons while Germany was still participating in World War II. He died before the end of war with Germany. President Truman claimed to be following Roosevelt's policy when he ordered the use of atomic weapons against Japan in August 1945, but neither he nor his advisors knew whether Roosevelt would have permitted this atrocity after the unconditional surrender of Germany. This is another example of the dilemma presented to Epigoni by changing circumstances. Pulsutsky was renowned for his ability to adapt his policies to changing circumstances. If he had died in 1932, his successors would never have known whether or not he would have concluded the non-aggression pact of 1932 with Germany. It was impressive when the followers of Pilsudski spoke of carrying out the policies of the dead marshal. In reality, they had to conduct their own policies. It would be a disadvantage whenever they thought they were responding to the wishes of Pilsudski. Independent judgment is the most essential attribute of foreign policy. Nothing is more fatal for it than the weight of a dead man's hand. The Career of Joseph Beck The leadership of Poland was collective after 1935, but primary responsibility for the conduct of foreign policy rested with Colonel Joseph Beck. He was appointed foreign minister in 1932. He held this post until the Polish collapse in 1939, and he considered no one in Poland to be his equal in the field of foreign relations. Beck was descended from a lower German family which had emigrated to Poland several hundred years earlier. His affluent father had conspired against the Russians and had been imprisoned by them. His mother came from a family of land-owning gentry in the region of Kalm. Beck was born at Warsaw in 1894, but he received his earliest impressions in the German cultural environment of Riga, where his family moved shortly after his birth. The family soon decided to elude the persecutions of the Russians altogether, and in 1900 they moved to Austrian Galicia. Beck went to school in Krakow and Lvov, and he improved his contact with the Germans by a period of study in Vienna. He was 19 years of age when World War I came. He had no political affiliations, but he decided at once to join Pilsudski's forces. He followed Pilsudski's line of opposing the Polish Council of State in 1917, and he was interned by the Germans. He was released when he offered to join a Hungarian regiment. His admiration for the Magyars was increased by military service with them. He became intimately acquainted during this period with the Carpatho-Ukrainian area, which acquired decisive importance for Poland in 1938. He returned to service in the Polish army at the end of World War I and he participated in the Russo-Polish War of 1920-1921.
he achieved distinction in this war, and he was frequently in close personal contact with Pilsudski in the fighting along the Neman River during the autumn of 1920. A military alliance was concluded between France and Poland shortly before the close of the Russo-Polish War, and Beck was selected to represent the Polish army in France as military attaché. Beck was satisfied to remain with the army, and he was on active service until after the coup d'état of 1926. Pulsutsky then selected him as his principal assistant in conducting the business of the war office, which was personally directed by the marshal. Pulsutsky was disconcerted in 1930 by the inclination of Foreign Minister Zaleski to take the League of Nations seriously. It was evident that a change was required. Pulsutsky recognized the problematical character of League pretensions, although he admitted that they could sometimes be exploited for limited purposes. He decided that Beck should terminate his military career, and enter diplomacy. He knew that he could trust Beck to share his views. Beck was appointed Under Secretary of State at the Polish Foreign Office in December 1930. He succeeded Zaleski as Foreign Minister in November 1932. Beck's ability to get on well with Pilsudski for many years reveals much about his personality. He had a sense of humor, and an ability to distinguish between pretentious sham and reality. His successful career also reveals personal bravery, a good education, and extensive administrative experience. He had personal charm and sharpness of intellect. He had never known reverses in his career, and he possessed a supreme degree of confidence in his own abilities. This success was a weakness, because it made Beck arrogant and disinclined to accept advice from others after Pilsudski's death. The relationship between Pilsudski and Beck was based on the prototypes of father and son, with Beck in the role of the gifted, but slightly spoiled son. Pilsudski appointed Count Jan Zembeck to succeed Beck as Under Secretary of State at the Polish Foreign Office. Zembeck was the brother in law of an earlier Polish foreign minister, Count Skrzynski who had been a favorite of the Marshal Zembeck had acquired valuable experience as a diplomat of Austria-Hungary, and after 1919 he had represented Poland at Budapest, Brussels and Bucharest. Pulsutski relied on Zembeck to exert a steadying influence on Beck. It was unfortunate that Beck usually ignored Zembeck's advice during the difficult months prior to the outbreak of World War LL. The Hostility Between Weimar Germany and Poland the improvement of German-Polish relations after 1934 contrasted with the enmity which had existed between the two nations during the preceding years. A German-Polish trade war had begun in 1925 shortly before Pilsudski took power in Poland. This was an especially severe economic blow to Poland, because 43,2% of Polish exports had gone to Germany in 1924 and 34.5% of Polish imports had been received from the Germans. A trade treaty was finally signed by Germany and Poland in March 1930. It would have mitigated some of the hardship caused by five years of economic warfare, but it was rejected by the German Reichstag. The Locarno Treaties of October 16, 1925, were considered to be a diplomatic defeat for Poland. They provided for the guarantee of the German borders with Belgium and France, and for the improvement of German relations with those two powers. The Poles at Locarno raised the question of a German guarantee of the Polish frontiers without success. It was easy for German Foreign Minister Gustav Stresemann to convince the British and French that such a guarantee would be an impossibility for Germany. This event terminated the uniform treatment of all European frontiers under the Paris Treaties, and it produced a distinction between favored Western and second-class Eastern frontiers. This distinction implied a victory for the doctrine of Eastern territorial revision in favor of Germany. The 1926 Russo-German Treaty of Friendship followed Locarno, and if offered a basis for the coordination of Russian and German programs of territorial revision at Poland's expense. The Russians had urged an anti-Polish understanding since the economic agreement of 1922 with the Germans at Rapallo. Stresemann gave the Russians an explicit assurance after Locarno that Germany planned to conduct her territorial revision at Poland's expense in close collaboration with the Soviet Union. The British considered themselves free of any obligation to defend the Poles against German or Russian revisionism. Sir Austin Chamberlain the British Foreign Secretary at the time of Locarno, 
paraphrased Bismarck when he said that the Eastern questions were not worth the bones of a single British grenadier. Poland had her 1921 military pact with France, but the Allied evacuation of the Rhineland in 1930 modified the earlier assumption that French military power was omnipresent in Europe. Pulsutsky distrusted the French, and he resented their policy of favoring the Czechs over Poland. He was convinced that Czechoslovakia would not survive as an independent state. Relations between Russia and Poland appeared to improve somewhat after 1928 and the inauguration of the Soviet first five-year plan, which absorbed Russian energies in gigantic changes on the domestic front. An additional factor was Russian preoccupation with the Far East after the Russo-Chinese War of 1929 and the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931. This trend culminated in the 1932 Russo-Polish Non-Aggression Pact, and in the understanding that the Soviet Union would not aid Germany in a German-Polish conflict. The Russians were not informed that the Polish-Romanian alliance of 1921 was directed exclusively against the Soviet Union. They made no inquiries about the alliance when they signed their treaty with Poland. This was natural, because the initiative for the Russo-Polish Treaty came from Russia. The policy of Poland toward Germany during the last years of the Weimar Republic was a combination of threats and an effort to keep Germany impotent. Polish Foreign Minister Zaleski told the President of the Danzig Senate in September 1930 that only a Polish Army Corps could solve the Danzig question. The Bruning government in Berlin frankly feared a Polish attack during 1931. The General Disarmament Conference opened at Geneva in February 1932 after a 12-year delay. Poland opposed the disarmament of the Allied nations or the removal of restrictions on German arms contained in the Treaty of Versailles. It was feared at Geneva that Pilsudski's decision to send the warship Witcher to Danzig in June 1932 was a Polish plot to seize Danzig in the fashion of the earlier Lithuanian seizure of Memel. Pilsudski received many warnings against action of this kind. Pilsudski was merely intimidating the Germans. He would have liked to take Danzig, but he considered the step impossible while the West was conducting a policy of conciliation toward Germany. Pilsudski's Plans for Preventive War Against Hitler Adolf Hitler was appointed German Chancellor by President Paul von Hindenburg on January 30, 1933. Pilsudski regarded Hitler as less dangerous to Poland than his immediate predecessors, Papen and Schleicher, but the Polish policy of hostility toward Germany went further in 1933 than in 1932. This was because Pilsudski viewed the appointment of Hitler as an effective pretext for Allied action against Germany. Pilsudski's 1933 plans for preventive war against the Germans have been a controversial topic for many years, and there have been impressive efforts to refute the contention that Pilsudski did have such plans. The question remained in doubt until 1958. Lord Van Sittert, with the approval of the British government, revealed the authenticity of the Pilsudski War proposals of 1933 25 years after the event. He observed that Pilsudski's plans were an idea, of which too little has been heard. Van Sittert believed that a war against Germany in 1933 might have been won with about 30,000 casualties. He added that in World War II Hitler was removed at a cost of 30 million lives. Van Sittert 26 revealed that the opposition of the British government to the plans in 1933 was the decisive factor in discouraging the French, and in prompting them to reject a preventive war. It should be added that Pilsudski's willingness to throttle a weak Germany in 1933 provides no clue to the policy he might have pursued toward a strong Germany in 1939. Hitler told a British correspondent on February 12, 1933, that the status quo in the Polish corridor contained injustices for Germany which would have to be removed. The conservative government in Danzig several days later adopted a defiant attitude toward Poland in a dispute concerning the mixed Danzig-Polish Harbour Police Commission. News of these events reached Pilsudski at the vacation resort of Pakilizy in northern Poland. He decided to conduct a demonstration against the Germans at the worst possible moment for them, on the day following their national election of March 5th. 1933. The Polish warship Wielgia disembarked Polish troops at the Westerplatte Arsenal in Danzig Harbor during the early morning of March 6, 1933. Kasimierz Poppy, the Polish High Commissioner in Danzig, 
informed Helmer Rosting, the Danish League High Commissioner, that the Polish step countered recent allegedly threatening events in Danzig. The Poles, it should be noted, were inclined to distort the demonstrations of the local National Socialist SA, storm units, as troop movements. Polsudski supported his first move several days later by concentrating Polish troops in the corridor. His immediate objective was to occupy East Prussia with the approval and support of France. Hitler was not inclined to take the Polish threat seriously despite warnings from Hans Adolf von Moltke, the German minister at Warsaw. The German generals were worried about possible aggressive Polish action, and they reported to Defence Minister Werner von Blomberg that Germany had almost no chance in a war against Poland. This would even be true if Poland attacked without allies. The Danzig authorities enlisted British support against Poland at Geneva, and Sir John Simon, the British Foreign Secretary, delivered a sharply critical speech to Joseph Beck in the League Council. The Danzig authorities promised to conciliate Poland in the issues of current dispute, and Beck announced on March 14, 1933, that Poland would soon withdraw her reinforcements from Danzig. The internal situation in Germany was calm again at this juncture, and Hitler turned his attention to relations with Poland. He launched efforts to conciliate the Poles and to win their confidence, and these became permanent features of his policy. He intervened directly in Danzig affairs to establish quiet, and he endeavoured to win the Poles by direct assurances. These efforts were temporarily and unintentionally frustrated by Mussolini's four-power pact plan of March 17, 1933, which envisaged revision for Germany at Polish expense in the hope of diverting the Germans from their interest in Austria. Polsudski responded by resuming his plans for military action against Germany in April 1933. A series of unfortunate incidents contributed to the tension. A wave of persecution against the Germans living in Poland culminated in Black Palm Sunday at Lodz on April 9, 1933. German property was damaged, and local Germans suffered beatings and humiliations. Hitler adopted a positive attitude toward the Four Power Pact plan because he admired Mussolini and desired to improve relations with his Western neighbors, but he explained in a communique of May, 1933, that he did not intend to exploit this project to obtain concessions from Poland. This announcement followed a conversation of Hitler and German Foreign Minister Konstantin von Neurath with the Polish minister at Berlin. The conversation convinced Hitler that it might be possible to reach an understanding with Poland. The Four Power Pact, Great Britain, France, Germany and Italy, was signed on June 7, 1933, but French reservations rendered it useless. This did not prevent the Poles from regarding the pact as a continuation of Locarno diplomacy at the expense of Poland. Joseph Beck condemned the Four Power Pact on June 8, 1933. Hitler's assurances in May 1933 had produced some effect and Beck did not direct any special criticism toward Germany. The ultimate aims of German policy in Eastern Europe were never clearly defined, but Hitler was shaping a definite policy toward Poland. Hitler had said little about Poland from 1930 to 1933 while the National Socialists were rapidly increasing their influence in Germany prior to heading the government. It was widely assumed that Hitler was anti-Polish because his chief ideological spokesman, Alfred Rosenberg, had written a book, Die Zukunft einer Deutschen Ausenpolitik, A Future German Foreign Policy, Munich, 1927, which contained a number of sharply anti-Polish observations. Hitler in 1933 experienced no difficulty in correcting the views of Rosenberg, a mild-mannered and devoted subordinate and he began to combat the wishes of the German army and German foreign office for an anti-Polish and pro-Soviet policy. Hitler began to envisage a full-scale alliance between Germany and Poland. He terminated the last military ties between Russia and Germany in the autumn of 1933, and military collaboration between the two countries became a thing of the past. The political situation within Danzig was clarified by the election of May 28, 1933. The National Socialists obtained the majority of votes, and they formed a government. Hitler in the future could exert the decisive influence in that crucial and sensitive area. It gradually became apparent that Polish fears of an anti-Polish policy under Hitler were without foundation. 
King Gustav V of Sweden had predicted to the Poles that this would be the case. The Swedish monarch was aware of foreign policy statements made to prominent Swedes by Hermann Göring, the number two National Socialist leader of Germany. Göring had realized that Hitler was not inclined toward an anti-Polish policy long before this was evident to the world. On May 30, 1933, Pilsudski announced the appointment of Joseph Lipsky as Polish minister to Berlin. Lipsky was 27 born in Germany of Polish parents in 1894. He was friendly toward Germany, and he favored German-Polish cooperation. His appointment was a hint that Pilsudski wished to support Hitler's efforts to improve relations with Poland. Under Secretary Jan Zembeck presented a favorable report on recent developments in Germany after a visit in August 1933, and discussions were held in Warsaw and Berlin to improve German-Polish trade relations. A last crisis in German-Polish relations in 1933 took place when Hitler withdrew Germany from the League of Nations. This step on October 19, 1933, was a response to the Simon Disarmament Plan of October 14 which denied Germany equality nearly 21 months after the opening of the Disarmament Conference. Pulsutsky could not resist this opportunity of returning to his plans for military action while Germany was weak, and history would have taken a different course had the French supported his plans. Hitler was extremely worried by the possibility of retaliation against Germany. He urged the other German leaders to exercise extreme caution in their utterances on foreign affairs, and on every possible occasion he insisted that Germany was dedicated to policies of peace and international cooperation. The 1934 German-Polish Non-Aggression Pact An important meeting took place between Hitler and Lipsky on November 15, 1933. The French had refused to support Pilsudski in a war against Germany. Hitler gave new assurances of his desire for friendship with Poland. A sensation was caused on the following day by a German-Polish communique which announced the intention of the two countries to conclude a non-aggression pact. The Czechs since May 1933 had enjoyed the prospect of an improvement in German-Polish relations which would exacerbate relations between Paris and Warsaw. The Czech envoys in Berlin and Warsaw after November 16, 1933, confirmed these expectations which had first been expressed by Stefan Osiski, the Minister of Prague at Paris. Pulsutsky hesitated once more in December 1933 before he gave his final order to conclude the pact. His attitude toward the treaty at the time of signature was frankly cynical. He believed that the pact might postpone a day of reckoning between Germany and Poland, but he doubted if it would endure for the ten-year period specified in its terms. He believed it could be used to strengthen the diplomatic position of Poland. The Czechs were right about French resentment toward Poland, but they were wrong in their expectation that France would react by ignoring Polish interests. France cultivated closer relations with Poland after January 1934 in a manner which had been unknown in earlier years. Hitler regarded the pact as a personal triumph over the German Foreign Office, the German Army, and the German Conservatives. The role of President von Hindenburg was important in questions of foreign policy until his death in August 1934, and Hindenburg was identified with the groups hostile toward Hitler. Hitler had succeeded in convincing the old president that an improvement in relations with Poland was a wise step. He promised him that no proposals for eventual German-Polish action against Russia had been made in connection with the pact. Hitler knew that the non-aggression pact was merely a first step in his courtship of Poland. This fact received emphasis from Beck's visit to Moscow in February 1934. No other Polish visit of this kind took place during the period from World War I to World War II, and Beck's visit was a deliberate demonstration. The purpose of the visit was to show that Poland was maintaining impartiality in her own relations with Russia and Germany while Russo-German relations were deteriorating. A series of practical agreements were concluded between Germany and Poland after Beck returned from Russia. These concerned border traffic, radio broadcasts, activities of journalists in the respective countries, and the exchange of currency. The world was much impressed by the sensible pattern of German-Polish relations in contrast to the earlier period. The 1934 pact doubtless increased the prestige of both Germany and Poland. It would be difficult to determine which country received the greater benefit. 
the Poles were not willing to attack Germany without French aid, which was not available. The Germans were powerless to revise the Versailles Treaty by force. A policy of German collaboration with the Russians might have hurt the Poles, and a policy of Polish collaboration with the Czechs might have injured Germany. These alternative policies were discussed in various quarters, but both would have been difficult to implement at the time. The pact was an asset to both parties, and it brought approximately equal benefits to both. Jan Zembeck played an important role on behalf of the pact on the Polish side with his conversations in Germany and the Western countries. A similar role was played on the German side by Joseph Goebbels, German Minister of Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. Beck accepted an invitation to discuss current problems at Geneva with Goebbels and German Foreign Minister von Neurath in the autumn of 1933. Beck later observed that the motive of knowing his adversaries was sufficient to prompt his acceptance. Beck and Goebbels communicated without difficulty, and the Polish foreign minister was not offended when the German propaganda expert referred to the League as a modern Tower of Babel. Beck explained that Poland intended to remain in the League, but she had no objection to bilateral pacts which ignored the League. Goebbels assured Beck that Hitler was prepared to renounce war as an instrument of German policy toward Poland and to recognize the importance to Poland of the Franco-Polish alliance. Beck agreed not to raise the question of a German guarantee of the Polish 28 frontier. The clarification of these points was decisive for the conclusion of the pact. Joseph Goebbels came to Warsaw in the summer of 1934, and his visit was a great success. Hermann Göring began a series of annual visits to Poland in the autumn of the same year. The exchange of views in 1934 between Göring and the Polish leaders on the Czech situation and the German and Polish minorities of Czechoslovakia was especially significant. Göring criticized the contrast between the liberal Czech facade, and the actual stern police policies directed against the Germans, Poles, Slovaks, Hungarians, and Ruthenians. Pulsutsky assured Göring that the Czechs were neither respected nor loved in Poland. Goring advocated an alliance between Poland and Germany within a common anti-Soviet front, but Pilsudski displayed no inclination to coordinate Polish policy with German aims in the East. He evaded Goring's suggestion by observing that Poland was pursuing a policy of moderation toward Russia. Beck's position strengthened by Pilsudski. Beck attempted to follow up the 1934 pact by securing Polish equality with the great powers. He insisted that Poland, in all objectivity, was a great power, and he retaliated against all slights received by Polish leaders. He had visited Paris shortly after his own appointment as Polish foreign minister, but he had not been received at the railroad station by French foreign minister Joseph Paul Boncourt. Louis Barthou, a later French foreign minister sincerely admired by Beck, visited Warsaw in April 1934. Beck refused to meet him at the station and he evidently enjoyed this opportunity to settle accounts. It was not surprising that a sharp note of tension pervaded the Warsaw atmosphere during the Barto visit. Beck had another reason for dissatisfaction at this time. He had tried in vain to secure an agreement from the League Council which would relieve Poland from unilateral servitudes in the treatment of minorities under Article 93 of the Versailles Treaty. Beck was on the watch for some pretext to repudiate this part of the 1919 settlement. An opportunity arrived with the decision to admit the Soviet Union to the League of Nations in September 1934. Beck declared that it would be intolerable to permit a communist state to intervene in Polish affairs. He added that it was necessary to abrogate Article 93 before Russia attempted to exploit it as a League member. The abrogation took place on September 13, 1934, five days before the Soviet Union entered the League. Pulsutsky held an important conference on foreign policy with Beck and other Polish leaders at Belvedere Palace after Barto departed from Warsaw in April 1934. Pulsutsky conceded that Poland enjoyed a favorable situation, but he predicted that it would not endure. He announced that plans existed for every wartime eventuality, but it would require great efforts to increase Polish strength to a point where these plans might be pursued with some prospect of success. He denounced anyone who suspected that attractive personalities among the German leaders had caused him to modify Polish foreign policy, and he insisted that no foreigners should be allowed to influence Polish policy. 
President Moskiki, who presided at the conference, confirmed the fact that he had inspected the marshal's various war plans. Everyone was impressed when Pilsudski made a special gesture of expressing personal confidence in Beck and in his successful conduct of Polish foreign policy. This was exceptional treatment, because the taciturn marshal rarely complimented one subordinate in the presence of others. It was his custom to bestow rare praise in strictly private audiences. Pulsutski was obviously seeking to inspire maximum confidence in Beck among the other Polish leaders. His gesture at the conference made the position of Beck virtually impregnable. Pulsutski addressed an important question to the ministers which reflected his distrust of Germany after the 1934 pact. He asked them whether danger to Poland from east or west was greater at the moment. The conference agreed that Russian imperialism had slowed down since Stalin had established his supremacy. They also recognized that both Germany and Russia were coping with important internal problems which were absorbing most of their energies at the moment. They failed to agree on a definitive answer to the marshal's principal question. Pulsutsky appointed a special committee under General Fabrici to study the question. The Foreign Office was directed to collaborate with the Army in preparing a series of fact-finding reports. Edward Smigli RYDZ did not like the new agency, because it produced an overlap of Army and Foreign Office jurisdiction, and he forced it to adjourn sign die after the death of Pilsudski. The committee concluded that Russia presented the greatest threat to Poland during the period of its deliberations in 1934 and 1935. Pulsutsky customarily discussed the reports of this committee with Beck. He confided on one occasion that in 1933 he had been tempted to wage a preventive war against Germany without French support. He had decided to negotiate, because he was uncertain how the Western powers would have reacted to a Polish campaign against Germany. Pulsutsky conducted his last conference with a foreign statesman when Anthony Eden came to Warsaw in March 1935. The British diplomat intended to proceed to Moscow. Pulsutsky asked if Eden had previously discussed questions of policy with Stalin. Eden replied in the affirmative, and Pulsutsky exclaimed, I congratulate you on having had a conversation with this bandit. The Polish marshal hoped to participate in conversations between 29 Beck and Pierre Laval on May 10, 1935. He intended to warn the French leader, who was about to visit Moscow, not to conclude an alliance with the Soviet Union. It was too late when Laval arrived in Warsaw, because Pilsudski was dying of cancer. Beck entertained the French premier at a gala reception in Rachinsky Palace. He hastened afterward in full dress and orders to report to the marshal. Pilsudski greeted him with a few personal remarks characteristic of their intimacy. He then asked with customary bluntness if Beck was ever afraid. Beck replied that Poles whom Pilsudski had honored with his confidence knew no fear. Pilsudski observed that this was fortunate, because it meant Beck would have the courage to conduct Polish policy. The two men discussed the French situation, and they expressed their mutual detestation of the proposed Franco-Russian alliance. The marshal died on May 12, 1935. His last major decision on policy had been to oppose attempts to frustrate Hitler's move to defy the Versailles Treaty on March 16, 1935. The remilitarization of Germany was proclaimed, and the Germans restored peacetime conscription. Pulsutsky observed that it was no longer possible to intimidate Germany. Beck's plan for preventive war in 1936. There were six weeks of official mourning in Warsaw after Pulsutsky's death and then Beck visited Berlin. Beck met Hitler for the first time. The German Chancellor proclaimed his desire to arrive at an understanding with England. He also discussed his program to maintain permanently good relations with Poland. He admitted that Germany's current policy toward Poland could be interpreted as a tactical trick to gain time for some future day of reckoning, but he insisted that it was in reality a permanent feature of his policy. Hitler conceded that his policy toward Poland was not popular in Germany, but he assured Beck that he could maintain it. He mentioned his success in persuading President von Hindenburg to accept this policy in 1934. Hitler warmly praised Pilsudski's acceptance of the non-aggression pact. Beck observed that Pilsudski's attitude had been decisive on the Polish side. He added that the general Polish attitude toward the treaty was one of distrust. 
Beck confided that he intended to base his own future policy on Pilsudski's instructions. Hitler, who hoped that these instructions were favorable to Germany, made no comment, but he probably considered Beck's remark to be extremely naive. Beck added that Pilsudski had been profoundly convinced that the decision to improve German-Polish relations was correct. Beck concluded from this conversation that Hitler was alarmed by Pilsudski's death, and feared that it might lead to the deterioration of German-Polish relations. Beck was also convinced that Hitler was sincere in his effort to obtain German public approval for his policy of friendship toward Poland. The major issues of European diplomacy at this time were the problems arising from the wars in Spain and Ethiopia and the Franco-Russian Alliance Pact of May 1935. The Alliance Pact remained unratified for more than nine months after signature. The Locarno Treaties of 1925 had recognized the existing alliance system of France, but this did not include an alliance with the Communist East. Hitler warned repeatedly after the signature of the pact that its ratification would, in his opinion, release Germany from her limitations of sovereignty under the Locarno Treaties. The Franco-Russian Pact was a direct threat to Germany, and Hitler believed that a demilitarized Rhineland, as provided at Locarno and in the Versailles Treaty, was a strategic luxury which Germany could not afford. The French were constantly discussing steps to be taken if Germany reoccupied the Rhineland, but they were unable to obtain an assurance from London that Great Britain would consider such a move to be in flagrant violation of the Locarno Treaties. Joseph Beck asked a group of his leading diplomats on February 4, 1936, to study possible Polish obligations to France in the event of a German move. It was more than doubtful if Poland was obliged to support French action against Germany in this contingency. In reality, the principal Polish preoccupation was to discover whether or not France would act. Beck hoped for a war in alliance with France against Germany. He believed that the unpopular Polish regime would acquire tremendous prestige and advantages from a military victory over Germany. His attitude illustrates the deceptiveness of the friendship between Poland and Germany during these years, which on the Polish side was pure treachery beneath the façade. No such step against Germany after the signing of the 1934 pact was contemplated while Pilsudski still lived. Pilsudski refused to sanction steps against Germany in 1935 when Hitler repudiated the military provisions of the Versailles Treaty. Hitler announced at noon on March 7, 1936, that German troops were reoccupying demilitarized German territory in the West. Beck did not hesitate. He did not consider waiting for France to request military aid against Germany. He hoped to force the French hand by an offer of unlimited Polish assistance. Beck summoned French ambassador Leon Noel on the afternoon of March 7 after a hasty telephone conversation with Edward Smigley RYDZ. Beck presented the French ambassador with an unequivocal declaration. He said that Poland would attack Germany in the east if France would agree to invade western Germany. Many volumes of documents explain French policy at this crucial juncture. The incumbent French cabinet was weak, and the country was facing national elections under the unruly shadow of the emerging Popular Front. French Foreign Minister Pierre Etienne Flandin was noted for his intimate contacts with conservative circles in 30 London, and he was considered to be much under British influence at this time. The indiscretions of Sir Robert Van Sittard in December 1935 had enabled unscrupulous journalists to expose the Horleval plan to conciliate Italy, and the subsequent outcry in Great Britain had wrecked the plan. This led to the overthrow of the strong government of Pierre Laval in January 1936, and it destroyed the Stresa Front for the enforcement by Great Britain, France and Italy, of the key treaty provisions against Germany. British opinion was aroused against Italy and inclined to tolerate anything Hitler did at this point. The British leaders continued to favour Germany as a bulwark against French and Russian influence. The French military counter-intelligence, the famous Second Bureau, informed the government that Germany had more divisions in the field than France, and that the outcome of a war between France and Germany would be doubtful in the event of French mobilisation. The French did not believe that Poland was capable of striking an effective blow against Germany and no arrangements could be made to bring the more impressive forces of the Soviet Union into the picture. 
it was decided that the prospect of ultimate success would not be favourable without active British support against Germany. France did not care to take the risk alone, or merely in the company of one or two weak Eastern European allies. There was danger that Great Britain might support Hitler. The fact that Hitler sent only 30,000 troops in the first wave of Rhineland occupation was not of decisive importance. French counterintelligence was less concerned about occupying the left bank of the Rhine than with prosecuting the war after that limited objective had been attained. French experts doubted if their armies would be able to cross the Rhine. Beck's effort to plunge most of Europe into war had failed. He was not entirely surprised by the French attitude, and he had taken the precaution of instructing the official Iskra Polish news agency to issue a pro-German statement about recent events on the morning of March 8. It is impossible to find any trace of Pilsudski in tactics of this sort. Beck soon realized that his démarche with the French had produced no effect. He contemptuously described French Foreign Minister Flandin as a weakling, and as a most sad personage. He hurriedly visited London in an attempt to influence the British attitude. The British were not prepared to take Beck seriously, and he suffered a rebuff. Discussions with King Edward VIII and the Conservative leaders produced no results. The Germans failed to understand what Beck was doing during the early phase of the Rhineland crisis. Beck assumed an aloof position when the League of Nations met at London in mid-March 1936 to investigate the Rhineland affair. Beck was dissatisfied with Polish Ambassador Klapowski at Paris, and he appointed Julius Lukasiewicz to succeed him. Lukasiewicz had represented Poland at Moscow for several years, and Beck considered him to be the most able of Polish envoys. The March 1936 Rhineland crisis convinced Beck that it was indispensable to have his best man at the Paris Post. Hitler's Effort to Promote German-Polish Friendship Hitler was content to keep Germany in the background of European developments during the remainder of 1936 and throughout 1937. Göring visited Poland again in February 1937, and he presented a new plan for closer collaboration between Poland and Germany. He supported this project with great vigor in conversations with Marshal Smigli Rydz. He conceded that Germany would eventually request a few advantages from Poland in exchange for German concessions. He promised that the price would not be high. Hitler had empowered him to assure the Polish marshal that Germany would not request the return of the corridor. He added that in his own opinion Germany did not require this region. He promised that Germany would continue to oppose collaboration with Soviet Russia. Smigli Rydz was told that Goring had refused to discuss such projects with Marshal Tukhakevsky, the Russian army commander, when the latter was in Berlin. Goring promised that collaboration between Germany and Poland would ban forever the Rapallo nightmare of a far-reaching agreement between the Soviet Union and Germany. Goring did an able job of clarifying the German position in his discussions with Polish leaders, but these meetings produced no immediate fruit. Beck at this time had no intention of placing Poland in the German-Japanese anti-Comintern front. He was pursuing a policy of complete detachment toward both Russia and Germany. He did not assume that this policy would prevent friction between Poland and her neighbours, because this was not his aim. It was his purpose to advance the position of Poland at the expense of both Germany and Russia, and this precluded collaboration with either country. His policy became more unrealistic with each passing day as Germany recovered from the blows of World War I and from the treatment she had received under the subsequent peace treaties. The dangers of an anti-German policy historical changes always have suggested the need for parallel adaptations of policy. A warning to this effect was offered by Algierd Gorka, a Polish historian, on September 18, 1935, at the Polish Historical Conference held in Wilna. Gorka pointed out that conditions for the existence of Poland were worse in 1935 than at the time of the first 31 partition of Poland in 1772. The population ratio between Poland and the three partitioning powers of 1772 had been 1 colon 2, but the population ratio between Poland on the one hand, and Germany and the Soviet Union on the other, was 1 colon 8 in 1935. A hostile Polish policy toward both Germany and Russia was like a canary seeking to devour two cats. 
Gorka concluded that it was necessary for the Polish leaders to take account of these realities in the formulation of their policies. There were many attempts during this period to analyze the heritage of Pilsudski in the conduct of Polish foreign policy. The most comprehensive was Medzin Yemkamaya Russia, between Germany and Russia, Warsaw, 1937, by Adolf Baczynski. It is vital to emphasize at least one of these studies in order to illustrate the extraordinary complexity of current Polish speculation of foreign policy. It must be understood that it is impossible to measure with exactitude the political influences of such a book, but the importance of Baczynski was recognized throughout the Polish émigré press following his death in action near Ancona, Italy, in 1944. Indeed, W. A. Z. Bizewski, in the distinguished London Polish newspaper We Adomasi, on December 7, 1947, went so far as to describe Adolf Baczynski as the greatest Polish intellectual of the 20th century, thus placing him, at least in this respect, ahead of Roman Domowski. Baczynski was a member of the Krakow School of Historians, both the foreign policy pursued by Joseph Beck during the following two years appeared to be in complete harmony with Baczynski's ideas. Baczynski, along with others of the Krakow group, was unwilling to accept the pro-Russian ideas of Dmovsky and the National Democrats. He denounced Dmovsky's thesis of the bad German and good Russian neighbor. A Pilsudski-type policy was more to Bachensky's liking, although, like Beck, he lacked Pilsudski's flexible approach. Bachensky argued against a policy of collaboration with either Germany or Russia under any circumstances. He regarded an eventual German attempt to recover both West Prussia and East Upper Silesia as inevitable, and he noted that Studnicki and his pro-German group were as much in fear of German territorial revision as other Poles. War with both Germany and Russia was regarded by Bachensky as inevitable. He predicted that there would be an understanding between Hitler and Stalin, and that the Soviet Union would seek to obtain territorial revision in the West at the expense of Poland. Bachensky's statement that it would be unendurable for his generation of Poles to be dependent on either Germany or Russia was more emotional than factual. It was inconsistent with his numerous attacks on the large numbers of pro-Russian Poles. The Soviet Union appeared more dangerous than Germany to Bachensky, because France constituted a greater allied weight for Poland against Germany than Romania did against Russia, he predicted a new Russo-German war but he was mistaken in expecting that such a conflict would ultimately guarantee the great power status of Poland. Had Baczynski proved, or at least made plausible, his claim that Poland could profit from such a war, he would have created an imposing theoretical basis for the reckless Polish foreign policy which he advocated. Instead, he merely returned to the familiar old story of how World War I was advantageous for Poland, and to the naive assumption that history would repeat itself in the course of a second major conflict of this sort. He was on more solid ground in claiming that Soviet-German rivalry in the 1930s was responsible for the allegedly brilliant showing made by Beck on the European stage, but this fair-weather phenomenon was no basis for a Polish foreign policy. Baczynski admitted that Polish opposition to both Germany and Russia would make inevitable the temporary collaboration of these two rivals against Poland. He claimed this was advantageous, because Poland was not a status quo state but a revisionist state, and conflict with Germany and Russia would justify later Polish claims against them both. Baczynski made it quite clear that Poland was not in a position to smash either Germany or Russia by her own efforts. Poland required a disastrous international situation to destroy or weaken both Germany and Russia. Baczynski was intoxicated by the vision of distant powers, such as Great Britain and the United States, running amok in Germany and Russia. He considered the possibility of partitioning Germany into a number of small states, but he concluded that this was unfeasible because of the irresistible national self-consciousness of the German people. He decided that it was possible to inflict greater damage on Russia than on Germany, because the former contained a huge population of hostile minorities. Bachensky speculated that the dissolution of the Soviet Union would remove a strong potential ally of Germany, and would make it easier for Poland and France to control a defeated Germany. He admitted that a small group in Poland favored an alliance with Germany to smash Russia. Bachensky called Russia and Czechoslovakia the two sick men of Europe, because both states, in his opinion, 
contained minorities more numerous than the ruling nationality. There could be little objection in Bachensky's view to policies working toward the destruction of both states. Bachensky admitted that the creation of an independent Ukraine would create a problem for Poland, because such a state would always seek to obtain Volhynia and East Galicia, the Ukrainian territories controlled by Poland. He counted on a much greater conflict of interests between Russia and an independent Ukraine, and he observed that it did not matter with which of these states Poland collaborated. The primary objective was to have two states in conflict where there was now one. An independent white Russian state would add to the confusion, and to the spread of Polish influence. He noted that there was a Ukrainian minority problem within Poland with or without an independent Ukraine. The ideal solution for Bachensky would be a federal imperium in which Poland persuaded the Ukraine and white Russia associate with her. Bachensky believed that the destruction of Russia would improve Polish relations with France. He complained that France always had sacrificed Poland to any stronger ally in the East, and that the French policy of seeking to bring Soviet troops into the heart of Europe was contrary to the interests of Poland. The dissolution of Russia would render Poland the permanent major ally of France in the East. Bachensky denounced the Czech state as a menace to Poland, and he ridiculed the Czechs for their allegedly fantastic claims to German territory at the close of World War I. He added that the pro-Soviet policy of the Czechs made it necessary for Poland to count them among his enemies. He recognized that Germany would inevitably profit most from the collapse of the Czech state, but he refused to accept this as an argument against an anti-Czech policy. He believed it would be calamitous for Polish interests if the Czechs succeeded in assimilating the Slovak area, and he noted that Andreas Hlinka, the popular Slovak leader, recognized this danger when he advised Slovak students to go to Budapest instead of Prague. Bachensky admitted that the Slovaks, in contrast to the Czechs, were friendly toward Germany, but he believed that Polish policy might eventually reap rewards in Slovakia. Bachensky insisted that the Little Entente, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Yugoslavia, combination of France was virtually dead and would not be of concern to Poland much longer. Poland was primarily interested in maintaining her own close relations with Romania. He admitted that Romania was pro-German because of the danger from Russia, but he noted that she was also pro-Polish. He hoped that it would be possible to reconcile Romanian-Hungarian differences, and he advocated the assignment of Ruthenia to Hungary when the Czech state was dissolved. Bachensky believed that Poland needed to establish her influence over a number of weaker neighboring states, Ukraine White Russia, Lithuania, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, and then proclaim her own Monroe Doctrine. He cited and passant the axiom that Poland could not afford to surrender one inch of the territory gained at Versailles or Riga. He added ominously that Poland, in the face of some irretrievable disaster, might meet the crushing fate of Hungary at Trianon in 1919. Bachensky concluded that defeats would be in store for Poland until radical changes were made in Europe. He welcomed the allegedly inevitable future conflict between Poland and Germany. He believed that the worst thing which could happen would be to have a communist Russia in the east and a communist German state to the west of Poland. It is easy to see today that this is exactly what did happen as the result of the adoption and pursuit of the policy advocated by Bachensky. Allied propagandists in the period of World War I were in the habit of citing obscure German books, which scarcely anyone Germany had ever read to prove the alleged rapacity and baseness of Germany. This type of propaganda has made every later attempt to cite an allegedly important book understandably suspect. Nevertheless, Bachensky's book contained the blueprint of Polish policy during the 1935-1939 period, and it was the most important book on foreign policy which appeared in Poland at that time. Its salient points were accompanied by several brilliant insights into the earlier epochs of European history. Bachensky advocated a policy of blood and disasters. He decried any attempts to arrive at understandings with either Germany or Russia. He conceded that Polish enmity toward Germany and the Soviet Union would lead to collaboration between these two states. He pointed to an illusory rainbow in the sky, but this was scant consolation for the Poles who would fail to survive. He felt no compunction in desiring the ruin and destruction of the principal neighbors of Poland. The salvation of Poland depended upon the repudiation of this policy. 
Bachensky declared that Poland would not give up one inch of territory obtained as a result of World War I and its aftermath. He insisted that Germany would eventually demand large stretches of former German territory. It remained to be seen what the Polish leaders would say when Hitler agreed to recognize the Polish Western frontier and to forego any German claim to the former German territories held by Poland. In 1937 it was still not too late for Poland. Conditions in Europe were changing, but Polish policy could reflect the change. The danger was that Great Britain would ultimately encourage Poland to challenge Germany and plunge the new Polish state into hopeless destruction. The roots of Polish policy were in the experiences of World War I. If the Polish leaders could be shown that the changes in Europe precluded the repetition of World War I, they might be expected to adapt their policy to new conditions. On the other hand, if Great Britain announced anew her intention to destroy Germany despite the absence of any conflict between British and German interests, the Poles, under these circumstances, could scarcely be blamed for failing to liberate themselves from their old World War I illusions. The key to Polish policy, once the reasonable German attitude toward Poland had been revealed, was in London. The undistinguished Polish leaders after 1935 could scarcely resist lavish and intoxicating offers of support from the British Empire. This would be true despite the fact that any Anglo-Polish alliance against Germany would be a disaster for the sorely tried Polish people. Chapter 3 The Danzig Problem The repudiation of self-determination at Danzig The establishment of the so-called Free City of Danzig by the victorious Allied and Associated Powers in 1919 was the least defensible territorial provision of the Versailles Treaty. It was soon evident to observers in the Western world, and to the people of Germany, Poland, and Danzig, that this incredibly complicated international arrangement could never function satisfactorily. Danzig in 1919 was an ordinary provincial German city without any expectation or desire to occupy a central position on the stage of world politics. The Danzigers would have welcomed special Polish economic privileges in their city as a means of increasing the commerce of their port. They were horrified at the prospect of being detached from Germany and separately constituted in an anomalous position under the jurisdiction of an experimental League of Nations, which did not begin to exist until 1920. One might well ask what the attitude of the people of Portland, Oregon, would be if their city were suddenly detached from the United States and placed under the jurisdiction of the United Nations in the interest of guaranteeing special port facilities to Canada near the estuary of the Columbia River. It would be small consolation to recall that the area around Portland, before passing under the sovereignty of the United States in 1846, was settled by the British Hudson Bay Company. The traditionally friendly relations between Canadians and Portlanders would soon deteriorate under such exacerbating conditions. It is not surprising that the National Socialists of Adolf Hitler won an electoral majority at Danzig before this was possible in Germany. The Danzigers hoped that perhaps Hitler could do something to change the intolerable conditions established during 1919 and the following years. It was easy in 1939 for Marguerite Gartner, the National Socialist propagandist, to compile extensive quotations from approximately 100 leading Western experts who deplored the idiocy of the Danzig settlement of 1919. Her list was merely a sampling but it was sufficient to substantiate the point that at Danzig a nasty blunder had been made. The issue exploited by Lord Halifax of Great Britain to destroy the friendship between Germany and Poland in March 1939 was the Danzig problem. The final collapse of the Czech state in March 1939 produced less effect in neighbouring Poland, where the leaders were inclined to welcome the event, than in the distant United States. The Polish leaders had agreed that the return of Memel from Lithuania to Germany in March 1939 would not constitute an issue of conflict between Germany and Poland. Hitler emphasized that Germany would not claim one inch of Polish territory, and that she was prepared to recognize the Versailles-Polish frontier on a permanent basis. Polish diplomats had suggested that a settlement of German requests for improved transit to German East Prussia would not present an insuperable problem. The German leaders were disturbed by Polish discrimination against the Germans within Poland, but they were not inclined to recognize this problem as an issue which could produce a conflict between the two states. It was primarily Danzig which made the breach. 
It was the discussion of Danzig between Germany and Poland which prompted the Polish leaders to warn Hitler that the pursuance of German aims in this area would produce a Polish-German war. Polish defiance of Hitler on the Danzig question did not occur until the British leaders had launched a vigorous encirclement policy designed to throttle the German Reich. It is very unlikely that the Polish leaders would have defied Hitler had they not expected British support. The Polish leaders had received assurances ever since September 1938 that the British leaders would support them against Hitler at Danzig. Many of the Polish leaders said that they would have fought to frustrate German aims in Danzig had Poland been without an ally in the world. They were seeking to emphasize the importance which they attached to Danzig in discussing what they might have done in this hypothetical situation. This does not mean that they actually would have fought for Danzig in a real situation of this kind, and it is doubtful if Pilsudski would have fought for Danzig in 1939 even with British support. It is evident that Danzig was the issue selected by the Polish leaders to defy Hitler after the British had offered an alliance to Poland. It is easy to see today that the creation of the free city of Danzig was the most foolish provision of the Versailles Treaty. A similar experiment at Trieste in 1947 was abandoned after a few years because it was recognized to be unworkable, and it is hoped that Europe in the future will be spared further experiments of this kind. Danzig had a national socialist regime after 1933, and Karl Burkhardt, the last League High Commissioner in Danzig, said in 1937 that the union between Danzig and the rest of Germany was inevitable. The Polish leaders professed to believe that it was necessary to prevent Danzig from returning to the Reich. This is especially difficult to understand when it is recalled that the Poles after 1924 had their own thriving port city of Gdynia on the former German coast, and that otherwise the Poles had never had a port of their own throughout their entire recorded history. The Poles claimed that the Vistula was their river, and that they deserved to control its estuary. When Joseph Goebbels observed that it would be equally logical for Germany to demand Rotterdam and the mouth of the Rhine, the Poles answered with the complaint that the Germans controlled the mouths of many of their rivers, such as the Weser, the Elba, and the Oder, but for unfortunate Poland it was the Vistula or nothing. The Germans might well have answered this complaint with one of their own to the effect that it was unfair of God to endow Poland with richer agricultural land than Germany possessed. The Poles were usually impervious to logic when Danzig was discussed. This in itself made a preposterous situation more difficult, although a compromise settlement on the basis of generous terms from Hitler might have been possible had it not been for British meddling. The establishment of the Free City regime Danzig was historically the key port at the mouth of the Great Vistula River artery. The modern city of Danzig was founded in the early 14th century, and it was inhabited almost exclusively by Germans from the beginning. There had previously been a fishing village at Danzig inhabited by local non-Polish West Slavs which was mentioned in a church chronicle of the 10th century. The Germans first came to the Danzig region during the eastward colonization movement of the German people in the late Middle Ages. Danzig was the capital of the Prussian province of West Prussia when the victors of World War I decided to separate this Baltic port from Germany. The city had been a provincial capital within the German Kingdom of Prussia prior to the establishment of the North German Federation in 1867 and of the German Second Empire in 1871. The Allied powers in 1920 converted Danzig from a German provincial capital to a German city-state in the style prevailing in the other Hanse-Attic cities of Bremen, Hamburg, and Lübeck. The latter three cities remained separate federal states within the German Empire created by Bismarck. The difference was that the victorious powers insisted that Danzig should not join the other states of the German Union, or again become a part of Germany. They also decreed that Danzig should submit to numerous servitudes established for the benefit of Poland. The renunciation of Danzig by Germany and the creation of the Free City Regime was stipulated by Articles 100 to 108 of the Versailles Treaty. A League High Commissioner was to be the first instance of appeal in disputes between Poland and Danzig. The foreign relations of Danzig were delegated to Poland, and the Free City was to be assigned to the Polish customs area. The Poles were allowed unrestricted use of Danzig canals, docks, railroads, and roads for trading purposes and they were delegated control over river traffic, and over telegraph, telephone and postal communications between Poland and Danzig Harbour. The Poles had the privilege of improving, leasing, 
or selling transit facilities. The residents of Danzig forfeited German citizenship, although formal provision was made for adults to request German citizenship within a two-year period. Double citizenship in Danzig and Germany was forbidden. The League of Nations, as the sovereign authority, was granted ownership over all possessions of the German and Prussian administrations on Danzig territory. The League was to stipulate what part of these possessions might be assigned to Poland or Danzig. The formal treaty which assigned specific property of Poland was ratified on May 3, 1923. The Poles received the Petershagen and Neufruiser barracks, naval supplies, oil tanks, all weapons and weapon tools from the dismantled Danzig Arms factory, supply buildings, an apartment building, the state welfare building on Hansa Square, the major railroad lines and their facilities, and ownership over most of the telegraph and telephone lines. Other facilities were assigned to the Free Harbor Commission supervised by the League of Nations in which the Poles participated. The Poles requested a munitions depot and base for a small Polish army garrison. The Westerplatt Peninsula close to the densely populated Neufruiser district was assigned to Poland on October 22, 1925. The Danzig parliament protested in vain that this decision constituted a new rape of Danzig. The Poles also received permission to station warships and naval personnel in the area. These various awards meant that by 1925 the Polish government was the largest owner of property in the Free City area. The Danzig Constitution was promulgated on June 14, 1922, after approval by Poland and the League of Nations. Provisions were enacted to guarantee the use of the Polish language by Poles in the Danzig courts, and a special law guaranteeing adequate educational facilities for the Polish minority was passed on December 20, 1921. The Danzig Constitution was based on the concept of popular sovereignty despite the denial to Danzigers of the right of self-determination. The Constitution stipulated that the construction of fortifications or manufacture of war material could not be undertaken without League approval. The Constitution provided for a Volkstag, assembly, of 120 members with four-year terms. It was primarily a consultative body with the right to demand information about public policy, although the formal approval of the Volkstag for current legislation enacted by the Senate was required. The Senate with its 22 members was the seat of carefully circumscribed local autonomy. The President and the other seven major administrative officers, who were comparable to city commissioners, were elected for four years and received fixed salaries. The seven Senate administrative departments included Justice and Trade, Public Works, Labor Relations, Interior, Police, Health and Religion, Science and Education, and Finance. There was no separate executive authority. The Danzig Constitution of 1922 replaced the Weimar German Constitution of August 11, 1919, which had been tolerated as the fundamental law of Danzig until that time. The election to the Weimar Constitutional Assembly in January 1919 had taken place throughout West Prussia and it constituted a virtual plebiscite in favor of remaining with Germany. The Allies refused to permit them a plebiscite of their own which they knew would end in a defeat for Poland. The British government played a more active role than any other power, including Poland, in the organization of the Danzig regime. British policy was decisive in the regulation of early disputes between Danzig and Poland. The British at Danzig furnished the first three League High Commissioners, Sir Reginald Tower, General Sir Richard Haking, and Malcolm S. Macdonnell, and the last of the British High Commissioners, after an Italian and Danish interlude, was Sean Lester from Ulster, who held office from 1934 until late 1936. British interest was largely a reflection of British investment and trade, and much of the industrial enterprise of Danzig came under the control of British citizens during these years. The British also played a decisive role in securing the appointment of Carl Jacob Burkhard, the Swiss historian who succeeded Lester and who held office until the liberation of Danzig by Germany on September 1, 1939. The so-called liberation of Danzig by the Red Army on March 30, 1945, referred to in recent editions of the Encyclopedia Brita NICA, was actually the annihilation of the city. The territory of the Free City had approximately 365,000 inhabitants in 1922. 
the Polish minority constituted less than 3% of the population at that time, but the continued influx of Poles raised the proportion to 4% by 1939. The introduction of proportional representation enabled the Poles to elect five of the 120 members of the second Volkstag following the promulgation of the unpopular 1922 constitution. The German vote was badly split among the usual assortment of Weimar German parties. The Conservatives, DNVP, elected 34 deputies and the Communists elected 11. The Social Democrat Marxists elected 30 and the Catholic Center 15. The remaining 25 deputies were elected by strictly local Danzig German parties. This disastrous fragmentation in the face of a crisis situation was changed after the National Socialists won the Danzig election of 1933. The divided Danzig Senate presided over by a conservative president was followed by a united National Socialist Senate. This created a slightly more favorable situation for coping with the moves of the Polish dictatorship at Danzig. It would not be correct to define Danzig's status as a Polish protectorate under the new system despite extensive Polish servitudes, i.e. privileges under international law. Danzig was a League of Nations protectorate. This was true despite the fact that the Allies, and not the League, created the confusing free city regime, and despite the absence of a formal ceremony in which actual sovereignty was transferred to the League. The protectorate was administered by a League of Nations High Commissioner resident in Danzig, by the Security Council of the League of Nations in Geneva, and, after 1936, by a special committee of League member states. The capital of the political system which included Danzig was moved from Berlin to Geneva, and this was an extremely dubious move from the standpoint of the Danzigers. The League was in control at Danzig as it had been in Memel before Lithuania was permitted to seize that German city. The Poles with varying success began an uninterrupted campaign in 1920 to push their rights at Danzig beyond the explicit terms of Versailles and the subsequent treaties. One of the earliest Polish aims was to establish the Polish Supreme Court as the final court of jurisdiction over Danzig law. This objective was never achieved because of opposition from the League High Commissioners, but Poland was eventually able to establish her Westerplatte garrison despite the early opposition of League High Commissioner General Sir Richard Haking. The Poles never abandoned these efforts, and everyone in Danzig knew that their ultimate objective was annexation of the free city. The existing system was unsatisfactory for Poland, Germany, and Danzig. The Poles wished to usurp the role of the League, and both Germany and Danzig favored the return of the new state to the German Reich. There could be no talk of the change of system in Germany in 1933 alienating the Danzigers, because the National Socialists won their majority in Danzig before this had been accomplished in Germany. The change of system in Germany was matched by the unification of Danzig under National Socialist leadership. The Polish effort to acquire Danzig Dmowski and Paderewski presented many arguments, at Versailles, to support their case for the Polish annexation of Danzig. It should occasion no surprise that Poland sought to achieve this program of annexation. The strategic and economic importance of Danzig at the mouth of the river on which the former and present capitals of Poland, Krakow and Warsaw, Warsaw, were located, was very great. The National Democratic leaders were not worried that they would create German hostility by making this conquest. They argued at Versailles that Germany in any case would seek revenge from Poland because of the other treaty provisions. They claimed that the region on which Danzig was situated belonged to the Poles by right of prior settlement, and they spoke of the so-called recent German invasion of the territory some 600 years earlier. The history of the Polish state, from the Viking regime imposed in the 10th century until the 18th century partitions, extended over 800 years, and the Poles were satisfied that their state was more ancient than Danzig. They were confident that they could contend with the German argument against their case on this point. The German argument was based on two principal facts. In the first place, Germanic tribes had occupied the Danzig area until the late phase of the Wandering of the Peoples, Volker Wanderung, in the 4th century AD. Secondly, the Poles had never settled the Danzig region before the Germans arrived to found their city in the late Middle Ages. The Polish reply to this German argument was twofold. They contended that the early German tribes in the Danzig area were representative of the entire Germanic civilization, which included, 
besides Germany, Scandinavia, England, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. They concluded that the Germans had no right to base claims on the early history of these tribes. Secondly, the small early West Slavic tribes, which were bordered by the West Slavic Poles, West Slavic Czechs, Borussians and Germans on land, and on water by the Baltic Sea, had been largely assimilated by their neighbors. These tribes had settled the Danzig region between the wandering of the peoples and the founding of Danzig by the Germans. It was argued that these early West Slavic tribes, who had maintained a fishing village on the site of the later city of Danzig, were more intimately related to the Poles than to their other neighbors. It was this doctrine which provided the claim that Poland might legitimately consider herself the heir to the entire German territory between the Elba and the Vistula. At one time or another this area had been occupied by West Slavic tribes. These were the principal so-called historical arguments of the Poles. They claimed along economic lines that Danzig had grown rich on the Polish hinterland. This was undoubtedly true, although the local West Prussian hinterland, which had long been German, also contributed to Danzig's prosperity. We have noted the Polish natural law argument that Danzig should belong to them because they controlled most of the Vistula River. They also raised the strategic argument that ownership of Danzig was necessary to defend Poland and to guarantee Polish access to the sea. The second point, if one overlooks the feasibility of granting Poland port facilities in German harbours, had been met after 1924 by the construction of the neighbouring port of Gdynia. The first point concerning defence does not merit lengthy examination. Danzig was distant from the bulk of Polish territory, and therefore it could contribute little to the defence of Poland. Ian D. Moro, the principal British historian of the treaty settlement in the eastern borderlands, concluded that the problem of Polish claims to Danzig constitutes as it were a permanent background to the history of the relations between the free city of Danzig and the Republic of Poland. The German Order of Knights played an important role in the early history of Danzig. The order had been commissioned by the Roman Catholic popes and German emperors to end the threat of heathen invasion in Eastern Europe. The order established its control over West Prussia by 1308. Danzig was developed within this territory by German settlers, and the order permitted her to join the Hansa Attic League. Danzig grew rapidly for more than 150 years under the protection of the order, and at one time it was the leading ship-building city of the world. The first Poles appeared in the area, and the tax register at Danzig indicated that 2% of the new settlers in the period from 1364 to 1400 were Polish. Polish historians have emphasized that a trading settlement of Germans on the Danzig site had first received approval for an urban charter in 1235 from Swantopak, a West Slavic chieftain. They therefore concluded that the first German trading settlement in the area was under Slavic sovereignty. They have regarded this as a sort of precedent to suggest that the Poles were requesting a return to the original state of affairs when they demanded Danzig. This is an impossible mystique for anyone questioning the allegedly close affinity between the early West Slavic tribes of the coastal area and the Poles. Polish historians see a great tragedy for Poland in the conquest of West Prussia by the German Order of Knights in 1308. The Knights were able, at least temporarily, to establish a common frontier between their conquests along the Baltic Sea and the rest of Germany. They also attained a frontier with the German Knights of the Sword farther to the north. This linked up the German Eastern conquests of the Middle Ages in one contiguous system from Holstein to the Gulf of Finland. It meant that any belated Polish attempt to attain territorial access to the Baltic Sea would have to contend with a solid barrier of German territory between Poland and the coast. The various German orders in their conquests had never seized any territory inhabited by the Poles. This meant that the Poles, if they attacked the Germans, would be unable to claim either to Pope or to Emperor that they were seeking to liberate Polish territories under German control. Confusion in the papacy during the 15th century, and distractions in the German Empire, enabled the Poles to isolate the German Order of Knights, and to attack the Order with the aid of Tartar and Lithuanian allies. The relations between the Poles and the German Emperors, however, remained peaceful throughout this same period. There were no wars at all between the German emperors and the Polish kings from this time until the disappearance of Poland in the 18th century. 
the Poles began their victorious struggle against the Order in 1410. They never lost the initiative after their great field victory at Tannenberg, Grunwald, in the first year of the war. The struggle dragged on to the accompaniment of sporadic bursts of activity from the Poles, and the Germans defended themselves stubbornly in their cities. The ultimate outcome of the war was influenced by internal German struggles between the colonists and the celibate knights from all parts of Germany. The colonists in both town and countryside had begun to consider themselves the native Germans several generations after the first settlement, and they regarded the knights, who had no family roots in these provinces, as foreigners. The internecine struggles which followed decisively weakened the order. The territorial integrity of the order state was shattered at the Peace of Thorn in 1466. Some Polish historians regard the period of the order in West Prussia as a mere episode in which Poland at last had begun to make good her claims to the heritage of the West Slavic tribes. The Poles in 1466 annexed most of West Prussia and part of East Prussia. They reached the Baltic coast, but they failed to establish Polish maritime interests. Danzig seceded from the order state, but she retained her status of German city within the Hanseatic League. Her position was unique. Unlike the other Hanseatic cities, she was neither a member of a German territorial state nor under the immediate jurisdiction of the emperor. Danzig enjoyed the theoretical protection of the Polish kings, but she was independent of them. She never compromised her independence by permitting a Polish army to control the city. King Stephen Bathory of Poland became impatient with the state of affairs in 1576. He threatened the Danzigers with war if they did not accept his demand for a Polish military occupation and a permanent Polish garrison. Danzig in reply did not hesitate to defy Stephen Bathory. The war which followed was a humiliation for the proud Polish state at the zenith of her power. The Polish forces were unable to capture Danzig. Danzig in the 17th century declined rapidly in commercial importance along with the other cities of the Hanseatic League. There were many complex causes both economic and political, but the principal factor was the successful manner in which the Dutch and the Danes conspired to thwart Hanseatic interests. Danzig continued to maintain her freedom from Polish control despite her decline, and indeed, the Polish state itself experienced a period of uninterrupted decline after the Great Ukrainian Uprising against Poland in 1648. The situation of Danzig remained unchanged until she was annexed by Prussia in the 18th century. Prussia surrendered to Napoleon I at the Peace of Tilsit in 1807. Danzig was separated from Prussia and converted into a French protectorate with a permanent French garrison. By this time the city had become ardently Prussian, and this unnatural state of affairs, which was also inflicted on Bremen, Hamburg and Lübeck, was violently resented by the Danzigers. The French regime at Danzig was threatened by Napoleon's debacle in Russia in 1812. This event enabled the Prussians to recover Danzig early in 1814 after a long siege. Danzig remained enthusiastically Prussian until the city was literally annihilated by Russian and Mongolian hordes in 1945. Danzig's anguish at separation from Germany Danzig saw nothing of war or invasion from 1814 until the defeat of Germany in 1918. The Danzigers did not contemplate the possibility of annexation by the new Polish state until after the close of World War I. They were assured by German Chancellor Hertling in February 1918 that President Wilson's peace program with its 13th point on Polish access to the sea did not threaten their affiliation with Germany in any way. The President's ambassador had assured the German government that this was the case when the point about Polish access to the sea was discussed before American entry into the war. The President's program was based on national self-determination, and Danzig was exclusively German. The Danzigers thought of port facilities for the Poles in German harbours along the lines subsequently granted to the Czechs at Hamburg and Stettin. This arrangement satisfied the Czech demand for access to the sea. No one thought of Polish rule at Danzig until it became known that the Poles were demanding Danzig at the peace conference, and that President Wilson favoured their case. The disillusioned Danzigers petitioned the German authorities at Weimar to reject any peace terms which envisaged the separation of Danzig from Germany. There was still some hope in April 1919, 
when the Allies refused to permit Polish troops in the West under General Haller to return to Poland by way of Danzig. German troops occupied Danzig at that time, and the Poles were required to return home by rail. The Danzigers were in despair after receiving the preliminary draft of the Versailles Treaty in May 1919. They discovered that some queer fate was conspiring to force them into the ludicrous and dubious situation of a separate state. Danzig discovered in May 1919 that the 14 points and self-determination had been a trick, a ruse de guerre el Americaine, and in June 1919, with the acceptance of the treaty by the Weimar government, it was evident that Danzig must turn her back on her German fatherland. The Allied spokesman in Danzig urged her to hasten about it, and not be sentimental. The Germans had been tricked and outsmarted by the Allies. After all, Danzig had lost World War I Poland's desire for a maritime role The distinguished Polish historian, Oskar Halecki, has declared that the demands of Dmowski at Versailles were unanimously put forward by the whole nation. Polish spokesmen have insisted that the entire Polish nation was longing for a free marine frontier in the north, and for a coastal position which would enable Poland to play an active maritime role. This was doubtless true after 1918, although for more than 300 years, when Poland from the 15th to the 18th centuries held most of the West Prussian coastline, the Poles played no maritime role. It should be added that they also held coastal territory east of the Vistula with harbour facilities during those years. When struggles occurred during the 17th century between rival Swedish and Polish Vesa kings, the Poles chartered German ships and crews from East Prussian bases to defend their coasts from the Swedes farther than to undertake their own naval defence. Poland made no effort to build a merchant marine or to acquire colonies, although the neighbouring German principality of Brandenburg, with a less favourable 17th century geographic and maritime position, engaged in foreign trade and acquired colonies in Africa. These facts in no way diminished the Polish right to play a maritime role in the 20th century, but it was unwarranted for Polish spokesmen to mislead the Polish people about their past. An especially crass example of this was offered by Eugenius Kwiatkowski, Vice Premier of Poland from 1935 to 1939, and from 1926 the leading government figure in Polish commerce and industry. Kwiatkowski was a close personal friend of President Moskicki, and he was entrusted with the organization of the Central Industrial Region COP, of Poland before World War II. He was an expert engineer who had studied in Krakow, Lwów, and Munich, and he had earned the proud title creator of Gdynia for his collaboration with Danish colleagues in the construction of Poland's principal port. Kwiatkowski, like some other scientists, was guilty of distorting history, and he went to absurd lengths to identify Poland with the nests of West Slavic pirates of the early Middle Ages who had operated from Rugen Island off the coast of Pomerania. Kwiatkowski announced at a maritime celebration on July 31, 1932, that, if the heroes of Poland's great naval past could raise their voices once again, one great, mighty, unending cry would resound along a stretch of hundreds of miles from the Oder to the Memel, Long Live Poland. Dot. At Paris the Poles had argued that Danzig was indispensable for their future maritime position. Lloyd George frustrated their plan to annex Danzig, but they were told by the Danes that the West Prussian coast north of Danzig presented the same physical characteristics as the northeastern coast of Danish Zealand. The Danes had built Copenhagen, and there was no reason why the Poles could not build their own port instead of seeking to confiscate a city built by another nation. The Poles were fascinated by this prospect, and they were soon busy with plans for the future port of Gdynia. The construction of Gdynia and Polish economic discrimination in favour of the new city after 1924 produced a catastrophic effect on the trade of the unfortunate Danzigers. The Polish maritime trade in 1929 was 1,620 million zloty, of which 1,490 million zloty still passed through Danzig. The total land and sea trade by 1938 had declined to 1,560 million zloty, and only 375 million went by way of Danzig. The Danzig trade was confined mainly to bulk products such as coal and ore. Imports of rice, tobacco, citrus fruits, wool, jute and leather, and exports of beet sugar and eggs passed through Gdynia. 
Danzig was virtually limited to the role of port for the former German mining region of East Upper Silesia. The trade of Gdynia had become more than three times as valuable as that of Danzig. Trade between Danzig and Germany was discouraged by a heavy Polish protective tariff. Polish concern about Danzig might have diminished after the successful completion of the port of Gdynia had Polish ambitions been less insatiable. Unfortunately this was not the case, and the Poles remained as jealous as before of their position within the so-called free city. The Poles had originally insisted that Danzig was the one great port they needed to guarantee their maritime access. They soon began to speak of modern sea power, and it was easy to demonstrate that one port was a narrow foundation for a major naval power. They described Danzig as their second lung, which they needed to breathe properly. It was a matter of complete indifference to them that Danzig did not wish to be a Polish lung. They were equally unmoved by the fact that millions of their Ukrainian subjects did not care to live within the Polish state and that nearly one million Germans had left Poland in despair during the 18 years after the Treaty of Versailles. Life had been made sufficiently miserable for them to do otherwise. It could be expected that the Germans would also evacuate a Polish Danzig, and thus make room for a Polish Gdansk. The Polish leaders were encouraged to hope for this result because of the manifestly ridiculous and humiliating situation created for Danzig by the Treaty of Versailles. The preoccupation of the Polish leaders with Danzig was quite extraordinary. This was indicated by the press and by the analytical surveys of the Polish Foreign Office, Polska Zagranica, Poland and Foreign Lands, which were sent to Polish diplomatic missions abroad. These secret reports were also distributed among Foreign Office officials, cabinet members and army leaders. They emphasized the consolidation of National Socialist rule at Danzig after the 1934 pact the economic problems of Danzig, and the constitutional conflict between the Danzig Senate and the League. It was possible to conclude from these reports that Danzig was the cardinal problem of Polish foreign policy despite the conclusion of the 1934 pact with Germany. The line taken by the Polish Foreign Office was simple and direct. It was noted that Polish public opinion was increasingly aroused about Danzig, and that the government continued to maintain great interest in the unresolved Danzig problem. Above all, it was stressed that Danzig, although it did not belong to Poland, was no less important to Poland than Gdynia, which was Polish. It would be impossible to convey Polish aspirations at Danzig in terms more eloquent. It should be evident at this point that no serious person could expect a lasting agreement between Germany and Poland without a final settlement of the Danzig question. The Danzig status quo of Versailles was a source of constant friction between Germany and Poland. The Polish leaders after 1935 continued to believe that the ideal solution would have been the annexation of Danzig by Poland, and Pilsudski himself had favoured this solution, under favourable conditions, such as the aftermath of a victorious preventive war against Germany. Pilsudski's preventive war plans dated from 1933, when Germany was weak. After the 1934 pact, the Poles opened an intensive propaganda campaign against the Czechs, and the prospects for a Polish success at Teschen, in cooperation with Germany, were not entirely unfavorable. It seemed by contrast that Poland had nothing more to seek at Danzig. Pilsudski had declared in March 1935 that no power on earth could intimidate Germany any longer. Hitler talked with good sense and conviction of abandoning claims to many German territories in Europe which had been lost after World War I. These included territories held by Denmark in the north, France in the west, Italy in the south, and Poland in the east. Hitler expected Poland to reciprocate by conceding the failure of her earlier effort to acquire Danzig. Hitler was not prepared to concede that Danzig was lost to Germany merely because she had been placed under the shadowy jurisdiction of the League. Danzig was a German National Socialist community plagued with a Polish economic depression and prevented from pursuing policies of recovery to improve her position. Danzig wished to return to Germany. Hitler had no intention of perpetuating the humiliating status quo of surrendering this purely German territory to Poland. He was whining to recognize extensive Polish economic rights at Danzig. It would have been wise for the Poles to concentrate upon obtaining favorable economic terms and otherwise to wash their hands of the problem. 
Hitler's effort to prevent friction at Danzig The Poles were seeking to extend their privileges at Danzig when Hitler was appointed Chancellor in 1933. There had been chronic tension between Danzig and Poland throughout the period of the Weimar Republic in Germany. Indeed, the 1919 settlement at Danzig virtually precluded conditions of any other kind. The improvement of German-Polish relations shortly after the advent of Hitler was accompanied by a temporary relaxation of tension between Poland and Danzig, but it would have required a superhuman effort to maintain a lasting détente within the context of the Versailles status quo. Hermann Rauschning, the first National Socialist Danzig Senate leader, was known to be extremely hostile to Poland, but Hitler persuaded him to go to Warsaw for talks with the Polish leaders in July 1933. Rauschning was accompanied by Senator Arter Grasser, who was known for his moderate views on Poland. A favorable development took place on August 5, 1933. Danzig and Poland agreed to settle important disputes by bilateral negotiation instead of carrying their complaints to the League of Nations. Either party was obliged to give three months' notice before appealing to the League if bilateral negotiations failed. The Poles also agreed to modify their policies of economic discrimination against Danzig, but they failed to keep this promise. The following year was relatively calm although there were many irritating minor incidents involving economic problems and the operations of Polish pressure groups on Danzig territory. Danzig and Poland concluded an economic pact on August 8, 1934, which contained mutual advantages on taxes and the marketing of Polish goods in Danzig territory. The conciliatory trend at Danzig was strengthened when Grasser succeeded Rauschning as Senate President on November 23, 1934. The Poles had no complaints about Grasser, but they objected to Albert Forster, the National Socialist District Party leader. Forster was an energetic and forceful Franconian with the Sturhit, stubbornness, characteristic of the men of his district. He was one of Hitler's best men and his assignment at Danzig was a significant indication of the seriousness of Germany's intentions. Forster was less cosmopolitan than Grasser, but he was highly intelligent, and he fully understood the scope and significance of the Danzig problem despite his West German origin. He was a stubborn negotiator with both Poland and the League, but he loyally supported Hitler's plans for a lasting agreement with Poland. He also shared Hitler's enthusiasm for an understanding with England. Lord Van Sittert described Forster in his memoirs as a rogue Forster was exceptionally handsome who came to our house with glib professions and a loving mate Forster's wife was exceptionally beautiful. This brief rejection of Forster by the leading British Germanophobe tallied closely with the negative attitude of the Poles. The effort of Hitler to achieve greater harmony with Poland at Danzig did not achieve lasting results. Friction began to increase again early in 1935 and this trend continued until the outbreak of war in 1939. Many of the new disputes were economic in nature. Danzig was experiencing a severe depression, and the local National Socialist regime wished to do more to help the people than had been done by the conservative regime in the past. The lack of freedom made it impossible to emulate the increasing prosperity which existed in Germany. The deflationary monetary policies of Poland were anathema in Danzig, where the Danziger Golden was tied to the scarce Zloty of the Poles. An attempt to free the Golden from the Zloty, without leaving the Polish Customs Union, produced a crisis in May 1935. Danzig received much expert advice from Hjalmar Schacht, the president of the German Reichsbank. The Polish financial experts regarded this as unwarranted German interference in the affairs of German Danzig. The crisis reached a climax on July 18. 1935, when Poland put Danzig under a blockade, and commanded the shipment of all goods through Gdynia. Danzig responded by opening her economic border with East Prussia in defiance of Poland. This involved an attempt to circumvent the Polish customs inspectors and to ignore the Polish tariff requirements. Hitler intervened at this critical point and used his influence to obtain the agreement of August 8, 1935, which amounted to a total retreat for Danzig. This capitulation ended any hope that Danzig might be able to ameliorate the economic depression through her own efforts. 
A typical dispute of this drab period transpired in 1936 when the Poles abruptly issued regular army uniforms to the Polish customs inspectors in the hope of accustoming the Danzig population to a regular Polish military occupation. The Danzig government protested, but the Poles, as usual, refused to accept protests from Danzig. A dangerous atmosphere was maintained by the constant agitation of the Polish pressure groups. The Polish Marine and Colonial League demonstrated in Warsaw in July 1936 for the expansion of existing Polish privileges at Danzig, and its activities were accompanied by a new campaign against Danzig in the Polish press. Relations between Poland and Danzig were as bad as they had been during the Weimar Republic. Hitler had attempted to reduce friction on the basis of the status quo, but this effort had failed. The chauvinism of Polish High Commissioner Kodaki Joseph Beck, Poland's foreign minister, soon decided that renewed tension had made Danzig the most prominent front in the conduct of Polish diplomacy, except possible Paris. He decided to recall Kasimierz Poppy, the Polish High Commissioner, and to replace him with a man who enjoyed his special confidence. The choice had fallen on Colonel Marjan Kodaki, who ranked second in Beck's estimation to Julius Lukasiewicz at Paris. Kodaki in 1936 was Poland's diplomatic representative at Prague. Beck invited his friend to return to Warsaw from Prague on December 1936 for three days of intensive discussions on the Danzig situation before clearing the channels for his new appointment. Beck told Kodaki at Warsaw of his decision, and he requested him to take the Danzig post. Kodaki accepted with the slightest hesitation. Beck asked if Kodaki was not afraid to accept such a dangerous mission. Kodaki, instead of replying, asked Beck a question in return, Are you not afraid to send me there? Dot. Beck agreed with a smile that this question had a point. He knew that his friend was the most ardent and sensitive of Polish patriots. Beck outlined the situation. He expected Kodaki to maintain Poland's position at Danzig by means short of war but he intimated that events at Danzig might ultimately lead to war. Beck emphasized the importance of the British and French attitudes toward Polish policy at Danzig, and Kodaki realized that Beck wished to have the support of the Western powers in any conflict with Germany. It was evident that Paris and London would be decisive in the determination of Polish policy at Danzig. Beck admitted that the two Western powers seemed to be indifferent about Danzig in 1936, but he expected their attitudes to change later. He discussed the details of current disputes at Danzig, and it was evident that the two men were in complete agreement. Kodaki assumed the new post several days later. The Danzigers had been annoyed with League High Commissioner Sean Lester for several years. Lester was an Ulsterman who seemed to delight in conducting a one-man crusade against National Socialism and all its works in Danzig. The officers of the German cruiser Leipzig ostentatiously refused to call on Leicester when their ship visited Danzig Harbour in June 1936. The Danzigers repeatedly urged the British to withdraw him, and at last this request was granted. Several replacements were considered, but the choice fell on Karl Jacob Burkhardt, a prominent Swiss historian who was an expert on Cardinal Richelieu and the traditions of European diplomacy. Burkhardt was acceptable to the Poles and he received his appointment from the League Security Council on February 18, 1937. Burkhardt had been extraordinarily discreet in concealing his fundamental sympathy for Germany. He was later criticized by many League diplomats, but at the time he was universally regarded as an admirable choice. Kodaki had been sent to Danzig to maintain the claims and position of Poland, whereas Burkhardt was merely the caretaker of the dying League regime. Kodaki was instructed to insist on Polish terms at Danzig, and he was not expected to believe in the permanent preservation of peace. The emphasis of his mission was on stiffening the Polish line without risking a conflict until Poland had British and French support. The attitude he adopted at Danzig was provocative and belligerent. He delivered an important speech to a Polish audience at Grostramkin, Danzig Territory, on Polish Independence Day, November 11th. 1937. He made the following significant statement, which left no doubt about his position, I remember very well the time I went into the Great War, hoping for Poland's resurrection. The Poles here in Danzig should likewise live and wait in the hope that very presently they may be living on Polish soil. 
This was holiday oratory, but it should have revealed to the last skeptic that neither Kodaki nor Beck had abandoned hope of annexing Danzig to Poland. A final solution would be required to end the unrest caused by rival German and Polish aspirations at Danzig, and there could be no lasting understanding between Poland and Germany until such a solution was achieved. Self-determination for the inhabitants was the best means of resolving this issue in view of the conflicting German and Polish claims. It was no longer news to the Danzigers that many Poles hoped for the ultimate annexation of Danzig to Poland. They would not have been surprised to discover that Beck's High Commissioner entertained similar sentiments privately. It would be difficult to argue that Kodaki's publicly announced campaign of Polish Urdentism was calculated to reduce the growing tension between Danzig and Poland. Beck had responded to the Danzig situation by sending a chauvinist to maintain the Polish position. The deterioration of the Danzig situation after 1936 issues of dispute between Danzig and Poland were markedly on the increase throughout 1937. Kodaki later declared that 15 1,000-page volumes would be required to describe the Danzig-Polish disputes prior to World War II. There can be no doubt that the year 1937 contributed its share. Times remained hard in both Danzig and Poland, and the great majority of disputes were economic in nature. The Poles placed heavy excise taxes on imports from the huge Danzig margarine industry to protect Polish competitors. They rejected the contention of Danzig that this measure was a violation of the August 6, 1934, economic treaties to eliminate trade barriers between the two countries. This single dispute produced an endless series of reprisals and recriminations. Irresponsible fishing in troubled waters by foreigners also occasioned much bad feeling. A typical example was the circulation of rumors by the Daily Telegraph, an English newspaper. The Daily Telegraph reported on May 10, 1937, that Joseph Goebbels had announced Germany's intention to annex Danzig in the near future. It is easy to understand the effect produced on the excitable Poles in the Danzig area by such reporting, and it would have been a pleasant surprise if this particular newspaper of Kaiser interview and Horlaval Pact fame had not contributed to alarmism at Danzig. The statement attributed to Goebbels in this instance was purely an invention. By 1938, tension had been built up to a point where incidents of violence played an increasingly prominent role. Meetings of protest, more frequently than otherwise about imaginary wrongs, were organized by pressure groups in surrounding Polish towns. They invariably ended with cries of, we want to march on Danzig, and with the murderous slogan, kin the Hitlerites. Kodaki told Smigli Rydz at Polish army maneuvers in September 1937 that the National Socialist Revolution in Danzig was virtually completed, and that the Gleisch-Chaltung, coordination, of Danzig within the German system had been achieved. The one exception was that Danzig still had her made in Poland depression, whereas Germany was swimming in plenty. The effective organization work of Albert Forster convinced the Poles that Danzig was at last slipping through their fingers. Awareness of this increased Polish exasperation. Kodaki claimed that in 1938 one of his speeches at Torin or elsewhere in West Prussia would have been sufficient to set a crowd of tens of thousands marching against Danzig. He admitted that he was often tempted to deliver such a speech. He felt goaded by fantastic attacks in the Krakow press that he was too conciliatory toward Danzig. The need for a solution the Danzig problem by 1938 was a skein of conflicting interests between exasperated Poles and impatient Danzigers. The absurd regime established at Versailles was a failure. Hitler intervened repeatedly for moderation, but he was no less disgusted with the humiliating farce than the Danzigers, and he was weary of conciliation at Danzig's expense. Intelligent foreign observers expected this attitude. Lord Halifax, who had outmaneuvered Gandhi of India on many occasions, visited Hitler at Birch Teskeden on November 19, 1937. He inquired whether Hitler planned to do something about Danzig. Hitler was understandably evasive in his reply, but Halifax made no secret of the fact that he expected German action to recover Danzig. The current mentality of the Polish leaders indicated that a solution would be difficult, and it is painful to recall that the entire problem would not have existed had Danzig not been placed in a fantastic situation by the peacemakers of 1919. 
the Danzig problem resulted from a wretched compromise between Lloyd George and Woodrow Wilson. It epitomized the comment of the American publicist, Porter Sargent, the Anglo-Saxon peoples held the world in the palms of their hands, and what a mess they made of it. There was nothing left but to try for a solution. It would be scant consolation in the event of failure to know that the blame would be shared by men of two generations. The cost of failure would be paid by untold generations. Chapter 4 Germany, Poland and the Czechs The Bolshevik threat to Germany and Poland The failure of two neighboring nations with similar interests to cooperate against a mutual danger posing a threat to their existence is a sorrowful spectacle. The civilizations of ancient Greece and of Aztec America were overwhelmed by alien invaders because of internecine strife. In the 1930s, the authoritarian and nationalistic states of Germany and Poland were seeking to promote the development, livelihood and culture of their national communities, but they faced a common threat from the Soviet Union. The ideology of the Soviet Union was based on the doctrines of class hatred and revolutionary internationalism of Karl Marx. The peoples of Russia were suffering on an unprecedented scale from their misfortune in falling prey to the merciless minority clique of Bolshevik revolutionaries who seized power in the hour of Russian defeat in World War I. The Bolsheviks later wrought untold havoc on the peoples of Poland and Germany. The communists by means of murder and terror have depopulated the entire eastern part of Germany, and they hold central Germany, the heart of the country, in an iron grip. It is a sad commentary that millions of Germans and Poles are now collaborating under a system which has destroyed the freedom of their two nations. They were unable to unite in defense of their freedom. It is of course possible that the Soviet Union would have triumphed over Germany and Poland had the two nations been allies. It is more likely that a Polish-German alliance would have been the rock to break the Soviet tide. The present power of the Bolsheviks is so great that no one knows if it is possible to prevent their conquest of the world, and the failure of German-Polish cooperation is one of the supreme tragedies of world history. The conflict between Warsaw and Berlin became the pretext in 1939 for the implementation of the antiquated English balance of power policy. This produced a senseless war of destruction against Germany. As it turned out, each Allied soldier of the West was fighting unwittingly for the expansion of Bolshevism, and he was simultaneously undermining the security of every Western nation. Never were so many sacrifices made for a cause so ignoble. Neither Germany nor Poland desired to evangelize the world or to impose alien systems of government of foreign nations throughout the globe. There was a monumental difference between them and the Soviet Union on this point. The elements of friction between Germany and Poland, despite the senseless provisions of the 1919 Versailles Treaty, were markedly reduced under the benign influence of the treaty between Pilsudski and Hitler. A few concessions on both sides if only in the interest of establishing a common front against Bolshevism, could have reduced this friction to insignificance. The two nations were natural allies. They were new states seeking to overcome the uncertainty and fear occasioned by the frustration of their healthy nationalist aspirations over many centuries. The leaders of both nations hated the Bolshevist system and they regarded it as the worst form of government devised by man. They realized that the Soviet Union possessed natural resources and population which made the combined resources and populations of Germany and Poland puny by comparison. It is evident from a survey of the international situation sent to missions abroad by the Polish Foreign Office in 1936 that the Soviet Union was regarded American Samoa the greatest foreign threat to Poland. This report confirmed the impressions of the Diplomatic Military Committee established by Pilsudski in 1934 to study the German and Russian situations. Nevertheless, Poland rebuffed the suggestions of Hermann Göring after 1934 for German-Polish collaboration against the Soviet Union. The great question was whether or not Poland intended permanently to follow a policy of impartiality toward the Soviet Union and Germany. Polish experts in Moscow were impressed by mid-1936 with the improved living conditions in Russia under the second five-year plan, which appeared to be far less drastic and cruel than the first five-year plan. They conceded that the Soviet system was consolidating its position. A new series of Soviet purges began later the same year. They lasted nearly three years, and dwarfed the bloody Chaikov purges of 1918 
or the Purge in 1934 which followed the assassination of Sergei Kirov, the Leningrad administrator. Foreign observers wondered whether the new purges would strengthen or weaken the Soviet regime. Opinions were divided on this crucial point, but it was evident that the new upheavals constituted a crisis for the regime. Hitler's anti-Bolshevik foreign policy Recent Soviet developments did not affect the tempo of Hitler's policy, which was geared to speed, although actual German preparations for defense were exceedingly lax because of monetary inflation fears. Hitler was striving to win the friendship of Great Britain, and to foster Anglo-German collaboration in the spirit and tradition of Bismarck, Cecil Rhodes, and Joseph Chamberlain. He was aware of the traditional British balance of power policy. He realized that he must complete his continental defensive preparations against Bolshevism before the British decided that he was too strong, and moved to crush him as they had crushed Napoleon. Hitler hoped that the British would not intervene while he was securing Germany's position through understandings with Germany's principal neighbors, and by a limited and moderate program of territorial revision. British leaders had opposed the German Customs Union before 1848, and they had opposed the national unification of Germany during the following years. Nevertheless, Bismarck had outbluffed Palmerston at Schleswig-Holstein in 1864, and it was evident by 1871 that Tories and Liberals alike were whining to accept the results of Bismarck's unification policy despite his repeated use of force. Germany was conceded to be the strongest military power on the European continent after 1871. The balance of power was operating, but the British faced colonial conflicts with France and Russia, and the 1875 Franco-German war scare crisis showed that Germany could still be checked by a hostile combination. At that time, a momentary coalition of France, Great Britain, and Russia was formed against Germany within a few days. Hitler hoped that a German program of territorial revision and defense against communism would be accepted by the British leaders, if it was carried through with sufficient speed. If the tempo was slow, the latent British hostility toward everything German could easily produce new flames. The traditional warlike ardor of the British upper classes was momentarily quiescent, but it could be aroused with relative ease. Hitler hoped that a refusal to pursue political aims overseas or in the west or south of Europe would convince the British leaders, once his position was secure, that his program was moderate. His strength would still be insufficient to overshadow the primary position of the British Empire in the world. He was whining to place Germany politically in a subservient position to Great Britain, and to accept a unilateral obligation to support British interest at any point. Hitler hoped that the British would appreciate the advantages of this situation. They could play off the United States against Germany. Germany would be useful in resisting American assaults against the sacred British doctrine of colonialism, and the United States could be used to counter any German claims for special privileges. Hitler's ideas were confirmed by a brilliant report of January 2, 1938, from Joachim von Ribbentrop, German ambassador to Great Britain. Ribbentrop pointed out that there was no real possibility of an Anglo-German agreement while conditions were unsettled, but that perhaps a strong German policy and the consolidation of the German position would make such an agreement possible. The German ambassador emphasized that an understanding with Great Britain had been the primary aim of his activity during his many months in London. He had reached his conclusions after personal conversations with the principal personalities of British public affairs. Ribbentrop's report was decisive in winning for him the position of German foreign minister in February 1938. No other German diplomat of the period had presented Hitler with a comparable analysis of British policy and of the British attitude toward Germany. The Ribbentrop report was comparable to the 1909 Memorandum of Alfred Kitterlin Wechter on Anglo-German and Russo-German relations. This memorandum had been requested by Chancellor Bethmann Hallweg and it brought Kitterlin from the obscure Bucharest legation to the Wilhelmstrasse despite the fact that he was disliked by Kaiser Wilhelm II. The controversial question of whether or not the Russian regime was successfully consolidating its position could not be decisive for Hitler under these circumstances. The impulse for rapid moves and definitive results arose from Hitler's evaluation of the situation in London. Hitler's basic program, 
after the recovery of the Saar and the restoration of German defences in the Rhineland, was to liberate the Germans of Austria, aid the Germans of Czechoslovakia and place German relations with France, Italy and Poland, his principal neighbours, on a solid basis. It would be possible afterward to talk to the British about a lasting agreement, when the prospects for success would be more favourable. Improved German-American relations would follow automatically from an Anglo-German understanding. Hitler also hoped to act as moderator between Japan and nationalist China to restore peace in the Far East, and to close the door to communist penetration which was always opened by war and revolution. If this moderate program could be achieved, the prospects for the final success of the Bolshevik world conspiracy in the foreseeable future would be bleak. No nation occupied a more crucial position in the realization of Hitler's program than Poland, because Hitler recognized that the Poland of Pilsudski and his successors was a bulwark against communism. The Polish leaders failed to recognize the importance of German support against the Soviet Union. Germany and Poland were conducting policies of defense against Bolshevism, but there were no plans for aggressive action against Russia and the Polish leaders failed to see the need for any understanding with Germany to cope with the existing situation. Polish hostility toward the Czechs The attitudes of the German and Polish leaders toward little Czechoslovakia were identical. The Czech problem, in contrast to the problem of Bolshevism, had moderate dimensions, and both countries were inclined to contemplate a solution of their grievances against the Czechs by some sort of aggressive action. The Polish press was many years ahead of the press of Germany in advocating the dissolution of Czechoslovakia. A Polish press campaign with this objective began in 1934, after the conclusion of the German-Polish Pact. The German and Polish leaders in the same year discussed their mutual dislike of the Czechs in terms more concrete than the Poles were willing to employ toward the Soviet Union. There have been many attempts to solve the Czech problem during the past five generations. This problem arose with the spread of a hitherto unknown anti-German Czech nationalism during the 19th century. The problem did not exist in the 12th century when Bishop Otto of Freising, a princely medieval chronicler, related the exploits of Czech shock troops fighting for Frederick I. Hohenstaufen, in his wars against the Lombard League. It did not exist in the 13th century when the proud new city of Königsberg, Royal Hill, on the Pregel River in East Prussia was named after Otto Kahr, a Bohemian king of the Premi Slid line, who was noted for his brave deeds and for his loyalty to the Holy Roman Empire. It did not exist in the 14th century when Charles IV, Luxembourg Premislid, made Prague the most glorious capital city the Holy Roman Empire had ever known. It did not exist in the 15th century when John Hus, the martyr of the Czech religious reform movement, reported back to Bohemia on his trip to the Council of Constance, that the audience which listened to him at Nuremberg was the most enthusiastic and grateful congregation he had ever encountered. It did not exist in the 16th century, when the Austrian duchies and the Bohemian Kingdom were firmly welded under the Habsburg Scepter within the framework of the Holy Roman Empire, or in the 17th century, when Bohemian Germans and Czechs fought on both sides in the Thirty Years' War. All historians agree that the 18th century period of Habsburg rule was the most tranquil in Bohemian history. By 1848, the modern intellectual movement of Czech nationalism, which originated from the impact of the Slavophile teachings of Johann Gottfried Herder in the late 18th century, had begun to make considerable headway with the Czech masses. The Frankfurt Parliament in 1848 anticipated the dissolution of the Austrian Empire and it quite naturally assumed that Bohemia and Moravia, which had been integral parts of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, would find their future in a modern national German state. It came as a rude shock when the Czech historian and nationalist leader, Francis Pelaki, addressed the Frankfurt Parliament with the announcement that his Czech faction hoped Austria would be preserved, and that they would oppose union with Germany if this effort failed. Only the continuation of the Austrian Empire stood as a buffer between the Czechs and Germany after 1848. Eduard Benes, the 20th century Czech nationalist leader, advocated full autonomy for both Germans and Czechs of Bohemia in his Dijon dissertation of 1908. He envisaged a Habsburg Reich in which full equality would exist among Slavs, Germans, and Magyars. This seemed feasible 
since the experiment of granting full equality to the Magyars in 1867 had proven successful. The Austro-Hungarian Empire held out with amazing vitality during the first four years of bitter conflict in World War I. The overwhelming majority of Czech deputies to the Austrian Reichsrat, Parliament, were loyal to the Habsburg state during these four years. In the summer and autumn of 1918, during the fifth year of the war, unendurable famine and plague produced a demoralization of loyalty among the many nationalities of the Austrian part of the empire. The Habsburg state was paralyzed. It had attempted to escape from the war by means of a separate peace, but it had failed. The problem of the Czechs and Germany could be postponed no longer. Arnold Toynbee, in his massive survey, Nationality and the War, had predicted in 1915 that Austria-Hungary would collapse, and he had advised that Bohemia and Moravia, the two mixed German-Czech regions, should be assigned to Germany in the coming peace treaty. The world was confronted in the meantime with one of the most bold conspiracies of history. Czech revolutionaries went abroad during World War I to organize a propaganda movement among the Allies for the creation of a veritable Czech Empire. The dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary was condemned because the allegedly dominant German and Magyar nationalities constituted merely half the total population of the federated Habsburg states. The Czech revolutionaries although constituting less than half the total population, the situation would have been still worse had not some of their more extravagant schemes failed such as the creation of a Slavic corridor from Bohemia to Croatia. It was surely the most brazen program of national aggrandizement to arise from World War I. It was also the program least likely to succeed over a protracted period, unless the subject peoples could be appeased, and unless good relations could be established with neighboring states. The Czech nationalist leaders, and their small group of Slovak allies, who in contrast to the mass of the Slovak people had fallen under Czech influence, made little progress in either direction during the 20 years following World War I. It is for this reason that there was still a Czech problem after World War II, which had now become a problem of Czech imperialism. They might have pressed for Czech autonomy within an independent Austrian state, which later could have been united with Germany at one stroke, while retaining guarantees for the Czechs. If this did not seem feasible following the accomplishments of Czech revolutionaries at Prague after October 1918, there were still other alternatives. They might at least have contested the spread of Czech rule over the traditional German parts of Bohemia and Moravia, or over the indisputably Magyar regions from the Danube to Ruthenia. It would have been easy for them to insist that the Czechs keep their promises of autonomy to the Slovaks. These promises had been incorporated in the famous Czech-Slovak Declaration of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in October 1918, prior to the Czech Declaration of Independence at Washington, D.C., on October 23, 1918. The first Czech president, Thomas Masaryk, had declared that his pledge to the Slovaks, which he later violated, was solemn and binding. The Allies might have contested the assignment of the distant region of Ruthenia to Czech rule, or they might have insisted on binding minority guarantees for a Czech state which had promised to become another Switzerland, but which developed a unitary state system and centralized administration in the French style. The Allies did none of these things, and the Czech government was soon spending lavish sums subsidizing foreign writers to fill the foreign press with deceptively optimistic reports about their regime. The Czechs had a solid economic position in the unravished principal Austrian industrial regions, the industrial heart of a former great power, which had fallen under their control. They also had a flourishing agricultural economy, and conditions of relative prosperity existed in their richly endowed country until the advent of the World Depression in 1929. Czechoslovakia appeared to be a wealthy and progressive country when compared to such backward states as Yugoslavia or Romania and the Czech leaders were not reticent in taking full credit for this phenomenon. A system of liberal politics prevailed among the principal Czech political parties, and this was part of their heritage from Austrian parliamentary experience. Czech propagandists exploited this fact to claim that their country was a model democracy. A war-weary generation in the West was looking for a few good results from the recent Holocaust, and it is not surprising that philo-Czechism became a popular phenomenon. There was also something romantic about it, 
because relatively few people in Great Britain or France had been aware of the existence of the Czechs prior to World War I. There had been talk of Bohemians in the old days, and few seemed to be certain whether this term included Slavs, Germans, or both. The Czech émigrés during World War I were more successful than the Poles in ingratiating themselves with the Western Allies. This was not fully evident until the period of peacemaking, when Czech and Polish interests clashed. In the early phase of World War I, Roman Domowski and Thomas Masaryk, the leading Polish and Czech spokesmen in the West, vied with one another in being pro-Russian. Thomas Masaryk dreamed of a Czech kingdom under a Romanov prince, but his dream was shattered by the Russian Revolution. The Polish state which emerged from the war developed a policy contrary to the pro-Russian attitude of Domowski, but in the Czech state the pro-Russian attitude and policy of Masaryk, and of Eduard Benes, his principal disciple, prevailed after the war. The accidental conflict in 1918 between the Czech prisoners of war in Russia, and the Bolsheviks, was not permitted by Masaryk to destroy the fundamental pro-Russian orientation of Czech policy. There was conflict between Poles and Czechs in the rich Austrian industrial region of Teschen, which was under the control of the local Polish community when Austria-Hungary concluded an armistice with the Western powers. The Teschen area consisted of the five principal districts of Friedach, Freistadt, Bielitz, Teschen, and Jablunkow. The Polish deputies of the Austrian Reichsrat proposed to their Czech colleagues at the end of World War I that Friedach, which had a distinct Czech majority, should go to the Czech state, and that the latter four districts should be assigned to Poland. The Czechs and Poles in the area agreed to a provisional compromise along these lines, and it was decided that 519 square kilometers should be Czech and 1,762 square kilometers Polish. The Poles did not realize that Edouard Benes had persuaded French Foreign Minister Pichon in June 1918 to support a Czech claim for the entire area. The Poles concentrated on securing their claims against Germany during the weeks following the Austro-Hungarian and German Armistice Agreements of November 1918, and they regarded the Teschen area with complacency. This mood was shattered on the eve of the Polish national election of January 26, 1919 when the Czechs ordered a surprise attack against the Poles in the Teschen area. Czech action was based on the assumption that the Teschen question could be resolved by force, and that the district was well worth a local war, particularly since Western Allied support of the Czech position against Poland was assured. The Western Allied leaders intervened on February 1, 1919, after the Czechs had completed their military advance, and they ordered a cessation of military operations pending a final solution by the peace conference. A plebiscite was proposed in the following months, but the Czechs, with French support, concentrated first on delaying, and then on cancelling, this development. Their objective was achieved in 1920 during the Russo-Polish War. The Poles were told in good ultimative form at the SPA conference in July 1920 that they must relinquish their demand for a plebiscite, and submit to the arbitration of the Allied powers. The greater part of the Teschen area was assigned to Czechoslovakia on July 28, 1920. The Czech objective had been achieved by an exceedingly adroit combination of force and diplomacy. The Poles were aware of the fact that the Czechs had used their influence to prevent the assignment of East Galicia to Poland, although this issue was ultimately decided in favor of Poland by the separate treaty between Russia and Poland at Riga in 1921. The Poles were equally conscious that Czechoslovakia favored the Soviet Union during the 1920-1921 war. The French were increasingly inclined to regard the Czech pro-Russian policy as realistic, and hence to favor Czechoslovakia over Poland. It was evident after the Polsudski coup d'état in 1926 that Czech political leaders were in close contact with many of the Polish politicians opposing the Warsaw dictatorship. Polish grievances and Western criticism experts on Central Eastern Europe have criticized the insufficient cooperation among the so-called succession states after 1918. The Poles in particular have received a large share of this criticism. It has been said that Polish differences with the Czechs over Teschen, or over the Czech pro-Soviet orientation, were minor compared to the importance of Czechoslovakia as a bastion which protected the Polish southern flank against German expansion. It has been argued that the Poles and Czechs both profited from World War I, 
and that they should have been prepared to cooperate in defending their positions against revisionist powers. Emphasis has been placed on the contention that they were sister Slavic nations with special ties of ethnography and culture. Winston Spencer Churchill had much to say on the subject of Czech-Polish relations. Churchill was the most articulate advocate of the British encirclement of Germany in the period before the Czech crisis of 1938. Churchill was noted for his belligerency, which was often regarded by his compatriots as a romantic love of adventure. He was noted for adopting the most uncompromising view of a situation and also the one most likely to produce a conflict. This had been true of his attitude in the Sudan, South Africa, and India, during the 1936 British abdication crisis, and toward many other problems in addition to Anglo-German relations. The same Churchill saw no reason why Poland should not turn her other cheek to the Czechs. When Polish leaders failed to look at matters the same way, Churchill invoked strong criticism, the heroic characteristics of the Polish race must not blind us to their record of folly and ingratitude which over centuries had led them through measureless suffering. The arguments of strategy, politics, and race appeared to Churchill to dictate a Polish policy of friendship toward Czechoslovakia. The three arguments which impressed Churchill carried little weight with the Polish leaders. They were not inclined after the death of Pilsudski in 1935 to modify the existing anti-Czech policy. This did not mean that they were unwilling under all circumstances to fight at the side of the Czechs in some war against Germany, and they made this clear to their French allies during the Czech crisis in 1938. If France supported the Czechs, if the Czechs were whining to fight, and if the Czechs disgorged the territory seized from Poland in 1919-1920, the Poles would cooperate with the Czechs. The Poles did not expect these conditions to be met for the simple reason that they did not believe the Czechs would dare to fight the Germans. The primary aim of Polish policy was to secure Polish claims against the Czechs by agreement, by threat of force, or by force. Foreign Minister Ricard Sandler of Sweden asked Beck before the 1938 Czech crisis why it was difficult to achieve an entente between Warsaw and Prague. The Polish foreign minister replied that one factor was Poland's lack of enthusiasm about a power whose claim to an independent existence was problematical. Czechoslovakia, in his opinion, was an artificial creation which violated the liberty of nations, and especially of Slovakia and Hungary. Beck's attitude was that of Mussolini, who publicly referred to the Czech state as Czecho Germano Polano Maguro Rudino Rumino Slovakia. Beck emphasized that the Czechs were a minority in their own state, and that none of the other nationalities desired to remain under Czech rule. He also objected to Czech hypocrisy in stressing the allegedly liberal and democratic nature of their regime. They granted extensive rights on paper to all citizens of the state, but they exercised a brutal and arbitrary police power over the nationalities which constituted the majority of the population. Sandler was much impressed by Beck's remarks and he observed that the Czechs obviously lacked the capacity to achieve good relations with their neighbors. Beck's attitude was not based primarily on these abstract considerations. Pulsutsky's program had called for the federation, of the Lithuanians, White Russians, and Ukrainians, under Polish control. If this program had been achieved, the Poles would have been a sort of minority within a large federation, although the granting of actual autonomy to the other peoples would have been in contrast to the Czech system. Ideological differences were not decisive for Beck, who did not consider the democratic liberalism of France an insurmountable obstacle to franco polish collaboration. He could not consistently boycott the same ideology at Prague. The situation, quite apart from the specific dispute over Teschen, was determined by purely power political considerations. Poland and Czechoslovakia were bitter rivals for power and influence in the same Central Eastern European area. Both were allied separately with Romania, and Warsaw resented the fact that Bucharest usually appeared to be closer to Prague. The Czech alliances with both Yugoslavia and Romania gave Prague a position of power in the general area equal to that of Warsaw. The Czechs also had an alliance with France, and they enjoyed better treatment from Paris than Warsaw received. They had ties with other allies of France in a general system directed against Germany and Hungary. The warm friendship between Prague and Moscow gave Czechoslovakia an extra trump, which the Poles could match only by establishing closer relations with Germany. 
In the Polish mind, the advantage of eliminating a dangerous rival far outweighed the consideration that Germany would be in a position to secure a greater immediate gain than Poland at Czech expense. Loyalty toward the Versailles Treaty and the other Paris treaties of 1919 was not a compelling motive, because the Poles were dissatisfied with the terms of these treaties. The argument that the two nations were sister Slavic communities was anathema to the Poles. This reminded them of the indiscriminate pan-Slavic vehicle of Russian domination over the lesser Slavic peoples. The Poles did not reject ties with sister Slavic communities, but they opposed to the Czech or Russian idea of pan-Slavism their own more exclusive concept, which substituted themselves for the Russians as the dominant Slavic force. The Czechs were at least half German in race, according to many Poles, and they were considered predominantly German in the cultural, political and social spheres. The Russians also were placed at the outside border of Slavdom because of their enormous Asiatic racial admixture. The same criterion was applied to the Serbs and the Bulgars, who had experienced a strong Oriental influx in their Balkan environment. The Slavic community recognized by the Poles included themselves, the Ukrainians, the White Russians, the Slovaks, the Croatians, and the Slovenians. According to Beck, the two foreign Slavic peoples most popular in Poland because of close cultural ties with the Poles were the Slovaks and the Croats. Relations between Warsaw and Belgrade, also, were cool, although there were no disputes between two countries separated so widely geographically. The Polish attitude toward Yugoslavia was negative, because the Roman Catholic Croats in Yugoslavia were oppressed by the semi-Oriental Greek Orthodox Serbs, who possessed the real power in the state. The Slovak people in Czechoslovakia were conspicuously unhappy under the alien rule and oppressive economic domination of the Czechs. In Poland the argument of cultural affinity could be a great force in condemning rather than in supporting the idea of collaboration with Prague. It would provoke endless controversy to decide whether Churchill or the Polish leaders had the more noble understanding of what Poland owed Czechoslovakia, or what would best serve Polish interests. It is more relevant to realize that the Polish leaders had a definite Czech policy, and that it was an intelligible policy whatever one may think of it. Beck never would have been at a loss in replying to any arguments on this subject from Churchill. The Czechs had taken the initiative in provoking the antagonism between Czechoslovakia and Poland. It is true that the ultimate dissolution of Czechoslovakia made the Polish military position more vulnerable on the German side but this would not have been serious had not Poland provoked a conflict with Germany instead of accepting German friendship. The main military threat to Poland came from the Soviet Union. In this respect the removal of Czechoslovakia was a gain, because the Czechs had made it clear that they would support Russia in the event of a conflict between Poland and Russia. The anti-German policy of Benes the critical attitude of Hitler toward Czechoslovakia is much easier to analyze and to explain. He had realized since his boyhood days at Linz that the Germans were confronted with a Czech problem, although at the time this problem was a matter of concern only to those Germans who were subjects of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. He had never sympathized with Czech aspirations for political independence, and he regarded it as a misfortune that in many respects, and particularly in local government, the Czechs of Bohemia enjoyed more privileges than the Bohemian Germans under Habsburg rule. Habsburg policy was based on the assumption that the loyalty of the Bohemian Germans could be taken for granted, but special privileges were required for the Czechs to appease their nationalism. Hitler became a German nationalist at an early date, and, as such, an opponent of the multinational Habsburg system. He knew that Bohemia, which had been traversed on foot by his musical idol, Richard Wagner, had been an integral part of the 1,000-year Reich of Charlemagne. Hitler. Contrary to popular superstition, never referred to his own regime as the 1,000-year Reich. Nevertheless, like any other German conscious of them, he had a profound respect for the traditions of German history. If the role of Bohemia within Germany had worked well for more than 1,000 years, one could be pardoned for skepticism toward the radical solution of placing that region within the confines of a Slavic state. It might have been possible for a larger number of people to accept this radical solution in time had conditions within Czechoslovakia been tolerable for the Germans living there, and had these local Germans become resigned to their fate. The Sudeten Germans were divided into four groups of Bavarian, 
Franconian, Saxon, and Silesian dialects and local cultures. They were far less aggressive politically than the Czechs, and they submitted without violence to the establishment of Czech rule in 1918 and 1919. It would have been easy to appease them, and it could have been done with a little local autonomy and with an impartial economic policy. The Czechs should have realized the importance of this for the future of their state, since the ratio of Germans to Czechs in the entire region of Bohemia-Moravia was approximately 1 colon 2, and there were far more Germans than Czechs in Slovakia. The Czechs, instead, soon developed a contemptuous attitude toward the Germans, and they began to believe that the Germans could be handled more effectively as passive subjects than as active citizens. The Germans were divided politically, but a new development appeared after conditions became increasingly worse for them and better for the Germans across the frontier. In the 1935 national Czechoslovak election, the Sudeten German Party, SDP, which was inspired by admiration for Adolf Hitler and his policies, captured the majority of the German vote and it became the largest single party in Czechoslovakia. There were 800,000 unemployed workers in Czechoslovakia at that time, and 500,000 of these were Sudeten Germans. Marriages and births were few, and the death rate was high. It is not surprising that conditions changed after the liberation of the Sudetenland in 1938. The northern Sudetenland, the three districts of Agar, Osig, and Trapa, the two southern sections were assigned to Bavaria and German Austria, led all regions of Germany in the number of marriages in 1939, approximately 30% ahead of the national average. The birth rate in 1940 was 60% greater than the birth rate of 1937. The period of Czech rule was a bad time for the Bohemian Germans, and conditions prior to the Munich Conference became steadily worse. These people were patient, but they were not cowards and the ultimate reaction was inevitable. It is impossible under these circumstances to claim that Hitler created an artificial problem, either in the Sudetenland or in the Bohemian-Moravian region as a whole. This problem had been created in the first instance by the peacemakers of Paris, and in the second instance by Czech misrule. It was evident that the Sudeten problem would come to a head of its own momentum if Hitler succeeded in liberating the Germans of Austria from the Schuschnigg dictatorship. Hitler had no definite plans before May 1938 for dealing with this problem, but he was determined to alleviate conditions for the Germans in some way, and there can be no doubt that he no less ardently than the Polish leaders hoped for the total dissolution of Czechoslovakia. It is for these reasons that the German and Polish leaders found a basis for agreement whenever Czechoslovakia was discussed. This situation, and especially the inevitable German attitude toward Czechoslovakia, was no mystery to foreign statesmen before the year of the Czech crisis, 1938. Lord Halifax, who was British Foreign Secretary throughout most of 1938, told Hitler after a luncheon at Birch Teskeden on November 19, 1937, that Great Britain realized that the Paris Treaties of 1919 contained mistakes which had to be rectified. Halifax assured Hitler that Great Britain did not believe in preserving the status quo at all costs. He mentioned the burning questions of Danzig, Austria, and Czechoslovakia quite on his own initiative, and without any prompting from Hitler. This was before Hitler had made any statement publicly that Germany was conc either with the Czech or Danzig problems. Indeed, no such statement was necessary, since the situation was perfectly obvious. At one time it seemed that common antipathy toward Czechoslovakia might cement a virtual alliance between Germany and Poland. It was evident that this Kamost bond would disappear after the Czech problem was solved, unless the Poles realized that antipathy toward the Soviet Union was a much more important issue in uniting the two countries. In the meantime, the points of friction between Germany and Poland would remain unless an understanding far more comprehensive than the 1934 pact could be attained. Neurath's anti-Polish policy rejected by Hitler it remained established German policy after 1934 to expect some revision of the Versailles Treaty along the German Eastern Frontier. An enduring German-Polish collaboration would depend upon a successful agreement on this issue. The German-Polish Non-Aggression Pact of January 1934 was as silent as the Locarno Treaties about German recognition of the Eastern status quo. The Germans did not consider the Versailles Treaty binding 
because it violated the Armistice Agreement of 1918, and it was signed under duress. The Polish leaders were aware of this, and occasionally Burke sought to obtain new guarantees without concluding a comprehensive agreement with Germany. Beck instructed Ambassador Lipsky at Berlin to propose a German-Polish declaration on Danzig in September 1937. The Germans were requested to join in avowing that it is imperative to maintain the statute which designates Danzig as the free city. Foreign Minister Konstantin von Neurath of Germany was less friendly than Hitler toward Poland, and he peremptorily instructed Maltka in Warsaw to tell Beck again that Germany would not recognize the peace treaties of 1919. Neurath had been foreign minister since 1932. He served under several chancellors of the Weimar Republic, and he was retained at his post by Hitler. He was not a particularly zealous foreign minister of the Third Reich, because he was an aristocrat who had little sympathy for Hitler's egalitarian measures. Hitler admired Neurath personally, but he recognized him as a weak link in the chain of German policy. Hitler was more intimate with Joachim von Ribbentrop, an ex-officer and merchant sincerely devoted to Hitler's policies. Ribbentrop gradually replaced Alfred Rosenberg as the principal National Socialist Party expert on foreign affairs, and he developed an extensive party bureaucratic organization to keep in touch with foreign countries. This organization was known as the Ribbentrop Office, and its foreign contacts were so extensive that it came to be looked upon as Germany's second and unofficial foreign service. Ribbentrop wished to retain control of this organization, and at the same time come to the top in the regular German Foreign Office. His ambition was recognized by the professional diplomats, and they did what they could to place obstacles in his way. Neurath was pleased that he had persuaded Hitler to send Ribbentrop, and not Franz von Papen, as German ambassador to London in 1936. Neurath believed that Ribbentrop would be unable to cope with the British situation, and that he would ruin his career at this difficult post. Papen, who had known Ribbentrop for many years, was more astute, and he feared that the London Embassy would provide the non-professional diplomat with an opportunity to show Hitler what he could do. The event was to prove that Papen was right. Neurath rejected Beck's gesture in September 1937 without consulting Hitler, because he assumed that no other German response was possible. Hitler did not wish to bind Germany permanently to the Danzig status quo, but he had a more flexible conception of German foreign policy. He was counting on Polish friendship in dealing with the crises which were likely to arise in Austria and Czechoslovakia. Beck's attempt to regulate Danzig affairs exclusively with Germany conformed to a trend. Great Britain and France were represented with Sweden on a new League Commission of three to supervise League responsibilities as the sovereign power at Danzig. This was clearly a caretaker arrangement, and Foreign Minister Anthony Eden of Great Britain tacitly spoke for the Commission when he told the new League High Commissioner, Carl Jacob Burkhardt, on September 15, 1937, that British policy had no special interest as such in the situation in Danzig. This position was consistent with British policy established by Prime Minister David Lloyd George in 1919 when he said that Great Britain would never fight for the Danzig status quo. Burkhardt had no illusions about the role of the League at Danzig. He told Adolf Hitler on September 18, 1937, that he hoped the role of the League was merely temporary and that the ultimate fate of Danzig would be settled by a direct agreement between Germany and Poland. Hitler listened to Burkhardt's views without offering any plan for a solution. Burkhardt surmised that Hitler feared to raise the Danzig question, because it would affect the related questions of the corridor, Czechoslovakia, and Austria. Hitler, after nearly five years in power, had pursued no questions of territorial revision, although responsibility for the ill-fated Austrian Revolution of July 1934 had been falsely attributed to him. Joseph Lipsky, the Polish ambassador in Berlin, knew that Hitler was a sincere advocate of an understanding with Poland. Lipsky was not inclined to accept the categorical statement on Danzig by Neurath. He hoped to obtain the declaration of Danzig which Beck had requested, and he was encouraged by conversations with Marshal Goring. The German marshal had many duties connected with the German Air Force, the Second German Four-Year Plan, and the Prussian State Administration, but he was also intensely interested in foreign affairs. He was the second man in the Reich, 
and Hitler employed him as an ambassador at large to Poland. He knew the Polish leaders, and he desired a lasting understanding with Poland. He was accustomed to discuss important matters of state with Polish representatives. He usually gave the German Foreign Office full information concerning these discussions, but it was sometimes necessary to inquire what he had said to foreign diplomats. Lipsky approached Neurath several times for a Danzig declaration. Neurath on October 18, 1937, bluntly told Lipsky that someday there would have to be a basic settlement on the Danzig question between Poland and us, since it would otherwise permanently disturb German-Polish relations. Neurath added that the sole aim of such a discussion would be the restoration of German Danzig to its natural connection with the Reich, in which case extensive consideration could be given to Poland's economic interests. Lipsky was surprised, and he asked if the question would be broached soon, or perhaps immediately. Neurath evaded this inquiry, but he requested Lipsky to inform Beck of his attitude. Lipsky mentioned that Robert Ley, chief of the German Labour Front, Arthur Grasser, President of the Danzig Senate, and Albert Forster, District National Socialist Party leader at Danzig, had declared publicly in recent days that Danzig must return to Germany. Neurath did not question or seek to excuse these statements. He replied that there was a need to solve the Danzig problem, and his conversation with Lipsky ended in an impasse. There was also the problem of German access by land to East Prussia, which had been severed from the Reich. In May 1935, when Germany was engaged in her huge superhighway construction project, German Ambassador Hans Adolf von Maltke informed Beck at Warsaw that Germany wished to build a superhighway across the Polish corridor to East Prussia. He inquired about the Polish attitude toward this plan, and Beck said that he would study the question. This was the beginning of protracted evasion by Beck. Repeated reminders from Maltke did not produce a definite statement about the Polish attitude toward the project. Fritz Tote, the National Inspector for Roads in Germany, discussed German plans with Julian Piasecki, the Polish Deputy Minister for Transportation. Maltke concluded after more than two years of fruitless inquiry that the attitude of the Polish government was negative. The plan embodied a vital German national interest, and its acceptance by Poland would have improved prospects for a comprehensive German-Polish agreement. Maltka was unwilling to concede a final defeat in this matter. Maltka presented a startling proposition to the German Foreign Office in October 1937. He suggested that Germany should build a superhighway up to the corridor boundary from both Pomerania and East Prussia without waiting for Polish permission to link the route through the corridor. Maltka failed to see that this would be a provocation which would stiffen Polish resistance to the German proposal. He believed that possible Polish objection to the construction of major military roads into the frontier area would be rendered pointless, and the Poles would find it expedient to conclude an agreement. He also had another factor in mind. The influx of tourists into Germany had greatly increased since the 1936 Olympic Games at Berlin, and Maltka believed that the complaints of foreigners, and especially tourists, who would be irritated by the break in the superhighway to historic Old East Prussia, could be exploited to apply pressure on the Poles. The Poles knew that the Germans desired a superhighway across their corridor, and Neurath's conversations with Lipsky suggested the possibility that Germany was about to demand Danzig. Lipsky was reticent when he conversed with Neurath again on October 23, 1937, and Neurath retained the false impression that the Poles were prepared to accept a German solution of the Danzig question. Neurath was also weighing favorably a suggestion from Albert Forster in Danzig that an offer to use Polish steel for the superhighway and a new Vistula bridge might influence the Poles to accept the highway project. The attitude of Neurath was fully shared by Czech Ambassador Slavik in Warsaw. The Czech diplomat regarded the recovery of Danzig by Germany as inevitable. He reported to Foreign Minister Kamil Krofta that in the opinion of Leon Noel, the French ambassador to Poland, Danzig was lost to Poland. The conclusion of a provisional agreement on Danzig between Germany and Poland on November 5, 1937, did not change his opinion. He reported to Krofta on November 7, 1937, that League High Commissioner Burkhard continued to insist that the union of Danzig with Germany could not be prevented. 
it was not surprising that the Czechs were complacent in their expectation that the German campaign of territorial revision would begin at Danzig in the vicinity of Poland. They were counting on Italy to prevent a German move into Austria, and they had nothing to fear from Germany as long as the Shushnik dictatorship was maintained. The fate of Danzig was a matter of complete indifference to Czechoslovakia. The German-Polish Minority Pact of 1937 The Germans had sought a treaty on minorities with Poland since 1934. When Beck exploited Russian entry into the League of Nations as a pretext to repudiate the existing treaties. The Germans of Poland were in a weak position, and they lacked the compact organization of the Germans in Czechoslovakia. The Polish treatment of the Germans after 1918 was harsh. Approximately 70% of the 1918 German population of Posen and West Prussia had emigrated to Germany before the Pilsudski coup d'état in 1926, and this comprised no less than 820,000 individuals from these two former German provinces. Polish propaganda often pretended that the Germans who remained were largely great landowners, but this was not so. It is true that 80% of the 325,000 Germans remaining in the two provinces by 1937 lived from agriculture, but they were mainly peasants. There were still 165,000 Germans by 1939 in East Upper Silesia, which had been detached from Germany despite the German victory in the 1921 plebiscite. There were also 364,000 Germans in Congress Poland in 1939 and there were 60,000 within the former Cressy territory of Volhynia. Germans were scattered through the Wilna area, and as late as 1939 there were over 900,000 Germans in the former German and Russian-Polish territories. This did not include Austrian Galicia, where the Germans were mainly agricultural, although the industrial town of Bielitz had a German population of 62%. A critical study of the 1931 Polish census, which contained startling inaccuracies in several directions, showed that the given figure of 727,000 Germans was short of the real figure by more than 400,000. Polish policy toward the Germans during the early years was more severe in the former German territories than in Galicia, Congress Poland, or the Cressy. More than one million acres of German-owned land were confiscated during the years from 1919 to 1929 in the provinces of Posen and West Prussia. German language schools throughout Poland were closed during the years before 1934. There were 21 German deputies in the Polish Sejm after the 1928 election, five German deputies after the election in autumn 1930, and no German deputies after 1935. Two Germans were allowed to sit in the less important Polish Senate at that time, but they were denied their seats many months before the outbreak of the German-Polish War in 1939. The exceptionally miserable conditions in the former German provinces inevitably produced protests from the local German population. There was much enthusiasm among the younger Germans in 1933 when the Hitler Revolution triumphed in the Reich, and this further irritated and antagonized the Poles. The older Germans were aware of this, and many of them were concerned about it. The younger Germans were attracted to the Young German Party for Poland, JDP, which had been founded by Dr. Rudolf Wiesner at Bielitz in 1921. A number of more conservative German parties had opposed this group, and in 1934 Senator Hesbeck attempted to unite the conservative opposition in the Council of Germans in Poland, RDP. The conservatives controlled most of the remaining German language press, and in 1937 there was a split in the young German leadership, when a more radical faction under Wilhelm Schneider sought to obtain control. Wiesner won out after much difficulty, but it was a conspicuous fact that no outstanding leadership emerged in any of the German groups. The contrast between the German factions in Poland and the Sudeten German party in Czechoslovakia under Konrad Henlein was very great. Both the conservative and radical groups were nominally pro-Hitler, but the latter had more ambitious ideas concerning the extent to which social reforms like those of the Reich could be of benefit in improving conditions for the Germans of Poland. Neither group indicated the slightest expectation that they would or could come under German rule. The Office for Ethnic Germans, Volksdeutsche Mittelstall, in the Reich, which promoted cultural contracts between Germans abroad and Germany did not interfere with the struggle between the German political factions in Poland. 
Both factions hoped that the rapprochement between Germany and Poland would improve their position, but there was no indication of this in the years after the conclusion of the 1934 pact. The Germans of Poland, with very few exceptions, remained strictly loyal to the Polish state, and later research by the Dutch expert, Louis de Jong, contradicted the popular Polish claim that there was a German fifth column in Poland. The agents of the German intelligence service in Poland were almost exclusively Jews and Poles. Thousands of young Germans of military age were serving with the Polish army when war came in 1939. The prominent Germans of Poland remained in the country in September 1939 and experienced arrest, transportation into the interior, or death. An article in Gazeta Polska, the government newspaper at Warsaw, stated on October 21, 1935, that moral solidarity and cultural ties were clearly within the rights of the Germans of Poland. This was all that the German minority sought. The Germans of Poland failed to unite, but their morale improved after 1933. They took an active part in the 1935 Polish national election, although it was known that they would be allowed no seats in the same. The National Democrats, a strictly Polish party, boycotted the same election. They provoked the authorities in a manner of which the Germans would never have dreamed. The Germans of Poland, when allowances made for a few individual exceptions, were passive, and not troublemakers. Haider was understandably concerned about their unfair treatment, but he merely wished that they would receive decent treatment as Polish subjects. The Polish minority in Germany was more united and more ably organized. The Union of Poles in Germany, Zwiezek Polakow W. Niemczech, was organized at Berlin in 1922. All members automatically received the newspaper, Polak W. Niemczech, the Pole in Germany. It had been true for generations that many people of Polish descent in Germany preferred to be considered German. The Union of Poles sought to combat this tendency, and it opposed the so-called subjective census introduced by the Weimar Republic and continued by Hitler. The old Hohenzollern bureaucracy had counted Poles on the basis of documentary evidence. The modern technique called for a subjective declaration of ethnic identity in addition to an identification of the mother tongue. This meant in Weimar days that a person could say his mother tongue was Polish, but that he was ethnically German. Many thousands of Poles had emigrated to work in West German industry as well as in the industries of France, and now the census permitted them to identify themselves as Germans. Under the conditions, only 14,000 claimed to be Poles in the census of 1939, although the Germans estimated that there must be at least 260,000 Poles in Germany by objective criteria, and the Polish government claimed that there were 1,500,000. Economic conditions in Germany were good, there was no economic discrimination against the Poles, and the national feeling of the Polish minority was lax. The same trend had been displayed in elections to the Reichstag during the Weimar Republic, but under Hitler it became an avalanche. During the 1928 school year, only 6,600 children had attended Polish schools in Germany, and of these 4,172 were in the Berlin and Ruhr areas. On the other hand, the Poles maintained many cooperatives, which were less explicitly an indication of national identity. The Polish press in Germany welcomed the improved economic and social conditions under Hitler, and it recognized the National Socialist program to secure these conditions for the Polish minority. The German citizen law of September 15, 1935, was explicit in recognizing that the Polish minority enjoyed full citizen rights. In 1937, the Polish minority organization still maintained 58 grammar schools and two high schools, gymnasia and these institutions provided ample space for Polish children wishing to attend Polish schools in the Reich. A general meeting of the Polish organization was held on March 6, 1938, in the Strength Through Joy, KDF, theater in Berlin with Father Domanski and Secretary General Czesław Kaczmarek presiding. Many proud speeches were made. A large organization was formally in evidence, but there was little behind it as the May 1939 German census clearly revealed. A promising German-Polish pact on minorities was concluded at last on November 5, 1937. 
it was agreed that on the same day Hitler would speak to the leaders of the Polish minority and President Moskicki of Poland would address the German minority leaders. Hitler was extremely pleased with what he regarded as a concrete step in the direction of a comprehensive German-Polish understanding. He could not know that the Polish leaders would consider the new pact a dead letter. He agreed to amnesty a number of German citizens of Polish extraction, who had violated German criminal laws. He also granted Lipsky's request for a compromise declaration on Danzig. It was agreed that the Danzig question would not be permitted to disturb German-Polish relations. Hitler displayed his Austrian charm when he received the delegation from the Polish minority in Germany. He emphasized to them that he was an Austrian, and that precisely for this reason he could understand their situation especially well. The Poles were extremely pleased by the warmly personal nature of Hitler's remarks. The reception given to the German minority leaders by President Moskicki at a vacation resort in the Beskidan Mountains was more reserved. The bogey of the Hasbach Memorandum a mysterious event which took place on the same day as the German-Polish Minority Pact has furnished ideal subject matter for professional propagandists. Hitler addressed a conference attended by some of his advisers, but without the majority of his cabinet. The narrow circle included Defense Minister Werner von Blomberg, Army Commander Werner von Fritsch, Navy Commander Erich Redder, Air Force Commander Hermann Göring, and Foreign Minister Konstantin von Neurath. Colonel Hasbach, an officer of the German General Staff assigned by the General Staff for Liaison Work with Hitler, was also present. This man was in no sense Hitler's personal adjutant, although this idea has persisted in many accounts. The so-called Hasbach version of the conference, which is supposed to have become one of the most celebrated documents of all time, was written several days after the event, and it could carry no weight in a normal court of law, even if an actual copy of this memorandum was available. Hasbach had been an opponent of Hitler and his system since 1934, and he was not averse to the employment of illegal and revolutionary means in eliminating Hitler. He was an ardent admirer of General Ludwig Beck, the German chief of staff, whose life he had once helped to save on the occasion of a cavalry accident. Beck was a determined foe of Hitler and he was engaged in organizing opposition against the German Chancellor. Hasbach was naturally on the alert to provide Beck with every possible kind of propaganda material. Hitler was popular in Germany, and only extreme methods might be effective in opposing him. It would be the duty of every historian to treat the so-called Hasbach Memorandum with reserve, even if it could be shown that the version introduced at Nuremberg was an authentic copy of the memorandum which Hasbach began to write on November 10, 1937, he failed to recall later when he completed his effort. The fact is, however, that no copies of this original version have been located since World War II. The version introduced by the American prosecution at Nuremberg, the only one extant, was said to be a copy made from the original version in late 1943 or early 1944, but Hasbach declared in a notarized affidavit on June 18, 1946, that he could not remember whether or not the Nuremberg copy corresponded to the original which he had made nearly nine years earlier. In other words, the sensational document, which was the primary instrument used in securing the conviction and execution of a number of Germany's top leaders, has never been verified, and there is no reason to assume that it is authentic. Redder explained that Hitler's views, as expressed on November 5, 1937, offered no basis to conclude that any change in German foreign policy was about to take place, but the judges at Nuremberg, with the dubious help of an unconfirmed record, decided that Hitler had revealed unmistakably his unalterable intention to wage a war of criminal aggression. Fritsch and Blomberg were dead when this conference was investigated after World War II, but Neurath and Göring agreed with Redder about the essential nature of Hitler's remarks. Hitler had discussed German aspirations in Central Europe and the danger of war, but this was certainly a very different thing than announcing an intention to pursue a reckless foreign policy or to seek a war. Even the alleged Hasbach Memorandum introduced at Nuremberg, as A.J.P. Taylor has pointed out, does not anticipate any of the actual events which followed in Europe during 1938 and 1939. It does contain some offensive and belligerent ideas, but it outlines no specific actions, and it establishes no timetables. Hence, 
error had been added to error. It was false to assume that the document was authentic in the first place, and it was incorrect to assume that even the fraudulent document contained any damaging evidence against Hitler and the other German leaders. Unfortunately, most of the later historians in Germany and elsewhere have blindly followed the Nuremberg judgment and have arrived at the mistaken conclusion that Hitler's conference of November 5, 1937, was relevant to the effort of determining the responsibility for World War II. Hitler's November 1937 Danzig Declaration The November 5, 1937, Treaty on Minorities would have resolved one of the two major points of friction between Germany and Poland had it been observed by the Poles. It guarded against assimilation by force, restrictions against the use of the mother tongue, suppression of associations, denial of schools, and the pursuit of policies of economic discrimination. The other principal point of friction was the Danzig Corridor problem. Hitler hoped to reassure the Poles by his statement that he was contemplating peaceful negotiation to resolve this problem. Neurath was not content to leave Hitler's vague assurance unqualified and he sought to interpret it as part of a quid pro quo bargain. According to Neurath, Hitler's promise to the Poles on Danzig would be a dead letter if they did not respect the Treaty on Minorities. The Poles attempted to interpret Hitler's statement as a disavowal that Germany intended to acquire Danzig. They were on weak ground in this effort, because the German failure to accord them a voluntary recognition of their frontiers meant that Germany was automatically claiming the territory assigned to Poland on the western side of the German 1914 eastern frontier. The Polish Foreign Office on November 9, 1937, protested against a speech by Albert Forster in Dusseldorf on November 6. Forster had declared to a large audience that his aim was to achieve the reunion of Danzig with the Reich. This speech was merely one incident in a major campaign to acquaint the German population with the Danzig problem. It was decided at the German Foreign Office on November 23, 1937, that the recent Danzig meetings carried out by Forster in various German cities had been so successful that this program should be intensified. Plans were made to prepare 100 additional meetings in the near future, and an additional 50 meetings before April 1938. Arrangements were made to provide the best possible speakers from Danzig. The Danzig Senate President, the Volkstag President, Danzig Lower House, the Danzig District Propaganda Leader, the Danzig Labor Front Leader, and many other prominent Danzigers were enrolled in addition to Forster. It was discovered that Der Danziger Vorpassen, the Danzig Sentinel, the principal news organ of Danzig, was an excellent newspaper, and plans were made to increase its circulation in the Reich. Das Deutsche Danzig, German Danzig, a traveling Danzig exposition, was also planned, and it was scheduled to open at Munster in Westphalia by the end of November 1937. The German Foreign Office had concluded that current knowledge and awareness of Danzig in the Reich was proper but insufficient. This activity was an excellent indication of the German attitude toward Hitler's Danzig declaration. It was regarded as the hopeful beginning of a definite diplomatic campaign to recover Danzig. Austria as a Czech buffer The German Foreign Office assumption about Danzig was basically correct although somewhat premature. Hitler did not pursue the Danzig question during the winter of 1937-1938, and by February 1938 the Austrian question commanded his full attention. It was soon evident that an Austrian crisis was approaching its climax and there could be no doubt that a solution of the Austrian problem would automatically raise the Czechoslovakian problem. The existence of 3,500,000 unhappy Sudeten Germans could be ignored neither by the Czechs, by Hitler, nor by the world if the Germans of Austria were united with Germany. A Czechoslovakian crisis in turn could provide the first major opportunity for Germany and Poland to cooperate in an international crisis because the attitudes of both of these states toward the Czechs were hostile and fundamentally identical. If this cooperation proved successful, it might be possible to deal with the two principal points of friction between Germany and Poland with greater prospect of success. The Czechs were well aware of the hostility of their principal neighbors. It was not surprising that on February 22, 1938, during the early phase of the Austrian crisis, Kamil Krafta, Czechoslovakia's foreign minister, prepared a memorandum which explained why he favoured definite Czech action to prevent the reunion of Austria and Germany. 
the complacent assumption that Danzig was the primary objective of German expansion would be shattered unless the puppet dictatorship in Austria could be maintained as a buffer against the realization of Hitler's dream of Greater Germany. Pahlocki had supported an independent Austria against the Frankfurt Parliament in 1848, and Krofta hoped that it would be possible to support an independent Austria, although merely a fragmentary rump Austria, against Hitler. In the foreground the Czechs were facing a surprise, and the Germans and the Poles were soon in a position to score their separate triumphs at Czech expense. In the background was the Soviet Union, the greatest single peril either Germans or Poles had ever had to face. It was desirable for Germany and Poland to unite against this danger, although perhaps no one, including the German and the Polish leaders, knew how great the peril really was. Chapter 5 The Road to Munich Hitler's Peaceful Revision Policy in 1938 The year 1938 retains a special place in the annals of Europe. It was the year of Adolf Hitler's greatest triumphs in foreign policy. A.J.P. Taylor, in his epical book, The Origins of the Second World War, has proved beyond dispute that Hitler's principal moves in 1938 were nothing more than improvised responses to the actions of others. Yet, in 1938, Hitler liberated 10 million Germans who had been denied self-determination by the peacemakers of 1919. Hitler gained for the German people the same rights enjoyed by the peoples of Great Britain, France, Italy, and Poland. He managed to achieve his victories without provoking an armed conflict. Nothing of the kind had happened in Europe before. There had been dynastic unions in which territories had been united without actual violence, but never had the leader of one nation triumphed over two hostile foreign governments without shedding blood. Hitler proved something which the League of Nations claimed that it would prove but never did. Peaceful territorial revision in Europe was possible. No one could have said this with any assurance before 1938, because empirical evidence was lacking. We now have the empirical evidence. The threat of force was used by Hitler to achieve these results, but the shedding of blood in senseless wars was avoided. A cursory examination of these triumphs will be vital in explaining why the major successes of Hitler in 1938 were not duplicated on a smaller scale in September 1939. Perhaps no statesman has been more violently criticized than Hitler by his compatriots and by foreigners throughout the world. This is not surprising when one considers that Hitler failed to carry out his program after 1939, and that his failure was total because of the savagery of his opponents. Some critics condemn Hitler from the hour of his birth. At the other extreme are those who perhaps regard themselves as friendly or sympathetic toward him, but who say that Hitler did not know how to wait or did not know when to stop. It is customary to condemn failure and to worship success. This tendency is part of the fundamental desire of mankind to simplify the world in which we live and to find a natural order and purpose in things. Nietzsche had this in mind when he wrote that a good war justifies every cause. No one can be immune from this desire, because it is human all too human, but momentary detachment, within the context of past events, is and should be possible. It will be evident later that the Munich Conference was not the final solution to Germany's problems, and that the adoption by Hitler of a passive wait-and-see policy at that stage would have been merely a simple and dangerous panacea. Hitler had no idea of what was in store when 1938 opened. There had been no sequel to the November 5, 1937, conference with Foreign Minister Neurath and the military men. He had no specific plans and no timetable for the accomplishment of territorial revision. When he looked out the Berghof windows at Berchtesgaden into the mountains of Austria, he did not know that within a few weeks he would return to his Austrian homeland for the first time in more than a quarter of a century. The achievements of Hitler in 1938 were not the result of careful foresight and planning in the style of Bismarck, but of the rapid exploitation of fortuitous circumstances in the style of Frederick the Great during the early years of his reign. The January 1938 Hitler-Beck Conference Hitler discussed the European situation with Polish Foreign Minister Beck at Berlin on January 14, 1938. This conference was important. The development of German-Polish relations since the November 5, 1937, declaration on minorities had caused disappointment in both countries, and it was necessary to clear the atmosphere. 
Polish protests about statements in Germany concerning Danzig had produced much bad feeling, although Albert Forster had agreed at Hitler's suggestion to go to Warsaw to discuss the situation with Polish leaders. German efforts to persuade the Poles to accept periodic talks on mutual minority problems met with evasion in Warsaw. The Germans presented protests on current Polish economic discrimination against minority Germans in the East Upper Silesian industrial area, but these protests remained unanswered. German Ambassador Maltka bluntly told Beck on December 11, 1937, that Germany was disillusioned in her hopes for favorable results under the new treaty. The Germans were also concerned about the Polish annual agrarian reform law which was announced early each year. These laws were used to expropriate land owned by Germans in Poland, and especially in the former German provinces. There was a rumor that the 1938 law would be more drastic than those of previous years, which later proved to be the case. Neurath had arranged to meet Beck on January 13, 1938, and he had prepared a careful memorandum containing many grievances. He intended to emphasize the agrarian law, and the special degermanization measures of Polish frontier ordinances, which proclaimed the right of the Polish state to prevent others than ethnic Poles from owning property in the region of the frontier. He also intended to protest the bitterly anti-German policy of Governor Grazinski in Polish East Upper Silesia, and to complain about the Polish press which remained anti-German despite the latest agreement. He intended to deplore the absence of a psychological breakthrough to better relations between the two countries. Neurath was frustrated by an order from Hitler which forbade him to raise these controversial points. The Polish Foreign Office on January 12, 1938, denounced the plan for periodic meetings to discuss minority problems as a dangerous road which could lead to friction. Maltka wired Neurath on the same day that Beck intended to concentrate on the Danzig question in his conversation with the German Foreign Minister. Neurath had little enthusiasm for his conference with Beck under these circumstances, and he was evasive when the Polish foreign minister suggested that the League High Commissioner should be removed from Danzig. He finally agreed that Beck should sound out the mood at Geneva in order to consider the possibility of pursuing the question at an appropriate time. Beck confided to Neurath that he was delighted with the new anti-Jewish government of Octavian Goga in Romania, and with the elimination, which was only temporary in this instance, of the Romanian liberal regime. Beck finally made the significant statement that Polish relations with Czechoslovakia could not be worse, and he could not imagine that they would ever change. He added pointedly that Poland had no political interest whatever in Austria. He indicated that Polish interests south of the Carpathians were limited to Poland's Romanian ally, to Polish territorial aspirations in Czechoslovakia, and to the eastern and largely non-Czech part of the Prague domain. Beck assured Neurath that combating Bolshevism, with which the Czechs had formally allied themselves in June 1935, was a primary aim of Polish policy. Neurath immediately raised the question of Polish participation in the 1936 German-Japanese Anti-Comintern Pact, which Italy had joined a few weeks previously. Beck hastily replied that this arrangement was impracticable for Poland. Beck was convinced that the great Soviet purges were undermining Russian strength, and he was determined to avoid a commitment with Germany which he considered unnecessary. Hitler met Beck the following day, and he made a statement which the Polish foreign minister should have considered very carefully. They discussed the current civil war in Spain and Hitler observed that he was vitally interested in the struggle against Bolshevism in Europe. He then added that his anti-Bolshevik policy would, nevertheless, have to take second place to his aim of strengthening and consolidating German power. The restoration of Germany was the primary mandate which he had received from the German people. It is important to bear this declaration in mind when examining the contention that Hitler reversed his entire foreign policy in seeking an accommodation with Russia in 1939. Actually, such a policy was conceivable at any moment when German interests were in serious jeopardy. Hitler also informed Beck with studied emphasis that he would never give his consent to cooperate with Poland in securing a revision of the Danzig Statute, if the purpose of such a revision was to perpetuate the free city regime. He hoped that Beck would realize that his attitude was unalterable on this point. The conversation turned to Austria, and it was evident to Beck that Hitler was preoccupied with conditions in that country. 
Hitler informed Beck that he would invade Austria immediately, if any attempt were made to restore the Habsburg dynasty. He confided that his current Austrian policy was based on peaceful relations with Vienna along the lines of the 1936 Austro-German Treaty. This treaty had been negotiated by Franz von Papen, who had been German envoy in Austria since October 1934, and Austrian Foreign Minister Guido Schmidt. It constituted a truce between the two countries in the undeclared war which had existed since Hitler came to power in 1933. Austria under the terms of this treaty, had obliged herself to conduct a foreign policy consistent with her character as a German state. Hitler mentioned that his policy toward Czechoslovakia was confined to improving the status of the German minority, but he confided his opinion that the whole structure of the Czech state, however, was impossible. Neither Hitler nor Beck were aware of the role of Czech President Benes in bringing on the Russian army purge by advising Stalin of alleged pro-German treason in the Red Army. Nevertheless, they both recognized the danger of Bolshevist penetration in Czechoslovakia, and Beck heartily agreed with Hitler's remarks about the Czechs. Beck confided something to Hitler that he had never told the Russians. He revealed that Poland's alliance with Romania was directed exclusively against the Soviet Union, and he added that Poland hoped to strengthen Romania against Bolshevism. He also claimed that he wished to increase German-Polish friendship and to continue the policy initiated by Marshal Pilsudski. The January 14, 1938, conversation between Hitler and Beck was the last one for nearly a year, and it played an important role in improving cooperation between the two countries despite the local incidents of friction which continued to occur. The relations between the two men were on a more friendly basis than before and State Secretary Wiesacker was not overstating the case when he informed Maltke that the meeting had been satisfactory on both sides. This was possible because points of interest had been emphasized, and differences had been ignored. The rise of Joachim von Ribbentrop two scandals involving Defense Minister Werner von Blomberg and Army Commander Werner von Fritsch occurred in Germany in January 1938. The latter was acquitted by a special military court in March 1938 of having engaged in the homosexual practices with which he had been charged. The Blomberg scandal was caused by the Blomberg-Erna Grun marriage at which Hitler had been a witness. The fact soon came to light that Erna Grun had a record as a registered prostitute in Berlin. No one, including Blomberg himself, believed that the defense minister could continue his duties under these circumstances. The dismissal of Fritsch as army commander, before the final verdict on his case, was an injustice based on mere suspicion, but it was perfectly legal, since Hitler had the constitutional power to dismiss him. These developments necessitated changes, and Hitler decided to extend them. Ribbentrop was at last appointed foreign minister to replace Neurath, and several other important changes were made in the diplomatic service. Hassel was withdrawn as German ambassador at Rome and replaced by Mackensen, who had been state secretary at the Foreign Office. The withdrawal of Ulrich von Hassel was a logical step, since he opposed the idea of a German-Italian alliance. Ernst von Wiesacker was selected to replace Hans George von Mackensen as state secretary, with the approval of Ribbentrop, who believed that Wiesacker could be trusted to execute his policy, and that Mackensen could not. In reality, both men were in fundamental opposition to Hitler, but Ribbentrop was not aware of this at the time. Dirksen was transferred from Tokyo and later sent to London to replace Ribbentrop, and ODT was sent to replace Dirksen at the Tokyo Post. Poppen was informed at Vienna on February 4, 1938, that he would be recalled as German ambassador to Austria. It was evident that Hitler believed the limit had been reached with Franz von Poppen's conciliatory Austrian policy. It is uncertain what Hitler would have done in the following days with the Austrian post, because Papen immediately took the initiative in determining the course of events in Austria. He was dismayed when he received word of his recall. He took leave of his family on February 5, and proceeded to Birch Teskeden for an interview with Hitler. It was his impression that the German Chancellor was much preoccupied with the situation in Austria, but undecided about the future course of German policy toward that country. The fall of Kurt von Schuschnigg Poppen had earlier suggested to Hitler that an interview with Austrian dictator Kurt von Schuschnigg might be useful, 
and Hitler had granted him permission to arrange one, Shushnik was understandably reluctant, and Hitler appeared to have forgotten about the matter. When Papen called on Hitler on February 5, he mentioned that Shushnik had at last expressed a desire for a conference and that it could be speedily arranged. Hitler was at once enthusiastic, and he told Papen to continue temporarily as German ambassador to Austria. Papen was somewhat nettled by this procedure, since he had taken leave of the Austrian government in his ambassadorial capacity, but he realized that Hitler was in the habit of cutting through conventional practices when the need for action arose. Papen arranged a conference between Hitler and Schuschnigg at Birch Teskeden for February 12. Hitler instructed Papen to tell the Austrian Chancellor that German officers would be present that day, so Schuschnigg came to Berkgaden accompanied by Austrian military officers and by Foreign Minister Guido Schmidt. Hitler greeted Schuschnigg courteously, and then proceeded to subject him, as a German, to moral pressure. By 11 p.m., Schuschnigg had agreed to cease persecuting Austrian National Socialists to admit the National Socialist Austrian leader, Cecil Quart, to the cabinet as Minister of Interior, and to permit Hitler to broadcast a speech to Austria in return for a Schuschnigg speech to Germany. The Austrian Chancellor was later ashamed that he had accepted these conditions, and he claimed that Hitler had been violent in manner during the first two hours of conversation. Papen denied this, and he insisted that the meeting had ended in general satisfaction. Papen was accustomed to Hitler and familiar with his occasional passionate outbursts, and from this perspective the day appeared less stormy to him. Schuschnigg recalled that Hitler thanked Papen in his presence at the end of the meeting and said that through your, Papen's, assistance I was appointed Chancellor of Germany and thus the Reich was saved from the abyss of communism. Hitler was exhilarated by this personal success. In a major speech on February 20, 1938, he drew the attention of the world to the 10 million Germans in the two neighboring states of Austria and Czechoslovakia. He stressed that these Germans had shared the same Reich with their compatriots until 1866. Austria-Hungary was closely allied a few years later with the new German Reich of Bismarck, and in this way a form of union continued to link the Germans. They had shared the same common experience of World War I as soldiers for the Central Powers. The peacemakers of 1919 had frustrated their desire for union within a new Germany. Schuschnigg began to consider means of repudiating the birch teskeden Agreement of February 12, 1938, shortly after he returned to Austria. He realized that he required the appearance of some moral mandate to achieve this aim. He knew that his regime could never win an honest election of the issues of continued separation from Germany and of his own scarcely veiled project of restoring the Habsburgs in the tiny Austrian state. At last he decided to stage a fraudulent plebiscite. He announced at Innsbruck on March 9, 1938, that a plebiscite on the important issue of the future of Austria would be held within the short span of four days, on March 13, 1938. It had been determined in advance that the balloting would be subjected to official scrutiny which would render impossible the anonymity of the voters' choice. Negative ballots would have to be supplied by the voters themselves, and it was required that for validity they should be of such an odd, fractional size that they could be readily disqualified. The vote of confidence question in Shushnik was to be phrased in terms as confusing and misleading as possible. Shushnik forced Hitler's hand in the Austrian question by means of this chicanery. Great Britain had been hastily seeking an agreement with Italy since January 1938 in the hope of using it to preserve the independence of the Austrian puppet state. The agreement was not concluded until April 1938, when it was too late to be of use. Mussolini had vainly advised Schuschnigg to abandon his risky plan for a plebiscite. Apparently Schuschnigg, and not Hitler, had become impatient and was determined to force the issue regardless of the consequences. Shushnik was informed by Cecil Quart on March 11, 1938, at 10 a.m., that he must agree within one hour to revoke the fraudulent plebiscite, and agree to a fair and secret ballot plebiscite within three to four weeks, on the question of whether Austria should remain independent or be reunited with the rest of Germany. Otherwise the German army would occupy Austria. The failure of a reply within the specified time produced a new ultimatum demanding that Cecil Quart succeed Schuschnigg as Chancellor of Austria. The crisis had reached a climax, 
and there was no retreat for either side. The principal danger to Germany was that Italy, the only other European great power which bordered Austria, would intervene. France had no engagements toward Austria, no common frontier, and was in the midst of a cabinet crisis. Lord Halifax, who had been appointed British Foreign Secretary the previous month to succeed Anthony Eden, did everything he could to incite Italian action against Germany. The British diplomatic representatives in Vienna favoured Schuschnigg's decision for a plebiscite. Halifax warned Ribbentrop in London on March 10, 1938, that there would be possible consequences in terms of British intervention against Germany if Hitler used force in Central Europe. Ribbentrop was in London to take leave of his ambassadorial post, and Neurath was directing the German Foreign Office during this interval. Early on March 11, 1938, Halifax instructed British Ambassador Henderson in Berlin to see Hitler and to warn him against German interference in Austria. On the same day, Halifax was informed from Rome that Italian Foreign Minister Gail Azzocano refused to discuss the Austrian situation with British diplomatic representatives. The situation had developed so quickly that Germany had been unable to arrive at an agreement with Italy, but Mussolini decided to make no difficulties for Hitler when the crisis came. Chano had anticipated this situation when he wrote in his diary on February 23, 1938, that an Italian war against Germany on behalf of Schuschnigg would be an impossibility. This did not change the fact that the Italian leaders were very unhappy about the Austrian situation. Hitler received word at 10.25 p.m., on March 11, 1938, that Mussolini accepted the Anschluss, Union, i.e. with Austria. It was evident by this time that there would be no resistance to German troops entering Austria, and Hitler was now convinced that there would be no overt foreign intervention. He left Hermann Göring in charge at Berlin, and he proceeded to his Austrian homeland. He was greeted with a joyously enthusiastic reception from the mass of the Austrian people. Hitler knew that his undisturbed Austrian triumph had been possible because Mussolini had sacrificed a former sphere of Italian influence, and on March 13, 1938, he wired Mussolini from Austria, Mussolini, I shall never forget this of you. When Halifax saw that France was immobilized by a domestic crisis and that Italy was disinclined to act, it was decided at London to adopt a friendly attitude toward the Austrian Anschluss situation. This was easy to do, because the German leaders during the next few days were so happy to see Germany score a major success for the first time in 20 years that they were prepared to embrace the entire world in the spirit of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Seid umschlungen, ihr Millionen, be embraced, you millions of humanity. The recorded version of a telephone conversation between Ribbentrop in London and Goring in Berlin on March 13, 1938, offers an indication of this. Ribbentrop praised the British attitude and added, I do think one knows pretty well over here what is going on. He told Goring that he had emphasized to Halifax on March 12 the importance of an Anglo-German understanding and Goring commented, I was always in favor of a German-English understanding. Ribbentrop suggested, Chamberlain also is very serious about an understanding, and Goring replied, I am also convinced that Halifax is an absolutely reasonable man. Ribbentrop concluded this phase of the discussion with the comment, I received the best impression of Halifax as well as of Chamberlain. The double game of Lord Halifax it was easy for Halifax to praise the Germans to their faces, and to seek to undermine them secretly but one must inquire after the purpose of this double game. The official British policy in Europe was conducted under the label of appeasement. This attractive term for a conciliatory policy had been popularized by French Foreign Minister Aristide Briand in the 1920s and revived by British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden during the Rhineland crisis in 1936. Appeasement to Britain meant a sincere French policy of conciliation toward Germany. Later the communist press, and the liberal, 19th century liberalism would have been hostile to the Soviet Union, journalists allied with it, succeeded in convincing the broad, unsuspecting masses in the Western countries that this term had an odious connotation. The communists at this time also invented the epithet Cliveden set, following a weekend which Neville Chamberlain spent at the Astor estate of Cliveden on the Thames from March 26 to 28, 1938. 
The fact that Anthony Eden, who was popular with the communists at the time, spent more weekends at Cliveden than Chamberlain made no difference to them, because they were no more inclined to be honest about Cliveden than about the Reichstag fire of 1933, which had been attributed to the National Socialists by the communist agent at Paris, Willy Munsterberg. The mass of the people in the Western countries accepted the story about the Reichstag despite the absence of proof, and the communists were correct in anticipating that they would believe the charge of a sinister pro-Nazi conspiracy at Cliveden. Communist propaganda victories were easy when the majority of Western liberals were working as their allies. President Roosevelt, in a speech at Chicago in 1937, included the Soviet Union among the so-called peace-loving nations of the world in contrast to the allegedly evil and aggressive Germans, Italians, and Japanese. There was no Cliveden set and no genuine British appeasement policy. The use of this term by Neville Chamberlain and Lord Halifax, and by their principal parliamentary advisers, Sir John Simon and Sir Samuel Hoare, was a facade to disguise the fact that the British leaders considered themselves to be somewhat behind in their military preparations. It was recognized in 1937 and 1938 that German rearmament was not especially formidable, and that it would be easy for Great Britain, despite her much smaller industrial capacity, to score relative gains on Germany in this field. British armament efforts in the early 1930s had been hampered by the effects of the World Depression, by the opposition from the Labour Party, and by interference from the British peace movement, which enjoyed considerable popularity for a time. It was recognised that the two previous Prime Ministers, Ramsay MacDonald and Stanley Baldwin, had been somewhat lax about overcoming these difficulties, but a major British armament campaign was now in full swing under Neville Chamberlain. It would require another year, after early 1938, before the full effects of this program would be realised, and in the meantime the British leaders believed it wise to tread softly, beneath the guise of impartial justice, in coping with European problems. Events were to show that it was a great gain for the Soviet Union that the British leaders were not sincerely devoted to the program to which they professed to adhere. There was another important factor which made appeasement a clever label for British policy. The injustices inflicted on Germany in 1919 and the following years converted many thinking Englishmen to that sympathy toward the Germans which had been the traditional English attitude in the 19th century. Popular sympathy toward a country on which one is contemplating a military assault is a bad basis on which to build war sentiment. A nominal adherence to appeasement for several years might enable British leaders to convince their subjects that sympathy toward Germany had been frustrated by the wicked and insatiable appetite of that country. The problem had been explained by the English expert, Geoffrey Gorer, in his book, Exploring English Character, War Against a Wicked Enemy and the Enemy Must Clearly Be Shown to Be Wicked by the Standards the Conscience Normally Uses is probably the only situation nowadays which will release the forces of righteous anger for the whole, or nearly the whole, population. Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was 68 years of age when he attained the highest British parliamentary office in April 1937. He was a strong man at the peak of his mental powers, and a stern Tory party disciplinarian. He was born with the privileges of the British merchant industrialist upper class, and his repeated elections as Lord Mayor of Birmingham after 1915 were considered little more than the rightful acceptance of a traditional sinecure. His father, Joseph Chamberlain, and his brother, Austin Chamberlain, had enjoyed strikingly successful careers in British public life, and they had been associated with important decisions on the principal national economic, colonial, and diplomatic questions of their day. Neville Chamberlain received much credit for launching the British protective tariff system of imperial preferences, and for securing the agreement of the British Dominions to this system at the famous Ottawa Conference in 1932. It has sometimes been suggested that Chamberlain, prior to March 1939, placed a blind trust in Hitler and believed that a comprehensive Anglo-German understanding would be achieved. This is untrue because Chamberlain never ceased thinking that Great Britain might go to war with Germany again instead of concluding an agreement with her. When Hitler reintroduced conscription in March 1935, Chamberlain wrote, Hitler's Germany is the bully of Europe, yet I don't despair. This emotional comment scarcely suggested that Chamberlain was enamoured either of Germany or of Hitler. On July 5, 
1935, Chamberlain was considering the appeasement of Italy in the Ethiopian crisis as a means of preventing a rapprochement between Italy and Germany. He defined appeasement on this occasion as a possible combination of threats and concessions, and this definition reflected the ambivalent nature of Chamberlain's thinking whenever he conducted a so-called appeasement policy. At the time of the alienation of Italy in December 1935, due to the scandal caused by the premature revelation of the Horlaval Treaty, Chamberlain insisted that this would not have happened had he been Prime Minister. He would have seen to it that Italy was securely retained in the anti-German front. After he became Prime Minister in 1937, Chamberlain considered it a principal aim of his policy to separate Italy from Germany. Chamberlain wrote to a friend in the United States on January 16, 1938, that he favored agreements with both Germany and Italy provided that the Germans could be persuaded to refrain from the use of force. This raised the question of what Chamberlain understood by the use of force, and whether force meant to him the actual shedding of blood or the mere threat of force. This question was clarified when Chamberlain said, after the Austro-German Anschluss on March 13, 1938, it is perfectly evident that force is the only argument Germany understands. The same Chamberlain defined his own program by saying that British armament was the basis for empire defence and collective security. The use of force in this sense was right in Chamberlain's mind when it was British, and wrong when it was German. The British had defined their position of empire defence at the time of the kellogg bryant Pact in 1928. They listed a large number of countries bordering the British Empire in which they claimed a right of permanent intervention, outside the terms of a pact designed to outlaw war as an instrument of national policy. Chamberlain considered himself detached and objective in his evaluation of Hitler, and he no doubt felt charitable when he wrote after their first meeting in 1938, I did not see any trace of insanity it has been said that, after a series of meetings with Hitler, Chamberlain felt himself coming irresistibly under the spell of the magnetic German leader. This is doubtless true, and Chamberlain has verified it himself. It was not difficult for him to dispel this momentary influence and to return to his habitual way of thinking after a few days back in England in his accustomed environment. After all, Hitler was merely the upstart leader of a power recently crushed almost beyond recognition, and Chamberlain was the prime minister of a proud empire with an allegedly uninterrupted series of victories dating back to Queen Elizabeth I in the 16th century. It was unrealistic to describe this proud man as the dupe of Hitler. Chamberlain was a formidable figure, but he was soon overshadowed by at least one of his ministers. Edward Frederick Lindley Wood, Earl of Halifax, has been one of the most self-assured, ruthless, clever, and sanctimoniously self-righteous diplomats the world has ever seen. It has been said that Halifax was born great, achieved greatness, and had greatness thrust upon him. He was an angular, tall, and rugged man. He was born with a withered left arm, and he compensated for his physical defect by an avid pursuit of sport, and especially hunting. By the age of nine, after the death of his older brothers, he was sole heir to his father's title. He received a first in modern history at Oxford in 1903, and, after a tour of the empire, he published a biography of the Anglican church leader, John Keeble. He entered the House of Commons as a conservative in January 1910. He emphatically denied that all men are created equal in his maiden speech in Commons. He called on the English people to remain true to their calling of a superior race within the British Empire. It was a blood and iron speech in the full sense of the phrase. He had some doubt about personally entering the war in 1914, but he later spent a period on the Western Front and participated in some of the battles of 1916-1917. Halifax had no patience with dissenters in this epic struggle, and he declared in Commons in December 1917, I feel, absolutely no sympathy with the real conscientious objector, i.e. to war, dot. In 1918 he was a principal organiser and signatory of the Lothar petition to Lloyd George for a hard peace with Germany. Halifax occupied important positions in the years after World War I. He was Under Secretary of State for Colonies, President of the Board of Education, British Representative on the League Council, and Minister of Agriculture. 
he often held several important posts simultaneously. Halifax was appointed Viceroy of India in 1925, and he arrived in that country on April 1, 1926, with the avowed intention of outwitting Gandhi, who was seeking payment in the coin of freedom for the sacrifices of India in World War I. Halifax hoped to beguile the Indian following of Gandhi by offering eventual rather than immediate dominion status, and in this respect he appeared deceptively liberal compared to a man like Churchill, who wished to govern India permanently in the fashion of a British Crown Colony. Halifax did not like pacifists, but he remembered that he was a diplomat, and he was always equivocal and evasive when asked what he thought about Gandhi. Halifax was 50 years old when he returned in triumph from India in May 1931. He continued to concentrate on Indian affairs for several years, and he again held the post of President of the Board of Education. He was appointed Secretary of State for War in June 1935, and in this capacity he pushed hard for an intensive armament campaign. Halifax declared with complacency, at Plymouth in October 1935, that there was no one on the continent who would not sleep more happily if he knew that Britain had the power to make the policy of peace prevail over the world. Halifax was the right-hand man of Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, and he was leader of the House of Lords and Lord Privy Seal. Halifax had an important voice in the conduct of British diplomacy from January 1935 onward. On March 10, 1936, during the Rhineland Crisis, he accompanied Foreign Minister Eden to Paris for crucial negotiations with the French leaders. He also played a key role in supporting the Archbishop of Canterbury against King Edward VII during the abdication crisis of 1936. The November 1937 Halifax visit to Hitler had been discussed for many months, and it caused a flurry of speculation in the British press when it was announced publicly on November 10, 1937. The Halifax visit was merely a fact-finding mission, and it produced no immediate results, although it aroused great hopes in Germany. Three months later Lord Halifax replaced Anthony Eden as British Foreign Secretary under acrimonious circumstances which accompanied an irreconcilable difference between Chamberlain and Eden on the advisability of appeasing Italy. Eden had previously been in conflict on this point with Sir Robert Van Sittert, the permanent under-secretary at the British Foreign Office. Van Sittert was promoted upstairs on January 1, 1938, to be Chief Diplomatic Advisor to His Majesty's Government which was a new post of unknown importance, and he was replaced as permanent undersecretary by Sir Alexander Cadogan. This change was interpreted as a victory of Eden over Van Sittert, until the fall of Eden some seven weeks later. It was no longer easy after the fall of Eden to interpret the changed status of Van Sittert, who actually retained all of his former influence, and this became a subject of speculation for many years. Halifax was solidly behind Chamberlain in the conduct of foreign policy, and, during the first eight months that he was foreign secretary, he permitted Chamberlain to keep the initiative in this field. Afterward he asserted his own authority, and Great Britain approached the Holocaust of World War II under the diplomatic leadership of Halifax rather than Chamberlain. Halifax never remotely understood or appreciated the German viewpoint or the problems which confronted Germany. A simple example will illustrate this point. Halifax told Ribbentrop in London on March 11, 1938, that a German action against Austria would be the same as a British action against Belgium. Halifax apparently considered this a fair statement, and a recognition of the fact that Austria was important to Germany and Belgium important to Great Britain. The fact that Austria had been part of Germany for more than 1,000 years, and that the legislators of Austria had voted to join Germany after World War I, carried no weight with him. Consequently, he did not recognize the Anschluss as an act of liberation for the Austrian people from a hated puppet regime. No problem confronting Germany could have been more simple for anyone capable of understanding German problems. Sir Neville Henderson, the British ambassador in Berlin, was able to comprehend the situation without difficulty and he never would have made the misleading comparison between Belgium and Austria. Halifax wrote memoirs nearly 20 years later which were candid in explaining his attitude toward the European situation at this time. He recognized that Hitler was an undoubted phenomenon, and he was ashamed to say that he did not dislike Goebbels. 
Unlike Chamberlain, Halifax was single-minded in 1937 and early 1938 about the inevitability of another war with Germany. Indeed, he went so far as to say that an Anglo-German war had been inevitable since March 1936, the moment Germany had recovered her freedom of action by reoccupying the Rhineland. It is important to recall that in March 1936 Halifax played a leading role in discouraging a vigorous French response to the military reoccupation of the Rhineland by Germany. No doubt a war in 1936 would have been inconvenient to the current British conception of the balance of power, but one can also regret that Halifax did not have a more accurate evaluation in 1939 of the balance of power to which he professed to be so devoted. Halifax also wrote that the Munich Conference of 1938 was a horrible and wretched business, but it was extremely useful, because it convinced the gullible English people in the following year that everything possible had been done to avoid war. This might seem to imply that working for peace in 1938 justified working for war in 1939, but this was not so. It was not the right that mattered, but victory. It was not the truth which counted but it was important to have the English people thinking along lines which were useful. Hoare and Simon were constant advisers of Chamberlain and Halifax in the conduct of British policy in 1938. Hoare had been dropped as British Foreign Secretary in December 1935 because of his tentative Ethiopian treaty prepared with Laval, it was repudiated for violating collective security but he returned to the British cabinet in 1936 as Parliamentary First Lord of the Admiralty. He worked hard for a policy of pro-Franco neutrality during the Spanish Civil War, and he was sent to Spain as ambassador during World War II low keep Spain pro-British. It was recognized in London that he had excellent contacts with the Spanish aristocracy. Hoare also had close contacts with the Czech leaders of 1938, and these dated from his military and diplomatic missions in World War I. Hoare became Home Secretary, Minister of the Interior, in June 1937 and he spent long hours with Chamberlain discussing the best means of separating Mussolini and Hitler. This British policy succeeded before the outbreak of World 99 War II, and it was cancelled solely by the unexpected collapse of France in 1940. Hoare advised Chamberlain on American affairs. He regarded Anglo-American friendship as the very basis of our foreign policy, but he was correct in recognizing that President Roosevelt was in no position to take active steps to intervene in Europe in 1938 or 1939. He did not hesitate to advise Chamberlain to reject Roosevelt's suggestion for an international conference in January 1938, at a time when the British Prime Minister was concentrating on achieving a bilateral agreement with Italy. Hoare claimed there was never any difficulty in being loyal to both Chamberlain and Halifax in foreign policy because the two were always in agreement. He recognized that Halifax was a strong personality, who could never be dominated by Chamberlain. Simon was British Foreign Secretary from 1931 to 1935 in the Macdonald Coalition government, which was dominated by the Conservatives. He established intimate understandings with the permanent service experts, Sir Robert Van Sittert and Sir Alexander Cadogan. Simon was unimpressed by revisionist historical writing on World War I, and he persisted in describing it as the Freedom War, or Crusade for Freedom. He was in close agreement with Chamberlain, Halifax, and Hoare in this respect. He was also for a heavy armament program throughout the 1930s, and he criticized the liberals and the labor leaders for impeding it. It is amusing that Simon regarded Ribbentrop as a pretentious sham and complained of the hard shell which surrounded his self-sufficiency, since these were precisely the complaints directed at Simon by his English critics. The position of Simon in the 1930s was that Britain could not act alone as the policeman of the world, and the implication was that she should police the world with the support of others. He described Chamberlain as a man of peace who would fight rather than see the world dominated by force. Simon was for peace in 1938 because he believed that Great Britain required another 12 months to complete her preparations for a victorious war against Germany. The British ability to rationalize an essentially immoral foreign policy and to moralize about it has always been unlimited. In 1937, with the approval of Van Sittert and Chamberlain, William Strang succeeded Ralph Wigram at the Central Department of the British Foreign Office 
which comprised German affairs in relation to both Western and Eastern Europe. The British by this time were shifting their foreign policy because of the purges in Russia, and they were moving from primary opposition to Russia toward conflict with Germany. It was essential that this change in policy be accompanied by some moral explanation, and it was supplied by Strang in the following words, In our generation, the cup of hatefulness has been filled to overflowing by the horrors of the Nazi and Soviet regimes, but yet perhaps not quite an equal measure. The Soviet system, cruel, evil and tyrannous as it shows itself to be in the pursuit by its self-appointed masters of absolute power both at home and abroad, springs, however remotely, from a moral idea, the idea namely that man shall not be exploited by man for his own personal profit, and there is thus at least a case to be made for it that is dangerously attractive to many minds, for Nazism, on the contrary, there was and is, it seems to me, nothing to be said. This was the judgment of the man who was allegedly the chief expert on Germany in the British Foreign Office. Apparently it did not occur to Strang that the Marxist slogan about exploitation was not much different and certainly no more noble than the National Socialist motto, Germaniets vor eigen Nutz, the profit of the community must come before the profit of the individual, dot. Furthermore, the National Socialists believed that this doctrine could be implemented without the fostering of permanent class hatred, or the expropriation of at least half of the community, Werner Sombart had shown that by no stretch of the imagination did the proletariat constitute more than half of the German population. It is instructive in this context to cite the recent book, The Rise and Fall of Nazi Germany, by the Jewish historian, T. L. Jarman. Jarman's volume contains much bitter criticism of Hitler and his system, but at least he is sufficiently objective to state that under National Socialism, terrorism, unlike in Russia, was kept in the background, and that Germany in the years 1933-1939 was an open country in a sense which Soviet Russia has never been. Strang complained that the months before World War II were a crushing period for him, but that 1939 was less burdensome than 1938 because war would almost certainly come. Apparently the possibility that Hitler in 1938 might find some means of avoiding a new Anglo-German war was irritating to Strang. Certainly no militarist could have sought war more avidly and Strang's attitude is not a flattering commentary on his qualifications for diplomacy. The fact that this man, at his key post, was perfectly satisfactory to Chamberlain and Halifax speaks for itself. The secret war aspirations of President Roosevelt The attitude of President Roosevelt and his entourage was perhaps more extreme than that of the British leaders, but at least the American president was restrained by constitutional checks, public opinion, and congressional legislation from inflicting his policy on Europe during the period before World War II. A petulant outburst from Assistant Secretary F. B. Sayer, of the American State Department, to British Ambassador Sir Ronald Lindsay on September 9. 1938, during difficult negotiations for an Anglo-American trade treaty, illustrated the psychosis which afflicted American leaders and diplomats. Sayer later recalled, I went on to say that at such a time, when war was threatening and Germany was pounding at our gates, it seemed to me tragic that we had not been able to reach and sign an agreement. To imagine Germany pounding on the gates of the United States in 1938 is like confusing Alice in Wonderland with the Bible. Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau, Jr., telephoned Paris on March 14, 1938, to inform the French that the United States would support and cooperate with a socialist measure of the Bloom Popular Front government to control, and, if necessary, to freeze foreign exchange in France. This would have been a drastic measure contrary to the international system of arbitrage and to the prevailing international financial policy of the United States. Morgenthau was eager to see Leon Blum retain the premiership in the hope that he would plunge France into conflict with Hitler. He had no compunctions about taking this step without informing either the United States Congress or American business leaders. Leon Blum, the socialist, did not dare to go that far, and his government fell because of an inadequate fiscal policy. The German leaders correctly believed that the unrestrained anti-German press in the United States was profoundly influencing both public and private American attitudes toward Germany. Goebbels told United States Ambassador Hugh Wilson on March 22, 1938, that he expected criticism, 
and indeed, it was inconceivable to him that writers in America should be sympathetic with present-day Germany because of the complete contrast of method by which the, German, government was acting. On the other hand he objected to libel and slander and to the deliberate stirring up of hatred. Wilson confided that it was not the German form of government which was at issue, but that the most crucial thing that stood between any betterment of our press relationship was the Jewish question. Ribbentrop was able to challenge Wilson on April 30, 1938, to find one single item in the German press which contained a personal criticism of President Roosevelt. He also intimated that the situation could be otherwise. In early 1938, Jewish doctors and dentists were still participating in the German state compulsory insurance program, Ortskrankenkassen, which guaranteed them a sufficient number of patients. Wilson relayed information to Secretary of State Hull that, in 1938, 10% of the practicing lawyers in Germany were Jews, although the Jews constituted less than 1% of the population. Nevertheless, the American State Department continued to bombard Germany with exaggerated protests on the Jewish question throughout 1938, although Wilson suggested to Hull on May 10, 1938, that these protests, which were not duplicated by other nations, did more harm than good. The United States took exception to a German law of March 30, 1938, which removed the Jewish Church from its position as one of the established churches of Germany. This meant that German public tax receipts would go no longer to the Jewish Church, although German citizens would continue to pay taxes for the Protestant and Catholic churches. The situation established by this new law in Germany was in conformity with current English practice, where public tax revenue went to the Anglican Church, but the Jewish churches received nothing. On March 14, 1938, Under Secretary of State Sumner Wells complained to Polish Ambassador Jerzy Potocki about the German treatment of the Jews and praised Poland for her policy of tolerance. Potocki who knew that current Polish measures against the Jews were more severe than those in Germany, replied with dignity that the Jewish problem in Poland was a very real problem. It is evident that the Jewish question was primarily a pretext of American policy to disguise the fact that American leaders were spoiling for a dispute with Germany on any terms. In September 1938 President Roosevelt had a bad cold, and he complained that he wanted to kill Hitler and amputate the nose. Perhaps frustration and knowledge of the domestic obstacles confronting his own policy increased President Roosevelt's fury. Jules Henry, the French charge d'affaires, reported to Paris on November 7, 1937, that President Roosevelt was interested in overthrowing Hitler, but that the majority of the American people did not share his views. French Ambassador Saint Quentin reported on June 11, 1938 that President Roosevelt suddenly blurted out during an interview that the Germans understand only force, and then clenched his fist like a boxer spoiling for a fight. He noted that the President was fond of saying that if France went down, the United States would go down. Apparently this proposition was supposed to contain some self-evident legalistic moralistic truth which required no demonstration. Ambassador St. Quentin noted that the relations between President Roosevelt and William C. Bullitt, were especially close. This was understandable, because Bullitt was a warmonger. Bullitt was currently serving as United States Ambassador to France, but he was Ambassador at large to all the countries of Europe, and he was accustomed to transmit orders from Roosevelt to American Ambassador Kennedy in London or American Ambassador Biddle in Warsaw. Bullitt had a profound knowledge of Europe. He was well aware that the British did not intend to fight in 1938 and that the French would not fight without British support. He improved his contacts and bided his time during the period of the Austrian and Czech crises. He prepared for his role in 1939 as the Roosevelt Ambassador P.A.R. Excellence. He could accomplish little in either year, because the whole world knew that the president he was serving did not have the backing of the American people for his foreign policy. The peace policy of Georges Bonnet The situation in France took a dramatic turn when Édouard Dalottier, who triumphed over the left-wing tendencies of Édouard Ariot in the Radical Socialist Party, became French Premier on April 10, 1938. Winston Churchill had combined his efforts with those of Henry Morgenthau to keep in power the government of Dalottier's predecessor, Leon Blum, 
but he had failed. Bloom had hoped to head a government including not only the usual popular front combination of socialists and radical socialists supported by the communists, but also Paul Reynaud and some of the moderate republicans of the right who favored a strong stand against Hitler. Pierre Etienne Flandin, who had close contacts with Chamberlain and Halifax in London, took the lead in opposing this combination. Churchill was in Paris from March 26 to 28, 1938, in a vain effort to convert Flandin on behalf of Bloom. Churchill knew that a Bloom government could exert effective pressure for action on the British leaders in the inevitable Czech crisis. Churchill hoped to use the French to overthrow the appeasement policy in London. Dalatier was inclined to follow the lead of London in foreign policy, where the appeasement policy was currently in effect. At the same time, a moderate trend of opinion was gaining ground in France which held that there was no longer any point in seeking to frustrate Hitler's aspirations in Central Europe. Hitler had been allowed to rearm in 1935, and on June 18, 1935, the British had concluded with him a bilateral naval pact which was clearly contrary to the military provisions of the Versailles Treaty. No doubt at the time this had appeared a useful step in securing British interests and in opposing communism, but the fact remained that it also had been a blow at French military hegemony in Western and Central Europe. The British policy of restraining France from interfering with Hitler's military reoccupation of the Rhineland on March 7, 1936, had greatly reduced the possibility that France could render effective military aid to the members of the Little Entente or to other French allies in the East. French military strategy in the meantime had been based on the creation of a strong defensive position in France. Sensible Frenchmen were asking if it would not be wise to draw the necessary political conclusions from these events, and to modify French commitments in the East in the interest of preventing war. Joseph Paul Boncourt had succeeded Yvonne Delbos as foreign minister after the fall of the Camille Chautat government at the time of the Anschluss. He opposed the moderate trend, and he favoured a strong policy in support of the Czechs. Dalatier had been inclined to retain him as foreign minister, but he turned to George's bonnet, when he discovered that Paul Boncourt was adamant about the Czechs. Bonnet was one of the leading exponents of the moderate trend and he favoured an interpretation of French commitments which would promote peace. Bonnet, in contrast to the British leaders, was a sincere and single-minded advocate of a permanent appeasement policy toward Germany in the earlier style of Aristide Briand. He remained as foreign minister from April 1938 until shortly after the outbreak of World War II. His appointment was one of the most significant events of the period, and it increased the chances for peace in Europe. Bonnet was not an isolated figure in his conduct of French foreign policy. He exerted great influence over Dalatier, he enjoyed the support of a large number of colleagues in the French cabinet, and he was encouraged by important interest groups throughout France. A special parliamentary committee of inquiry was established in France in 1946 to investigate the causes and events of World War II. The communist tide was running high in France at that time. Many prominent Frenchmen had been imprisoned for no apparent reason, and approximately 100,000 French citizens were liquidated in a communist-inspired purge. Georges Bonnet had departed from France toward the end of World War II for Geneva, Switzerland, the ancestral seat of the Bonnet family. He wisely declined to return to France until he received adequate guarantees that he would not be unjustly imprisoned. Bonnet did not testify before the committee until March 1951, approximately one year after his return to France. Bonnet explained that he was convinced the United States would play no active role in Europe in the immediate future, when he returned to France in 1937 after a period as ambassador to the United States. He was aware that the British were not inclined to send large forces to Europe in the event of a new war because of their bitter experience with heavy losses in World War I. He knew that the Soviet Union would do everything possible to avert war with Germany, and to embroil France and Germany in war in the interest of weakening the so-called capitalist powers. It seemed stupid to Bonnet not to do everything possible under these circumstances to avoid war with Germany. Bonnet complained that he was weary of being called a fanatical partisan of the Germans. He had not been in Germany since 1927 and he had always preferred the French system of liberal capitalism to German National Socialism. On the other hand, 
he had spent nearly three months in the Soviet Union in 1934, and this had been useful in equipping him to deal with Russian policy in 1938 and 1939. Bonnet could point to uninterruptedly friendly and confidential relations with Premier Dalatier in 1938 and 1939. He and Dalatier were convinced that Hitler was determined to carry through his program of Eastern Territorial Revision on behalf of Germany. Bonnet, as foreign minister, never conducted so-called private diplomacy. It was his rule that all dispatches, including the most secret ones, be translated or decoded and prepared in four copies. These copies went automatically to President Lerdre, to Premier Dalatier, to Alexis Ledger, the Secretary General of the Foreign Office, and to Bonnet. Bonnet considered himself a disciple of Aristide Briand in foreign policy. He was in the Painlev cabinet at the time of the signing of the Locomo Treaties in 1925. Briand, who was foreign minister, told the cabinet that the treaties would be applied solely within the context of the League of Nations and with the support of the necessary combination of preponderant powers. Bonnet concluded that France had no obligation to fulfill unilaterally the collective security treaties concluded after the signing of the Covenant of the League. Bonnet reminded the committee that Great Britain had never given France a pledge of armed support for an active French policy of intervention throughout the entire period of the Czech crisis in 1938. Bonnet discussed the situation with the British leaders on April 28-29. 1938, and he was told that Great Britain was not yet ready for a European war. When Halifax and Chamberlain suggested that Hitler might be bluffing, Bonnet predicted that Hitler would use force against the Czechs if peaceful revision failed. Bonnet had great respect for the military strength of the Soviet Union, and his opinion in this regard was not shaken by the current Soviet purges. He was equally convinced from his current diplomatic contracts that the Soviet Union would resist every effort in 1938 to persuade her to take the military initiative against Germany. Under these circumstances Bonnet had no compunctions, in 1938, in seeking to persuade the Czechs to arrive at a peaceful settlement with Germany at the expense of surrendering the German districts seized by the Czechs in 1918 and 1919. The Clarity of Bonnet's Thought and his habit of retaining detailed notes to illustrate his points, threw refreshing light on many obscure events of the period, and his revealing record was important in prompting several countries to publish a number of otherwise secret documents. He published two very full volumes of memoirs prior to his testimony before the Parliamentary Committee, and he produced a disconcerting amount of additional material to cope with the questions raised by his interrogators. It was not surprising when this man delivered an effective reply to each point raised against him. The memoirs of Bonnet abound with penetrating insights, and they ignore the many defamatory comments made about him by popular writers. He recognized that President Roosevelt employed a genial manner to hide his violent passions. Bonnet agreed in June 1937 to return from the United States to France as Minister of Finance in the new Chauta government after Joseph Kale Locks in the French Senate had succeeded in overthrowing the first Bloom government. Bonnet admired Joseph Kale Locks, who had fought in vain for peace in 1914 against the aggressive policies of Poincaré and Viviani, and he was pleased by the overthrow of Bloom. Bonnet insisted in a last audience with President Roosevelt that a new war in Europe would be a disaster for the entire world. Bonnet noted that Premier Chauta, and Foreign Minister Delbos were invited to London on November 29-30, 1937, immediately after the return of Halifax from Germany, and that the British leaders were mainly concerned about urging the French to increase their military preparations. Bonnet noted, after meeting Chamberlain in April 1938 for the first time in several years, that the British Prime Minister was obviously skeptical of reaching a lasting agreement with Hitler. This attitude contrasted with the opinion of Bonnet, who saw no reason why a lasting Anglo-German agreement could not be attained, if the British leaders sincerely desired one. The idea that the British were playing for time was confirmed when Chamberlain told Bonnet that one should select a favourable hour to stop Hitler rather than to permit the German leader to pick both the time and the place for a conflict. Hitler actually had no desire to pick either the time or place for a conflict with the British. Hugh Wilson United States Ambassador to Germany, 
sent Hull an analysis by an expert of the American Embassy staff on February 1, 1938, which contained the following significant statement, an English-German understanding is Hitler's first principle of diplomacy in 1938, just as it was in 1934, or in 1924 when he wrote Mein Kampf. Litvinov's hopes for a Franco-German war The Russians planned to play a cautious role in the Czech crisis. Maxim Litvinov, the Soviet Commissar for Foreign Affairs, told United States Ambassador Joseph Davies on March 24, 1938, that the League of Nations was dead, that no arrangements existed between France and Russia to cope with a Czech crisis, and that Czechoslovakia might capitulate without a struggle to German pressure. It was evident that Russia had no obligations to Czechoslovakia, unless the Czechs resisted Germany with active French military support. The Soviet policy did not imply a desire on the part of the Russian rulers to see the so-called capitalist powers of Western and Central Europe compose their differences. A French representative at Geneva in January 1938 was attacked by Maxim Litvinov when he suggested to a group of League spokesmen that a French rapprochement policy toward Germany might also be of benefit to Russia. The Russians hoped that they could stay temporarily in the background while the states which were their ideological rivals became embroiled. It was believed with good reason that the interests of Stalin would best be served by a conflict in the West. The official Soviet diplomatic history of the period later condemned Great Britain and France in strong terms for refusing to fight Germany over the Czech issue. Soviet diplomats in 1938 adopted the insincere line that Hitler was bluffing, and that a strong Anglo-French front on behalf of the Czechs would force him to retreat. The reckless diplomacy of Eduard Benes Hermann Göring in Berlin on March 12, 1938, assured the Czechs in response to specific inquiries that Germany contemplated no action against Czechoslovakia. The truth of this statement has since been revealed by the diplomatic documents, but common sense should have suggested at the time that it was true, when one considers the speed with which the Austrian crisis reached a climax within a few days. Although Hitler had linked the fate of Austrian and Sudeten Germans in his speech of February 20, 1938, he had always considered that Austria and Czechoslovakia constituted two entirely separate problems, and he scarcely had an opportunity to consider the second of these while the first was coming to a head with unexpected rapidity. The Germans promised that their troops in Austria would remain a considerable distance from the Czech frontier. It was clear to the Czechs, from the immediate reactions of the Sudeten Germans to the Anschluss, that a crisis was inevitable in which Czechoslovakia would occupy the central role. Jan Masaryk, the Czech envoy in London, discussed the situation with the British leaders. He reported to Prague on March 16, 1938, that the British were inclined to regard an Anglo-German war as inevitable but that it was evident that they were not contemplating such a conflict in 1938. Chamberlain restricted himself in the House of Commons on March 14, 1938 to the enigmatic statement that Great Britain was and always would be interested in the events of Central Europe because of her desire to maintain the peace of the world. It was clear to Masaryk that a British pledge to the Czechs in 1938 would be difficult if not impossible to obtain. The excitement among the Sudeten Germans after the Anschluss forced the Sudeten question to the center of the stage. The German legation in Prague reported on March 31, 1938, that Conrad Henlein, the leader of the Sudeten German Party, SDP, was pleading for the curtailment of all propaganda efforts to arouse the Sudeten people who were already too much aroused. In Great Britain and Canada a number of officially inspired articles were appearing which criticised the injustices inflicted on the Sudeten Germans over many years. Henlein realised that he would have to announce a programme which met the requirements of the new situation, and he collaborated closely with German Foreign Minister Ribbentrop and Ernst Eisenlohr, the German minister to Czechoslovakia, in preparing the famous Karlsbad demands for conditions of autonomy in the Sudeten region. The demands were announced by Henlein in a speech on April 24, 1938. It was evident that Hitler would support the Sudeten Germans in their bid for concessions, and Jan Masaryk was instructed by Czech Foreign Minister Krofta to make another specific request for British military support in defying the Germans. Masaryk reported on May 3, 1938, 
that British Foreign Secretary Halifax was pessimistic about the military prospects for Czechoslovakia in a conflict with Germany, and he refused to commit Great Britain to the Czech cause. The Czech leaders adopted the pattern of Shushnik, revealing that they were much more impatient than was Hitler to force the issue. The Czech cabinet and military leaders decided on the afternoon of May 20, 1938, to order the partial mobilization of the Czech armed forces, and to base this provocative act on the false accusation that German troops were concentrating on the Czech frontiers. It was hoped that the resulting emotional confusion would commit the British and the French to the Czech position before a policy favoring concessions to the Sudeten Germans could be implemented. The plot failed although Krofta on May 27, and Benes on June 1, granted interviews in which they claimed that Czechoslovakia had scored a great victory over Germany. An inspired press campaign to create this impression had begun on May 21, 1938, and it reverberated around the world. The war bid of Benes rejected by Halifax Halifax was not inclined to permit President Benes to conduct the foreign policy of the British Empire. He was careful to sidestep the Czech trap although he went far enough to increase the indignation of Hitler toward the Czechs. He instructed British Ambassador Sir Neville Henderson in Berlin on May 21, 1938, to tell the Germans that the British might fight if the Germans moved on the Czechs. Henderson was to add that France might intervene and that His Majesty's government could not guarantee that they would not be forced by circumstances to become involved also. It was a warning to Hitler but it was not a specific declaration that Great Britain would wage war for the Czechs. Henderson reported a few days afterward that British military experts had scoured the German-Czech frontier and had found no evidence of German troop concentrations. The Czech gamble failed, and it was a costly gamble. Hitler was sufficiently shrewd to see that the British had avoided a commitment to the Czechs under the dramatic circumstances created by the bold Czech mobilization move. The Czechs had tipped their hand, it was evident that they held no trumps. Hitler decided to force the issue with the Czechs in 1938, and to secure the liberation of the Sudeten Germans and the dissolution of the Czech Empire. Hitler's decision to liberate the Sudeten land Hitler had discussed with General Wilhelm Keitel on April 22, 1938, an existing routine operational plan of 1935 for possible conflict with the Czechs. Hitler issued a directive which excluded an unprovoked German attack on the Czechs. Keitel returned the revised draft to Hitler on May 20, 1938, and it contained the explicit statement that Germany had no intention to attack Czechoslovakia. The Czech war scare crisis of May 21, 1938, intervened before Hitler again returned the plan to Keitel on May 30, 1938. Hitler changed the political protocol and he added the following significant statement, It is my unalterable decision to smash Czechoslovakia by military action in the near future. General Alfred Jodl recorded in his diary on the same day that Hitler's belief that the Czech question could be settled in 1938 had produced a serious conflict of opinion between Hitler and the army general staff. This conflict was quickly exploited by a small but ambitious German underground movement in an effort to overthrow Hitler in 1938. Gerhard Ritter, the leading German expert on this question, later expressed doubt that the military putsch plan against Hitler in 1938 would have succeeded under any circumstances, and he added that it was rendered completely impossible by the current British policy of concessions to Hitler. He also recognized that there was no chance for a successful military putsch against Hitler in the period from the Munich Conference to the outbreak of World War II. The initiative was retained by Hitler during the four months from the revised military plan of May 30, 1938, until the Munich Conference of September 29-30, 1938. The Sudeten German leaders followed directives from Berlin, and they held fast to demands which the Czechs were unwilling to grant in full measure. Italy gave full diplomatic support to Germany and neither Soviet Russia on the one side nor Great Britain and France on the other displayed any enthusiasm for taking the initiative to attack Germany. The Czechs, despite the grandiose ambitions of some of their leaders, were an intensely practical people, and most of them realized that life would still be worth living if Germany returned to her traditional role as the dominant power in Central Europe. The Czechs had no taste for an isolated war against Germany, 
and they were ripe for the Anglo-French efforts of September 1938 to persuade them to surrender the Sudetenland to Germany without a struggle. Lord Halifax informed the French leaders in Paris on July 20, 1938, that a special British fact-finding mission under Lord Runciman would be sent to Czechoslovakia. The mission was announced publicly on July 26, 1938, and President Benes was disturbed by this news. It was a definite indication that the British did not intend to adopt an uncompromising policy toward Germany in the crisis. The mission completed its labours early in September 1938, and it reported that the main difficulty in the Sudeten area had been the disinclination of the Czechs to grant reforms. This development was accompanied by the final rupture of negotiations between the Sudeten German and Czech leaders. It was evident that the peak of the crisis was close at hand. President Benes delivered a defiant speech on September 10, 1938, at the time of the opening of the annual National Socialist Congress at Nuremberg across the border in Germany. The Czech president placed a bold front on the precarious Czech position. He declared that he had always been an optimist, and that his optimism was stronger than ever at the present time. Initial replies to President Benes were made by Joseph Goebbels and Hermann Göring. The principal reply came from Hitler in a major speech delivered at Nuremberg on September 12, 1938. The German leader denounced the policies of Benes since 1918 in scathing terms, and he made an appeal to the leaders of foreign states not to intervene when he settled accounts with the Czechs. He reminded the French leaders that the permanent renunciation by Germany of Alsace-Lorraine, including the ancient German city of Strasbourg, had been a major sacrifice which had been made willingly in the interest of Franco-German amity. He added that Germany was seeking to settle a limited number of problems in Europe, and that she had completely satisfactory borders in many directions. The Sport Palast Pledge of September 26, 1938 The entire diplomatic corps had been present at Nuremberg to hear Hitler. Polish Ambassador Lipski contacted State Secretary Wiesacker on September 13, 1938, to complain that he had distinctly heard Hitler say that Germany had perfectly satisfactory boundaries in all directions, and that the published version was incorrect in referring to many directions. Lipsky warned ominously that unfortunate consequences might result if this change in the version of Hitler's remarks was noticed in Poland. Wiesacker was unable to discover anyone else who had heard the words of the version Lipsky claimed Hitler had used. He requested the text which had been written before the speech was delivered, and he noted that it also contained the words many directions. This incident was brought to the attention of Hitler. Two weeks later, Hitler delivered a second major speech at the Sport Palast in Berlin, on September 26, 1938, when it seemed that Europe after all might be plunged into war over the Czech question. Hitler on that occasion made an explicit statement which was consistent with his policies, but which left him extremely vulnerable to the attacks and misrepresentations of hostile propagandists. The Berlin speech of September 26 took place in a highly charged atmosphere dominated by the slogan of Goebbels, Führer Befehl, we're Falgen. Command us, leader, and we will follow. Dot. Hitler, in explaining German policy, asserted, we have no interest in suppressing other peoples. He reminded the world that Germany was strong again after 15 terrible years, before 1933, but he insisted that she harbored no hatred toward other peoples. He emphasized the importance of a lasting German-Polish understanding in the realization of his program. He insisted that Czech rule should be terminated in the Sudeten German area, and he promised that his demand for German rule in the Sudetenland was the last territorial demand which I have to make in Europe. The Poles and the Germans knew that Germany at this time was automatically claiming the entire territory which she had lost in the East in 1918, but the world as a whole had taken no notice of this. The precedent set by Stresemann at Locarno in 1925 in refusing to recognize any of the German territorial losses to Poland had not yet been modified. It was easy for propagandists to claim that the specific German request for the return of Danzig in the following month was a violation of Hitler's solemn promise. Later, when the Czech state was disrupted in March 1939, 
the same propagandists were quick to claim that the establishment of a German protectorate in Bohemia Moravia was a violation of Hitler's promise of 1938. This was extremely effective propaganda, and it was widely believed in Germany itself. Nevertheless, it does not take full account of existing realities. Boris Silovsky, himself a Czech and the leading expert on the Czech crisis of 1938, has expressed the considered opinion that the 1918 Czech state was doomed when the Sudeten areas were amputated. The other minorities, including the Slovaks, were opposed to the continuation of Czech rule, and the total overthrow of the Prague system was merely a question of time. Hitler worked for a specific solution in the interests of Germany during the March 1939 crisis, but he did not insist that his provisional solution, which was achieved in the heat of crisis, need be permanent. He made it clear to the British leaders that he was willing afterward to discuss the ultimate solution of the Czech question in the councils of international diplomacy. If Hitler's later move to Prague was a major British grievance, it could have been discussed through normal diplomatic channels. In reality, the British in the period from March to September 1939 refused to respond to the various efforts made to raise this issue. In the meantime, the propagandists were seeking to whip people into a frenzy, and to represent Hitler, who ruled a tiny state in comparison to the great empires of Britain, Russia, and the United States, as a would-be conqueror of the world. Hungarian aspirations in Czechoslovakia The Poles and the Hungarians refrained from major efforts to settle their own claims against the Czechs until Chamberlain's visit to Hitler at Berchteskaden on September 15, 1938. Regent Horty of Hungary was invited to Germany in August 1938 to christen the German cruiser, Prince Eugen, which was named after the famous Habsburg military hero and statesman of the early 18th century. Horty was accompanied by Premier Bela Imrady and Foreign Minister Kenya. The visit was a ticklish one, because the Hungarians had instructed their special representatives to the Little Entente Conference at Bled, Yugoslavia, to promise that Hungary would not offer Germany military support in the event of a German-Czech war. On the other hand, the Hungarians expected the Germans to take great risks to return the Hungarian ethnic territory which the Czechs had seized. This meant that friction was inevitable, and Horty later complained that Hitler was less pleasant to him than at the time of his previous visit in 1936. Horty imagined that he could buy Hitler's support by offering to mediate and securing a comprehensive understanding between Germany and Poland. Horty reminded Hitler that he enjoyed intimate relations with the Poles and he made the startling proposition that he was prepared to ask Warsaw to hand over the Polish corridor to Germany. Hitler who had no intention of asking for any Polish territory, did not like this plan at all. He strongly urged Horty not to say anything about the corridor in Warsaw. Hitler informed the Hungarian leaders in no uncertain terms that he would not play their game with Czechoslovakia. He made it clear that Germany would tolerate no further provocation from the Czechs, and that a new challenge from Prague would be answered with a German invasion. He noted that both Hungary and Poland had claims against the Czechs, and he added that he would welcome their participation in a war involving Germany and Czechoslovakia. He insisted that it was necessary for Hungary and Poland to shoulder the entire initiative in pushing their claims. The Hungarians pleaded that a war would involve greater risks for a small country like Hungary than for Germany. Hitler was not impressed with this argument, and he refused to modify his position. The Hungarians approached the British on September 16, 1938 immediately after Chamberlain returned from Berchteskaden and his first meeting with Hitler. They scented British complicity in a future partition of Czechoslovakia, and they attempted to make good their rebuff in Germany by requesting British support for Magyar aspirations in Czechoslovakia. They talked boldly in London for several days of their determination to secure justice from the Czechs. One week later the European situation took a turn for the worse, after the unsuccessful talks between Hitler and Chamberlain at their second meeting in Bad Godesberg. The Hungarians responded by retreating rapidly to a more cautious and conciliatory position. British encouragement of Polish defiance at Danzig The Poles used their own method to deal with the Czechs and they maintained their initiative with an insistence and vigour foreign to Budapest. The Poles also established contact with London on September 16, 1938 on the question of territorial claims, 
but they limited their action to an informative day march. Polish Ambassador Edward Ryczynski, a young and wealthy aristocrat, was instructed to avoid protracted discussions about Polish claims, and merely to inform the British of these claims rather than to consult with them. The previous month an important conference had taken place at the Hela Peninsula on the Polish coast, between Polish Foreign Minister Beck and Alfred Duff Cooper, the British Parliamentary First Lord of the Admiralty. Beck made it clear that Poland desired closer ties with London and that she would appreciate an indication of eventual British support against Germany at Danzig. Halifax informed the Polish diplomats in London, after the return of Duff Cooper, that Great Britain would support Poland for a permanent position on the League Council, which would imply recognition of the status of Poland as a great power. He also promised that Great Britain would support Poland as much as possible at Danzig. This pledge was phrased cautiously and ambiguously, but the first step along the road toward the Anglo-Polish military alliance had been taken before the conference at Munich. The attitude of Halifax toward Danzig had passed through a remarkable evolution during recent months. On May 21, 1938, League High Commissioner Burkhardt informed the Germans that a few days earlier a Lord Halifax had termed Danzig and the corridor an absurdity, and probably the most foolish provision of the Versailles settlement. Halifax had expressed the hope that a change in the status quo might be achieved by bilateral negotiations between Germany and Poland. He told Burkhardt that he did not regard Hitler's November 5, 1937, declaration as the final German word on Danzig, and he suggested that Great Britain would be willing to mediate between Germany and Poland if an impasse was reached in negotiation between the two countries. Halifax added that he would welcome a visit to England by Albert Forster, the District National Socialist Party leader of Danzig, who subsequently went to London in response to this invitation Halifax had expressed an interest in coming to Danzig for deer hunting, and of course an invitation went to him immediately after Burkhard relayed this information. The May 1938 crisis, which was precipitated by President Benes, followed closely on the talks between Halifax and Burkhard. The invitation from Danzig Senate President Gracer for deer hunting in the forests of the Danzig state was rejected by Halifax in June 1938. In July 1938 Halifax told Victor Bircher, the chief unofficial diplomatic agent of Danzig, that Great Britain favoured the retention of the status quo at the so-called Free City. He showered Bircher with specious arguments to the effect that Danzig could play a natural role of mediator between Germany and Poland, and he urged the Danzigers to be satisfied with existing conditions. Halifax came full circle the following month when he assured the Poles that Great Britain was interested in supporting them to prevent changes at Danzig. It was evident to the Poles that this volte face was an indication of British determination to organize a coalition against Germany at some date after the Czech crisis, and that, in the British mind, Poland would be very useful in forming such a front. It was natural under these circumstances for the Poles not to humble themselves in London when informing the British of their demands against the Czechs. Polish pressure on the Czechs further information about Polish intentions reached London from Warsaw almost immediately. Sir Howard Kennard, the British ambassador in Warsaw, was well known for his enthusiastic espousal of Polish interests. Kennard's sympathy for the Polish cause was matched among the Western diplomats by that of William Bullitt, United States ambassador to France, but certainly exceeded by no one else. Kennard reported to London on September 16, 1938, that the Polish government was preparing a note which would demand self-determination for the Polish minority in Czechoslovakia. The Poles had informed the Czechs in general terms in May 1938 that Poland would present demands if the Czechs made minority concessions to other powers. The Czechs had made no concessions to other powers but the Chamberlain visit to Birch Teskeden convinced Beck that they would soon do so. Poland began to move on September 16 and she did not stop until she received her share of the Czech spoils. President Benes conformed to his usual style in dealing with the Poles. He launched a subtle attempt to appease Poland without surrendering anything tangible. On May 24, 1938, he replied to Beck's original demand for equal treatment with the bland assurance that Poland would receive it. He did not plan to surrender anything to Germany at that time, and his response did not imply that he intended to cede territory to the Poles. 
French Foreign Minister Bonnet attempted to settle the differences between Poland and Czechoslovakia, and he later blamed Poland for the lack of close contact between Paris and Warsaw during the Czech crisis. The British historian, Louis Bernstein Namier, later claimed that Bonnet was at fault in failing to obtain Polish cooperation with the Czechs, but Bonnet effectively defended his position against his charge in the London Times Literary Supplement. Poland throughout the Czech crisis insisted that nothing less than the surrender of territory by the Czechs to the Poles would make the discussion of Polish assistance feasible. This proposition, when suggested at Prague by the French, did not stimulate whatever Czech desire there was to fight the Germans. The bitter rivalry between Prague and Warsaw prompted many Czechs to prefer the surrender of everything to Germany rather than one village to Poland. Ryczynski delivered a formal note in London on September 19, 1938, which described the Polish position against the Czechs. There was some speculation that Poland and Germany had a previous secret understanding in the Czech question, but this was not so. In reality, there was no contact at all between the Germans and the Poles in their respective efforts against the Czechs unless one regards as an understanding the fact that German and Polish leaders had told one another for years how much they detested Czechoslovakia. A government-inspired Polish pressure group, the OZON, Camp of National Unity created by Colonel Adam Koc, which would have replaced the existing Polish political parties had it been more successful, was stirring up anti-Czech feeling in Poland and its propaganda in this instance was conspicuously successful. Kennard was obliged to concede that Poland might intervene on the German side in the event of a German-Czech war. The British responded by delivering identical notes to the Hungarians and Poles which warned them to remain aloof from the current crisis. The gesture had no effect on the Poles, who indignantly brushed aside the British warning. The Hungarian leaders, who had returned at this moment from a second unsuccessful mission to Hitler, were further shaken in their confidence by the British stand Kennard understood that the Poles were sensitive about their alleged great power status, and he was appalled by the tactlessness of Halifax in sending identical notes to Warsaw and Budapest. He expressed his displeasure in a report to the British Foreign Office on September 22, 1938 and he simultaneously attempted to present Polish policy in a more favourable light in London. Kennard suggested that anti-German feeling in Hungary was too weak to be useful to Great Britain, but he insisted that in Poland there was a great reservoir of hatred against the Germans. He argued that it was a vital British interest to augment this hatred rather than to diffuse it by carelessly insulting Warsaw as Halifax had done. Kennard also reported that the Poles were not bluffing and that they had pushed their military preparations against the Czechs to an advanced stage. Beck revenged himself on Halifax for the mere carbon copy of a note addressed to Hungary. He replied to Halifax haughtily on September 22, 1938, that he had no reason to discuss with the British any measures he might deem advisable in securing legitimate Polish interests. Beck believed that he had an impregnable basis for this reply because Great Britain had no commitment toward Czechoslovakia. The Soviet threat to Poland Beck wished to remain abreast of Germany in dealing with the Czechs without getting ahead of her. He knew the next step was an ultimatum with a time limit, but he believed the Czechs might surrender to Germany in exchange for German support if they received a Polish ultimatum. The Poles in a few days had reached the same point as the Germans in a crisis which had lasted nearly five months. Beck decided to advance no further until the Germans made their next move. As a result, an extremely tense but stagnant period in the Czech-Polish crisis arrived. Great Britain had been excluded from further contact with Poland in the crisis by Beck's brusque retort to Halifax, but contact between Poland and France remained close. Bonnet decided to make a last effort to secure a détente and then a rapprochement between Warsaw and Prague. At the very moment he launched this delicate maneuver, a third French ally, the Soviet Union, sent a thundering warning to Warsaw on September 23, 1938. The Poles were told that intervention against the Czechs would cause Russia to repudiate the Russo-Polish Non-Aggression Pact of 1932 and would lead to unforeseeable consequences. Beck's first reaction was to believe that the Russians were bluffing, and he replied defiantly to the Russian note. The failure of Benes to deceive Beck the specific incident which prompted the Russian démarche was Beck's repudiation on September 21, 1938, 
of the 1925 Polish-Czech Minorities Treaty. This had been accompanied by the announcement that Poland would take active measures to secure the welfare of the Poles beyond the Czech frontier. Bonnet used this development as a point of departure in his final mediation effort. His first step was to inquire in Warsaw whether Poland had concluded an agreement with Germany concerning Czechoslovakia, and whether Polish claims against the Czechs were limited to Teschen or also included other areas. Beck and Miroslaw Arkiziski, a leading Polish diplomat who had returned from a mission in Romania to assist Beck during the crisis, drafted a note to the French and forwarded it to Polish ambassador Julius Lukasi which in Paris. The Polish note was elaborate in assurances of good faith, but was evasive. It did not answer the two questions of Bonnet. The Polish position was clarified verbally in Warsaw on September 24 by Marshal Smigli Rydz, who granted an audience to French Ambassador Leon Noel with the approval of Beck. The marshal assured Noel that Poland had no agreement with Germany on Czechoslovakia, and he claimed that Polish aspirations were limited to the Teschen area. He declared that Czechoslovakia would be attacked if Polish demands were not accepted, but he added that a Polish invasion would be confined as closely as possible to the area Poland intended to annex from the Czechs. The second move of Bonnet was to apply pressure on President Benes to make concessions to the Poles. Benes responded promptly but in characteristic fashion. He wrote a letter to Beck which was delivered in Warsaw on September 26, 1938. He agreed in principle to cede Teschen to Poland if the Poles supported Czechoslovakia in a war against Germany. Beck was not satisfied with this offer, and he observed with indignation that an agreement in principle from Benes was not worth the paper on which it was written. Nevertheless, he was in close contact with the French, and he decided to make an effort to reach an agreement with the Czechs along the lines advocated by Bonnet. Beck informed the Czechs that the matter could be settled if they would turn the Teschen territory over to Poland without delay. They could count on full Polish assistance against Germany if they accepted this proposition, and if France fulfilled her obligations to the Czechs. This left scant room for maneuver to Benes, who was insincere in his offer to Poland. The Czech president replied with the feeble excuse that the railway system in Teschen territory occupied an important place in the Czech operational plan against Germany. He insisted that it would not be possible to surrender Teschen to Poland until Germany had been defeated in the approaching war. Beck promptly disrupted negotiations when he received this revealing reply. This development took place at the peak of the Seven Days Crisis in Europe which followed the failure of the initial Bad Godesberg talks between Chamberlain and Hitler on September 22, 1938. Bullet was in close contact with Lukasiewicz at Paris during these trying days. Lukasiewicz received Bullet at the Polish embassy on September 25, 1938, to inform him that the Polish government had changed its attitude about the current crisis. They had believed that there would be no war, but now they believed that war would occur. Lukasi which insisted that a conflict would be a war of religion between fascism and Bolshevism, with Benes as the agent of Moscow. Lukasi which confided to the American ambassador that Poland would invade Slovakia in addition to Teschen if Germany advanced against the Czechs. It would be a primary Polish aim to establish a common front with friendly Hungary. The Polish diplomat believed that a Russian attack on Poland would follow this move, but he claimed that Poland did not fear it. He predicted that in three months Russia would be routed by Germany and Poland and he insisted that the Soviet Union was a hell of warring factions. Bullet accused Poland of betraying France, but Lukasi which denied this charge. He said that Poland would not make war on France, but that, if France, Great Britain, and the United States supported the Czechs, the Western powers would be the tools of Bolshevism. Lukasi which urged Bullet, who was friendly to Poland, to seek the support of President Roosevelt for territorial revision in favor of Poland and Hungary. He also told Bullet that he could repeat any or all of these remarks to the French Foreign Office. Bullet concluded that Poland would inevitably attack Czechoslovakia when Germany did, unless territorial concessions were made to the Poles. Bullet realized when he received a report from American Ambassador Kennedy in London on September 25, 1938 that the Poles were speaking the same language everywhere. 
Polish Ambassador Ryczynski claimed to Kennedy that British and French attitudes in support of Czechoslovakia had caused Poland to become the little cousin of Hitler. Ryczynski declared that Poland and Hungary believed that Hitler's position at Bad Godesberg had been correct and that the British were to blame for the impasse which had been reached, because they did not take account of the urgency of the situation and the importance of Polish and Hungarian claims. It was known that Hitler had chided Chamberlain at Bad Godesberg for failing to take these issues into account. Kennedy complained to Bullitt that Ryczynski was seeking to propagandize him, which was doubtless true. A further conversation with Lukasi which on September 26, 1938, convinced Bullitt that the Polish position would not change. The Polish diplomat asserted that Germany, Poland and Hungary would act in unison in imposing their will in Czechoslovakia. Bullitt also had received confirmation of the Polish attitude from Czech ambassador Stefan Osiski. Bullitt was extremely excited, and he was indignant with Bonnet who obviously believed that the destruction of Czechoslovakia was a feasible price to avoid war. Bullet reported scornfully to Roosevelt that Bonnet was for peace at any price, and he followed this up with a further dispatch containing a host of unkind comments about the French foreign minister. Bonnet's initiative to secure a Polish-Czech rapprochement had failed, but this was not because Poland had modified her original offer to collaborate with France and Czechoslovakia. Beck's stand was identical toward the Czechs and the French. The difficulty was that Benes agreed to surrender territory to Germany after the chamberlain hitler birch teskeden conference, but he was unwilling to cede the Teschen area to Poland. It was evident that only a Polish ultimatum with a time limit would resolve the issue of whether or not there would be a Czech-Polish war in 1938. The failure of the Czechs to accept Polish demands in the interest of creating a common front against Germany caused astonishment in many quarters. German Ambassador Maltka in Warsaw observed to Jan Zembeck on September 24, 1938, that Polish demands were modest and easy to satisfy compared to Germany's interest in the entire Sudetenland, and so it would seem, if one ignored the fact of bitter Czech-Polish rivalry. The Munich Conference Maltka was no less astonished when Mussolini launched a last-minute mediation effort on September 28, 1938, which banished the danger of war over the Sudeten question, and brought the German-Czech crisis to a close. Sir Horace Wilson, who had served Prime Minister Chamberlain in various capacities over many years, had been sent to Berlin on a special mission on September 26, 1938, the day of Hitler's Sport Palast speech. Wilson's instructions were inadequate to permit him to resolve the Anglo-German differences which had been created at Bad Godesberg on September 22-24, 1938. Hitler resented the fact that Chamberlain wished to arrange the entire program of events in Czechoslovakia himself, and Chamberlain in turn was annoyed by Hitler's effort to impose several conditions in the matter. Although the last conversations between the two leaders in Bad Godesberg had been conciliatory, the realization of a definite agreement on the Czech crisis had not been attained. Wilson discussed the situation with Hitler a second time on September 27, 1938. The main gist of Wilson's remarks was that there would be an Anglo-German war unless Hitler retreated. Wilson did not say this very explicitly, but Hitler helped him by cutting through the niceties of fulfilling treaty obligations and the like. He said that what Wilson meant was that if France decided to attack Germany, Great Britain would also attack Germany. He informed Wilson that he understood the situation and that he would take note of this communication. The Wilson mission had failed to break the impasse. Hitler and the British leaders were equally anxious to avoid a conflict despite the stubborn nature of their respective comments at this late stage of the crisis. Chamberlain appealed to Mussolini to do something at 11.30 a.m. on September 28, 1938. The effect was magical and Hitler did not hesitate. The British ambassador was able to telephone London at 3.15 p.m. on September 28, 1938, that Hitler wished to invite Chamberlain, Dalatier, and Mussolini to Munich on the next day to discuss a peaceful solution of the Czech problem. The British Prime Minister received this news while delivering a tense speech to the House of Commons on the imminent danger of war. When he announced the news of Hitler's invitation and of his intention to accept, he received the greatest ovation in the history of the British Parliament. 
The Bavarian city of Munich was wild with enthusiasm for peace when the European leaders arrived to negotiate on September 29, 1938. There was no appreciable enthusiasm for war in any of the European countries after the terrible experience of World War I, and in the light of the horrors of modern conflict currently revealed by the civil war in Spain. A number of factors produced the Munich meeting. There was the strenuous initiative of Chamberlain to persuade the Czechs to capitulate. There was the patience of Dalatier in agreeing to accept whatever his British ally could achieve. There was the restraint of Hitler in modifying his demands, and in resisting the temptation to strike at a time most favourable to win a war. Hitler was convinced that war in Europe need not be regarded as inevitable, otherwise he would never have invited the foreign leaders to Munich. There was the mediation of Mussolini, and the conviction that the respective parties were too close to an agreement to ruin everything by an unnecessary war. Never was an agreement more clearly in the interest of all powers concerned. Great Britain had one time to continue to gain on the German lead in aerial armament. France extricated herself from the danger of a desperate war after having abandoned her military hegemony in Europe in 1936. Italy was spared the danger of involvement in a war when she was woefully unprepared. Germany won a great bloodless victory in her program of peaceful territorial revision. By resisting the temptation to fight merely because she had the momentary military advantage, she increased her stature and prestige. As A.J.P. Taylor put it, the demonstration had been given that Germany could attain by peaceful negotiation the position in Europe to which her resources entitled her. Czech representatives in Munich were informed of developments, but they were not allowed to participate in deliberations, and there were no Hungarian or Polish representatives present. Winston Churchill later argued that French honour had been compromised at Munich because France had a formal obligation to defend the Czechs. It has been seen that this was not the view of Bonnet, and it is necessary to add that France, despite the pressure she imposed, might have aided the Czechs had they gambled again and actually resisted Germany. This situation never arose in reality. The Czechs had a young state which had been created by the efforts of others rather than by some fierce struggle for independence. Their state had been launched into a turbulent world under the problematical leadership of Masaryk and Benes. They had been associated politically for hundreds of years either with Germany or Austria. They were surrounded by enemies in 1938 and their defeat in a war was inevitable. Their surrender under these circumstances might not satisfy the honor requirements of armchair chauvinists, but it was a wise move. The Czechs might have emerged from World War II in excellent shape had the later diplomacy of Benes, Churchill and Roosevelt not permitted the communists to dominate the Czech people, and to incite them in 1945 to deeds of horror and violence against the masses of unarmed Slovaks, Hungarians and Germans. The Polish ultimatum to Czechoslovakia the Poles were extremely irritated by the Munich Conference, and that the revival of cooperation among the principal non-communist powers of Europe. Hitler, after achieving his own success, took an indulgent view at Munich toward Polish and Hungarian claims, but the idea of the powers discussing an issue of Polish foreign policy in the absence of Poland was anathema to Beck. It violated Pilsudski's principal maxim on foreign policy, nothing about us without us. Beck did not wait to learn the results of the Munich deliberations. On the evening of September 30, 1938, he submitted an ultimatum to Prague demanding the town of Teschen and its surrounding district by noon on Sunday, October 2. He also demanded the surrender within ten days of the remaining hinterland claimed by Poland. Beck warned that if a Czech note of compliance was not received by noon on October 1, Poland would not be responsible for the consequences. The ultimatum gave the Czechs merely a few hours to decide on their reply. The Czechs hastened to capitulate, and their reply was received in Warsaw ahead of the deadline. Beck's action worried Kennard, who feared that his beloved Poles were jeopardizing their reputation abroad. He lectured Beck on the dangers of military action, and he added that if the Polish government proceeded to direct action they would draw upon themselves the serious reprobation of the whole world, which had only just emerged from a crisis of a far greater nature. It is amusing to note that in British diplomatic language the attitude of the British Empire, which meant the small proportion of people who were the masters of that empire together with the friends of Britain at the moment, 
was supposed to be equivalent to the attitude of the entire world. British diplomats modified this at times, and referred to the attitude of the entire civilized world. It is almost unnecessary to observe that Kennett's lecture produced not the slightest effect on Beck. Lord Halifax was annoyed. His instructions to Kennard at 10 p.m. on September 30, indicated that he had taken no notice of Pulsutsky's maxim of nothing about us without us, although this maxim had been reiterated publicly by Beck on innumerable occasions. Halifax observed that the Munich Conference had recognized the necessity of settling Hungarian and Polish claims, and that the Polish government would be very short-sighted and ill-advised to take the law into their own hands instead of basing their policy on the four powers. This ignored the fact that the Munich powers also had taken the law into their own hands. Halifax complained that with an ultimatum threatening occupation by force the Poles put themselves entirely in the wrong. In all fairness, it should be recalled that the Czechs had not obtained the region in the first place by sending bouquets to Warsaw. The Polish government disagreed with Halifax and believed it would place itself in the wrong if it waited for the crumbs to be swept from the Munich conference table. German support to Poland against the Soviet Union German claims had been settled at Munich, and Beck knew that he was vulnerable. Major incidents and even air battles had taken place on the Russo-Polish frontier in recent days. Beck had become less confident that the Russians were bluffing. His two main fears were that Russia would attack him in the rear, and that the Czechs would receive German support by some additional concessions to Germany, of which he believed them totally capable. Beck badly needed some assurance of foreign support. The British attitude was momentarily hostile, and it would be too much to expect the French to support him against their Czech ally. There remained only Germany, and Beck decided to act upon this fact. German-Polish cooperation under the 1934 pact reached a new summit at this moment. Beck summoned Maltka on the evening of September 30, 1938, and announced that he was delivering an ultimatum to the Czechs. He wished to know if Germany would maintain a benevolent attitude during a Polish-Czech war. He added that he also wanted German support in the event of an attack on Poland by the Soviet Union. Beck assured Maltka with warmth that he was grateful for the loyal German attitude toward Poland during the Munich Conference and for the sincerity of relations during the Czech conflict. Beck was frank in his evaluation of the German policy, but the sincerity of relations sounds ironical when one considers that a few days earlier Poland was discussing the conditions under which she would attack Germany. Hitler immediately gave Beck all the protection he desired. The French had led a day march in Warsaw protesting the Polish ultimatum, and Italy had participated in this step. Ribbentrop responded by telephoning Italian Foreign Minister Chano to inform him that Germany was in full sympathy with the Polish position. He told Chano that the Poles had informed him of terrible conditions in the Teshin territory, and he reminded him that 240,000 Germans had been expelled from the Sudetenland during the recent crisis. He concluded that Chano would understand if Germany did not care to use the same language as Italy at Warsaw. Ribbentrop did everything possible to comfort the Poles. He told Lipsky that he believed the Czechs would submit quickly. He promised that Germany would adopt a benevolent attitude if Poland had to invade Czechoslovakia to secure her claims. He had Hitler's consent to inform Lipsky that Germany would adopt a benevolent attitude toward Poland in a Russo-Polish war. He made it clear that this benevolent attitude was tantamount to giving Poland everything she might require in such a conflict. He added that a Russian invasion would create a new situation in which Germany would not be inhibited by the attitude of the other Munich powers. German support to Poland was instant, unequivocal, and complete. Bullet in Paris was no less dismayed by the Polish attitude than Kennard. He persuaded the British to intervene again in the Teshin question, before Czech willingness to comply with Polish demands had become generally known. He pleaded with British Ambassador Eric Phipps, in Paris on October 1, that if he had more time he would propose intervention in Warsaw by President Roosevelt, but that Chamberlain was the only person who could act under existing circumstances. The British Prime Minister responded to this suggestion. He was preparing a message to Beck when a confused report arrived from British Minister Newton in Prague that the Czechs had rejected the Polish ultimatum and would resist force. The prospect of this disaster stiffened Chamberlain's message to Beck. 
He warned the Poles not to use force if the Czechs rejected their ultimatum, and he added that it was quite inadmissible for Poland to insist on taking matters into her own hands. Word arrived in London shortly after Chamberlain's message to Beck that the Czechs had capitulated. Newton was acutely embarrassed. He complained angrily that the speed of the surrender was a great surprise after the brave words which had been spoken in Prague. He observed contemptuously that the Czech spirit seems indeed somewhat broken, and his disappointment that the Czechs would not fight Poland was obvious. Nevertheless, it seems understandable that the Czechs had little stomach for a hopeless contest against the Poles after having been denied support against Germany. The Czech crisis which culminated in the Munich Conference passed the acute stage with the settlement of the Polish demand for Teschen. It was obvious that the Hungarians would not dare to act against the Czechs as Poland had done. Events had moved rapidly in a direction not at all to the liking of the Soviet Union. After a luncheon with Soviet Foreign Commissar Litvinov at the Paris Soviet Embassy on October 1, 1938, Bonnet speculated that the Soviet Union might denounce the Franco-Russian alliance. Litvinov was especially furious about Chamberlain. He complained that Chamberlain should not have been allowed to go to Birch Teskeden or Bad Godesberg, but that these two mistakes were as nothing compared to the enormity of Munich. Litvinov insisted passionately that Hitler had been bluffing, and that he could have been forced to retreat without serious danger of war. Bonnet held exactly the opposite view. He gently pointed out that France wished to be on decent terms with Germany, Italy, and Franco-Spain. He was aware that these nations were objectionable to Russia, but they also were the immediate neighbors of France, and he would not permit the Soviet Union to dictate French policy. Litvinov did not have the satisfaction of seeing his French guest seriously perturbed by the outcome of the recent crisis. Bonnet was concentrating on developing a new policy to meet the new circumstances. Anglo-German treaty accepted by Hitler There was a dramatic epilogue to the Munich Conference in which Chamberlain and Hitler were the principal figures. Chamberlain proposed a private meeting at Hitler's Prince Regentenstrasse apartment in Munich on September 30, 1938, at which Hitler's interpreter, Paul Schmidt, was the only third party. The British Prime Minister and the German leader discussed the European situation at length. In Schmidt's record of the conversation, which was confirmed in its authenticity by Chamberlain, Hitler declared that the most difficult problem of all had now been concluded and his own main task had been happily fulfilled. Chamberlain said that if the Czechs nevertheless resisted, he hoped there would be no air attacks on women and children. This was ironical when one considers that Chamberlain knew the British Air Force, in contrast to the German strategy of tactical air support to the ground forces was basing its strategy on concentrated air attacks against civilian centers in a future war. Hitler was not aware of this, and he insisted emphatically that he was opposed in every event to such air attacks, which would never be employed by Germany except in retaliation. Chamberlain and Hitler discussed the problem of arms limitation, and they agreed that there might be some future prospect for this. Hitler emphasized that he was primarily worried about the Soviet Union and by the communist ideology which the Russians were seeking to export to the entire world. He was concerned because Poland refused to define her position toward the Soviet Union, and he observed that Poland intervenes geographically between Germany and Russia, but he had no very clear idea of her powers of resistance. The two leaders discussed trade relations, but they were far apart on this issue. Hitler deprecated the importance of international loans in stimulating trade, or the need for uniform tariff policies toward all nations. This attitude was questioned by Chamberlain. When the conversation was ending, Chamberlain suddenly asked Hitler if he would sign a declaration of Anglo-German friendship. There is a legend that Hitler signed this document without having it translated, but it is entirely untrue. After Hitler had listened to the terms, he signed without hesitation the two copies of the treaty in the English language which Chamberlain presented to him. Chamberlain signed both copies and returned one to Hitler. The agreement contained the following terms, We, the German Führer and Chancellor and the British Prime Minister, have had a further meeting today and are agreed in recognizing that the question of Anglo-German relations is of first importance for the two countries and for Europe. 
we regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as a symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. We are resolved that the method of consultation shall be the method adopted to deal with any other questions that may concern our two countries, and we are determined to continue our efforts to remove possible sources of difference and thus to contribute to assure the peace of Europe. This important agreement might have become the cornerstone for the preservation of peace in Europe and for the defense of Europe against communism. It was accepted by Hitler without reservations, and by Chamberlain with reservations which were certain to become more vigorous when he returned to English soil. Many prominent Englishmen entertained a variety of superstitions, both old and new, about Germany which were not conducive to the preservation of peace. It was Hitler's problem to cope with this situation while carrying out his program, and it will be evident later, in the evaluation of the British scene after Munich, that the odds for success were not favorable. The initiative for the agreement came from Chamberlain, who knew that it would be a trump to show his critics at home. This does not alter the fact that Chamberlain was ambivalent and Hitler single-minded about it. Hitler's unique achievements in Austria and Czechoslovakia in 1938, which consisted of territorial revisions without force, would not have been possible had the British favored war that year. The greatest single misfortune in 1939 was the changed British attitude in favor of war. Chapter 6 A German offer to Poland Germany's perilous position after Munich The victory of Hitler at Munich convinced the last skeptic that Germany had regained her traditional position as the dominant power in Central Europe. This position had been occupied by France in the years after the German defeat in 1918. Hitler challenged French military hegemony in the area when he reoccupied the German Rhineland in 1936. The acquisition of 10 million Germans in Austria and Czechoslovakia in 1938 greatly improved the German strategic position toward the east and the south. Germany established new common frontiers with Italy, Hungary, and Yugoslavia. The Italian sphere of influence in Central Europe north of the Brenner Pass was demolished, and the French and Soviet sphere of influence in Czechoslovakia was insignificant after the Czechs lost the strategic natural frontier of Bohemia with its elaborate fortifications. The German Reich after Munich had a population of 78 million Germans. The principal neighbors of Germany in Europe were France, Italy, and Poland. The Germans were almost twice as numerous as the Italians, nearly twice as numerous as the French, and approximately four times as numerous as the Poles, when one discounts the Ukrainians and other eastern minorities of the Polish state, whose loyalty was extremely dubious. Industrial capacity had become the decisive criterion in measuring a modern power, and Germany was many times stronger in this respect than any of her immediate neighbors. The German people were noted for their energy, vigor, and martial valor. The fact that Germany was the leading power in Central Europe was no less logical or natural than was the dominant role of the United States on the North American continent. The United States enjoyed her position for much the same reasons. Nevertheless, the situation of Germany after Munich was precarious to an extent which had been unknown in the United States for many generations. It is not surprising under these circumstances that it was difficult, if not impossible, for Americans in 1938 to understand the problems which confronted Germany. The impressive and seemingly impregnable position of Germany, which had been created by Bismarck in 1871 following Prussian victories in three wars, had been shattered by the single defeat of 1918. The defeat of Germany had been exploited so thoroughly that it seemed unlikely for many years that the Germans would recover their former position. The leading role of the Germans in Central Europe had existed for many centuries before the defeat and emasculation of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation in 1648. More than two centuries elapsed before the new German state created by Bismarck in 1871 restored the traditional German position, although it is true that the Prussian state alone was sufficiently powerful to obtain recognition as a major European power during the interim period. The Hohenzollern Empire lasted only from 1871 to 1918. It was clear that the ability of Germany to occupy her rightful place in Europe had become problematical for a number of reasons, some obscure. Although Germany after Munich could doubtless have coped with a combined attack from all of her immediate neighbors on land. 
she had to face the elementary possibility that she might be attacked by an overwhelming coalition of distant powers, if she became involved in a conflict with any of her immediate neighbors. The Baghdad Railway Question The last direct point of friction between Germany and the British Empire in the years before World War I, had been settled by peaceful negotiation in June 1914. This did not prevent Great Britain, the dominant naval power of the world, from attacking Germany a few weeks later, or from inflicting an unrestricted blockade on an industrial nation, which did not enjoy any degree of self-sufficiency. It did not prevent Japan from attacking Germany in 1914, although there was no direct point of conflict between Germany and Japan. It did not prevent the United States from holding Germany to strict accountability in the conduct of naval warfare, and from accepting gross violations of maritime international law when they were British. In 1917 the United States declared war on Germany on the specious plea that the Germans were violating the same freedom of the seas which the British failed to recognize. The British refused to conclude the armistice in 1918 until point two about freedom of the seas was dropped from President Wilson's program, and there were never any American protests about British unrestricted submarine warfare in the Baltic Sea during World War I. It was this coalition of distant powers which made inevitable the defeat of Germany in World War I. There was no appreciable difference between the German situation of 1914 and 1938 except that Hitler had learned from experience. It was no longer possible to accept the facile proposition that Germany was secure, merely because she could cope with attacks from her immediate neighbors in the West or in the East. The Soviet Union was a gigantic unknown factor in the world power relationships of 1938. The attitude of the British Empire toward Germany was problematical. The British leaders warned Germany repeatedly in 1938 that they might not remain aloof from a conflict involving Germany and some third power. The United States since 1900 was usually inclined to follow the British lead in foreign policy, and there could be no certain guarantee that the United States would remain aloof from a new Anglo-German war. Hitler correctly recognized the British attitude as the crux of the entire situation. Neither the United States nor the Soviet Union was likely to attack Germany unless she became ensnared in a new conflict with Great Britain. Hitler knew that Germany had nothing to gain in a war with the British, but he feared the anti-Germanism of the British leaders. His sole ally in this situation was British public opinion. The British public would not be likely to support a war against Germany unless it was accompanied by some seemingly plausible pretext. But if Hitler became involved in some local European conflict, the British leaders might convince their public opinion that Germany had embarked on a program of unlimited conquest which threatened British security. The inadequacy of German armament Winston Churchill and other British bellicists circulated the greatest possible amount of nonsense about the current German armament program, and the British leaders in power were not averse to this exaggerated notion of German military strength. It was useful in gaining support for the current British armament program. But Burton Klein has pointed out that Hitler himself opposed large defence expenditures throughout the decade from 1933 to 1943, and that Germany, with her large industrial capacity, might easily have developed a much more adequate defence program. Many people in Great Britain were astonished to learn later that Great Britain and Germany were producing approximately the same number of military aircraft each month when World War II came in 1939. It was more surprising still that Great Britain was producing 50 more armoured tanks each month than Germany. Great Britain and France greatly outnumbered Germany in this important category of mechanised armament when France fell in 1940. German public finance before 1939 was conservative compared to the United States and Great Britain, and large-scale public borrowing was not undertaken in Germany. Public expenditure in Germany increased from 15 billion marks, $3.75 billion, in 1933 to 39 billion marks, $9.75 billion, in 1938, but more than 80% of this outlay was raised by current taxation. The value of German gross national production during the same period increased from 59 billion marks, $14.75 billion, to 105 billion marks, $26.25 billion. There was merely a slight rise in prices, 
and there was a higher level of German private consumption and investment in 1938 than in the peak year of 1929. Hitler declared in a speech on September 1, 1939, that 90 billion marks, $22.5 billion, had been spent on defense by Germany since he had been appointed Chancellor on January 30, 1933. Hitler, in arriving at this figure, included items of public expenditure which had nothing to do with arms, and which would not have met the later official definition of the War Production Board in the United States. He was seeking to use intimidation to dissuade the British and French from attacking Germany. It is ironical that the League of Nations experts on armaments at Geneva were willing in this instance to accept Hitler's statement at face value, although they were skeptical about his remarks on every other occasion. In reality, Germany spent 55 billion marks, $13.75 billion, on military defense during the period of nearly seven years from January 1933 until the outbreak of World War II. It was said that Germany entered World War II with a guns and butter philosophy. In the last peacetime year, 1938 to 1939, 16 billion marks, $4 billion, or 15% of the German gross national product was spent on military preparation. The volume of arms expense in the United States during the last American peacetime year from December 1940 to December 1941 was much higher although American critics claimed that the United States was woefully unprepared when Japan struck at Pearl Harbor. The Germans, on the other hand, had allegedly done everything humanly possible to prepare for war before the outbreak of World War II. In reality, Germany was spending a large proportion of public funds on municipal improvements and public buildings when war came. Hitler believed that Germany needed immediate military superiority over France and Great Britain to intimidate them for a short period from intervening against Germany while he completed his program of territorial revision, but he hoped to avoid war against a coalition of major powers. Nearly one half of the total German expense on arms during the last year of peace went to the Air Force, but the British leaders were confident during the same period that they were gaining rapidly on Germany in the air. The favorable position of Great Britain the British leaders had a problem of national security, but their situation was more favorable than that of Hitler. In 1938 Great Britain was at a temporary disadvantage toward Germany in the air, but the prospects for successful air defense against the Germans were extremely favorable in 1939. Germany had few submarines, and the British Navy was overwhelmingly powerful compared to the German Navy. The insular position of Great Britain offered an admirable defense against the employment of German land forces. In contrast to Germany, the British did not have to face the peril of an invasion from the Soviet Union in the event of a Western European war. They were backed by the tremendous resources of the British Empire and the United States. Had Hitler been determined to crush Great Britain, he would have had to recognize that the British strategic situation was superior to his own. Hitler had no intention to attack Great Britain. The British leaders could have remained neutral in any European conflict involving Germany without jeopardizing British security. The main danger in 1938 and 1939 was that Great Britain would attack Germany and seek to crush her completely. This would lead to involvement in a protracted war, which would exhaust British resources and expose the British Empire to the forces of disintegration. This is what later happened. The British strategic position was good in 1939, but it was sacrificed unnecessarily. The principal benefactor was the Soviet Union, the mortal enemy of the British Empire. This dread development was one which Hitler hoped to avoid. It seemed to him that German security would not be complete until Germany attained comprehensive understandings with her principal neighbors. He recognized that such understandings would demand a price. He was prepared to abandon the Germans south of the Brenner Pass to Italy, and to France he conceded the problematical Germans of Alsace-Lorraine, who seemed to long for Germany when they were French and for France when they were German. He hoped for an alliance with Italy, and after the Munich Conference he sought to attain a Franco-German declaration of friendship similar to the one which he had signed with Chamberlain at Munich. Hitler's generous attitude toward Poland Poland was the third principal neighbor of Germany and she was the sole neighboring power with which Germany was in direct danger of conflict after the Munich Conference.
the problem of Danzig and the German-Polish frontier was more dangerous than that of Bosnia-Herzegovina before 1914. The position of Poland between Germany and her principal adversary, the Soviet Union, was one of paramount importance. It seemed to Hitler that the clarification of German-Polish relations was an absolute necessity. A policy of aimless drifting from one unexpected crisis to another had led to the ruin of Germany in World War I. Hitler believed that this vicious pattern had to be broken, and it is not surprising that he wished to establish German security on a rock-like foundation after the harrowing German experiences since 1900. Hitler's concern would have been intensified had he known of the secret Anglo-Polish negotiations of August 1938 to frustrate German aspirations at Danzig. He was greatly concerned as it was. He harbored no animosity toward Poland, and this is astonishing when one considers the bitter legacy of German-Polish relations from the 1918-1934 period, or the attitudes of the Polish leaders. He was prepared to pay a high price for Polish friendship, and, indeed, to pay a much higher price to the Poles than to either Italy or France. The renunciation of every piece of German territory lost to Poland since 1918 would have been unthinkable to Gustav Stresemann and the leaders of the Weimar Republic. Hitler was prepared to pay this price, and he believed that the favorable moment for a settlement had arrived after the close and unprecedented German-Polish cooperation in the latest phase of the Czech crisis. Hitler was inclined to be confident when he approached Poland with a comprehensive offer a few weeks after the Munich Conference. He was warned in vague terms by Ambassador Maltka in Warsaw that a settlement would not be easy, but no one outside of Poland could have known that his generous proposals would actually be received with scorn. Further Polish aspirations in Czechoslovakia The further development of the Czech situation was a minor theme compared to the issue of a German-Polish settlement, but the Czech and Polish issues remained closely linked for many months, and it is impossible to consider one without the other. The hyphenated name Czechoslovakia was adopted by law at Prague, shortly after the Munich Conference, as the official name to designate the Czech state. This was part of a series of half-hearted Czech appeasement measures to the Slovaks. It was evident immediately after Poland's success in the Teshin question that Polish leaders were eager to realize other objectives in Czechoslovakia. These objectives were three in number, and not easily compatible. The Poles hoped to see Slovakia emerge immediately from Czech rule as an independent state. The prospect for this development was not good. The Slovakian nationalist movement had been ruthlessly suppressed by the Czechs after President Thomas Masaryk had betrayed the promises for Slovak autonomy contained in the Pittsburgh Agreement of 1918. It was obvious that time would be required before the Slovak nationalist movement could successfully reassert itself. Joseph Tiso and Karol Sitter, the two principal leaders of Slovak nationalism in 1938, were unable to command a single-minded following. Most Slovaks were opposed to the continuation of Czech rule, but they were divided into three conflicting groups. An influential group favoured the return of Slovakia to Hungary, but the timidity of the Magyars was so great that no effective support could be expected from Budapest. Another group, of which Sitter was the principal spokesman, favoured a close association between Slovakia and Poland and even a Polish protectorate. A third group, of which Tiso was the outstanding leader, favoured a completely independent Slovakia, but they were doubtful if such a state could survive without strong protection from some neighbouring power. When one includes the High Assist movement, which was PROCZEK, the Slovaks were divided into no less than four schools of thought on the fundamental question of their future existence. Slovakia was a backward agrarian country with a mixed ethnic population. It was too much to expect Slovakia to declare her independence the moment Czech power was weakened. Polish disappointment was inevitable when the Slovaks failed to respond as expected. The Polish High Commissioner in Danzig, Marjan Kodaki, exclaimed to Jan Zembek at the Polish Foreign Office on October 11, 1938 that Slovakia and Ruthenia would become instruments of German eastward expansion unless they were quickly separated from Czech rule. There was always the possibility of direct Polish intervention if the Slovaks failed to act for themselves, but the Polish military leaders expressed a negative attitude toward this project. The idea of a Poland eventually extending from the Danube River to the Dvina River was attractive to the military men, 
but they claimed that a conflict with Germany was likely, and they believed that a Polish protectorate in Slovakia would be bad strategy. The Carpathian Mountains, in their estimation, formed the most important natural frontier of Poland, and they argued that the Polish position would become overextended if Polish troops were sent to occupy the land beyond the mountains. Many foreign observers were aware that a Slovakian crisis was likely in the near future. Truman Smith, the American military attaché in Berlin, sent a valuable report to President Roosevelt on October 5, 1938, concerning the strategic situation in Europe after the Munich Conference. His report was accompanied by a prediction from Ambassador Hugh Wilson suggesting that Hitler in the near future might support Italy in some important question out of gratitude for Mussolini's mediation at Munich, because the outstanding characteristic of Hitler in standing by his friends is well known. Smith explained to Roosevelt that Hitler's hope and wish is to retain Italy's friendship while winning France and England's. He predicted that there would be trouble in Slovakia and that Italy, Poland and Hungary would support Slovakian independence aspirations. He said, Hitler's diplomatic position at the moment is not an enviable one. He will require all of his diplomatic skill to avoid the many pitfalls which today confront him and hold to Italy while winning England and France. Smith declared that Germany desired peace, but that there was certain to be much trouble in Europe in the immediate future. He concluded his report with the ominous warning, lastly, watch the fate of Slovakia. He considered Slovakia to be the most important issue in Europe, and more so than Spain, where the civil war was approaching its final phase. Polish Foreign Minister Beck was nettled by Hungarian timidity, and by the reluctance of Polish military men to extend their commitments to the south. Tiso wanted strong protection for an independent Slovakian state, and Germany was the only alternative if Hungary and Poland refused to accept this responsibility. Fulminations against the Czechs, and the promise that Poland would adopt a friendly policy toward an independent Slovakia, was all that Beck could offer the Slovaks for the moment. It was evident that he was extremely worried by this situation. The second Polish objective in Czechoslovakia complicated the problem created by the first one. In the years before the first Polish partition of 1772, Joseph II, Kaiser of the Holy Roman Empire and King of Hungary, seized a region in the Carpathian Mountains which had been in dispute between Poland and Hungary since the Middle Ages. He took this step with the reluctant consent of Maria Theresa, CEO regent in the Habsburg dominions of her son Joseph's imperial domain. This region had been awarded to the favoured Czechs by the Allied and Associated Powers at Paris in 1919. The circumstances of the allocation, for which the principal powers were solely responsible, and the unimportant economic value of the region, made Polish reaction less intense than the passion aroused by Teschen. Nevertheless the Polish leaders had never forgotten their disappointment in failing to obtain the Zipsorei Carpathian area. The region was on the ethnic frontier with Slovakia, and it would have been prudent for them to play down Polish interest in territorial revision at Slovakian expense until the general situation of Slovakia had been clarified. Unfortunately they could not countenance the thought of losing their chance to acquire the disputed territory while general conditions remained favorably fluid. The temptation to exploit Czech weakness to achieve this second objective was too great. Polish impulsiveness ended by wrecking Polish-Slovakian relations, and Poland's primary objective of securing a favorable solution of the Slovakian question was sacrificed. The third objective of Polish policy in Czechoslovakia after the Teschen settlement was the elimination of Czech rule in Ruthenia. John Rachetar, the principal American historian of Ruthenian extraction, has pointed out that Ruthenia could be classified equally well as a greater Russian or Ukrainian community. The geographic proximity of Ruthenia to the Ukraine presented the advocates of an independent or Soviet Ukraine with a distinct advantage in Ruthenian councils. It can be affirmed, with this consideration in mind, that the Ukraine in 1938 was divided among four partitioning powers. The greatest number of Ukrainians were Soviet subjects, and they were twice as numerous as the entire Polish population of Poland. They inhabited the central and eastern Ukraine. Poland came second to Russia with her rule established over the eight or nine million Ukrainians of the western Ukraine. 
Romania was third with her control over the Ukrainian section of the Bessarabian area between the Prut and Dniester rivers north of the mouth of the Danube. Finally, the Czechs ruled over approximately one million Ruthenians south of the Carpathians, who were descended from the subjects of the Kievan Russian state of the Middle Ages. Czech rule in Ruthenia had been established at Paris in 1919, and it had always seemed fantastic to the Poles. The Romanians, on the other hand, welcomed it because it provided direct Romanian contact by land with the armament industry of Bohemia, and it deprived Hungary of a common frontier with Poland. Polish thought on the Ruthenian question was simplicity itself. Ruthenia had belonged to Hungary for hundreds of years before 1919, and Ruthenia should return to Hungary. Hungary had suffered mutilation at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, where they lost two-thirds of their population and three-fourths of their territory. They were understandably reluctant under these circumstances to take risks twenty years later. Poland was annoyed because the Hungarian leaders would not take matters into their own hands and march into Ruthenia. The Poles were no less determined because of this to see the territory return to Hungary, and they regarded a solution in this sense as absolutely essential. The Poles feared the emergence of an entirely independent Ruthenia. The communists might succeed in gaining control of the area. This would enable them to exert pressure from both west and east on the restive and discontented Polish-Ukrainian population. No student of Polish history or literature forgot that the decline of Poland as a great power in the early modern period began with a gigantic revolt in 1648 of the Ukrainians under Polish rule. This revolt had been successfully exploited by Russia. The Poles also feared that Hitler might return to the 1918 German policy in support of Ukrainian separatism. This program had been belatedly adopted by the Germans at the 1918 Brest-Litovsk conference because of Trotsky's intransigence in refusing to conclude a peace settlement between Russia and Germany in World War I. The object now as then might be to strike a crippling blow at the Soviet Union. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk had been a favorite theme of Hitler's oratory in the early days of his political career. Hitler had defended the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, because Germany had made no territorial annexations, but had extended self-determination to millions of Europeans, and had sought to protect them from the terrors of Bolshevik rule. Hitler considered Brest-Litovsk to have been a piece of justice when compared to Versailles, and he used a number of effective arguments to support this view. It seemed logical to the Polish leaders that Hitler might seek to follow this policy and attempt to push back the Bolshevik tide by liberating the Ukrainians. It was known that many Ukrainian refugees were allowed to conduct their propaganda activities from points within Germany. It was believed that Hitler could secure greater access for Germany to the valuable resources of Eastern Europe if he freed the Ukraine. A more effective Polish policy in Slovakia would have been useful in settling the Ruthenian question in a sense favorable to Poland. It would be impossible to maintain Czech rule in Ruthenia once Slovakia was independent. Polish thinking was so dominated by the idea of a war with Germany, and by strategic considerations for such a war that an excellent opportunity to implement Polsudski's policy of federation with neighboring nations was thrown away in Slovakia. The Poles and Slovaks were closely related in culture, temperament, and customs, and at this point a close association between the two countries was feasible as never before. The Poles did not stop to consider that concessions at Danzig, or in the superhighway question, would be a small price to pay for German support in acquiring Slovakia. The greatest foreign policy successes of Poland since the Riga Treaty in 1921 consisted solely of the opening of the Polish-Lithuanian frontier after the Austro-German Anschluss, and of the acquisition of Teschen territory after the German success at Munich. Poland decided to proceed in the same manner by nibbling at the Carpathian Mountains rather than by achieving a great success in establishing a Polish-Slovakian Union. The policy of union had a much greater chance of success in Slovakia than in a non-Slavic country like Lithuania. The removal of Polish prejudice toward Germany at this point would have made the experiment feasible. German Ambassador Maltke complained from Warsaw on October 6, 1938, that the Polish press did not hint that success at Teschen had been attained because Germany had cleared the path. The German diplomat had been wrong in his predictions about Polish policy throughout the Czech crisis, 
and a number of his remarks on October 6 about recent events betrayed considerable confusion. He was still insisting that the Poles were trying to collaborate with the Czechs against Germany when the news arrived that there would be a conference at Munich. This analysis undoubtedly increased his indignation when he reported that the officially inspired Polish press claimed unanimously that German success in the Sudeten question was possible because of Polish aid. The Polish press claimed that Germany would have failed had not Polish neutrality prevented Soviet-Russian intervention. The wisdom of this propaganda line from the official Polish standpoint was questionable, since a recitation of alleged Polish aid to Germany was not calculated to appease anti-German public opinion in Poland. Maltka believed that the Munich conference had diminished the prestige of France in Poland, but he did not think that Poland would drop the French alliance merely to strengthen her relations with Germany. Maltka was wrong in assuming that Hitler intended to ask the Poles to drop their French alliance. He was right when he reminded the German Foreign Office that Polish policy in Ruthenia was directed primarily against the Soviet Union, but that fears of German expansion also play a part. The principal theme in Maltka's report was that German-Polish cooperation in the Czech crisis did not guarantee the termination of a Polish policy hostile toward Germany. Continued Czech hostility toward Poland and Germany The Czech leaders knew that the chance for the continued existence of their state were not good, and they denounced the Polish leaders for seeking the total disruption of Czechoslovakia. Czech Foreign Minister Krofta informed the British on October 3, 1938, that events were proceeding smoothly in the Sudeten area where the Czechs were busily withdrawing, but he complained vehemently about the Poles. British Minister Newton reported that Krofta displayed anxiety over the intrigues and propaganda which had been conducted by Poles in Slovakia. Krofta confided that Czech weakness might be exploited to spread suggestions that Slovakia would be better off if associated with Poland. Krofta would not have entertained such fears had he not realized how deeply the Czechs were hated in Slovakia, and how much the Slovak people preferred almost any association to one with the Czechs. Krofta added that he chiefly desired French and British help against the Poles, but he also hoped that Hitler would perhaps help in resisting such Polish ambitions. Hitler was irritated with the Czechs at this point, and scarcely in a mood to challenge Polish propaganda in Slovakia. There was vigorous disagreement between the Germans and Czechs on the delimitation of the non-plebiscite Sudeten regions to be assigned to Germany. The Munich Agreement had provided that some areas were to be surrendered to Germany within 10 days, and that other areas were to be occupied by an international police force pending a plebiscite. British Ambassador Neville Henderson took an active interest in the regulation of the dispute. He was a sincere advocate of appeasement, and in this respect he was much closer to Bonnet, with whom he established close contact, than to Chamberlain and Halifax in London. He was considered the most promising of the younger British diplomats when he was sent to Berlin in 1937, but his devotion to those principles, which were professed without conviction by his masters in London, soon made his position in the British diplomatic service an isolated and unenviable one. Henderson believed that the Czechs were conducting a policy of hopeless obstruction when they made difficulties about the procedure which had been accepted by the powers at Munich. It had been decided that the 1918 population figures would be used to delimit the non-plebiscite areas, and the 1910 Habsburg census was the last one taken before 1918. The Czechs suggested that their own, doctored, census returns from 1921 or even 1930 should serve as the criterion. At Munich it had been decided that areas assigned to Germany without plebiscite would be those which contained more than 50% German population. The Czechs insisted that 75% rather than 51% should be considered more than 50%. Hitler replied by threatening to send the German army down to the Bad Godesberg line if the Czechs did not abide by the terms of the published British documents on Munich. At Bad Godesberg Hitler had demanded the immediate occupation of a much greater area than had been granted to Germany at Munich. Halifax favoured a last-minute game to modify the Munich Agreement in favour of the Czechs but he was opposed by the French and Italians, who insisted on the need to respect the spirit of this protocol. Halifax consoled himself with the thought that something could be done for the Czechs in the plebiscite zone, but President Benes decided that the last attempt to accomplish anything by opposing Germany had failed. He resigned in disgust on October 5, 1938. 
a provisional government was formed by General Jan Syrovi, a Czech national hero who had helped to secure the withdrawal of former Czech prisoners of war from Russia in 1918. The Milan Haja cabinet had been forced out by a demonstration directed by Clement Gottwald, the Communist Party leader, on September 22. Syrovi had succeeded Haja as premier and he became interim chief of state after the resignation of Benes and pending the election of a new president. Frantisek Kvakovsky from the dominant agrarian party succeeded Krofta as foreign minister after the latter resigned from the Syrovi cabinet on October 5. Kvakovsky had represented Czechoslovakia in both Rome and Berlin. He was a loyal Czech patriot but he did not share the fanatical hatred of his predecessor toward fascism and national socialism. It was too early to predict the ultimate policy of the new regime but the resignation of Benes produced an immediate relaxation of tension. The Czechs were seeking to stir up Great Britain against Poland, but Sir Howard Kennard in Warsaw was doing everything possible to restore Poland to favour in London. He argued that Polish resentment toward the Czechs was justified because of the Czech occupation of Teschen in 1919, which he described as a short-sighted seizure, to use no stronger terms. He claimed that his own earlier evaluation of Poland's attitude toward a war of the Czechs, French, and British against the Germans had been incorrect. A new appraisal had convinced him that Poland would never have fought on the German side against the Western powers. He insisted that Poland would have remained neutral a short time before entering the war on the side of the Allies under the pressure of Polish public opinion. He claimed that President Roosevelt had taken a mysterious secret step during the Czech crisis, through American Ambassador Biddle, to modify the Polish attitude. This step had been overtaken by events, but Biddle had been favorably impressed with the Polish attitude. Kennard assured Halifax that he did not wish to appear naive by accepting either Polish or American claims, but he was convinced on his own account that there had been no German-Polish agreement on joint policy during the crisis. Kennard presented a series of additional reports to explain why Poland was seeking to exploit Czech weakness to secure a common frontier with Hungary. He declared that it was a principal feature of Polish policy to do this, and he regarded it as his most important task to explain and to justify this new policy to the British Foreign Office. The mysterious American step referred to by Kennard was little more than the information that President Roosevelt would not like to see Poland on the wrong side in a European war. Polish Foreign Minister Beck knew that Ambassador Biddle was friendly toward Poland and he had freely discussed the situation with him during the Czech crisis. Beck told Biddle on September 29, 1938, that Poland was extremely disappointed not to have been invited to the Munich conference. Kennett's efforts to elevate Poland and to deflate the Czechs in London were reinforced by the change in the Czech government, which further dampened enthusiasm for Czechoslovakia among the Western powers. Henderson predicted to Halifax on October 6, 1938, that Czechoslovakia may be found within the German political and economic orbit much sooner than is generally expected. The idea of sending Western troops into Bohemia to supervise the plebiscite and to secure everything possible for the Czechs began to lose its appeal. Roger Makins, a British foreign office expert on the Berlin International Commission to delimit the Czech frontier, announced on October 6 that he had joined with his Italian colleagues in opposing any plebiscite. He argued that the Czechs would gain nothing from a referendum. The Czechs themselves soon concluded that a popular vote would not advance their cause and that it might reveal some startling weaknesses. The Czech delegate to the International Commission informed the Germans on October 7 that his government would prefer to forget the plebiscite. The Germans were entitled to a plebiscite under the Munich terms and they reserved their decision for some time. Henderson confided to Halifax on October 11 that there was a strong swing toward Germany in Bohemia Moravia, and that the Czechs might lose the Moravian capital of Brunn, Brno, if a plebiscite was held. This possibility alarmed the Czechs because the loss of Brunn would virtually cut them off from Slovakia. Kennard explained to Halifax that Poland favoured the expulsion of the Czechs from Slovakia. The suspense was ended on October 13, 1938, when Hitler agreed to stop with the zone occupied by his troops on October 10, and to abandon the plebiscite with the understanding that he was reserving minor additional German claims. The discussion of the plebiscite began with the suggestion of Halifax that it could be used as an instrument against the Germans. 
It ended with a sigh of relief in London when the Germans agreed to abandon the idea. The Hungarians and Czechs began to negotiate on the settlement of Hungarian ethnic claims in Slovakia while the question of the German plebiscite was being regulated. Hungary was the least aggressive of Czechoslovakia's three enemies in the recent crisis, and it was no coincidence that she had obtained nothing from the Czechs. Beck feared that Hungary would conduct her negotiations without energy and settle for much less than Poland desired her to obtain. Beck expressed the wish to discuss the matter with a special Hungarian envoy and Budapest responded by sending Count Istvan Ksaki, the new Hungarian foreign minister, on a special mission to Warsaw. Ksaki arrived on October 7 to receive advice from Beck. Maltka informed Ribbentrop on October 8 that Hungarian alarm about Romania was causing trouble for Beck. The Poles wanted Hungary to demand the entire province of Ruthenia, but Ksaki was afraid that Romania would attack Hungary if this was done. The Polish press had launched a vigorous campaign in favour of the annexation of Ruthenia by Hungary. Maltka noted that the Italian diplomats in Warsaw were jealous of Beck's exclusive policy in sponsoring Hungary, because Italy, although somewhat unrealistically, still considered Hungary an Italian sphere of influence. The Italians claimed that Poland was seeking to erect an independent bloc between the Axis powers and the Soviet Union, and they were correct in this estimate. It was not clear to Maltka whether or not Beck was urging Hungary to seize Slovakia but this was unlikely because the Hungarians were timid even about Ruthenia. The emphasis of the Polish press was entirely on an independent Slovakia. Polish claims at Oderberg protected by Hitler Hitler had difficulty at this time in preventing a major German-Polish crisis because of the brutal treatment of Germans by the Polish occupation authorities in the Teschen district. Most of the German leaders believed that the Poles had claimed too much German ethnic territory in the vicinity of Teschen. Marshal Goring had advised State Secretary Wiesacker that the territory beyond Teschen, along the southeastern German Silesian frontier, should not go to Poland unless Poland agreed to support the return of Danzig to Germany. He favoured acquiring the territory for Germany or retaining it for Czechoslovakia, if the Poles refused. The German Foreign Office experts were inclined to agree with Goring and it was decided to make an effort to keep the Poles out of the industrial centre of Witkowitz and out of poverty-stricken Little Oderberg near the source of the Oder River. Goring was closely interrogated by Wiesacker concerning all of his recent conversations with Polish representatives. Polish Ambassador Lipski was angry when he discovered the attitude of the German Foreign Office in the Oderberg question. He insisted to Ernst Wormann, the head of the political division in the German Foreign Office, that both Hitler and Goring had promised this strategic town to Poland. Wormann, who was familiar with Goring's attitude, refused to believe this and he reminded Lipsky that Oderberg was preponderantly German. Lipsky refused to be impressed. He warned Wormann that an official report on this conversation would complicate German-Polish relations, and he added that he would write back a private letter about it. Copies of official reports went to President Moskicki, and through him to other Polish leaders. The implication was clear. Poland was determined to make a stand on the Oderberg issue. The lipsky wormann conversation took place on October 4. Hitler intervened the following day to demolish the recalcitrant position which had been adopted by Göring and the German Foreign Office. He insisted that he had no interest in Oderberg whatever, and he added that he was not going to haggle with the Poles about every single city, but would be generous toward those who were modest in their demands. After this rebuke the German Foreign Office had no choice but to retreat. This was merely the beginning of the problem, because the Poles began to wage a virtual undeclared war against the German inhabitants of the Teschen region. The resentment of the Germans across the border in the Reich was intense and news of the daily incidents began to appear in the German provincial press. Hitler moved swiftly to impose restraint while there was still time. He took strong measures to suppress publicity of the Teschen incidents, and he declared in a special directive that it was his policy to release nothing unfavorable to Poland, this also applies to incidents involving the German minority. The German Foreign Office was alarmed anew when Polish propaganda maps began to appear with claims to Morava Ostrava, the key North Moravian industrial city and railway center. Wiesacker told Lipski on October 12 that Germany had given Poland a free hand at Oderberg, but that Morava Ostrava was different. 
he added with sarcasm that he would support a Polish bid for a plebiscite at Morav Ostrava, provided, of course, that the plebiscite was conducted under international control. Wiesacker and Lipsky knew that Poland could never win such a plebiscite, and the Polish ambassador did not appreciate this unpleasant joke. He replied with dignity that Poland did not intend to take Morava Ostrava from the Czechs. Wiesacker did not believe him and rumors about new Polish demands in Moravia continued to circulate. Hitler decided to adopt an attitude of watchful waiting in the Morava Ostrava question. The failure of Czech-Hungarian negotiations A number of unfavorable new developments began to cloud the international scene while Hitler was coping with the aftermath of Polish claims in the Teschen area. The bilateral negotiations between Hungary and Czechoslovakia were disrupted on October 13, 1938, and it was evident that the two parties could not reach an agreement. This threw the question back to the four Munich powers. Hitler had delivered a speech at Saarbrücken on October 9, 1938, where he had gone to dedicate a new theatre. He took strong exception in this speech to the fact that prominent British Tories were heaping abuse on him in public speeches in and out of Parliament without receiving reprimands from the Conservative Party leaders. This seemed to Hitler a poor spirit in which to observe the Anglo-German Declaration of Friendship which had been signed a few days previously. Hitler's sole intention in making this speech was to remind the British leaders that international friendship had its price, but he was showered with terms of abuse from the British press for an alleged intervention in British domestic affairs. Anglo-German relations at this point had already become catastrophic rather than friendly. The whole world knew that Great Britain was seeking a vast acceleration of her current armament campaign. The German press explained that it did not object to the British armament campaign. This was a British domestic affair. It did not object to the expansion of the British Expeditionary Force, because Great Britain was the ally of France, and it was her privilege to decide the extent of her obligations to that country. Unfortunately this was not the end of the matter, and the German press explained that what is inexcusable is the fact that members of Mr Chamberlain's government should be making propaganda for rearmament once more on the ground of the German danger. Conditions were not favourable for a friendly meeting of the Munich powers to settle the delicate problem of Hungarian claims against the Czechs. Italian Foreign Minister Chano attempted to overcome the difficulty by ignoring the tension and by blandly proposing that the foreign ministers of the Munich powers meet in Venice or Brioni without delay to settle the Hungarian-Czechoslovak problem. The Hungarians realised that the time was not propitious for this plan, they requested a renewal of bilateral negotiations with the Czechs and the Czechs accepted. There was no prospect of success, but a breathing spell was gained during which new methods of procedure could be explored. The Czech leaders presented the chief obstacle to the settlement of a question which did not directly concern the Czech people. It was the ethnic claims of Hungarians and of Slovaks, but not of Czechs, which were at stake. The situation in Slovakia was still confused. The pro checklist movement in Slovakia was virtually eliminated, and every political party had to stand at least for autonomy, if not for eventual independence, because of prevailing public opinion. A local Slovak government had been formed on October 8, 1938, but it was soon evident that the divided Slovak parties were no match for the Czechs, who sought to circumscribe Slovak autonomy in every possible way. A consolidation movement was launched and eventually the four principal Slovak parties joined into one Slovak Linka People's Party, the Party of Slovakian National Unity, but this was not achieved until November 11, 1938. The question of the Slovak-Hungarian frontier had virtually been settled by that time without Slovakian participation. The formal constitutional amendment in Prague, which was known as the Slovak Autonomy Law, was not in effect until November 22, 1938. Its provisions were highly objectionable to all Slovak leaders, although the preamble contained belated recognition of the Pittsburgh Agreement of 1918. Ferdinand Durkansky was the principal Slovak leader who attempted to make autonomy workable, but his complaints received little recognition in Prague. Adalbert Tuka, the veteran Slovak independence leader who had spent many years in Czech jails, warned Durkansky that lasting collaboration between Slovakia and Prague was impossible. Events in Slovakia were moving slowly, 
but the direction of public opinion was unmistakably toward independence, and the Czechs knew that they would receive the blame for the surrender of Slovak territory. The stubbornness of the Czechs and the indecision of the Hungarians were primarily responsible for the hopeless deadlock in bilateral negotiations. The Poles were not unhappy about the delay because they hoped that time would permit them to strengthen Hungarian demands. They concentrated primarily on Ruthenia, and on October 15, 1938, Jan Zembeck accused Maltka in Warsaw of failing to admit that Germany was behind Ukrainian groups who hoped to use Ruthenia as the nucleus for an independent Ukrainian state. Lipsky had returned from Berlin a few days earlier to report, and Beck and Zembeck had decided that it was necessary to employ more energy with the Germans in seeking to settle the Ruthenian question. Maltka was upset by the accusation of Zembeck concerning the Ukrainians. He feared that Zembek was right and that Hitler was flirting with the idea of playing the Ukrainian card. He complained to the German Foreign Office that the Poles were extremely sensitive about the Ukrainian question, and added, I should therefore be grateful if I could be authorized to give Count Zembek a reassuring reply as soon as possible. The effect in Berlin was to convince Hitler that Ruthenia could be useful in obtaining concessions from Poland. He believed that Germany was prepared to offer Poland more than she asked from her, but every additional favor which he could offer Poland would be extra insurance for the success of his plan to reach a lasting agreement. There was considerable talk in Berlin about Hitler's projected offer to Poland, and President Grasser of the Danzig Senate was bewildered to encounter these rumors when he came to the German capital in mid-October. He feared that Hitler intended to shelve the Danzig question for an indefinite period and this impression had been reinforced by Hitler's Sport Palast speech of September 26, 1938. He visited the German Foreign Office to discover what was happening, but he encountered in State Secretary Wiesacher a sphinx-like and impenetrable attitude. The Suabian diplomat confined himself to the comment that Danzig's interests should be upheld with calm objectivity. Gracer heartily agreed, but this platitude did not satisfy his curiosity. When Gracer visited Berlin, the German Foreign Office was concerned with a request from Czech Foreign Minister Kvakovsky for the guarantee of the new Czech frontiers which had been promised at Munich. The German diplomats were astonished that Kvakovsky would request this guarantee before any of the Hungarian claims were settled, or before the Polish claims were settled in their entirety. They concluded that the Czech state was more wobbly and more desperately in need of help, than they had supposed. Kvakovsky thought the matter over and he told German Minister Henk in Prague on October 17 that his request for a guarantee had been premature. Germany's intentions probed by Halifax British Ambassador Kennard in Warsaw speculated that Romania would be an effective obstacle in postponing the realization of Polish aspirations in Slovakia and Ruthenia. He urged Halifax to adopt an indulgent view toward these Polish aspirations, and he proclaimed the alleged importance of a special mission to promote British influence in Eastern Europe if European culture in the countries east and southeast of Germany is to be saved from the grip of totalitarianism. Kennard admitted that Poland was also a dictatorship, but he was favorably impressed by the Polish regime. He stressed Polish Catholicism and Polish individualism as virtuous influences which tempered the authoritarianism of the Polish state. He mentioned that Poland had recently accepted a loan from Germany, but he asserted, it is improbable that Poland will willingly submit to complete German domination. Kennard was not aware of the full content of the Hella Peninsula and London talks on Danzig which had preceded the Munich conference. It still seemed to him only a question of time before Danzig becomes wholly German it had not occurred to Kennard any more than to Hitler that Poland might raise insurmountable obstacles to the peaceful acquisition of Danzig by Germany. Kennard predicted that Beck would accept the reunion of Danzig with Germany if Hitler placed the proposition on an attractive quid pro quo basis. He had discussed the matter with Beck who denied that at present a deal was in progress. Kennard employed a patronizing tone toward Beck in his reports to Halifax. He was aware of the less statesmanlike aspects of his character, including his personal ambition and vanity. It seemed that as Polish history shows, there is always grave danger ahead if Polish statesmen cast their country for the role of a great power, when she has neither the political unity nor the military or economic strength necessary for such a part. This was a true statement, 
and it is unfortunate that he did not advise Beck in this sense with greater consistency. In reality, Kennard was thinking merely of Polish conduct during the recent Teshin crisis and of its adverse effect on official British opinion. Halifax was impressed by Kennard's comments on Polish aspirations in Slovakia and Ruthenia, and he concluded that the time had come to sound out the German attitude. He confided his assumption to Henderson, on October 15, that German policy toward Slovakia and Ruthenia was still in flux, but it seemed that Germany is bound to have the deciding voice in the future of these territories. He mentioned that reports were reaching London of a deal in which Poland would seize Slovakia and Hungary would reoccupy Ruthenia. He requested Henderson to discover what the Germans knew about Polish aspirations in Slovakia and about the impasse in Czech Magyar negotiations. Henderson responded by requesting Wiesacker to explain Germany's position in relation to these two problems. Wiesacker replied that current German policy toward Czechoslovakia was based on the application of self-determination. The Germans were assuming that future claims in Ruthenia or Slovakia would be made on that basis. Henderson received the impression that Germany was inclined to protect the Czechs against extreme Hungarian or Polish claims. After considering this idea further, he reported to Halifax that if Germany feels that she can count upon the Czechs to adapt their foreign and economic policy to hers she would prefer to see Slovakia at any rate remain a component part of Czechoslovakia. This tentative formulation of the current German attitude was a remarkably shrewd guess. Hitler knew that the position of Czechoslovakia was extremely precarious after Munich, because Czech prestige had been reduced and the Slovakian and Ruthenian minorities were extremely antagonistic toward the continuation of Czech rule. The new Czech leaders seemed to be inclined toward an effort to appease these minorities, but it was difficult to predict what the outcome would be because the Czech record in the field of appeasement was poor. The secret directive of Hitler to the German armed forces on October 21, 1938, indicates that he contemplated the possible collapse of the Czech state in the near future. The military leaders were instructed to be prepared to defend Germany from surprise attacks on the frontiers and from the air. The German forces were ordered to be prepared to occupy Memel, and there had been considerable concern, since the Polish-Lithuanian crisis of March 1938, about the fate of this former German city which had been seized by Lithuania. Lastly, the German armed forces were ordered to be prepared to occupy the region of Czechoslovakia. Hitler explained in a later directive of December 17, 1938, that a German move in the Czech area would not mean that there would be a major crisis, and he added that such a move would not require the mobilization of the German armed forces. Henderson had discussed the plan for a four-power conference on the Czech Magyar dispute with Wiesacker. He had not indicated the British attitude, and he had no instructions from Halifax on this subject. Wiesacker noted that it would be unwise to call a four-power conference as long as the Czechs and Magyars were willing to negotiate. The question of a guarantee to the Czech state was not discussed. The Czech leaders claimed to British Minister Newton in Prague, on the following day, that Hitler had told Kvakovsky of German readiness to join the other powers in guaranteeing the Czech state as soon as the Czech disputes with Poland and Hungary were settled. The Czechs were using every means to arouse British interest in the guarantee question. Events were to show that these efforts were fruitless and that Halifax was not interested in guaranteeing Czechoslovakia. Halifax was not satisfied with Wiesacker's comment about the Czech Magyar dispute. He instructed Henderson to discuss the matter again with the German state secretary. Wiesacker admitted in a second conversation that a Czech Magyar settlement was unlikely unless the four Munich powers intervened. Henderson and Wiesacker discussed the situation on the assumption that intervention would take place, and it was clear that Wiesacker considered this to be the sole solution of bilateral negotiations failed. It did not occur to Henderson that Halifax would object to the four-power intervention plan arranged at Munich. He analyzed the problem for Halifax on the assumption that the British would participate in such a conference. He noted that the present Hungarian Prime Minister was not specially friendly to Germany and that it would be foolish for Great Britain to take a pro-Czech and anti-Hungarian stand. It seemed to him that the British should incline toward the Hungarians since Prague was moving into the German orbit. Sir Basil Newton in Prague adopted a similar attitude. 
he observed that the Czech leaders were not disturbed by the fact that new hostility or intrigues within the country against Germany might mean the end of the current unstable regime. On the contrary, they asserted that they would be relieved to have a more definite solution of their problems, which would enable them to know just where they stood. Beck's failure to enlist Romania against Czechoslovakia Poland had not attempted to maintain the close contact with Germany which had served her during the Teschen crisis. Beck realized that the policy of Germany might be decisive in the Ruthenian question, but his first reaction had merely been to warn the Germans not to encourage Ukrainian nationalist ambitions. He decided to revert to a more positive approach toward Germany, and he sent corresponding instructions to Lipsky. The Polish diplomat called on State Secretary Wiesacker on October 18, 1938, to discuss the Czech situation. Wiesacker noted that the principal object of the visit was the announcement that Beck wished to remain in friendly consultation with us in regard to the Hungarian-Slovak question. Wiesacker confided to Lipsky that Germany was exerting pressure on the Czechs and Hungarians to settle their differences, but that these efforts were producing no results. He attempted to sound out Lipsky's attitude toward the possibility of four-power intervention, and he received the impression that the Poles would like to participate in a settlement of the Slovakian and Ruthenian questions. Wiesacker reported to Ribbentrop that concessions to Poland in settling these questions might be useful in attaining a comprehensive Polish-German understanding. Lipsky had claimed that the Poles were handling the Czechs with kid gloves when Wiesacker inquired about rumors of new Polish demands on the Czechs. The situation was ripe for comprehensive Polish proposals to the Germans about the settlement of these questions. Beck was reluctant to take this step, and he hoped that it would be possible to secure Polish interests in some other way. Ksaki had claimed that the Romanian attitude was an important factor in inhibiting Hungarian policy toward Ruthenia. Romania was the ally of Poland and Beck hoped that a personal effort would enable him to influence policy. Beck left Warsaw for Galati in a conference with King Carol of Romania on October 18, 1938. He explained to his principal subordinates at the Polish Foreign Office before his departure that he hoped to persuade the Romanian royal dictator to accept the elimination of Czech rule in Ruthenia. There were 14,000 Romanians in Ruthenia, and Beck hoped to tempt King Carol by offering him a share of the territory. Count Lubinsky was sent to Budapest on the same day to discuss this move with the Hungarians. Beck intended to tell King Carol frankly that he was working for the total dissolution of Czechoslovakia. He hoped to convince him that Slovak independence was inevitable, and that the disruption of Czech rule in Slovakia would destroy the king's direct line of communication through Czech territory to the Skoda works in any case. Beck hoped to bring about a rapprochement between Hungary and Romania by persuading them to cooperate in a common cause. He told his subordinates that he hoped to acquire a position of strength from which he would request German neutrality toward Hungarian direct action, which would forestall the intervention of the four Munich powers. He was willing to tell the Germans that his plan was not prompted by anti-German considerations. After the departure of Beck the Polish Foreign Office admitted to foreign diplomats that the aim of his mission was to settle the Ruthenian question. It was explained that a common frontier with Hungary had become a vital Polish interest. Maltka reported on October 19 that the Poles were publicly referring to Ruthenia as a Ukrainian Piedmont, which jeopardized Poland's control over the millions of Ukrainians under her rule. Maltka pointed out that emphasis on self-determination during the Czech crisis had stirred passions in eastern Poland and had led to bloody rioting in Lvov for the first time since 1931. The German diplomat added that the Poles feared the spread of German influence, and that the quick reversal of Czech policy in the direction of alignment with Germany has caused surprise here and made a strong impression. Maltke noted that Polish leaders were disappointed in the Slovak failure to declare independence immediately after Munich. He predicted correctly that Beck's mission to Romania, which had been accompanied with much fanfare, would end in total failure. He knew that Beck intended to offer territory to Romania, but he did not believe that the Romanians would join in the partition of an ally from the Little Entente. The German ambassador did not enjoy the prospect of Beck's failure with the Romanians. He believed that the atmosphere would be improved if Beck succeeded in his Ruthenian policy. He warned that much of the Polish press was arguing that Germany would use her influence to oppose the establishment of a common Polish-Hungarian frontier. 
he concluded that if Polish policy failed Germany will undoubtedly be held chiefly responsible. Beck's principal conversations during his Romanian visit took place on the Royal Hohenzollern yacht anchored in the Danube at the point where the Prut River flowed into the Danube from the north out of Poland. He had to face a barrage of criticism from Romanian Foreign Minister Petrescu Kaman whenever he thought he was making some progress in his effort to influence King Carol. The Romanian diplomat displayed versatility in undermining Beck's plan to gain King Carol's support. Petrescu Kaman solemnly accused Beck of seeking to involve Romania in a war of aggression against the Czechs. He noted with satisfaction that the attitude of King Carol was serious and severe, and that Beck displayed a nervous tick. He taunted Beck with the claim that the four Munich powers, including Germany, had agreed to settle the Ruthenian question on the basis of self-determination. Petrescu Kaman was especially hostile toward Hungary. He asked Beck with irony if the Hungarians would win the entire Ruthenian area by plebiscite, except for the few districts to be transferred to Poland and Romania. Petrescu Kaman reminded King Carol that Romania had taken the trouble to fortify her existing 400-kilometer frontier with Hungary, it was not in her interest to see this frontier extended. King Carol was persuaded by his foreign minister that Beck's plan to solve the Ruthenian question was reckless and contrary to Romania's true interest. Beck challenged his adversary in vain to produce evidence of the prior decision of the four Munich powers. He explained that Romania would be taking nothing from the Czechs, because the territory he was seeking to throw her way would otherwise go to Hungary. He insisted that two previous Czech capitulations proved that Czech resistance to his plan was out of the question. He did not take his ultimate rebuff from King Carol graciously, and he was full of scorn and contempt for Petrescu Kamen, whom he described as a perfect imbecile. Beck was especially irked because the Romanians, in contrast to Poland, never challenged the arbitrary authority of the principal European powers. He simply would have spat at the Romanians and proceeded with his plan had it merely been a question of Polish action. The difficulty was that his plan called for Hungary, and not Poland, to occupy Ruthenia. Beck knew that the Hungarians would never budge without Romanian consent, unless they had the support of one or more of the principal powers. Beck was convinced that the opposition of Romania to his Ruthenian plan would carry with it the opposition of France. He concluded with reluctance that his sole chance of success was to appeal once again to Germany. The Czechs had the same idea and they appealed to Germany for support against further Polish demands while Beck was in Romania. Hitler replied through the German legation in Prague that it was not possible to comply with Czech requests to restrain Poland. The German diplomats in Prague were also told to avoid discussions about Poland with the Czechs. Beck's request for German support to Hungary Maltka reported to Ribbentrop on October 22, 1938, that Beck was greatly disturbed after his trip to Romania. It was bad enough that Romania had refused to cooperate, and it was worse when she declared her intention to oppose Polish plans. Beck was telling anyone who cared to listen that he would use force if necessary to destroy Czech rule in Ruthenia, and to achieve a common frontier with Hungary. Beck also decided to present his demands for Slovakian territory at this time. The Polish press had been speculating for many days about forthcoming Polish demands in Slovakia and the Slovakian press commenced to reply to the polls with increasing hostility while Beck was in Romania. The Slovaks refused to concede that Polish territorial demands were justifiable, and Slovak nationalists opposed concessions to Poland. Karol Sitter visited Warsaw while Beck was in Romania. Jan Zembeck had assured Sitter on October 19, 1938, that Poland had complete sympathy for Slovakian independence aspirations. Sitter frankly stated that he was seeking an independent Slovakia with such close military, political, and cultural ties with Poland that it would actually be a sort of political and military Polish protectorate. Zembeck was compelled to reply in the negative when Sitter asked if Poland would send troops to Slovakia and abandon her territorial demands in exchange for a close Polish-Slovakian alignment. Sitter continued his conversations with Zembeck the following day and it seemed at first that the Polish refusal to accept his original proposals had not shaken his confidence in Poland. Nevertheless, within 48 hours of his return to Bratislava, Sitter had changed his mind completely, and he announced publicly that his attempt to arrive at an understanding with Poland had failed. 
This was too much for Beck, who decided to press Polish claims against the Slovaks as soon as possible and to increase them for good measure. Beck moved rapidly to improve contact with Germany. Lipsky called at the German Foreign Office on October 22, 1938, to present to the Germans a detailed list of Slovakian districts which Beck thought should be allocated to Hungary. Lipsky added that Beck wished Germany to help Poland to secure the entire province of Ruthenia for Hungary. He requested that Germany keep Poland completely informed of her plans in the Hungarian frontier question. Lipsky gave the Germans no indication of the territories Poland intended to take from Slovakia, because Beck did not feel that this matter was of direct concern to Germany. Lipsky confided that the Romanian foreign minister had attempted to play Poland off against Germany during Beck's recent visit. Lipsky mentioned the Romanian assertion that Germany intended to apply self-determination to Hungarian claims, and he proceeded to contradict this without waiting for any comment from the Germans. He asserted that the Polish government knew that Germany had no intention of partly smothering Hungarian claims under the cloak of self-determination. The Germans were astonished by the audacity of this contention. Baron Ernst Wormann, the chief of the political division of the German Foreign Office, recorded after the conversation that he contradicted Lipsky at once, I told the ambassador on this point that we continued to stand for the right of self-determination for the, Carpatho, Ukraine, whatever this might imply. Lipsky countered by feigning astonishment, and he exclaimed that the Ruthenian area was not Czech in population, and not suitable material for an independent state. He insisted that Prague could not maintain authority there, and that Poland feared the spread of communist agitation in the area. These formidable arguments produced no apparent effect on the German foreign office leaders. They reiterated that Germany refused to exclude Ruthenia from the application of self-determination. The Germans asked Lipsky what Karol Sitter had been doing in Warsaw but the Polish ambassador replied stiffly that he was unable to give them any information on this point. Lipsky hastened to report to Beck after this conversation that his attempt to secure the cooperation of the German Foreign Office in the Ruthenian question had failed. The Germans were evidently committed to a Ruthenian policy which ran counter to Poland's interests. Beck was not unduly alarmed by Lipsky's report. It seemed that an old situation was merely repeating itself. Poland had encountered opposition from the German Foreign Office in the past, and she had responded by bringing the matter in question to the attention of Hitler. Beck instructed Lipsky to pursue the issue, and the next step was a conversation between the Polish ambassador and the German foreign minister. Hitler's suggestion for a comprehensive settlement Hitler's attention had been called to an interview granted by Beck to the Hearst Press on October 10, 1938. The Polish foreign minister had denounced rumors that Germany and Poland were negotiating about the return of Danzig to Germany. Beck claimed that the German people of Danzig had sufficient opportunity to express their German individuality under the existing constitution of the free city. He added that lasting peace in Europe would be possible only when the nations reached a lasting understanding with Germany. This interview encouraged Hitler to raise the Danzig issue. He hoped that an understanding with Germany would be more important to Beck than the retention of the unsatisfactory status quo at Danzig. Hitler decided to act when he heard that Lipsky had requested a meeting with Ribbentrop. He instructed Ribbentrop to listen to whatever Lipsky had to say before introducing German proposals for a comprehensive agreement, and for the settlement of the Danzig and superhighway questions. He advised Ribbentrop that German support for Polish plans would depend upon the degree of cooperation between the two countries. Ribbentrop met Lipsky for lunch at Birch Teskeden on October 24, 1938. This date marked the beginning of Germany's attempt to acquire Danzig by means of a negotiated settlement between Germany and Poland. Polish failure to accept this idea, and the subsequent Polish challenge to Germany, led ultimately to a German-Polish war. This local war provided the pretext for the British attack on Germany which precipitated World War II. Lipsky had requested the meeting and he took the initiative in its early phase. He repeated his earlier arguments at the German Foreign Office about Ruthenia, and he added that there could be no stabilization in the entire Danubian area unless the Ruthenian question was settled. He emphasized that Yugoslavia, as one of the three little Entente powers, 
would offer no objection to the Polish plan for Hungarian rule in Ruthenia. He admitted that Romania was opposed and he said that Beck's trip to Romania had been a disappointment to Poland. He remarked contemptuously that all Czechoslovakia had ever done for Ruthenia was to build a few airports for Soviet Russian flyers. He denied that Poland's motivation for her Ruthenian policy was the desire to construct a bloc to oppose Germany. Ribbentrop's attention appeared to be thoroughly absorbed by Lipsky's remarks. The German foreign minister began to reply by criticizing recent Hungarian policy. He confided to Lipsky that Germany had discovered the secret Hungarian commitment to the Little Entente which dated from the Bled, Yugoslavia, Conference of August 23, 1938. Hungary had renounced recourse to force during the Czech crisis in exchange for the arms equality offered to her by the Little Entente. This seemed to indicate a weak Hungarian policy. Hungary would have been unwilling to join Germany to secure her aims by force in the event of a showdown. Ribbentrop hoped that Lipsky would understand the difficulty implicit in the abandonment of self-determination merely to acquire Ruthenia for Hungary. The German foreign minister was convinced that the Ruthenians would not vote for union with Hungary in a plebiscite. Ribbentrop quickly added that he was not adopting a totally negative attitude toward the Polish plan. Lipsky had introduced many new ideas which would have to be taken into account in a final evaluation of the situation. It was evident that the problem of Romania's attitude also required further consideration. It was Ribbentrop's aim to remind the Poles that their plan was not a simple one which Germany could support without running risks. The attitude of Romania, where Hitler hoped to improve German trade relations and to acquire more supplies of fats, cereals and petroleum, was no negligible matter for Germany. Ribbentrop proceeded to change the subject. He had a large general problem in mind which he had wished to discuss when he agreed to receive Lipsky at Birch Teskeden. He emphasized that he was about to say something strictly confidential, and he intimated that it was to be a secret shared solely among Beck, Lipsky and himself. Lipsky, who was a diplomat able to understand half a word, knew that Ribbentrop was suggesting that he alone and not Hitler was responsible for what was to follow. Ribbentrop made his point well, and Beck believed for several years after this conversation that the real initiative in the Danzig question stemmed from Ribbentrop and the German Foreign Office rather than from Hitler. The obvious motive for this maneuver was caution. Hitler, before discovering the Polish attitude, did not wish the Polish leaders to believe that he had adopted a rigid or unalterable position in a question where it might be difficult to attain an agreement. Ribbentrop requested Lipsky to convey a cordial invitation to Beck to visit Germany again in November 1938. Lipsky promised to do this, and the German foreign minister proceeded to outline Hitler's plan. Germany would request Poland to permit her to annex Danzig. She would ask permission to construct a superhighway and a railroad to East Prussia. Lipsky was assured that these carefully circumscribed suggestions represented the total of German requests from Poland. It was clear that there had to be a quid pro quo basis for negotiation and Germany was prepared to offer many concessions. Poland would be granted a permanent free port in Danzig and the right to build her own highway and railroad to the port. The entire Danzig area would be a permanent free market for Polish goods on which no German customs duties would be levied. Germany would take the unprecedented step of recognizing and guaranteeing the existing German-Polish frontier including the 1922 boundary in Upper Silesia. Ribbentrop compared the German sacrifice in making this offer with concessions recently made to Italy in the Tyrol question. He added that Germany hoped to make a similar agreement with France about the Franco-German frontier, since the Locarno treaties were no longer in effect. Germany had many other ideas for further proposals which would be of advantage to Poland. Ribbentrop proposed a new formal treaty to include these provisions for a general settlement. It need not be an alliance pact, and a new non-aggression pact which might be extended to 25 years would suffice. He hoped that the new pact would contain a consultation clause to increase cooperation, and he thought it would be helpful if Poland would join the anti-Comintern front. Hitler's offer contained generous terms for Poland. It included an enormous German renunciation in favor of Poland in the question of the frontiers. Besides, 
Hitler's offer to guarantee Poland's frontiers carried with it a degree of security which could not have been matched by any of the other non-communist powers. This more than compensated for the return to Germany of Danzig, which had been under a national socialist regime for several years. Polish prestige in agreeing to the change at Danzig would be protected by this fact. It would be easy for Polish propagandists to point out that Poland was securing great advantages in such a policy. An ambassador would normally have confined his response to a discussion of the individual points in such an offer with the aim of obtaining complete clarity prior to receiving new instructions. This was not Lipsky's method. He replied at once that he did not consider an Anschluss, Germany Danzig, possible, however, if only and principally for reasons of domestic policy. He developed this theme with great intensity, and he insisted that Beck could never prevail upon the Polish people to accept the German annexation of Danzig. He added that in Poland the free city of Danzig, unlike the Tsar, was not regarded as a product of the Versailles Treaty, but of an older historical tradition. Lipsky was insincere in his presentation of these carefully prepared arguments. He knew perfectly well that the chief obstacle to the German annexation of Danzig was the determination of Beck that Germany should never recover this city. The Polish diplomat deliberately created the misleading impression that Beck was unable to decide about Danzig because of public opinion. It was astonishing that Lipsky displayed no enthusiasm about German recognition of the Polish frontiers. He would have been enthusiastic had he been more optimistic about lasting good relations with Germany, but unfortunately this was not the attitude of the Polish Foreign Office under Beck's leadership. Ribbentrop tried to conceal his impatience, but he was obviously irritated by the strange attitude of Lipsky. He warned Lipsky that recognition of the Polish corridor was no easy matter for Hitler. Lipsky's response was to change the subject and to return to the Czech question. He requested the abandonment of the Munich Conference procedure in dealing with the Czech-Hungarian frontier. He suggested a new plan in which Poland, Germany and Italy would settle the question. Lipsky knew perfectly well that the Italians were supporting extreme Hungarian claims in the interest of maintaining their influence in Hungary, and he anticipated that Italy and Poland could outvote Germany, if necessary, at a conference. Ribbentrop replied that something might be done if Germany and Poland could reach an agreement about their own problems. Lipsky merely promised to transmit the German proposals to Warsaw. Ribbentrop did not refer to new Polish demands on Lithuania, which had been made on October 20, 1938. Poland had insisted on the suppression of anti-Polish pressure groups in Lithuania and on the granting of new privileges to the Polish minority. Beck's delay of the Polish response reports about this confidential discussion spread rapidly through Europe. Kennard informed Halifax on October 25, 1938, on fairly good authority, that Germany and Poland were negotiating on provisions for a general agreement in addition to a common Hungarian-Polish frontier. Kennard recapitulated the points raised by Ribbentrop the previous day with complete accuracy. He added that he had received this information from a number of different sources in Warsaw. Maltka was pessimistic about the chances for an understanding with Poland. He continued to worry about the activities of Ukrainian propagandists in Germany. He noted that the Poles mistrusted Germany and that we frequently give grounds for this mistrust. He also had changed his earlier attitude about the advisability of suppressing news about the German minority in Poland in the German press. He contended that this made the Poles uneasy and that at a calm, factual presentation of these matters would not be seriously disturbing to the Poles at all. Maltka also claimed that Germany had soft-pedaled the anti-Soviet line since the Munich conference, and that the Poles were worried about a possible German-Soviet deal. Of course, a German pro-Soviet policy would be incompatible with a Ukrainian irredentist policy, but Maltka was claiming that individual Poles were worried about both prospects. It was clear that he was himself worried about the unfavorable prospects for a German-Polish understanding, and he was not confident that generous concessions from Germany could overcome the obstacles. Beck was shrewd enough to realize, after October 24, 1938, that he would not receive German support in the Ruthenian question unless he adopted a positive attitude toward German proposals for an understanding. He knew that Great Britain wished to support Poland against Germany 
but realized that the British leaders were playing for time. He was inclined to stake the future of Poland on a successful British preventive war against Germany rather than to reach an understanding with the Germans. His belief that Great Britain would oppose Germany discouraged serious consideration of the German offer. His realization that the British needed time to prepare their war prompted him to adopt elaborate delaying tactics in dealing with the Germans. His first step was merely to delay a Polish response to the German proposals, and his second step was to withdraw from the policy of seeking German cooperation in Ruthenia. He adopted the attitude, in his conversations with Maltka, that the Ruthenian question after all was not so important to Poland. He observed that it had been foolish to give the territory to the Czechs in 1918, and he added that it would be better for Hungary to have it rather than see it hanging completely in the air. Maltka was told that the Romanians were idiotic not to support Hungarian claims in Ruthenia, since this might appease Hungary and deflect Magyar ambitions from Transylvania. He insisted that the Ruthenians were poor material for a Ukrainian irredentist movement because they did not have the slightest sympathy for the Galician Ukrainians. Maltka confined himself to the observation that the acquisition of poverty-stricken Ruthenia would scarcely appease the Hungarian appetite for the rich lands of Transylvania which had been ceded to Romania in 1919. Beck lost no time in forming Lipsky in strict confidence what he really thought about Ribbentrop's proposals. He declared that the time would never come when Poland would accept the restoration of Danzig to Germany. He reminded Lipsky on October 25, 1938, that Pilsudski had called Danzig the barometer of Polish-German relations, and this meant that Poland should seek to retain the upper hand at Danzig. He confided that a German attempt to incorporate Danzig would produce a Polish attack on Germany. Beck did not say this to the Germans until March 1939, when he knew that the British were prepared to oppose Germany and to form an alliance with Poland. Nevertheless, he was counting on the British in October 1938 rather than merely contemplating an isolated Polish war against Germany, and he shaped his tactics accordingly. Beck might have adopted an entirely different attitude had the British not revealed in September 1938 that it was their intention to oppose Germany when they were ready. Beck tempted by British support against Germany the British attempt to foment a German-Polish conflict, which dated from the duff cooper beck conversations of August 1938, was the worst possible influence on the formation of Polish policy. The glamour of a prospective Anglo-Polish alliance blinded the Polish leaders to the practical advantages of an understanding with the Germans. A British alliance would render inevitable the hostility of both Germany and the Soviet Union toward Poland, without giving Poland the slightest military advantage. An alliance with the British would be equivalent to a death warrant for the new Polish state. Polish diplomacy was floundering badly after the Teshin crisis. The alienation of Slovakia was a colossal blunder, and the attempt to win Romanian support in the Ruthenian question was a farce. Poland had no chance of establishing cordial relations with the Soviet Union. Her sole hope of attaining national security lay in an understanding with Germany, and Poland was lost unless she awakened to the need for such an understanding. The one positive element in the situation was the patient attitude of Hitler toward the Poles. He was not inclined to apply pressure on Poland, and later events suggest that he might have waited indefinitely for a favorable Polish response to his offer had Beck not become impatient and forced Hitler's hand just as Shushnik and Benes had done. It is ironical that Hitler had been denounced for impatience in the context of his territorial revision policy, where in every instance it was the impatience of his adversaries which forced the issue. An understanding with Germany would have given Poland a strong position from which to face future problems with equanimity. The terms offered by Ribbentrop were ideal for the realization of a lasting understanding. The solution envisaged at Danzig would have clarified that perennial problem on terms eminently satisfactory to both Germany and Poland. German willingness to accept the 1919 Polish frontiers 20 years after the Versailles Treaty was most conciliatory diplomacy. The 1919 settlement with Poland was far more unjust to Germany than the 1871 settlement with Germany was to France. Nevertheless, the voluntary recognition by the French leaders of the Franco-German frontier would have been unthinkable in 1890. 
the mirage of effective British support for the realization of their grandiose dreams blinded the Polish leaders and prevented them from recognizing this simple fact. The Great Poland of 1750 was a dangerous legacy which clouded their judgment. The British plot to destroy Germany was the fatal item which undermined their judgment entirely. Chapter 7 German-Polish Friction In 1938 the obstacles to a German-Polish understanding it was a tragedy for Europe that the Munich Conference was limited to the Sudeten question and failed to include a settlement of German-Polish differences, although Mussolini was probably right in favoring a successful limited conference prior to any general conclave. It might have helped had Great Britain received a prize such as Helgoland at Munich. The acquisition of Cyprus at Berlin in 1878 had made palatable the statement of Disraeli that he returned bringing peace with honour. The British were not accustomed to attend conferences involving transfers of territory without acquiring new territory themselves. There were four major obstacles to a German-Polish understanding after the Munich Conference. The most important of these was the notion of Polish leaders that the defeat of Germany in a new war would serve the interests of Poland. The prevalence of this attitude after the death of Pilsudski was implicit in the Polish attempt to foment a war against Germany during the Rhineland crisis of March 1936. There were two primary reasons for this Polish attitude. There was the idea that Poland could not really attain the status of a European great power if she was overshadowed by any of her immediate neighbours. There was the dissatisfaction with the territorial provisions of the Versailles Treaty and the hope of Polish leaders that future territorial expansion at German expense would be possible. Neither of these reasons would have carried much weight after Munich had the British not reverted to a hostile policy toward Germany. The second hindrance was the failure of Polish leaders to recognize the danger to Poland from the Soviet Union. Soviet Foreign Commissar Maxim Litvinov and the American diplomat, William Bullitt, once traveled together on the train to Moscow, when Bullet was ambassador to the Soviet Union. They arrived at the town of Białystok in central Poland, and Litvinov commented that this was his native city. Bullet observed that he had not realized the Soviet diplomat was of Polish birth. Litvinov replied that he was not of Polish birth and that the city of Białystok would not remain Polish. This incident occurred shortly after the admission of the Soviet Union to the League of Nations and at a time when Litvinov was the acknowledged leader of the League attempts to outlaw aggression. Bullet repeated the incident to Polish Foreign Minister Beck. The Polish Foreign Minister had no illusions about the Soviet attitude toward the new Polish state, but he underestimated the industrial strength and military striking power of Russia. Georges Bonnet later said that he did not require a battle of Stalingrad to be convinced of Soviet strength, and this was doubtless true. The majority of European diplomats were prejudiced against communism to the point of blindness, and they simply could not admit that the communist system was capable of producing the most formidable military striking power in Europe until they were shown by irrevocable events. Anthony Eden declared after his visit to Moscow in March 1935 that the Soviet Union would be incapable of aggression for the next 50 years. The Polish Foreign Office on March 9, 1938, circulated a complacent survey of the Soviet scene among its missions abroad. The current terror in Russia was seen to be the dominant factor on the Russian internal front, and the 1936 democratic Soviet constitution was correctly described as a fraud. The balance of the report was preoccupied with the alleged decline of Soviet power, and with the current popular front tactics of communist parties abroad, which were described as a protective front to veil the weakness of the Soviet Union. There was no suggestion that the Soviet Union might emerge more ruthlessly and efficiently united than ever before when the current purges were completed. A realistic Polish appraisal of the Soviet danger might have been an effective force in promoting German-Polish cooperation. The contemptuous dismissal of Russian power prevented the Poles from perceiving their common interests with Germany. It also caused them to suspect some sinister motive in the repeated German attempts to form a common front with Poland against Bolshevism. The third problem resulted from feelings of German insecurity about two of the German communities in the East which were neither under German nor Polish rule. These communities were Danzig and Memel, with a total German population of more than 500,000. Many German communities in the East had been uprooted since 1918, 
and the thought was unbearable to many Germans that this might also happen to Danzig and Memel, after Germany was strong again. There could be no lasting confidence in German-Polish cooperation until these communities were restored to Germany. German concern about Memel was apparent during the March 1938 Polish-Lithuanian crisis. This occurred at the time of the Anschluss between Germany and Austria, when Beck was visiting in Italy. The Italian foreign minister, Count Gael Azzocano, who rarely seemed to have a good word about anyone, referred to Beck as not particularly strong nor singularly intelligent. He noted with evident satisfaction in his diary that Mussolini was not the least impressed with him. Beck, on the other hand, was an interested spectator of the humiliation of the Italian leaders when Hitler occupied Austria. After all, both Austria and Hungary had been within the Italian sphere of influence for many years, and this had been evident to the entire world following the Rome agreements with the two states in 1934. Mussolini made a tremendous effort to explain the situation in his speech to the Italian parliament on March 16, 1938, but the loss of Italian prestige implicit in the Anschluss simply could not be denied. A Polish frontier guard was killed on Lithuanian territory on March 11, 1938. Polish Senator Kazimierz Fudakowski insisted, in a Senate interpellation on March 14, that Lithuania should be forced to submit to extensive Polish demands. It was evident that the Polish leaders were in a mood to score some success at Lithuanian expense, to parallel Hitler's triumph in Austria. Beck returned to Poland on March 16, 1938, by way of Vienna, where he received a brief glimpse of the excitement in the former Austrian capital. Beck discovered that many Polish leaders advocated demands on Lithuania which he considered to be exorbitant under the circumstances. He believed that Lithuania would gradually come within the Polish orbit if too much was not attempted all at once. There were demonstrations in Warsaw and Wilna favoring the acquisition of Memel by Poland, and the creation of a new Polish port on the Baltic Sea. The response in Germany was to order the immediate military occupation of Memel if Polish troops invaded Lithuania. Ribbentrop requested information from Lipski about Polish intentions in Lithuania, but he received no satisfaction from the Polish ambassador until March 18. In the meantime there were several days of uncertainty. Poland presented a 48-hour ultimatum to Lithuania on March 17 which demanded Lithuanian recognition of the status quo, including Polish possession of the ancient Lithuanian capital of Wilna. Beck also demanded the exchange of diplomatic representatives between the two countries, and the opening of the dead Lithuanian-Polish frontier to normal trade. The Lithuanian government on March 19, 1938, decided to submit at the last minute. An attempt to solicit the support of the Soviet Union against Poland had failed, because the Russians had no intention of taking the initiative to promote a conflict at that time. The old Lithuanian policy of hostility toward Poland was abandoned under pressure, and relations between the two countries improved rapidly during the months which followed. Hitler did not object to the gradual transformation of Lithuania into a Polish sphere of influence, but he was convinced that German interests would remain insecure until Memel returned to the Reich. The fourth obstacle to a German-Polish understanding was the ruthless Polish treatment of minorities. This concerned primarily the Polish mistreatment of the Germans, but the Polish attempt to strand more than 50,000 of their Jewish nationals in the Reich, in 1938, also had a bad effect on German-Polish relations. The Polish policy in this maneuver to rid Poland of a large number of Polish Jews was both cruel and audacious. The step itself is not comprehensible unless one takes account of the rising tide of anti-Jewish feeling in Poland early in 1938. The Polish passport crisis considerable attention was given to the problem of encouraging Jewish emigration from Germany in the years from 1933 to 1938, but far more Jews departed from Poland than from Germany during these years. An average 100,000 Jews were emigrating from Poland each year compared to 25 to 28,000 Jews leaving Germany annually. From September 1933 to November 1938 a special economic agreement, Havara Agreement, enabled German Jews to transfer their assets to Palestine, and the German authorities were far more liberal in this respect than Poland. 
There were also special arrangements for wealthy Jews in Germany to contribute to the emigration of others by capital transfers to various places. 170,000 Jews had left Germany by November 9, 1938, compared to approximately 575,000 who had departed from Poland during the same years. It was noted that thousands of Jews who left Germany in 1933 returned to the country after 1934, and that scarcely any of the Polish Jews returned to Poland during the same period. Polish Ambassador Jerzy Potocki made it clear to American Undersecretary of State Sumner Wells in March 1938 that Poland wished to increase the emigration of Polish Jews, and Wells agreed to aid the settlement of Polish Jews in Latin America, and especially in the rich country of Venezuela. A special Polish mission under Major Michael Lepecki was sent to Madagascar in 1937 to study the possibilities for Jewish settlement in that rich, but sparsely populated, French possession. It was clear that the Poles were seeking to encourage the emigration of the greatest possible number of Jews at the least possible cost. American Ambassador Biddle reported from Warsaw on March 28, 1938, that many Polish Jews would welcome a new European war. The destruction of the new Polish state might improve the status of the Jews, and many of them believed that the Soviet Union was a veritable paradise compared to Poland. Biddle added that conditions for the Jews in Poland were becoming constantly more unfavorable, and, of course, this trend increased Jewish disloyalty toward Poland. Biddle declared that both Jewish and Polish leaders favored maximum Jewish emigration, although they did so for different reasons. The Jews had been accused of creating a financial panic during the March 1938 Polish-Lithuanian crisis, when there was a noticeable run on the savings banks. Distrust and dislike of the Jews in Poland extended right to the top. Prime Minister Stowojask Tadkowski claimed, in a conversation with League High Commissioner Burkhard at Warsaw in 1937, that 60% of all Polish Jews were communists and that 90% of the Polish communists were Jews. Biddle announced on March 29, 1938, that the Polish Sejm was passing a large number of new anti-Jewish laws. He explained that 53% of Polish lawyers were Jews, whereas the Jews accounted for merely 8% of the total Polish population. The aim of the new legislation would be to limit Jewish lawyers to a quota based on their proportion of the population. This type of law was sponsored by the government, but there was always the danger that the situation would get out of hand. A bill passed the same in March 1938 which made the eating of kosher meat illegal, although 2.5 million Jews in Poland ate only kosher meat. The government naturally feared the effect on the Polish meat industry of such a forced conversion to vegetarianism, and steps were taken to prevent the implementation of this law. The extremity of the legislative measure provided a good indication of Polish hatred of the Jews. A law also passed the same in March 1938 which permitted the Polish government arbitrarily to withdraw Polish citizenship from nationals abroad. The specific provisions stipulated that individuals could be declared stateless if they had been out of the country for five years. The implementation of the law was postponed until the Czech crisis had run its course. The law had been passed as part of the 1938 Polish anti-Jewish program, and its obvious purpose was to prevent the return to Poland of as many Jews as possible. Many of the Polish Jewish citizens abroad were in Germany. Friction between Germany and Poland was inevitable when the Poles published an ordinance on October 15, 1938, to implement the March 1938 citizenship law. The Poles were well aware of the German attitude toward the Jewish question. Years had passed since Hitler had introduced his anti-Jewish policy in Germany, and his program had received legal sanction in the Nuremberg Reichstag laws of 1935. Hitler believed that the policy of granting full legal and political equality to the Jews, which had been adopted in Germany and Great Britain during the previous century, had been a great mistake for Germany. He believed that intermarriage between Germans and Jews harmed the German people and should be discontinued. He shared the conviction of Roman Domofsky in Poland that the Jews were harmful in the economic and cultural spheres. He also believed that the Jewish influence on German politics had weakened Germany. Hitler worked for the day when there would be no more Jewish subjects in Germany, just as Abraham Lincoln in his last years had worked for an exodus of Negroes from America. 
Hitler's view on the Jewish question was intolerant, and this was perfectly clear to the Polish leaders when they implemented the law of March 1938. The Russian government in 1885 had created difficulties for the Polish and Russian Jews who had sought to return to Poland from Germany. Chancellor Bismarck, at a time when Germany pursued no anti-Jewish policy, insisted that Polish and Russian Jews be deported in increasing numbers until the Russians abolished their restrictions. He argued that, unless he responded in this way, Germany would be tacitly recognizing the right of one nation to dump large numbers of unwanted citizens permanently in a neighboring country. Poland had learned nothing from this example, and she attempted to rid herself of part of her Jewish minority at German expense. The Poles suspected that Hitler might not like this, but they were prepared to use methods to counter German retaliation which the Russian Empire had not dared to adopt. They decided to stop Polish Jews, whom Germany might seek to deport, at the border, with the help of the bayonet. In this tactic they completely surprised the Germans, who never suspected that Poland would go this far. The German Foreign Office made several efforts to persuade the Poles to cancel their decree, but these efforts met with no success. Maltka made a last attempt on October 26, 1938. Time was growing short, because the Polish passports of the Jews would automatically become invalid after October 29, 1938, two weeks after publication of the decree. The Polish consuls in Germany had been empowered to issue special stamps which would free the passports of certain individuals from the decree, but it was evident that these stamps were not granted to Polish citizens of Jewish extraction. It was apparent to Maltka that his last protest produced no effect on Jan Zembek at the Polish Foreign Office. He proceeded to give Zembek fair warning by confiding that the Germans would expel the Polish Jews unless they received satisfaction from Poland. This produced a reaction, and Zembek expressed his astonishment at the allegedly severe reprisal planned by Germany. Maltka explained that the question could easily be settled if the Polish government agreed that the decree would not apply to Reich territory or if it promised that Polish citizens in Germany would be allowed to return to Poland without the special stamp. Beck's reply on October 27 to Maltka's Daymarsh contained an interesting set of arguments in support of the Polish stand. He argued that Polish resident aliens of Jewish extraction in Germany had suffered from anti-Jewish legislation, despite the fact that they were not German citizens. He contended that this justified Poland in divesting herself of responsibility for this group. He admitted that Poland herself employed anti-Jewish measures, and that she did not desire the return of Polish Jews abroad. He claimed that this was justifiable because German currency controls would prevent Polish Jews from bringing most of their wealth to Poland. This would mean that they would constitute a drain on the resources of the Polish state. Beck's language was unmistakably clear and it was apparent to the Germans that there was no point in pursuing the negotiation. The German authorities took great pains to act without guilt or blame. They organized the transport of Polish Jews with great care, and they made certain that the travelers had good facilities, including plenty of space and ample good food. The story told years later by the American journalist William Shire, about Jews deported to Poland in boxcars under brutal conditions, was clearly fictitious. The first trains passed the border to Polish stations before the Poles were prepared to stop them. After that, the unbelievable happened. Although the last day for issuance of the stamps was not until October 29, and the new exclusion policy was not scheduled to take effect until October 30, and Polish border police attempted to prevent the Jews from entering Poland. The Germans had made no preparation for this development, and soon thousands of Polish Jews were pouring into a few small border towns in Upper Silesia and elsewhere. W.K. Best, the German police official in charge of the operation, declared that through the massing of thousands of Polish Jews in a few border towns on the German-Polish frontier, some very disagreeable conditions resulted. The German police decided to bring as many Jews as possible into Poland at night by means of the Green Border which meant by obscure paths in heavily wooded areas or across unguarded meadows. This was dangerous work. There was considerable small arms fire from the Polish side, but no actual engagements occurred between the Germans and the Poles along the border. 
the Poles retaliated immediately by driving across the border into Germany small numbers of Jews from Western Poland, who had retained German citizenship since World War I. The Polish government issued a decree on the afternoon of October 29, 1938, for the expulsion of enough ethnic Germans from Posen and West Prussia to make up for the discrepancy in numbers between the two Jewish groups. This Polish act of defiance brought the German action to a halt. It was feared that the Poles, with deliberate exaggeration, would organize vast transports of Germans, and exploit the occasion to empty the former Prussian provinces of their remaining German population. Furthermore, Hitler did not like the bitter nature of the affair, and he feared that German-Polish relations might be wrecked if the incident was not checked. Most of the Jews who had been successfully deported were sent across on the night of October 28-29. The Polish Jews who arrived at the border on the afternoon of October 29 were returned to their homes in Germany. The German authorities had not rushed the Polish Jews out of their homes under the impression that they would never be permitted to return. They were explicit in promising them that they could return, when their passports were validated in Poland, and when the Poles gave them re-entry permits. Negotiations on this subject were conducted in Warsaw, since Lipski had deliberately left Germany and remained in Poland throughout this crisis. The negotiations were transferred to Berlin in late November 1938. Nothing like a comprehensive settlement was ever attained, but the Poles at last agreed that the Jews actually deported could return to Germany without forfeiting their right to return to Poland. The majority of the Polish Jews in Germany had not participated in the deportation action, and they did not receive special entry stamps entitling them to return to Poland. They became stateless Jews, and many of them emigrated later from Germany to other countries. Most of the Polish Jews resident in Germany at the time of the Polish decree preferred for economic reasons to stay there rather than to return to Poland. There is no doubt that more Polish Jews returned to Poland because of the decree than otherwise would have been the case but the Polish leaders had the satisfaction of reducing the actual number of Polish Jews in Poland, at least on paper. The Polish decree and its repercussions produced an important impact on the current treatment of the Jews in Germany. Large numbers of Jews had been coming to Berlin from other areas after the Anschluss between Germany and Austria. The Anschluss increased the German Jewish population by nearly 200,000, or more than the total number of Jews who had departed from Germany. American Ambassador Hugh Wilson reported on June 22, 1938, that an alleged 3,000 new Jews had entered Berlin during the past month, and on the weekend of June 18 there had been demonstrations against Jewish stores in Berlin for the first time since 1933. The German government in October 1938 was preparing a series of measures to restrict the participation of Jews in the legal profession and it was evident that there might be other measures designed to restrict Jewish activities. There was obviously considerable disagreement among the German leaders about what, if anything, should be done, but the repercussions of the Polish passport crisis played into the hands of the more radical group, headed by German Minister of Propaganda and Enlightenment, Joseph Goebbels. The parents and sisters of Herschel Grinspan, a syphilitic degenerate living in Paris, had been on one of the German transports. Grinspan received a postcard from one of his sisters on November 3, 1938. This postcard described the journey to Poland, but it did not contain any special complaint. The German transports were carefully provided with comfortable facilities and adequate food. Grinspan had been living with an uncle in Paris since 1936, but there was a French police order demanding his expulsion from France. Grinspan had been thrown out of his uncle's house on the day before he assaulted the German diplomat, Ernst vom Rath. Grinspan had decided to murder German ambassador Welchek, and he actually spoke to him without recognizing him in front of the German embassy on the morning of November 7, 1938. Afterward he entered the German embassy, and he fired his revolver at vom Rath after he discovered that Welchek was absent. Grinspan was still living in Paris after World War II and the story of his trial and imprisonment by the French, and of his imprisonment by the Germans, is an interesting chapter in legal history. Dorothy Thompson in the United States sponsored the collection of large sums for the legal defense of the allegedly heroic young Jew, who actually belonged in an institution before the affair at the German embassy. 
Ironically, Ernst von Rath had been a resolute opponent of Hitler's anti-Jewish policy. The tragedy in Paris was exploited by Goebbels in an obvious effort to increase the severity of the general German policy toward the unfortunate German Jews. At the time of a previous murder of a prominent German abroad by a Jew, in 1936, Goebbels had warned that the next incident of this type would lead to severe measures against the Jews. When Vom Rath died of his wounds on November 9, 1938, Goebbels did what he could to carry out this threat. He gave an anti-Jewish speech at Munich on November 9 which was seized upon by German SA leaders as an excuse to attack Jewish property. Some of the Jewish synagogues in Germany were destroyed by fires set by organized groups on November 10, 1938, and much business property was damaged. There were demonstrations against the Jews, but no pogroms, since no Jews lost their lives. The mass of the Germans were horrified by the destruction of Jewish property, which was contrary to their sense of decency and their feeling for law and order. Goebbels welcomed this as a turning point which would lead to the elimination of the last vestiges of Jewish influence in Germany. American reaction to the events in Germany was more vigorous than elsewhere, and for the first time it appeared that conditions for Jewish life were becoming worse in Germany than in any other country of Europe. Hull ordered Ambassador Wilson on November 14 to leave Germany within a few days, and he forbade him to sail on a German ship. Wilson relayed an assurance from Goebbels on the following day that there would be no financial penalty or other measures against foreign Jews in Germany. Wilson reported on November 16 that the British diplomats in Berlin were rather complacent about he Jewish question. They noted that German public opinion was not behind the recent anti-Jewish measures and they wisely concluded that this sort of thing would not be repeated. This was the last report which Wilson sent to Hull before leaving the country. Hitler was persuaded by Goebbels, after the demonstrations, to levy a 1 billion mark, $250 million, fine on the wealthy and moderately wealthy Jews of Germany. Goebbels had argued that otherwise the Jews would be able to pocket vast amounts of money from the German insurance companies, because the assets damaged or destroyed on November 10, 1938, had been heavily insured. The poorer Jews who had less than 5,000 marks in immediate cash assets were exempted. The German insurance companies were ordered to pay the Jews promptly for all damages suffered to property on November 10, and it was permissible to use part of this money in paying the fine. The fine was to be paid in four installments, on December 15, 1938, February 15, May 15, and August 15, 1939. The Jews complained that their total capital in Germany in November 1938 was only 8 billion marks, and that the fine was tantamount to the confiscation of a large share of their assets. A German law was announced on November 26, 1938, that would eliminate Jewish retail stores, and its provisions were to go into effect on January 1, 1939. At the same time it was promised that welfare care and other state relief measures on behalf of the Jews would be continued. The Polish passport crisis and its repercussions had little effect on the official relations of Germany with foreign countries other than with the United States and Poland. German-American relations were catastrophically bad in any event because of the hostility of the American leaders toward Germany. The main effect in Poland was to stimulate more severe measures toward the German minority, and to produce an indefinite postponement of Beck's visit to Germany. It was obvious to the Germans, without knowing Beck's attitude on Danzig, that the prompt negotiation of a general settlement with Poland had met with serious delay. Persecution of the German minority in Poland The entire year of 1938 was a bad period for the German minority in Poland because of the intensification of the official Polish anti-German measures. It seemed as if the Poles were suddenly in a great hurry to eliminate the German minority. The Polish leaders rationalized their policy of persecuting Germans with the specious argument that conditions facing the Polish minority in Germany were worse than ever before. Chairman Jan Wieluski, of the Foreign Policy Committee of the same, brought the attention of Polish public opinion to this issue in an important speech of April 23, 1938. Wieluski charged that the November 1937 minority agreement was observed solely in the German Reich Chancellery and nowhere else in Germany. He claimed that conditions for the Germans in Poland were far better than the situation of the Poles in Germany. 
This speech had a disastrous effect on the attitude of the Polish masses toward the Germans in Poland, and the theme of the speech was constantly reiterated in the Polish popular press. The speech and the press campaign were inconvenient for Germany at a time when Hitler was seeking to improve conditions for the Sudeten Germans in Czechoslovakia. It was easy for the international press to claim that Germany deserved no sympathy because she mistreated her own minorities. Polish complaints reached a staccato peak when the results of the May 15, 1938, census were announced, and a mere 15,000 individuals in Germany claimed to be ethnically Polish. This result had been anticipated by the Polish leaders. Lipsky had presented a first complaint against the methods of the German census as early as March 31, 1938. It was astonishing to note that the Poles hoped to dictate a return to the census methods of the Prussian monarchy before 1918. 15,927 individuals had voted for union with Poland in the southeast West Prussian and southern East Prussian plebiscite zone in 1920. This had been at a time when Germany was prostrate and defeated. In May 1938, only 212 individuals in this entire area claimed Polish ethnic origin. This was too much for the Poles, and they invoked the clauses of the 1937 treaty which prohibited assimilation by force. The Union of Poles in Germany began a campaign on orders from Warsaw to demonstrate that the situation of the Polish minority was deteriorating. The Polish organization claimed that the activities of Poles were being restricted in many spheres. The Germans realized that the grievances of a minority are never entirely imaginary, and they hoped to appease the Poles in the interest of the much larger German minority in Poland. The German Ministry of the Interior promised to deal with Polish complaints after calling a conference of experts. They were under strong pressure from the German Foreign Office to do this, and they were advised that the Polish press was drawing ugly parallels with the oppression of the Polish minority in Czechoslovakia. It was noted that the warmongering Jewish New York Times had taken up the theme. The German Ministry of the Interior in a report on June 24, 1938, admitted that certain Polish grievances correspond to some extent with the actual situation. Instances of discrimination against Polish students and of restrictions on the distribution of books by Polish cooperatives had been discovered. German Minister of the Interior Wilhelm Frick received the leaders of the Polish minority, and he promised them that Polish grievances would be remedied. The German Ministry of the Interior also insisted that the position of the German minority in Poland offered far greater cause for complaint. The need for periodic conferences among representatives from the two nations was stressed, and the German Foreign Office was secretly informed that this was the only effective means of alleviating the difficult position of the German minority in Poland. The Ministry of Interior realized that unilateral concessions to the Poles in Germany would not solve the problem of the Germans in Poland. Coordination of German and Polish policies was demanded, but it was precisely this coordination that the Germans were never able to attain. Frick's reception of the Polish minority leaders on June 24, 1938, was publicized in the Polish press. Nevertheless, the official Gazeta Polska argued in an editorial devoted to the question that coordination of policies by the two nations was unnecessary. The editors took the position that minority questions should be treated as a purely domestic concern by each government. This declaration was tantamount to an abrogation of the November 1937 German-Polish Minority Pact, which stipulated official Polish interest in the Poles of Germany and official German interest in the Germans of Poland. The difficulty was that the German minority in Poland was more numerous and prominent than the Polish minority in Germany. It was easy for the Polish leaders to conclude that the elimination of the large German minority in Poland would more than compensate for any possible losses to the Poles in Germany were the Germans eventually goaded into retaliation. Indeed, a less tolerant German policy might have encouraged a revival of Polish nationalism among the Poles of Germany. Most of the Polish-speaking people of Germany were proud of German prosperity and efficiency, and they preferred to be considered German. The Polish leaders hoped that they would rediscover their Polish hearts if Germany adopted a less favorable policy or experienced another disaster as bad or worse than 1918. In the meantime they could take care of themselves. It was much as if Germany and Poland were nations at war. 
The Poles had a vast number of German hostages and the Germans had a considerably smaller number of Poles. The reciprocity which sometimes prompts belligerent nations to treat prisoners humanely, because many of their own people are in the hands of the enemy, was sadly lacking in this instance. There were signs that the German Foreign Office would not desist forever from according to the Polish mistreatment of the German minority the major emphasis which it deserved. Lipsky appeared at the German Foreign Office on June 13, 1938 to protest about obstacles to the completion of a new Polish school for girls at Radibor in West Upper Silesia. The local German authorities were exasperated about this new school. They claimed that it was being erected on the wrong side of the frontier, because most of the girls studying there would be from Poland. The incident seemed a minor one to State Secretary Wiesacker, and he admitted to his colleagues that he was sorely tempted to challenge Lipski about current Polish measures against the Germans in Poland but he had desisted because of the Czech crisis. At last, on June 17, 1938, Foreign Minister Ribbentrop issued an order for German diplomats in Poland to assemble a list of grievances from the German minority in Poland. It was evident that the Poles were going too far and that the German Foreign Office was reluctantly contemplating recourse to diplomatic protests on behalf of the Germans in Poland. Senator Hesbuck, the leader of the conservative German faction in Poland, was appalled by this situation. He argued that the German government should confine itself to requests for the coordination of minority policies. He was terrified by the increasing tension between Germans and Poles in Western Poland. There were rumors that the German press was about to retaliate against the anti-German Polish press campaign and Hesbuck was convinced that this would be a disaster. He pleaded with German diplomats in Poland that press retaliation would whip the provincial Poles into a frenzy. They had been told by their local newspapers that the Germans never complained about conditions in another country unless they intended to conquer it. Hasbuck predicted fearful consequences if the restrictions on the German press were removed. Maltke did not favor complete press silence about Polish treatment of the German minority, but he did agree with Hasbuck that the question should be handled with great caution. Maltke was scornful about the complaints of the Polish minority in Germany and he noted that they had admitted on June 2, 1938, that they had no complaint about discrimination in the economic sphere. Economic discrimination was the major issue for the Germans in Poland, although they also had to face much more cultural and educational discrimination than the Poles of Germany. Maltke reported with great indignation on July 7, 1938, that the Poles had discovered that Germany was planning a press campaign to expose Polish mistreatment of the Germans. The German newspapers had discovered that the Foreign Office was collecting material about Polish outrages, and the editors proceeded to do likewise. They had sent instructions to several correspondents by public telephone, and in Poland where the wires were tapped this was equivalent to broadcasting the news. Maltka strongly advised that the Polish government should be given some assurances about this situation. The warning from Maltka suggested to the German Foreign Office that Lipski might raise the question in Berlin. A special memorandum was prepared on July 8, 1938, for use in possible conversations. It contained a few of the major grievances about the mistreatment of the Germans in Poland. The Polish 1938 annual land reform law was heavily biased against German interests. Most of the larger agricultural holdings in Posen and West Prussia belonged to Poles, and only these larger holdings were subject to confiscation and redistribution under the law. Nevertheless, the Germans in these two provinces were compelled to supply more than two-thirds of the acreage for confiscation in 1938. The new Polish program of establishing a 30-kilometer border zone, in which the Germans could own no land, included all of East Upper Silesia and broad strips of Posen and West Prussia. The memorandum accused the Polish authorities of tolerating and encouraging a private boycott of all industrial firms which employed Germans. 80% of the German labor force in East Upper Silesia was unemployed, and it was apparent that an increasing number of desperate young Germans were abandoning their homes in that area. The German youth were denied the apprenticeships which would have enabled them to find employment in the many craft professions. The Poles had intensified their program of closing German schools. The memorandum, which sketched the existing situation in general terms, 
concluded with the suggestion that future concessions to the Poles of Germany should be dependent on the improvement of conditions in Poland. Maltka was instructed to tell Beck, on the same day, that the complaint of the Polish minority and the extensive treatment of this complaint in the Polish press had done extremely great damage in many respects. The response of Beck was characteristic. He agreed to inform the Polish Ministry of Interior of Maltka's complaint, but he added pointedly that the question was not within his competence as foreign minister. This statement followed the line adopted by the Gazeta Polska, and it indicated that the Poles regarded the 1937 Minority Pact as a dead letter. It was feared in the German Foreign Office that Hitler would not raise a finger to prevent the doom of the German minority in Poland. In August 1938 the political division of the German Foreign Office prepared a memorandum on the question for Werner Lorenz, the chief of the Central Agency for Germans Abroad. This organization had maintained strict neutrality toward the feuds and conflicts of the German political groups in Poland. Hitler did not wish the agency to pursue an active policy in Poland and he intervened to prevent the memorandum from reaching Lorenz. The text of the memorandum was in conflict with Hitler's policy. It suggested that no considerations of higher policy could justify the abandonment of the German minority in Poland. The situation of the Germans in the former Prussian, Austrian, and Russian sections of Poland was described, and the lack of initiative and unity among the German minority communities was deplored. It was noted that the principal Polish effort was directed against the German community in former Prussian territory and that the Poles had exploited the 1934 pact with Germany to intensify their de-Germanization policies. The memorandum contained the dangerous suggestion that the German authorities should take the initiative to secure greater unity among the Germans in Poland. This fact alone was sufficient to prompt Hitler to suppress it. Polish demonstrations against Germany Maltka attempted to explain the increasingly unfavorable situation of the German minority in a report on September 2, 1938. He blamed much of the trouble on the OZON, Camp of National Unity, which had been founded by Colonel Adam K.O.C. This vast officially sponsored pressure group was seeking to secure a broad basis of popular support for the policies of the Polish government. Maltka charged that the government departments in Poland were under OZON influence, and that they were seeking to increase their popularity by exploiting and encouraging the rising anti-German sentiment. The government was trying to be more anti-German than the people, rather than opposing popular superstition and prejudice about the Germans. This policy was incompatible with the spirit of the 1934 pact. The German ambassador admitted that this development was stimulated by German successes. The Anschluss had produced a catastrophic effect, and the uneasiness and excitement had increased with the opening of the Sudeten crisis. The Poles knew that the militant Sudeten German minority in Czechoslovakia was the most powerful ally Hitler had in dealing with the Czechs, and they were determined that the Germans in Poland should remain intimidated. Maltkin noted that an increasing number of Germans were being sentenced to prison by Polish courts for such alleged remarks as the Führer would have to straighten things out here, or it would soon be Poland's turn. There was no way of knowing how many of these unfortunate individuals were entirely innocent of the remarks attributed to them. The flames were fanned by Poles who returned from Germany with the claim that they had encountered German propaganda directed against Poland. It was said that propagandists were encouraging the Ukrainians to revolt against Poland, and that they were demanding the return of the corridor to Germany. Maltka was especially annoyed by the apparent indifference of the Polish government toward the increasing number of anti-German mass demonstrations. He was indignant that groups of Poles had recently appeared before German consulates, without official interference, to sing the provocative Rota, a popular anti-German song with many different versions. One central theme in 1938 was that God would reward Poles who hanged Germans. Maltke concluded his report with a list of prominent individuals in Poland who had recently adopted a more hostile attitude toward Germany. He remained completely deceived about Joseph Beck, whom he continued to regard as pro-German. It was unfortunate for Hitler that Maltke was unable to penetrate Beck's attitude to some extent. Hitler might have been able to avoid the trap that Halifax was preparing for him had he realized that Beck was one of his enemies. The outrages at Teschen The situation at Teschen in October 1938 offered a vivid illustration of the problem created by Polish persecution of the Germans. 
Hitler had given Poland full support in her successful effort to acquire this district from the Czechs. The Poles, however, proceeded to treat the German and pro-German elements of the district as archenemies. Degermanization measures began immediately after the Polish military occupation of the area. Every German school in the district was closed at once. The Germans were told that the schools would be reopened later, but in the meantime the parents of the school children were threatened with unemployment if they did not send their children to Polish schools. Merely one-tenth of the previous number of children reported, when it was announced that the schools would be reopened, and only a fraction of these were subsequently allowed to attend German schools. The original staffs of German teachers had been dismissed. It was announced that Polish was the sole official language, and the doctors and lawyers of the area were told that they would not be allowed to practice unless they learned Polish within three months. Bank assets were frozen for a considerable period, and pensions and state salaries to Germans were reduced. The mayors of both Teschen and Oderberg were removed. Mayor Kozden of Teschen was the leader of the local Slonczyk community, which was a small West Slavic group similar to the Kasubians of West Prussia, or the Lusitian Sorbs of Saxony. When Kozden was disgraced and sent to prison in Poland, the local Slonczyk community replied with the scornful slogan that they would rather be inmates of a German concentration camp than so-called citizens of Poland. The situation was aggravated when the local Slonczyk population offered considerable resistance to the Poles. It seemed for a time that the Germans might also resist. The leaders of the German community, Dr. Harbich of Teschen, and Dr. Fitzner of Oderberg, hastened to Berlin to appeal for German assistance. When the German Foreign Office ignored their pleas they threatened to appeal to France, Great Britain, Italy and Japan, as signatories of the 1919 Minority Agreement on Teschen. They were coolly advised by the German diplomats to leave out the Japanese, because it was repugnant to envisage an Asiatic power intervening in a European question. They were told that for the German government the question of Teschen was to be regarded as settled. Harbich exclaimed in despair that he would return home to lead his community in battle against the Poles. Baron Wurman later recalled, I tried to explain to them the renunciation of Oderberg in the context of general German policy, but apparently without success. This failure is not surprising when one considers that the homes and livelihood of these men were at stake. On October 3, 1938, after the occupation of the city of Teschen, the Polish armed forces pushed on to Trinitz, Lazy, and Kerwin in the Teschen district ahead of the schedule agreed upon with the Czechs. The Polish excuse for the rapid advance was the hostility of the local population. The Gazeta Polska explained that it was necessary to anticipate the formation of German shock troops at Oderberg. It was added that the German authorities were not permitting these forces to receive arms from Germany. In reality, the Poles were not fighting German shock troops, which did not exist, but a few desperate Slonczyk workers and farmers. Polish placards posted during the day were torn down at night, and a pitched battle took place between the Polish soldiers and the Slonczyks at Trinitz. Governor Grazinski of East Upper Silesia, who was scheduled to administer the new district for Poland, concluded that the Slonczyks needed considerable re-education before they could become useful Polish citizens. A first major step in the Polonization program was to drive out as many Germans and Czechs as possible, and to bring in Polish specialists and industrial workers from East Upper Silesia. The effect of this policy is well illustrated by the following example. The Oderberg Wire Factory, which annually produced 90,000 tons of iron, steel and copper wire, had 1,324 employees on October 10, 1938. There were also 126 engineers, merchants and master craftsmen connected with the firm, and they comprised the group of specialists. The Germans furnished 758 factory workers and specialists, the Czechs 547 factory workers and 73 specialists, the Poles 19 factory workers and one specialist. Approximately 20% of the Czechs had close Polish contacts and one acceptance in the Polish ethnic group after the Polish occupation. By May 10, 1939, there were 635 Polish factory workers and 82 specialists, 112 Czech factory workers and 11 specialists, 
and 324 German factory workers and 17 specialists. The Poles had become the dominant group, after the arbitrary dismissal of large numbers of German and Czech workers, and this pattern was repeated in other crucial industries. Approximately 20% of the total German population of the district fled within the first month of Polish occupation, and it was necessary to house 5,000 of the refugees in emergency camps in West Upper Silesia. Thousands of refugees received temporary quarters in private German homes. Governor Grazinski had raised feelings to a white heat among his followers with charges that the Teschen Germans were guilty of an insurrectionary conspiracy. Most of the refugees entered Germany without frontier passes from the Polish authorities, simply glad to be alive. Passes in any event were issued solely on the condition that those receiving them renounce their right to return. On October 15, 1938, the Germans began to present a series of careful formal protests which received no publicity. Conditions in Teschen were never rectified while the region was under Polish control. A protest note containing a detailed list of grievances about Teschen was presented at Warsaw on November 26, 1938. Several weeks later Maltka was told that this protest should not have been made, because most of the Germans in the Teschen area were not German citizens. The Poles had promised to review the entire matter, but this was their sole response. Their stand was remarkably bold when one recalls that the German-Polish Minority Treaty of November 1937 applied to ethnic Poles in Germany and to ethnic Germans in Poland, and not merely to Polish and German citizens in the opposite countries. A series of anti-German measures accompanied the national election to the Polish Sejm in November 1938. The German minority leaders urged their people to vote, although candidates of German extraction were no longer allowed to stand for election. Four of the remaining six German secondary schools in Posen province were deprived of their status as public schools at this time and they forfeited both the special state protection extended to public institutions and their tax privileges. Governor Grazinski of East Upper Silesia considered an election a favorable time to agitate publicly against the Germans. He presided at a meeting which had the temerity to resolve that the Polish minority in West Upper Silesia should place its allegiance in Poland, rather than in Germany. He also intensified his campaign to secure the discharge of the remaining German workers in East Upper Silesian mining and industry. New Polish measures of school censorship were introduced in West Prussia. The Index of Forbidden Germanic Books was expanded to include such works as the Nibelungen Lied, the most highly prized early German heroic epic, Goethe's Poetry and Truth, Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, and Stanley's Through Darkest Africa. The leading German charity organization in the city of Grujots, Graudenz, was closed and its property was confiscated. The exclusively German private school in Little Neustadt was told that it would be forbidden to hold its annual Christmas play in 1938. The anti-German and anti-Jewish pressure group, Association of Young Poland, planned a major boycott against all German firms in Polish West Prussia for January 1939 and at that time it was permitted to picket German firms without interference from Polish authorities. Indeed, the boycott would probably never have been attempted had the Polish authorities given the slightest indication that they would oppose it. The encouragement of anti-German measures was part of the formula with which the Polish leaders were seeking to promote the popularity of their regime. It is incredible under these circumstances to read in a widely accepted Polish source, outside of the communist orbit and more than 20 years later, that the persecution of the Germans in Poland was entirely imaginary. It was evident that Hitler was willing to close one eye to a great amount of Polish mistreatment of the German minority. It was not clear at the end of 1938 how far the Poles would push this policy in the immediate future, or whether or not Hitler would be willing to tolerate whatever the Poles might decide to do. It would have meant a great deal had the Poles indicated a positive attitude toward a comprehensive settlement along the lines proposed by Germany on October 24, 1938. It is probable that Hitler in such circumstances and for reasons of higher policy would have ignored anything they chose to do to the Germans of Poland short of slaughtering them. The failure of the Poles to indicate a positive attitude contributed to the increasing German-Polish friction toward the end of 1938. The problem of German communication with East Prussia Ribbentrop, after his conversation with Lipsky on October 24, 
requested a special report from Fritz Tote, the inspector for German highways, about the problem of German transit over the corridor. Tote discussed the matter with Hitler. Hitler and Tote were close personal friends. The German leader told Tote that a German guarantee of Polish possession of the corridor was conditional on the acquisition of a German route to East Prussia. Hitler confided that he would like to have both a superhighway and a railway, but that he would be willing to settle for a superhighway. Tote was also inclined to favor the Poles, and he and Hitler found themselves in close agreement on this issue. Tote reported to Ribbentrop that nothing could more effectively lend force to a guarantee of the Polish corridor than the elimination, through such a corridor highway, of the economic disadvantage of the corridor for Germany, namely, the interruption of traffic between East Prussia and the Reich. Tote believed that there were two feasible possibilities for a transit route through the corridor. A superhighway might be constructed from Buto, Pomerania, to Elbing, East Prussia, via Prost in Danzig territory. This route would run 75 km through Danzig territory and only 40 km through Polish territory. Nevertheless, Tote feared that the Poles might object to this route for strategic reasons. They would consider the road a German military asset, and they might claim that this route was too close to the coast and would place the entire coast under German control. The German inspector was inclined to believe that the Poles would prefer a route from Schlicka, Pomerania, to Marienwerder, East Prussia, which would extend 85 km through Polish territory. This route would avoid Danzig territory, but it would be close enough to connect Danzig with the highway by means of a feeder road on German territory. Tote believed that any route farther from Danzig would be distinctly disadvantageous for Germany, because Danzig was the largest metropolis within the German-populated region on the eastern side of the corridor. It was easy for Tote to supply a number of convincing arguments to justify the road scheme. German land traffic between Pomerania and East Prussia was hampered by current Polish control measures. The high Polish fees for the use of Polish roads involved the loss of much foreign exchange by Germany at a time when the balance of German trade was far from favorable. Tote calculated that the Poles were making 500% profit on road maintenance and on the servicing of rolling stock. Tote mentioned a comparable road project which had been proposed at Prague. This plan for a superhighway connecting Breslau and Vienna, by way of Brunn in Moravia, had been worked out in complete detail. He believed that it was easy to illustrate that this plan made full allowance for the protection of Czech interests, and that it contained economic features which would prove attractive to the Czechs. Tote concluded his report by requesting Ribbentrop to consult with him and to inform him at once if an agreement with Poland could be achieved. Tension at Danzig on November 9, 1938, the very day that Baron von Rath in Paris succumbed to the wounds inflicted by Grinspan, the Germans received some disquieting information from League High Commissioner Burkhardt in Danzig. Burkhardt confided that there had been a peculiar change in Poland's attitude toward Danzig. The Poles had earlier indicated their desire to eliminate the League regime in the area, but recently they had switched their policy to support for the League regime. This was disappointing to Burkhardt, who had hoped that Poland and Germany were about to agree on the return of Danzig to Germany. Burkhardt mentioned that foreign diplomats were aware that there was evidently some disharmony between Germany and Poland. The November 1938 Ribbentrop-Lipsky conference Lipsky returned to Warsaw shortly after his conversation with Ribbentrop on October 24, 1938. And he participated in a conference at the Polish Foreign Office on November 4, 1938, to discuss the Ruthenian problem. Ribbentrop's recent offer was also freely discussed at the conference. The Poles had not taken seriously the suggestion that Beck and Lipsky were to share a secret with Ribbentrop, and the British had been aware of the content of the German offer since October 25 Lipsky predicted that the Germans would never retreat at Danzig, and that they would never drop their plan to recover the city from the League. He spoke of Ribbentrop in unfavorable terms as a disagreeable partner in negotiation. He added that Ribbentrop wasted much time in insisting that Danzig was a German city, and he claimed that the German foreign minister did not understand Panzig at all. Lipsky exclaimed that Danzig had returned to the orbit of its Polish hinterland, and that it was therefore no longer German. Lipsky returned to Berlin with instructions from Beck. 
The Polish foreign minister knew that the British wished to gain more time for their armament campaign before challenging Germany, and he chose to adopt delaying tactics in the interest of synchronizing Polish policy with British policy. Ribbentrop asked Lipsky on November 19, 1938, if he had received instructions from Beck in response to the German offer. Lipsky replied in the affirmative, and he blandly assured the German foreign minister that an agreement might be reached for a German superhighway and railway through the corridor. Lipsky reminded Ribbentrop that Polish neutrality had been useful to Germany during the Czech crisis. He added the deceptive claim that, during those critical days, the Polish government had turned a deaf ear to all siren songs emanating from certain quarters. Ribbentrop accepted Lipsky's statements at face value, and he expressed the hope that Poland recognized the importance of German friendship during the Teschen crisis. Lipsky proceeded to discuss the Danzig question. His two principal themes were that the maintenance of the free city was essential to the vital interests of Poland, and that any Polish decision about Danzig would have to take account of the Polish domestic situation and Polish public opinion. He announced that Beck had instructed him to introduce counter-proposals. These included a very general statement about the importance of improving German-Polish relations, and a suggestion that Germany and Poland conclude a special Danzig treaty. The principal purpose of this treaty would be to recognize the permanent independence of the free city of Danzig. Lipsky seemingly favored the termination of League sovereignty despite the report from Burkhardt about the current Polish attitude in favor of the League regime. Ribbentrop was disappointed. He replied that the proposed treaty indicated an attitude on the part of Beck which he deplored. He did not deny that the acquisition of Danzig by Germany would represent a sacrifice for Poland, but he failed to understand why the Poles did not realize that a guarantee of Polish rule in the corridor would be a much greater sacrifice for Hitler. He said to Lipsky, the purpose underlying my suggestion was to establish German-Polish relations on a foundation as lasting as solid rock, and to do away with all possible points of friction. He complained that the Poles apparently thought that he was merely interested in engaging in a little diplomatic chat. These remarks did not discourage Lipsky from espousing Beck's proposal. He continued to discuss with intensity the alleged advantages of the Danzig Treaty. It was evident that Ribbentrop wished to avoid the danger of disrupting negotiations. He finally replied that the proposal did not seem very practicable, but that he would discuss it with Hitler. Ribbentrop passed briefly to a specific German grievance. He noted that the Polish postal authorities had recently issued Polish stamps for use in Danzig which represented Danzig as a Polish city. Lipsky admitted at once that he could understand the negative reaction this had produced among the Germans. Ribbentrop reminded Lipsky again that his offer was motivated by the desire to promote a German-Polish understanding. Lipsky replied that it was clear to him that the German foreign minister was seeking to achieve a permanent understanding. This remark pleased Ribbentrop, and he told Lipsky that anything as important as a permanent understanding could not be achieved in one day. He added that if M. Beck would give our proposals his best thought, he might see his way to adopting a positive attitude. Lipsky claimed that Beck was seeking to maintain complete secrecy, and he asserted that Beck had told an American correspondent of the Hearst Press, in late October 1938, that no negotiations were being conducted between Germany and Poland. This was a lapse on Lipsky's part, because the interview to which he referred had taken place on October 10, 1938, two weeks before the German offer. German confusion about Polish intentions League High Commissioner Burkhard was visiting Beck in Warsaw at the time of Lipsky's conversation with Ribbentrop. He was pleased to discover that Beck seemed to be in a very friendly mood toward Germany. Beck told Burkhard that he was willing to surrender the Polish right to represent Danzig diplomatically in foreign countries. He believed Danzig should receive permission to maintain her own diplomatic representatives in Germany, Poland, and elsewhere. He deprecated the role of the League at Danzig. Beck observed that Poland's interest in Danzig was mainly economic, and not political. Burkhard was delighted with this remark, and he interpreted it as a confession that Poland was willing to have Germany acquire Danzig. He advised the Germans on November 21, 1938, that only a German suggestion was necessary for discussions with Poland. The effect of this report on the Germans is easy to understand. 
they did not know where they stood with Poland. The discrepancy between the Burkhard reports of November 9 and November 21 was obvious. They could not base their policy on the remarks which Beck made to a league representative. Burkhard did not know that negotiations on Danzig had been in progress between Germany and Poland for four weeks. The adamant position which Lipsky had taken on Danzig two days earlier did not permit the German diplomats to share the optimism of Burkhard. Hitler was considering every possible means of resolving the dilemma. He wondered if it might not be possible to gamble on Beck's willingness to accept a fait accompli. Negotiation of an agreement with Poland would be incomparably easier once Germany was established at Danzig. Hitler issued an order to the German armed forces on November 24, 1938, to prepare for the swift occupation of Danzig independently of an agreement with Poland. He placed special emphasis on the fact that he was not contemplating a war with Poland, but that he wished to be prepared for a politically favorable situation. Hitler was considering a Danzig coup at the moment when relations with Poland were as cordial as possible and when Polish armed reprisals against Germany were least likely. This did not mean that he was willing to take such a gamble on the day that he issued the order. The risk was too great because he knew very little about the real Polish attitude. It was extremely significant that the German Foreign Office received permission on the same day to convey full information to the Danzig leaders about the current German-Polish negotiation. The Danzig leaders were to be kept abreast of all future developments. Hitler might not have taken this step had he believed that it would be a simple matter to reach a settlement with Poland at Danzig. He wished Forster and Grasser to be fully informed so that he could coordinate steps with them on the shortest possible notice. It was useful for the Danzig leaders to have accurate information directly from Hitler. Burkhardt had returned to Danzig on November 21, 1938, and his description of the Polish attitude in conversations with the Danzig leaders was entirely too favorable. He suggested that a Ruthenian solution favorable to Poland might be adequate compensation to Beck for the abandonment of Polish obstruction tactics at Danzig. Burkhardt had succeeded in creating the impression among his listeners that Poland was prepared to give way at Danzig. He seemed to think that Poland's improved diplomatic situation would prompt her to be generous. He observed that Poland was no longer in the very difficult situation of four weeks ago, and that she could now again count much more on the support of England and France, particularly since Germany had injured herself politically, at least for the present, through her action against the Jews. Burkhard told the Danzigers that he had accepted a hunting invitation from Goring, and that he planned to discuss the European situation with Goebbels before returning to Danzig. He obviously believed that an auspicious moment had arrived to settle the Danzig question. Burkhard was disgusted by the attitude of the American ambassador to Poland, Anthony Biddle, who predicted on December 2, 1938, that the Poles would fight Germany in the near future. Biddle declared that he would welcome this development. He reminded Burkhardt of the great hatred of Germany in the most influential American quarters, and he also predicted that Great Britain and France would intervene in a German-Polish war. Burkhardt summarized his conversation with Biddle in pithy fashion, fine perspectives. Calvin against the descendants of Luther, and Lenin as Calvin's ally. Secret official Polish hostility toward Germany Lipsky returned to Poland on November 22, 1938, to discuss the Danzig situation. His assurance to Ribbentrop about the superhighway and the railway had been a mere ruse designed to appease the Germans. The Polish leaders agreed that no concessions would be made to Germany either at Danzig or in the corridor transit question. The affable manner of Ribbentrop, despite the adamant Polish stand on Danzig, impressed the Polish leaders. Beck speculated that Danzig might not be the issue after all which would produce a conflict between Germany and Poland. He suggested that Hitler might be allowing Ribbentrop unusual liberty in the Danzig question to see what he could accomplish. Lipsky's attitude was similar to Beck's. His latest conversation with Ribbentrop had caused him to modify his earlier opinion that Germany would never retreat at Danzig. He suggested that the injury done to German relations with the United States by the anti-Jewish policy might affect German policy toward Poland. Lipsky tended to exaggerate the effects on German foreign relations of the demonstrations against the Jews in Germany on November 10, 1938. 
he predicted that a Franco-German declaration of friendship, which had been discussed by Hitler and the French leaders since the preceding month, would never be signed because of the negative reaction to the anti-Jewish demonstrations. This prediction proved to be false, and Ribbentrop signed the declaration at Paris on December 6, 1938. Lipsky and the other Polish diplomats were influenced in their judgment of this question at the moment by a report which had been telegraphed by Count Jerzy Potocki from Washington, D.C., on November 21, 1938. The Polish ambassador was informed by William C. Bullitt, the American ambassador to France who was visiting in the United States, that President Roosevelt was determined to bring America into the next European war. Bullitt explained to Potocki at great length that he enjoyed the special confidence of President Roosevelt. Bullitt predicted that a long war would soon break out in Europe, and of Germany and her Chancellor, Adolf Hitler, he spoke with extreme vehemence and with bitter hatred. He suggested that the war might last six years, and he advocated that it should be fought to a point where Germany could never recover. Potocki did not share the enthusiasm of Bullitt and Roosevelt for war and destruction. He asked how such a war might arise, since it seemed exceedingly unlikely that Germany would attack Great Britain or France. Bullitt suggested that a war might break out between Germany and some other power, and that the Western powers would intervene in such a war. Bullitt considered an eventual Soviet-German war inevitable, and he predicted that Germany, after an enervating war in Russia, would capitulate to the Western powers. He assured Potocki that the United States would participate in this war if Great Britain and France made the first move. Bullet inquired about Polish policy, and Potocki replied that Poland would fight rather than permit Germany to tamper with her western frontier. Bullet, who was strongly pro-Polish, declared it was his conviction that it would be possible to rely on Poland to stand firmly against Germany. Potocki incorrectly attributed the belligerent American attitude solely to Jewish influence. He failed to realize that President Roosevelt and his entourage considered World War I to have been a great adventure, and that they were bitter about those Americans who continued to adopt a cynical attitude toward American militarism after President Roosevelt's quarantine speech in 1937. President Roosevelt had been one of the few advocating permanent peacetime military conscription in the United States during the complacent 1920s. Such factors were more than sufficient to prompt Roosevelt to adopt an aggressive attitude toward Germany. He had no strong Proj-Ewish feelings, he jokingly said at the 1945 Yalta conference that he would like to give the Arabian leader, Ibn Saud, 5 million American Jews. The Jewish issue was mainly a convenient pretext to justify official American hostility toward Germany, and to exploit the typical American sympathy for the underdog in any situation. Potocki overestimated the Jewish question because of his own intense prejudices against the Jews, which were shared by the entire Polish leadership. He was highly critical of the American Jews. He believed that Jewish influence on American culture and public opinion, which he regarded as unquestionably preponderant, was producing a rapid decline of intellectual standards in the United States. He reported to Warsaw again and again that American public opinion was merely the product of Jewish machinations. The Poles themselves had a grievance against Germany because of the recent anti-Jewish demonstrations, but it was not prompted by any sympathy for the Jews. They resented the fact that recent German measures against the Jews placed Germany in a better position to compete with Poland in disposing of her Jews abroad. The majority of the remaining German Jews were at last ready to believe that emigration was better for them than life in Germany, and most of them were in a far better financial position to contemplate emigration than the Polish Jews. Maltke reported from Warsaw on November 22, 1938, that the Polish press had maintained reserve in describing the reprisal action carried out in Germany against Jewry. The Gienic Narodowy, National Daily, had complained that Germany was right in seeking to get rid of her Jews, but wrong in her methods. Only a few of the leading newspapers had given their unreserved approval to the recent German measures. Zuz, the Times, claimed that the Germans had gone too far in some instances. Maltkin noted that the Polish government feared a Ukrainian insurrection, and that this consideration was prompting them to slow down the campaign against the Jews within Poland. At the same time, 
they were stepping up their diplomatic offensive to find new goals for the Polish-Jewish exodus, and they were convinced that the recent events in Germany would handicap them in these efforts. Lipsky claimed at the Polish Foreign Office Conference on November 22, 1938, that there was a bright side to this picture. He asserted that German public opinion had been alienated by the recent anti-Jewish measures, and that this had shaken the position of the Hitler regime. He suggested that a strong Polish stand on Danzig might threaten Ribbentrop's position and convince Hitler that Ribbentrop was not an able diplomat. Polish High Commissioner Marjan Kodaki, who had come to Warsaw for the conference, was quick to agree with Lipski. He suggested that Poland might influence the situation by adopting a more stern policy in dealing with the Danzig authorities. Beck did not seem particularly concerned about the deterioration of German-Polish relations after the Munich conference. He told Jan Zembeck on December 7, 1938, that relations with Germany had reached an impasse. This was a simple statement of the situation which Beck was not inclined to remedy. He still hoped that Germany would support him in Ruthenia, and he did not believe for one moment that Hitler intended to use Ruthenia as a base for Ukrainian Urdentism. He knew that Hitler was sincerely pro-Polish, and he complained to Zembeck that it might have been possible to obtain more concessions from him had it not been for the opposition of the anti-Polish Junker aristocracy, and the members of the German cabinet who had belonged to the former conservative German National People's Party. Beck indulged in some wishful thinking when he claimed to Zembeck that Hitler and Ribbentrop were not in close agreement, and that it was Neurath, and not Ribbentrop, who understood and executed perfectly the projects and instructions of Hitler. Neurath was actually one of the anti-Polish diplomats whom Beck had condemned, and he was far less tolerant toward Poland than was Ribbentrop. The similarity between Beck's career and that of the German foreign minister stimulated Beck's dislike for his colleague in Berlin. Neither Beck nor Ribbentrop were actually career diplomats. Beck had pursued a military career for many years, and Ribbentrop had earned a fortune as a merchant after serving as a German army officer in World War I. It had been possible for both men to obtain top posts in the diplomatic services of their respective countries for the same reason. Beck had been intimate with Pilsudski for many years, and Ribbentrop had won the confidence of Hitler. The two men had established their supremacy over the career diplomats because they enjoyed the favor of their respective dictators. The Polish foreign minister decided that Lipski, for tactical reasons, should continue to take a positive attitude toward the German superhighway, but that he was not to involve Poland in any definite commitments, nor admit that there was any connection between the problems of Danzig and corridor transit. Beck would continue to press for a bilateral treaty with the Germans to be based on a German renunciation of Danzig. Beck suspected that Hitler would insist on the annexation of Danzig, but he was not certain about it, and, above all, he did not know how long he could count on Hitler's patience. Beck had decided to direct his main attention toward Anglo-Polish relations, and his entire policy was based on the assumption that he would obtain British support against Germany. Beck was clever in his relations with the British. He wished to impress them with his independence and to tantalize them by the reserve with which he approached important problems. He permitted Count Ruchinsky in London to tell Halifax, at the time of the German offer on October 24, 1938, that Poland would stand firmly against any German demands, but he denied Ruchinsky permission to come to Warsaw to discuss the situation. It was nearly two months before the Polish ambassador was allowed to appear in Warsaw to discuss Beck's plan for an understanding with the British. Beck agreed in December 1938 to come to London within a few months to discuss the coordination of Polish and British policies, but he balanced his agreement by arranging on his own initiative for a meeting with Hitler in January 1939. He wished the British to know that he could make a deal with the Germans if he desired it and he assumed correctly that this would increase Polish prestige in London. He did not wish the British to regard Poland as a mere puppet state in the style of Austria or Czechoslovakia. Beck had learned a great deal since his hurried visit to England in March 1936, and his vain plea for British military intervention against Germany. A German-Polish understanding feared by Halifax the British diplomat, Ogilvy Forbes, reported from Berlin on November 9. 1938, that there were increasingly frequent rumors of an impending agreement between Germany and Poland. 
it seemed to him only a matter of time before the ripe fruit of Danzig fell into the German lap, but he predicted difficulties in the question of German transit through the corridor. He speculated that the Germans might seek to offer Poland special compensation for a transit arrangement by supporting them against the Czechs, the Lithuanians, and even the Russians. Ogilvy Forbes had received the impression from Polish circles in Berlin that there was a genuine Polish desire to compound with the mammon of iniquity. He correctly assumed that this quaint reference to Hitler would amuse and please Halifax. He was also watching out for his own interest, because he was considered in London to be pro-Hitler. He did not believe that German acquisition of Danzig would solve the problem of German-Polish friction. He concluded that a speedy settlement of all German-Polish questions in a manner permanently acceptable to the national pride and the political and economic interests of both parties would seem to be a miracle of which not even Hitler is capable. William Strang, the chief of the Central Division of the British Foreign Office, predicted to Ambassador Kennard in Warsaw on the following day that there would be trouble between Germany and Poland. He instructed Kennard, you will no doubt be interested to know that we have received reliable information to the effect that Hitler now holds the view that Poland has not yet consolidated her position as an independent state, and that he has plans for dealing with the Polish question. He expects to be able to do this without a European war. Strang invented this rumor in the hope that it would make Beck nervous when Kennard repeated it to him, and that it would discourage any temptation he might have to reach an agreement with Hitler. Kennard feared at this time that Beck would accept Hitler's proposals about Danzig and corridor transit. Nevertheless, he hoped that German-Polish friction in the minority question would spoil an agreement on the other points. He saw no solution to the minority problem, concluding, nor do I think that any arrangement for the exchange of populations is practicable. Kennard knew virtually nothing about the German minority in Poland. He claimed that the Poles in Germany were mainly laborers, which was correct, but he was mistaken when he described the Germans in Poland as mostly landowners and shopkeepers who were fairly well-to-do. The great majority of the Germans in Poland were agricultural and industrial laborers. This lack of accurate information is not surprising when one considers that Kennard was not interested in the conditions of the Germans except to minimize whatever complaints were made about their situation. Kennard denied that the Poles were either nervous or in any hurry to settle their differences with Germany. He informed Halifax, at the time of the Burkhard visit to Warsaw in November 1938, that the League High Commissioner shared his belief that the Poles would be willing to relinquish Danzig to Germany. Kennard reminded Halifax that nothing had been done since the Teschen crisis to secure for Poland the permanent seat on the League Security Council which Great Britain had advocated and he warned him that Beck would remain critical of the League of Nations until this point was settled. Kennard had made no secret of his hatred for Germany when he discussed the situation with Burkhard, and the Swiss diplomat in turn lost no time in supplying the Germans with full information about Kennard's attitude toward them. Hitler was interested to learn that the British ambassador in Warsaw, who enjoyed the confidence of Halifax, was an enemy of appeasement. Burkhard had complained to the Germans that Kennard had been haughty at first, and Halifax was apparently worried about Burkhard's attitude and the possibility that Kennard's arrogant manner may have alienated him. Halifax did not like to contemplate the possibility that the League High Commissioner might identify himself with the German position at Danzig. He explained to Kennard that Burkhard had been told in 1937 that the main object of his mission was to prevent the establishment of a full national socialist regime in the free city. It is interesting that Halifax emphasized this in December 1938, when one recalls that he told Burkhardt in May 1938 that he hoped Danzig would return to Germany by means of a negotiated settlement. Halifax also reminded Kennard that Burkhardt possessed exceptional diplomatic and political skill, and that he was not to be taken lightly. He confided that he would raise the Danzig question at the next meeting of the League Security Council, in January 1939, regardless of whether or not Beck or Burkhardt favoured such a step. Halifax discussed the situation with Rachinsky in London on December 14, 1938, in the hope of obtaining more information about the current Polish attitude toward a settlement with Germany. He began the conversation by complaining that the Poles had not been helpful about promoting League of Nations activities at Danzig. 
Ryczynski replied that Poland recognized the importance of the league position and did not desire to see Burkhard withdrawn. Halifax then asked the Polish ambassador point blank if Hitler had recently raised the question of German claims to Danzig. The Polish ambassador responded with an evasive answer. He declared that the main problem for Poland at the moment was to obtain international aid to rid the country of its Jewish population. He assured Halifax that the Jews constituted a really big problem in Poland. Ryczynski emphasized that Poland favored an active British policy in Eastern Europe, although it was perhaps not possible for His Majesty's government to intervene directly in practical fashion in the event of trouble in Eastern Europe. It was clear to both Halifax and Ryczynski that British soldiers could not be landed on the Polish coast in the event of war, but Ryczynski hoped that the British would not disinterest themselves in the area. Halifax promised that he was prepared to give the question of British support to Poland careful consideration. Halifax was annoyed that Beck had not allowed Ryczynski to give him tangible information about current German-Polish negotiations. The certainty of a German-Polish conflict was an essential element in the formulation of his plans. He instructed Kennard to use every means to discover Beck's real attitude. Kennard ingeniously suggested to Beck that it might be better to allow the Germans to take Danzig now, rather than permit them later to link Danzig with demands for the return of the entire corridor. Beck stated categorically that any question of concession in the corridor would involve war. Kennard eagerly inquired if this would apply to a German request for transit facilities across the corridor. Beck replied that any such German suggestion could hardly be considered although he had allowed Lipsky to nourish the illusion among the Germans that Poland might accept this. Halifax was able to conclude that a German-Polish understanding was virtually impossible because of the chimera of British aid to Poland, and despite the fact that Beck was currently refusing to inform him about his negotiations with the Germans. Poland endangered by Beck's diplomacy The tortuous diplomacy of Beck during this period had a double purpose. The British were prevented from taking for granted Polish opposition to Germany at a time when appeasement was the official British policy. It was evident that the British leaders would have to educate their public to hate and fear Germany before a shift in British policy could take place which would permit a British commitment to Poland. The Polish diplomat knew that he would not be treated as an equal by Great Britain unless he maintained a similar reserve in the conduct of his own policy. The Germans were deceived about Polish policy in the interest of gaining time. Beck realized that Hitler would have more room to maneuver if he tipped his hand before the British leaders were ready to attack Germany. He knew that the patience of Hitler was his greatest asset, and he intended to challenge Germany when the time was ripe, rather than to receive an unexpected German challenge. This tortuous diplomacy would have been unnecessary had Beck perceived that the interests of Poland could best be served by joining Germany in a common front against Bolshevism. Hitler had offered reasonable and honorable terms which were highly advantageous to Poland. The friction caused by the minority question would have been a minor issue within the context of a German-Polish understanding. The Germans of Poland were far too disunited and intimidated to cause trouble if Hitler gained a success at Danzig and a German guarantee of the existing German-Polish frontier would have convinced the few chauvinists among them that there was no point in hoping for union with the Reich. Poland could have played an important role as a bulwark of European defense against Bolshevism, and, with German support, she would have stood a good chance of surviving an attack from the Soviet Union. The British had nothing to offer Poland. Their policy of hostility toward Germany, which was thinly veiled by appeasement while they prepared for war, placed the Soviet Union in the enviable role of Tertius Gaudens. A suicidal internecine struggle among the capitalist powers of Europe was the answer to a Soviet Marxist prayer. The geographical position of Poland was such that she would be the first victim of ultimate Soviet expansion toward the West. The British leaders did not intend to send a large army to Europe, as they had done in World War I and the British Navy and British Air Force could offer no protection to Poland. The dream of the Great Poland of 1750 was the fateful legacy which clouded the judgment of Beck. Pulsutsky had shared this dream, but he was also a realist who would have been capable of making many major adjustments in Polish policy. It was the fate of Poland to find herself in the hands of the Epigoni at the most crucial moment of her history.
there was no sign that the Polish leaders were awake to the realities of the European situation when the year 1938 drew to a close. Chapter 8 British Hostility Toward Germany After Munich Hitler's bid for British friendship The Anglo-German relationship was the most important European issue after the Munich Conference. An Anglo-German understanding could mean peace, prosperity, and security for Europe. A new Anglo-German war would bring destruction, ruin, and despair. The former condition would offer nothing to the doctrine of Bolshevism, which thrived on human misery. The latter situation would present a unique opportunity for expansion to the Bolshevist leaders. It is not to be wondered that the Bolshevist leaders hated the Munich Conference which had prevented an Anglo-German war. They feared that from its aftermath a permanent Anglo-German understanding would emerge. The British attitude toward Germany was the crux of the problem. The attitude of Hitler toward Great Britain was favourable from the standpoint of establishing the permanent peace between the two nations which had been envisaged in the Anglo-German Friendship Declaration of September 30, 1938. Hitler hoped to avoid what he considered to have been the failures of Hohenzollern Germany. He condemned the idea of a large German navy, which had been brilliantly advocated before 1914 by Admiral von Tirpitz. He was unenthusiastic about the acquisition of German colonies overseas, and he regarded Germany's legal right to her former colonies as a mere bargaining counter. Hitler opposed trade rivalry between Germany and Great Britain. He wished the British to preserve their world commercial supremacy. The attitude of Hitler was familiar to the British leaders. The prominent Labour Party spokesman, George Lansbury, who had been the chief of the British Labour Party until 1935, had done what he could to inform the British Conservative leaders of Hitler's ideas. Lansbury met Hitler in Berlin on April 19, 1937. He was greatly impressed with the German leader, and he was convinced that he did not desire war. Lansbury discussed Hitler with Lord Halifax, and he rendered strong support to Chamberlain at the time of the Munich Conference. He emphasized that no important section of the British population opposed Chamberlain's trip to Munich. Arnold Toynbee, a leading English historian and an expert on international affairs, had visited Hitler in March 1936. He returned to England with a clear impression of Hitler's ideas. He informed Conservative Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin that Adolf Hitler was a sincere advocate of peace and close friendship between Great Britain and Germany. Thomas Jones, the closest friend of Lloyd George and Stanley Baldwin, had excellent connections with British statesmen. He was with Hitler in Munich on May 17, 1936. Jones was on close terms with Ribbentrop, and he was fully informed about Hitler's attitudes. Hitler had said that, if an Anglo-German understanding was achieved, my biggest life's desire will be accomplished. Jones promised Hitler in Munich that Great Britain hoped to get alongside Germany, and he praised Hitler's decision to give the English language priority after German, in the German schools, as a significant contribution to future contacts between the two nations. Leopold Amory, one of the principal conservative statesmen, was in Germany on a vacation in August 1935. He was hostile toward Hitler's aspirations, and he had not intended visiting the German leader. Hitler was informed that Amory was in Germany and he immediately extended an invitation to him. He and Amory discussed recent developments in Germany and future German aims for several hours. Hitler assured Amory that Germany accepted the Polish corridor settlement, and he hoped one day to be in a position to offer Poland a German guarantee of her western frontier. Amory reluctantly concluded that Hitler was not unpleasantly boastful, and he was charmed by Hitler's statement that he could not claim originality for any of his reforms. Viscount Rothermere was a prominent British newspaper publisher and a leader of the British armament campaign. He was with Hitler in Birch Teskeden in 1937 shortly before the Hitler-Halifax conversations. Rothermere believed that the Hitler with whom he spoke was convinced that he had been called from his social obscurity to power not to make war, but to preserve peace and rebuild both spiritual and physical Germany. Rothermere and Hitler were also in correspondence. Hitler wrote to Rothermere that his ultimate objective was a comprehensive understanding among Germany, Great Britain, and the United States. 
Rothermir also remained in correspondence with Ribbentrop until a few weeks before the outbreak of World War II in 1939. Rothermir explained in a wartime book, which contained an introduction by Winston Churchill, that Ribbentrop had never been unfriendly toward Great Britain. David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of the victorious British Coalition Government of 1918, visited Hitler in September 1936. Hitler made no secret of the fact that he was tremendously impressed with the achievements of the British wartime leader, and it was evident that he was extensively informed about his career. Lloyd George replied that he was deeply touched by the personal tribute of the Führer and was proud to hear it paid to him by the greatest German of the age. Lloyd George returned to Great Britain convinced that Hitler had performed a Herculean task in restoring prosperity and happiness to truncated Germany. The prominent British Conservative leader, Lord Londonderry, and the popular British journalist, Ward Price, both visited Hitler on numerous occasions. Each of these men published books in 1938 which favoured an Anglo-German understanding, and which explained the aims and ideas of Hitler to their countrymen. Hitler tried repeatedly to arrange a meeting with British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin in 1936, but neither he nor Ribbentrop were able to overcome Baldwin's anti-German prejudices. Baldwin remarked at the time of his retirement on April 20, 1937, that he envied Lansbury the faith which enabled him to go and tackle Hitler. He might also have envied Hitler the faith which enabled him to seek out Baldwin and other British leaders in a vain effort to appease their distrust of Germany. Hitler knew that a personal visit to Great Britain, before an Anglo-German understanding had been achieved, would not be possible because of this anti-German prejudice. He had offered to meet Baldwin at sea in the vicinity of the British coast. Later he received three visits from Prime Minister Chamberlain, but these occurred during a crisis when conditions were not normal. Chamberlain noted that Hitler seemed very shy at their first meeting on September 15, 1938. Hitler confessed his fear that he would be received with demonstrations of disapproval if he visited England and Chamberlain agreed that it would be wise to choose the right moment. Winston Churchill never met Hitler. He was in Munich for a few days in April 1932 and he expressed a desire to see Hitler. He claimed later, on the strength of an unlikely supposition, that Hitler refused to see him because Churchill had allegedly criticized Hitler's attitude toward the Jews. Ernst Hanfstengel, who was commissioned by Hitler to entertain Churchill in Munich, explained that Hitler was in Nuremberg and that he was distracted by several important crises during a crucial phase of his struggle for power. Churchill made no effort to see Hitler after the latter was appointed Chancellor. There is no evidence that he had criticized Hitler's attitude toward the Jews prior to 1932. Churchill wrote in 1937, If our country were defeated I hope we should find a champion as indomitable to restore our courage and lead us back to our place among the nations. The champion to whom he referred with such enthusiasm was Adolf Hitler. Anthony Eden met Hitler on several occasions. The first meeting took place in 1934, Eden noted that Hitler was restrained and friendly and showed himself completely master of his subject, European armaments. Dot. The second meeting occurred in March 1935 after the British government had severely criticized Hitler for introducing peacetime military conscription a few days earlier. The personal relations between Eden and Hitler remained friendly at the second meeting. But there was not much real communication, because Eden had little awareness of German problems. This fact was apparent at a discussion between Foreign Minister Eden and Neville Henderson at Cliveden on October 24, 1937. Thomas Jones noted that the British ambassador to Germany has lived in the countries we talked about and Eden has not and this was apparent. Sir John Simon one of the closest advisers to Chamberlain in 1938, accompanied Eden to Berlin in March 1935, and he afterward recorded his impressions of Hitler at that meeting. He noted that Hitler displayed no desire during their conversation to play the role of dictator. He had no doubt that Hitler was sincere in his desire for a permanent understanding with the British. He was equally convinced that Hitler considered the moral rehabilitation of defeated Germany an urgent task. But Simon also remained convinced that it was a vital British interest to challenge Hitler at the favourable moment. It was this attitude, based on anti-German prejudice, 
which constituted the great obstacle to an understanding between Great Britain and Germany. Chamberlain's failure to criticize Duff Cooper the first few days after the Munich Conference provided a startling revelation of the depth of resentment toward Germany among British officials. It should be emphasized that it was the hostility within the British leadership which constituted the danger. The mass of the British people were obviously desirous of peace with Germany. The ovation which Chamberlain received in London on the rainy Friday afternoon of September 30, 1938, when he returned from Munich, was unprecedented. He was the hero of the hour among the common people because he had prevented war. The enthusiasm remained unbroken until the debates on the Munich Conference opened in the British Parliament on Monday, October 3, 1938. King George VI departed for Balmoral Castle in Scotland on October 2. He issued an announcement prior to his departure in which he expressed his confidence in Chamberlain and his hope that the peace of Europe would be preserved. The British war enthusiasts lost no time in launching their effort to spoil the celebration of peace. The first blow was a message to Chamberlain from Parliamentary First Lord of the Admiralty, Alfred Duff Cooper, on October 1, 1938. Duff Cooper announced that he distrusted the policy which had avoided war. He was resigning from the British cabinet, and he intended to deliver a major speech in Parliament to explain this decision. Chamberlain replied in mild tones that he was aware of the fundamental disagreement which existed. Duff Cooper was an ideal ally of Churchill in the struggle against peace. He hated the Germans, and he had disliked the German language and German literature since his student days. He was appointed Secretary of State for War in 1935, and by that time his principal concern was the ever-growing German menace. He agreed with Sir Robert Van Sittert, the permanent under-secretary at the Foreign Office, that everything possible should be done to prevent Italy from aligning with Germany. He was convinced that it was more important to oppose Hitler than to oppose communism. He condemned the entire German nation as a cruel people, and he criticized Englishmen who were inclined to forget the German crimes of World War I. He had been convinced since 1936, as had Lord Halifax, that an Anglo-German war was inevitable. Duff Cooper delivered numerous bellicose speeches in 1936 and 1937, and he doubted if Chamberlain, when he succeeded Baldwin in April 1937, would care to retain him in the cabinet. He was retained, and he was promoted to the Admiralty. He was young and handsome, and he delighted in the flamboyant cruises to foreign places afforded by his new post. He joined Van Sittard in supporting Chamberlain against Eden in the February 1938 British cabinet crisis, and his breach with Chamberlain did not occur until the Prime Minister returned from his first visit to Hitler in September 1938. The derogatory comments which Chamberlain made about Hitler after their first meeting failed to appease Duff Cooper. He wanted war with Germany and he feared that the chance might be lost. He believed that he could do more to promote war if he joined the Churchill faction of conservatives outside the cabinet. Duff Cooper had informed Chamberlain on September 25, 1938, that he intended to resign, but had agreed to reserve his announcement until the termination of the Czech crisis. Duff Cooper was allowed to deliver the first speech of the debate in the House of Commons on October 3, 1938. He criticized the government for not assuming a definite commitment during the Czech crisis. He asserted that Great Britain would not have been fighting for the Czechs, because this would have been an insufficient basis for war. He insisted that she would have been fighting for the balance of power, which was precious to some British hearts. He believed that it was his mission and that of his country to prevent Germany from achieving a dominant position on the continent. Chamberlain astonished his critics by refusing to reply to this condemnation of his policy by a former subordinate. He said instead, in the tones of mawkish sentimentality which he frequently employed, that he always was moved by the resignation speeches of cabinet ministers. It was obvious that he cherished a deep affection for Duff Cooper, and the differences between them were those of tactics rather than basic principles. He praised Duff Cooper for doing a good job at the Admiralty and he apologized for him by observing that many of the cabinet ministers would carry the scars of the recent crisis for a long time to come. 
the British Tories in fundamental agreement there was no disagreement between Chamberlain and Duff Cooper about the antiquated British policy of the balance of power. The theory had first been espoused in England in the 16th century by Thomas Cromwell, a disciple of Machiavelli, and a wealthy adventurer who had witnessed at first hand the late phase of balance of power diplomacy in Renaissance Italy. It was Thomas Cromwell who persuaded Cardinal Wolsey to conduct English policy along these lines. The policy had been employed to prevent a strong state, such as Milan, from gaining supremacy over the weaker Italian states. It was useless when outside powers such as France and Spain appeared on the scene with overwhelming forces and crushed a divided Italy. The balance of power policy was effectively employed in Europe by England for several centuries to prevent any single power from attaining the sort of supremacy over the divided continent which was enjoyed in North America by the United States after 1865. It meant the relentless curtailment of any seemingly preponderant continental state, regardless of the domestic institutions or foreign policy of such a state. The purpose of the policy was to give Great Britain a permanent position of control over the destinies of her neighbours. The policy was futile by the 1930s, when outside powers such as the Soviet Union and the United States were in a position to appear upon the scene with overwhelming forces and to share dominion over a crushed and divided Europe. There were several occasions, after Thomas Cromwell and Henry VIII, when English policy rejected the balance of power. Oliver Cromwell the Lord Protector of England during the 1650s, was scornful of the balance of power theory, which he regarded as a decadent basis for policy. He sometimes promoted alliances, such as the one he proposed to Holland and Sweden to promote the Protestant cause. His fundamental attitude was that England could provide her own defence, and that she need not fear an attack from a preponderant European power. This attitude of Cromwell's was useful to Giulio Mazzarini in building up French supremacy in Europe. He persuaded Cromwell to join France in despoiling weaker Spain. Cromwell did not throw English resources and manpower into a futile struggle to support declining Spanish power merely because France was stronger than Spain. Louis XIV discovered in the War of Devolution in the 1660s that Holland was an irritating obstacle to the continuation of French supremacy. Dutch diplomacy had reduced French gains in that war. The English had waged two wars of aggression against the Dutch in recent years. It was comparatively easy for Louis XIV to cement Anglo-French relations in the Treaty of Dover in 1670 with Charles II of England, and to prepare a combined Anglo-French war of aggression against the Dutch. The English were persuaded to attack the Dutch without warning in April 1672, and Louis XIV soon intervened to support the English. French plans to crush Holland were foiled, because the Dutch were able to defeat the combined Anglo-French fleets in one of the great military upsets of history, Battle of Solbay. This was a second important instance in the 17th century when the English conducted their policy without consideration for the balance of power. The balance of power policy was revived by King William III of England in the 1690s in a remarkable series of speeches from the throne to Parliament. King William, the great-grandson of the German Prince of Nassau Orange, William the Silent, was flexible in his national loyalties. He built up English power at the expense of his native Holland because in England there was greater respect for the monarchical institutions which he cherished. William used French support of the Catholic Scotch-English Stuarts as the pretext for plunging England into the War of the League of Augsburg, but he explained after the war was well underway that the balance of power was his primary consideration. The balance of power was used to justify English participation in the next major European and overseas struggle, the War of the Spanish Succession. England made great gains when she concluded a separate peace with France at Utrecht in 1713 and the balance of power received a new lease on life, once the horrors of the war had been forgotten. The English statesman, James Stanhope, led a brief attempt to organise a preponderant League of European States, but it collapsed in 1720 during a severe economic depression and a change in English leadership. England returned to the balance of power under Robert Walpole, and no subsequent English statesman was able to equal his skill in conducting English policy under this system. 
he kept England out of the European War of the Polish Succession in the 1730s because he realized that the balance of power was not threatened by the war. He was unable to prevent England's entry into an unnecessary war against Spain in 1739, and he was soon forced from power. England subordinated the balance of power, in the following period, to her effort to acquire the overseas colonies of France. There were four principal continental powers of approximately equal military strength at that time. They were France, Prussia, Austria, and Russia, although France was by far the most wealthy. England had taken over most of the French colonies by 1763, but there had been a change of English leadership in 1761. Pitt's advocacy of a preventive war against Spain was used by Butte as a pretext to overthrow him, and this led to the ruin of English relations with the principal continental states. This unfavorable development resulted from the incredible arrogance and crudeness of English diplomacy under Butte. England was the principal European power when her American mainland colonies revolted in 1775. She was unable to crush the insurgent American colonies because of her inability to hire sufficient mercenary troops in Europe, but she defended her European position with the ease against an enemy coalition which included France, Spain, and Holland. The English leaders sought to frustrate the attempts of Russia, France, and Spain to expand during the decade between the end of the American War in 1783 and the outbreak of war between England and Republican France. No single power offered an impressive challenge to the balance of power at that time. The balance of power received dramatic emphasis during the four wars of coalition waged against France under the First Republic, and after 1804 under the First Napoleonic Empire. The Fourth Coalition waged a second war against Napoleon when he returned from Elba in 1815. The balance of power was used on several occasions during this period to justify the continuation of English warfare against France, when the other enemies of France had left the field. Robert Castlereagh was conducting British foreign policy when France was crushed in 1815, and he hoped to abandon the balance of power policy. He repeated the performance of Stanhope in the preceding century by seeking to associate England permanently with a preponderant League of European States. His opponents at home demanded a return to the balance of power, and in 1822 Castlereagh abandoned his task and committed suicide. England followed the balance of power policy without interruption after 1822. This was true either when she was in splendid isolations or when she was a member of some alliance system. England supported Napoleon III against Russia in the Crimean War of the 1850s because she believed that Russia was stronger than France. She refused to protect Belgium from a possible German invasion in 1887, because she believed that a Franco-Russian combination was more powerful than Germany and her allies. Decisions were difficult during these years, because opposing forces were almost in perfect balance without England. This meant, on the positive side, that England could pursue her balance of power policy in splendid isolation without promoting a complicated system of alliances, although at one time she was closely associated with Bismarck's Triple Alliance. There was a period of great confusion in English foreign policy during the 1890s. The five principal continental powers were organized into two alliance systems. It was feared in London that the two systems might combine against England in one of the frequent colonial crises of these years. Joseph Chamberlain, the father of Neville, led a group who favored an English alliance policy. Prime Minister Salisbury opposed an alliance policy. He insisted that alliances were superfluous for England and would impair the flexibility of English policy. The military reverses suffered by England in the early phase of the Boer War helped to carry the day for Chamberlain and alliances. Salisbury was right when he insisted that the opposite conclusion should have been drawn, because the continental powers did not intervene against England in this crisis when she was most vulnerable. The growth of German wealth and productive power during these years was phenomenal, and it seemed to more than compensate for the reverses currently suffered by Germany in diplomatic affairs. Many of the British leaders began to suspect that German growth was a challenge to the balance of power. The balance of power had its own morality. 
Any nation which seemed to challenge it should be treated as an enemy. It did not matter whether or not Germany planned to attack British interests, or whether or not she was in a position to strike a blow at England. The prospect that she might become stronger than any possible hostile continental combination suggested that it was time to redress the balance of power. The situation was more complicated than it had been during earlier centuries. Great Britain launched her alliance policy by concluding an Anglo-Japanese alliance in 1902, but it was easy to see that the rising imperial power of Japan might become a real challenge to British interests in Asia. Both the United States and Germany surpassed Great Britain in industrial strength before 1914. British power since 1750 had been based more on industrial and naval supremacy than on diplomacy, and the loss of industrial supremacy made the British position more difficult. A challenge to Germany would play into the hands of the United States, just as a challenge to America, which almost occurred during the 1895-1896 Venezuelan crisis, would have played into the hands of Germany. Cecil Rhodes, the architect of British imperial expansion in Africa, recognized this dilemma, and this prompted him to advocate permanent peace and cooperation among Great Britain, Germany and the United States. This would have meant the abandonment of the balance of power policy, but Cecil Rhodes was sufficiently shrewd to see that the policy was obsolete. The ruling British leaders did not see it that way and Great Britain suffered an enormous loss of power and prestige in World War I despite her victory over Germany. The Soviet Union began to emerge as an industrial giant of incalculable power during the two decades after World War I. It was evident that there were at least four nations immediately or potentially far more powerful than Great Britain. These four nations were the United States, the Soviet Union, Germany and Japan. This was different than in the old days when it had merely been a question of one preponderant Spain, or one preponderant France. The bankruptcy of the British balance of power policy should have been evident to everyone. It was as obsolete as Italian balance of power politics after the intervention, with overwhelming forces, of King Charles VIII of France in Italian affairs in 1494. The balance of power policy always had been an unhealthy and decadent basis from which to approach diplomatic relations. It substituted for a healthy pursuit of common interests among states the tortuous attempt to undermine or even destroy any state which attained a leading position. It took no regard of the attitude of such a state toward England. The policy was also extremely unstable. It demanded otherwise inexplicable shifts of position when it was evident that one state had been overestimated or another underestimated. It was particularly tragic when France abandoned an independent policy and became dependent on Great Britain. This meant that France was in danger, along with Great Britain, of contributing to the blunders of an obsolete British policy. It seemed momentarily that Great Britain might be returning to the policies of Stanhope and Castlereagh when she joined the League of Nations in 1919. Unfortunately this was not the case. France after 1919 was no longer as powerful as Great Britain, but she enjoyed continental preponderance for several years because of the treaty restrictions on Germany, the intrinsic feebleness of Italy, and the disappearance of Austria-Hungary. Revolutionary upheavals after the defeat in World War I temporarily reduced Russian power. The British responded by employing their balance of power policy against France. There had been notorious rivalry between the two nations in the Near East during World War I, because of oil and traditional prestige factors, and the British nearly succeeded in biffing the French out of their Syrian claims. The British and French took opposite sides in the post-war struggle between the Greeks and the Turks. The British continued to oppose French policies with increasing vigour when the Turks emerged victorious with French support. The climax came when Great Britain opposed the efforts of France and Belgium to collect reparations in the Ruhr in 1923-1924. The French were confidently pursuing a policy of independence under Poincaré's bold leadership, but the debacle suffered in the Ruhr was a stunning psychological blow to the French. Édouard Ario, who took the reins of policy from Poincaré, concluded that nothing could succeed without British cooperation. There were later instances of friction between France and Great Britain, but the French leaders were always inclined to accept the British lead. 
It was apparent to everyone during the Czech crisis in 1938 that Anglo-French policy was conducted from London. The British occasionally pursued policies which seemed to strengthen French preponderance on the continent. They joined France and Italy in squelching the feeble attempt of Chancellor Bruning of Germany to conclude a customs union with Austria in 1931. It did not seem that the hunger Chancellor was capable of removing the threat of communism in Germany, which implied a new preponderant Russo-German combination, or of challenging the old preponderance of France. The situation changed with the arrival of Hitler in 1933. The new Chancellor dealt a few annihilating blows to German communism, and challenged France by withdrawing Germany from the disarmament conference at Geneva, where German claims to equality received farcical treatment. The balance of power on the continent was restored when Hitler sent German troops into the Rhineland in 1936. The French might have challenged this move successfully had they received an assurance of British support. As it was, the French feared that action would mean an Anglo-German combination against them as in 1923. Duff Cooper and Chamberlain agreed in October 1938 that Great Britain should continue the balance of power policy. They agreed that everything possible should be done to prevent a permanent alignment of Italy with Germany. They both underestimated the Soviet Union and believed that she was much less powerful than Germany. They also agreed that the Czech cause as such was not worth British participation in a European war. The sole point where they disagreed was whether or not it would be wise for Great Britain to attack Germany in 1938. Duff Cooper believed that Great Britain was sufficiently strong in 1938 to attack Germany, but Chamberlain believed that it would be wiser to play for time. Neither Chamberlain nor Duff Cooper had any sympathy for Germany, the nation which Chamberlain called the bully of Europe as early as 1935. It is possible from this perspective to see that the differences within the British Conservative Party in October 1938 were not really very profound. Anti-German prejudice was the dominant attitude within the entire Conservative Party. Tory and Labour war sentiment The London Times seemed to incline toward the evaluation of Duff Cooper when it announced on October 3, 1938, that Germany was relieved to escape from a war which, in the opinion of most sections of the population, it would almost certainly have lost. The Times predicted that Mr Chamberlain will find plenty of critics in the current parliamentary debates. It is important to recall that Geoffrey Dawson, the editor of The Times, had provided valuable support for Halifax and Chamberlain during the Czech crisis. On the afternoon of September 6, 1938, he had revised the famous article which appeared in The Times on the following day, and advocated the cession of the Sudeten districts to Germany. Dawson was especially close to Halifax, whom he had met in South Africa in 1905. He published an article on October 30, 1925, which praised Halifax without stint or limit when it was announced in London that the latter had been appointed Viceroy of India. Halifax had given Dawson a detailed private analysis of his visit to Hitler in November 1937, and he had told Dawson that he was well satisfied with the visit. Dawson noted that Halifax probably could have negotiated a lasting agreement with Germany at that time, had Great Britain agreed to remain aloof from possible complications between Germany and her eastern neighbours. Dawson also realised that Halifax was not willing to do this. It was significant that the London Times, which had been the principal journalistic organ of appeasement during the Czech crisis, began to adopt a more critical attitude toward Germany immediately after the Munich conference. It followed the policy of Halifax in this respect. The differences between the attitudes of the Times and of the Daily Express toward Germany became increasingly pronounced. This was because Lord Beaverbrook, the owner of the Daily Express, was a sincere advocate of appeasement as a permanent policy, whereas Geoffrey Dawson was not. The Daily Express continued to hope and to predict that there would be no war with Germany until within a few days of the outbreak of World War II in September 1939. This attitude reflected the wishes of wide sections of the British population in the autumn of 1938, and in November 1938 the Daily Express noted that its circulation had increased to over 2 million within a very short time, which gave it the largest circulation of any newspaper in British history. When Halifax at last launched a gigantic propaganda campaign in March 1939 to sell the British public on war with Germany, 
the editorial policy of the Daily Express gradually became a liability for circulation rather than an asset. It is not surprising that Beaverbrook finally made concessions to the warlike mood in order to preserve his newspaper. It became evident that a large circulation British newspaper with consistent principles was an impossibility in the modern age. Chamberlain paid special tribute to Halifax in the British House of Commons on October 3, 1938. He claimed that Halifax felt a duty not only to England, but to all humanity. There was no point in wondering what prompted Chamberlain to make this sentimental statement, because it was consistent with his usual oratorical style. There is no record that Halifax ever recanted his maiden speech to Parliament, in which he denied that all men were equal and insisted that the British were the superior race within an empire which comprised more than a quarter of the population of the world. Chamberlain leaned on the prestige of Halifax to protect his own position. Chamberlain reminded Commons that there was a very considerable difference between the terms of Munich and the proposals of Hitler at Bad Godesberg. The Munich Agreement permitted the Czechs to withdraw important strategic materials from the areas about to be ceded, and the region which the Germans were permitted to occupy in five gradual stages was smaller than the area Hitler had requested. He reminded the members that the avoidance of a catastrophe at Munich was in the interest of the four Munich powers rather than merely a triumph for one of them. These cogent remarks of the Prime Minister were greeted with shouts of shame, shame, from the opposition benches. This was to be expected. The current Labour Party leaders had supported Chamberlain's trip to Munich, but they hoped to make political capital by denouncing his policy after he returned. The situation was explained later by Hugh Dalton, one of the top Labour Party leaders. Dalton, like many of his colleagues, was pro-communist, and he referred to a visit to the Soviet Union in July 1932, during the greatest famine in Russian history, as an inspiring experience. Dalton and the other Labour Party leaders actually had considerable confidence in Chamberlain's leadership. They knew that he would never permit the return of the German colonies or make any tangible concession to Germany at British expense. They were angry that Charles Lindbergh had discouraged war in 1938 by emphasizing current German strength in the air. They agreed with Duff Cooper after Munich that 1938 would have been a favorable year to oppose Germany. They hoped that by contesting the results of the Munich conference they could either unseat Chamberlain or push him into an anti-German policy. They knew that the Labour opposition was much too weak in Parliament to accomplish this result without important allies from the British Conservative Party. The Labour Party leaders professed to believe that cooperation with National Socialist Germany in foreign affairs would discourage necessary reforms at home. Chamberlain continued his speech by reading the text of the Anglo-German Declaration of Friendship of September 30, 1938. He mentioned that this agreement would not be effective unless there was goodwill on both sides. This left room to claim later that the British had to oppose Germany because Hitler did not show goodwill toward England. Chamberlain noted that Munich had merely provided a foundation for peace and that the structure was still lacking. He then turned to his favorite theme of British armament, and he reminded the House with pride that the pace of the British armament campaign was increasing daily. He promised that the British Empire would not relax her efforts unless the rest of the world disarmed. He concluded with the announcement that military power was the key to successful British diplomacy. Clement Attlee, the new Labour Party leader, spoke of the Munich Agreement as a huge victory for Hitler and an annihilating defeat for democracy, which of course was meant to include so-called Soviet democracy. Eden gave a speech in which he criticised Chamberlain on detailed points, and expressed doubt that Great Britain would implement her promised guarantee to the Czech state. He drew on his old experience as special British representative to the League of Nations, and he denounced the idea of the Munich powers deciding an important question without consulting the smaller states. He advised the House to regard the current situation as a mere pause before the next crisis. He claimed that the British armament campaign was still somewhat too slow. Hoare concluded the debate in Commons on October 3, 1938, with a mild defence of Chamberlain's policy. He introduced an argument which was to be one of his favourites, except when applied to Poland. He suggested that a new world war would have been useless as an attempt to maintain the old Czech borders. The Germans and other minorities were saturated with Czech rule and would not accept it again. 
he added that the British government would be willing to give the Czechs an effective guarantee at some future date, but only after the outstanding problems which afflicted the Czechs were settled. Halifax delivered an important speech in the British House of Lords on October 3, 1938. He shared the opinion of Hoare that Great Britain should never fight for a foreign state unless she was in a position to restore its old frontiers after a victorious war. This was an interesting idea, especially when one considers that Halifax refused to guarantee the Polish frontier with the Soviet Union when he concluded the Anglo-Polish alliance of August 25, 1939. It was obvious that this argument was largely sophistry to Halifax, and a sop to appease the opposition. He revealed to the Lords that he had done what he could to improve British relations with the Soviet Union by placing the blame solely on Germany and Italy for refusing to invite the Soviets to Munich. He had given a formal declaration to this effect to Soviet Ambassador Maisky on October 1, 1938. Halifax regarded all this as a permanent trend in British foreign policy. Relations between Maisky and Halifax became more cordial in the months after Munich, and the Soviet ambassador scored a great triumph on March 1, 1939, when Chamberlain and Halifax attended a reception at the Soviet embassy in London shortly before Stalin himself delivered a bitter speech denouncing the Western powers. Halifax was obviously intent upon switching British appeasement from Germany to the Soviet Union. The key to the Halifax speech of October 3 was the statement that Great Britain would continue to prepare for a possible war against Germany despite the Anglo-German Friendship Declaration of September 30, 1938. Halifax, like Chamberlain, devoted the latter part of his speech to a discussion of the British armament campaign. He emphasized that the need for more weapons was the principal British concern at the moment. Baldwin delivered a speech in Lords on the following day. He complained that it had been difficult to establish personal contact with the German and Italian dictators during the past five years. This was an astonishing statement when one recalls that Hitler had made repeated efforts to meet Baldwin at any time or place while the latter was Prime Minister. Baldwin dropped the mask completely when he claimed that Great Britain needed the spirit of 1914 to solve contemporary world problems. He was supposedly defending the peace settlement of Chamberlain but in reality he was invoking the glory of the British attack on Germany in 1914. He mentioned that in the recent crisis he had been reminded of Sir Edward Grey, who looked like a man who had gone through hell when he pushed for war in 1914. Baldwin did not mention that the main reason for Grey's concern was the fear that the mountain of deceit on which he had built British foreign policy would be discovered by the British Parliament. The British Parliament did not realise in 1914 that Grey had given the French a commitment to fight Germany whether Belgium was invaded or not. The French had concentrated their navy in the Mediterranean, and had entrusted the defence of their northern coastline to the British, before there was the slightest sign of an impending German invasion of Belgium. This situation was explored and explained by historians of many nations after World War I, but Baldwin, like Halifax, preferred to evaluate Gray in terms of 1914 war propaganda. Arthur Greenwood and Herbert Morrison resumed the labor attack on Chamberlain in Commons on October 4, 1938. They repeated many of the arguments which Clement Attlee and Hugh Dalton had made on the previous day. It was known that President Roosevelt in January 1938 had advocated a world conference on European problems, which was supposed to include both the United States and the Soviet Union. The labor leaders adopted the World Conference slogan and stressed the importance of the voice of the Soviet Union in the councils of Europe. Leslie Bergen, Minister of Transport, spoke on behalf of Chamberlain, and he repeated the argument that a war for the Czechs would have been immoral, unless it could have been shown that it was possible to restore the Czech state in its entirety after the war. It is astonishing that these same people accepted war on behalf of Poland without a murmur, when it was obvious after August 22, 1939, that the Soviet Union was hostile to Poland, and that Great Britain had no intention of opposing Russia. It should have been apparent to anyone that the defeat of Germany would not enable the British to restore the new Polish state. In reality, the British leaders were not truly concerned about either the Czechs or the Poles. The same argument about not being able to restore the Czechs was repeated on October 4 by Sir Thomas Inskip another British cabinet member. 
In the following weeks the argument was repeated ad nauseum. It seems impossible that anyone could have forgotten it within the short span of one year. Nevertheless, the deluge of propaganda in England, after March 1939, was so great that it would have been easy to forget the Ten Commandments. Sir John Simon declared complacently in Commons on October 5, 1938, that history would have to decide whether or not the Munich Agreement was the prelude to better times. The debate was entering the third day, and it had already surpassed all other parliamentary debates on British foreign policy since World War I. Simon admitted candidly that Article 19 of the League Covenant for Peaceful Territorial Revision had always been a dead letter. Eden pursued the tactics of October 3, and he inquired of Simon if the government in the future intended to participate in the settlement of European problems by means of four-power diplomacy. Simon emphatically denied this, and he intimated that the British leaders hoped that the Soviet Union and the smaller powers would have more to say in the future. Winston Churchill followed with his long-awaited anti-German speech. The other English war enthusiasts hoped that he would make his speech as provocative as possible, and he did not disappoint them. He agreed with his close friend in America, Bernard Baruch, that Hitler should not be allowed to get away with it. Churchill claimed that Hitler had extracted British concessions at Pistol Point, and he loved to use the image of Hitler as a highwayman or a gangster. He hoped to worry Hitler by intimating that he had contacts with an underground movement in Germany. He suggested that a common Anglo-Franco-Soviet front in support of the Czechs would have enabled an opposition movement within Germany to cause trouble for Hitler, and possibly to overthrow him. He used flowery rhetoric to describe the allegedly mournful Czechs slipping away into a darkness comparable to the black hole of Calcutta. The speech was couched in elegant phrases dear to the hearts of many of Churchill's countrymen. The simple and stark purpose of the speech was to foment a war of annihilation against Germany. Churchill had been excluded from conservative governments in England for many years, but he had made countless speeches, and his personal influence remained tremendous. He had propagated the myth that Great Britain was disarmed in 1932, indeed, that she had wrongly practiced a policy of unilateral disarmament in response to the noble sentiment of the League Covenant. In reality, the British military establishment in 1932 was gigantic compared to that of Germany, and much larger than that of the United States. Great Britain had less than one million men in all of her ground forces throughout the empire, but it had never been traditional British policy to maintain a large standing army. She had the largest navy in the world, despite the Washington Conference of 1921-1922 which envisaged eventual British equality with the United States. The maintenance of a navy was no less expensive or militaristic than the upkeep of an army. Churchill had conducted an uninterrupted campaign of agitation against Germany since March 1933, and he was a veteran in the field. Some of his inaccurate statements about alleged German armaments in this period are contained in his 1948 volume, The Gathering Storm, and in his 1938 book of speeches, When England Slept. Churchill wanted to convince his countrymen that Germany was governed by an insatiable desire for world conquest. In his speech of October 5, 1938, he did more than anyone else to warn Hitler that Germany was in danger of being strangled by a British coalition in the style of 1914. Churchill does not bear direct responsibility for the attack on Germany in 1939, because he was not admitted to the British cabinet until the die was cast. The crucial decisions on policy were made without his knowledge, and he was frankly amazed when Halifax suddenly shifted to a war policy in March 1939. Churchill was useful to Halifax in building up British prejudice against Germany, but he was a mere instrument, at the most, in the conduct of British policy in 1938 and 1939. The most convincing speech in defence of the Munich Conference was delivered by Rab Butler, the Parliamentary Undersecretary for Foreign Affairs. Butler held moderate views on international questions, and he admired the diplomacy which had produced the Munich Conference. He declared on October 5 that a war to deny self-determination to the Sudeten Germans was unthinkable, and he defended Munich as the only possible solution of a difficult problem. He denied the proposition that Great Britain had departed from democratic principles in seeking an agreement with Germany. 
The debate was interrupted but not terminated when Chamberlain proposed a motion on the following day to adjourn until November 1, 1938. Churchill supported the Labour opposition in opposing the motion, and he delivered a bitter personal attack against Chamberlain. He had refrained from doing this in his major speech on the previous day because he was concentrating his fire against the Germans. The adjournment motion was followed by a vote of confidence. Chamberlain carried the vote, but many of the prominent conservatives refrained from voting, and of course Labour and the Liberals voted against him. The roster of conservatives who refused to accept the Munich Agreement or vote for Chamberlain is impressive. It included Churchill, Eden, Duff Cooper, Harold Macmillan, Duncan Sandys, Leopold Amory, Harold Nicholson, Roger Keyes, Sidney Herbert, and General Spears. These men comprised about half of the leading figures of the Conservative Party in 1938, and they were well known to the British public. They were joined by a score of lesser figures in the House of Commons, and they were supported by such prominent peers as Lord Cranbourne and Lord Wolmer in the House of Lords. It was recognised that many other members of Parliament refrained from joining them solely because they were concerned about Conservative Party discipline, particularly in case they were men of limited reputation. Chamberlain won the vote of confidence, but it was doubtful if he possessed the confidence of the British Conservative Party. Chamberlain produced his major rhetorical effort on behalf of Munich just before the vote of confidence on October 6. He declared that his conscience was clear, he did not regret that Great Britain was not fighting Germany over the Czech issue. He stressed the horrors of modern war as the main justification for any peace policy. Chamberlain suggested that the Czech state might best survive in the future if it became permanently neutral in the Swiss style. He added proudly that new elections at this time would be an unfair advantage for the government because of the sentiment of the country. Everyone listening knew that the current conservative majority was unnaturally large because advantage had been taken of the sentiment aroused by the Ethiopian crisis in 1935. Baldwin had given the country the false impression that the government was prepared to win a great victory for collective security at Ethiopia, and the stirring slogans which followed had rallied the voters. Chamberlain reverted to his previous, tactic of painting the contemporary situation in sombre rather than bright colours. He implied that Europe was gripped by a great crisis despite the Munich Conference and the Anglo-German Friendship Declaration. He warned that elections might impair the unity of the nation at a crucial moment. He added that great efforts would be demanded from the nation in coming weeks because of the expanded armament campaign, and he claimed that it was important to keep differences of opinion about British policy to a minimum. He created the impression, which he had to do under the circumstances, that war was not inevitable. Hitler had accepted the Munich Conference because he believed this. Chamberlain declared that war would be inevitable unless some sort of relations were maintained with the totalitarian states. He said that there was no reason to suppose that a new war would end the European crisis more successfully than the last war had done. He rejected the idea of the World Conference, proposed by Labour, with the argument that it had no prospect of success. He finished his speech by emphasising Anglo-French unity and the need to increase the production of British arms. The Prime Minister was obviously not optimistic about the prospects for peace. Chamberlain went much further in this speech in stressing the need for war preparation than can be indicated in a brief summary. He nearly persuaded Anthony Eden and Leopold Amory, who denounced Munich and favoured war, to vote for him. Amory and Eden would not have reacted in this manner had the dominant theme been an expression of faith in the continuation of peace. Control of British policy by Halifax One of the most dramatic incidents in England after Munich was the firm bid of Halifax to take the reins of British foreign policy into his own hands, or resign. Halifax permitted Chamberlain to have the lead during the Czech crisis, but he made it clear afterward that the time had come for a change. He wanted sole responsibility, and he did not wish Chamberlain to travel abroad to important conferences again without his foreign minister. This situation reached a climax before Chamberlain's speech on October 6 Halifax was firmly in control after this date. Halifax, like Eden earlier, had rejected Chamberlain's policy, but, unlike Eden, Halifax put through his own policy. Chamberlain chose to conform, 
as illustrated by the following excerpt from his apologetic letter to Halifax of March 11, 1939, your rebuke, was fully merited. I was horrified at the result of my talk. I promise faithfully not to do it again, but to consult you beforehand. The roles of Chamberlain and Halifax were reversed. Halifax felt like a mere spectator of events during the Sudeten crisis, and Chamberlain felt the same way after October 6. The change of tactics by Halifax, during the months of October and November 1938, offers striking evidence of this. American Ambassador Kennedy had tea with Halifax on October 12, and he received a complacent picture of the European situation from the British Foreign Secretary. It was evident that Halifax did not wish to create the impression of an abrupt change of course. It should be noted that this tea occurred after the furor created by Hitler's Saarbrücken speech of October 9, which had criticized conservative warmongering tactics against Germany. Halifax admitted to Kennedy that everyone in a position of influence knew that Hitler did not desire war against England. Great Britain intended to increase her air strength, but this did not necessarily mean that she planned to interfere with Hitler on the continent. Halifax told Kennedy that he expected Hitler to make a bid for the annexation of both Danzig and Memel, and he suggested that Great Britain might not intervene if Hitler moved as far as Romania. He added that Great Britain was seeking to prepare for all eventualities by improving her relations with the Soviet Union. Halifax discussed the same European situation with Kennedy again on October 28. The only new development in the interim was the German offer to Poland, and Halifax himself had predicted on October 12 that Hitler would seek to acquire Danzig. Halifax painted a somber picture of Hitler's attitude toward Great Britain in this second conversation, and he also gave Kennedy a great quantity of unreliable information about Hitler's alleged attitudes toward a number of current continental problems. A few weeks later he claimed to Kennedy that Hitler was consumed by passionate hatred of England, and that he had a plan to tear the Soviet Union to pieces in the spring of 1939. The purpose of these deceptive tactics was obvious. Halifax was exercising his diplomatic talents in preparation for a British attack on Germany. He was also indulging in the easy task of adding fuel to the dislike of the American leaders for Germany. World War I had amply vindicated the efficacy of propaganda. Tory alarmist tactics The speeches which Chamberlain delivered for public consumption during the debate on the Munich Conference are important. They show that the British public was not receiving a cheerful picture of the European situation, and that the Anglo-German declaration of friendship received far less emphasis than the need to prepare for war against Germany. These speeches provided no clue to Chamberlain's real motives in going to Munich. The motive at one moment seemed to be a genuine desire to avert war permanently, and, at another, to postpone war until Great Britain was ready. It is necessary to consider what Chamberlain told his intimate advisers in private conversation. 112 These men learned after Munich that the attempt to come to terms with the dictators was not the primary reason for Chamberlain's Munich policy. They were told by Chamberlain that two other factors were more important. The most weighty was momentary British unreadiness for a test of arms with Germany. The second consideration was French opposition to a military offensive on behalf of the Czechs. Chamberlain's attitude would have been different in 1938 if the French had possessed a brilliant offensive strategy to aid the Czechs, and were prepared to use it. It is probable that Chamberlain would have pushed Great Britain into war against Germany had British armaments reached the 1939 level, or had the French pursued a more aggressive policy. The Conservative leaders delivered two important speeches on British foreign policy between the adjournment of Parliament on October 6 and the reopening of Parliament on November 1, 1938. Sir Samuel Hoare spoke at Clacton-on-Sea on October 20. His speech explained an elementary fact of great importance. He pointed out that a war against Germany on behalf of the Czechs would have been a preventive war. He reminded his listeners that the verdict of history condemned the doctrine of preventive war. Hoare noted that preventive wars always were great mistakes, and that a nation had no right to appeal to arms except in defense of her own interests. It seems almost incredible, when one reads this speech, to anticipate that Hoare supported a policy of preventive war against Germany a few months later. 
Hoare reminded his listeners that Hitler had abided by the terms of the 1935 Anglo-German Naval Treaty. Hoare also lauded the British armament campaign, and he promised that no nation which favoured peace need fear British arms. It was a promise which received little support from the British record. It was the expression of an ideal which Great Britain had not attained. It was an ideal totally incompatible with the policy of the balance of power. Halifax spoke at Edinburgh on October 24. He explained to his listeners that the British leaders were not satisfied with the existing peace because it was an armed peace. He hoped that a peace of understanding could be attained, but it was too early to say how this might be achieved. He was seemingly conciliatory toward Germany, and he described the Anglo-German declaration as an important step toward obviating existing dangers. He then suggested that Czechoslovakia had been saved at Munich, because the Czech state would have been destroyed by war, regardless of the number of powers participating in war against Germany. Halifax had begun to emphasize the salvation of Czechoslovakia as a principal justification for Munich. This was clever strategy at a time when competent observers were predicting that the Czech state was on the verge of collapse. Halifax was interested in discrediting Munich while appearing to defend it. This was not apparent to all of his listeners, and the speech was well received in Scotland, where there was much less dissatisfaction with the Munich Agreement than in England. The debate about Munich was resumed in Parliament on November 1, 1938, when Clement Attlee delivered another speech which described the Munich Agreement as a tremendous British defeat. Chamberlain replied with a prepared speech. He added a few objections to Attlee's remarks but he concentrated his principal fire on Lloyd George. The unpredictable Welshman, who later advocated peace with Germany after the defeat of Poland in 1939, had delivered an inflammatory speech against Chamberlain to the American radio audience on October 27, 1938. Chamberlain denounced this speech with great bitterness, and he accused Lloyd George of performing a disservice to the country by claiming that the British Empire was in a condition of decline under Chamberlain's leadership. The debate on Munich continued with sound and fury, and it was not terminated until the following day. Chamberlain at that time won an important parliamentary victory when the April 1938 Anglo-Italian Agreement was ratified by an overwhelming vote. The furor about the Munich Agreement might have subsided in the following months had not the conservative leaders contrived by various means to keep the public in a state of alarm about Germany. A few of the more important instances will illustrate this problem. Earl de la War, Education Minister in the Chamberlain Cabinet, insisted in a speech at Bradford on December 4, 1938, that the feeling was prevalent in Great Britain that nothing could ever be done to satisfy Germany. This was a propaganda trick designed to create the very opinion which he claimed existed. It was tantamount to saying that the appeasement policy which culminated at Munich was a farce. Prime Minister Chamberlain pointedly declared in the House of Commons on December 7 that he did not disagree with the inspired remarks of his minister. On December 13 he delivered a speech stressing the importance of his coming visit to Italy, and praising the increased tempo of the armament campaign and the support which it enjoyed. Sir Auckland Geddes, the administrator of the British National Service Act, predicted in a speech on January 17, 1939, that the British people would be in the front line of a coming war, and he explicitly urged them to hoard food supplies in anticipation of this eventuality. This horrendous suggestion produced great public alarm. Geddes added that the British Air Force would take a heavy toll of the invading bombers which he had conjured with frightening clarity and he urged the British people to show the world that they did not fear war. The most provocative of these speeches was delivered on January 23, 1939, by Chamberlain himself. Chamberlain urged public support of the National Service Programme, which will make us ready for war. He denied that Great Britain ever would begin a war, but his next statement demolished whatever assurance one might have deduced from this announcement. He warned that Great Britain might participate in a war begun by others. This was a different situation than responding to an attack on Great Britain or on British interests. Chamberlain was embracing the doctrine of preventive war which had been denounced publicly by Hoare three months earlier. 
that the British leaders were not at all accurate in their estimates of the respective strength of such powers as Germany or the Soviet Union illustrated the supremacy of the balance of power policy. It was an evil omen for the future. Tory confidence in war preparations The alarmist public utterances of the British leaders, when Hitler had done nothing contrary to the Anglo-German Declaration or the Munich Agreement, were mild compared to statements made through the channels of secret diplomacy. The January 1939 visit of Halifax and Chamberlain to Rome offered eloquent testimony of hostile British intentions toward Germany. The British leaders were in excellent spirits because of the unexpected successes of the aerial armament campaign after the Munich Conference. The production of British fighter aircraft was 25% beyond the figure which had been predicted at the time of Munich in the early autumn of 1938. The American expert Charles Lindbergh, who lived in England, made a considerable impression on the English leaders before Munich with his report on German air power. Lindbergh praised the quality of German aerial armament in the strongest terms which the facts would permit. He was glad to contribute what he could to pointing out the senselessness of a new European war, and he surmised correctly that the British attitude was the key factor in deciding whether or not there would be such a war. He was overjoyed by the news of Munich, and he sincerely hoped that peace had been saved. Unfortunately, the British leaders realized that the German lead in the air was very narrow in 1938. They were not merely interested in defense against a possible German aerial offensive. They hoped that their own air power would be a decisive offensive instrument in a future war. British aerial strategy since 1936 had been based on the doctrine of mass attacks against objectives far behind the military front. Their strategy contrasted sharply with that of the Germans who hoped that aerial bombardment would be restricted to frontline military action in the event of war. The difference in strategy was reflected in the types of aircraft produced by the two countries. Germany produced many light and medium bombers for tactical operations in support of ground troops, but the major British emphasis was on the construction of heavy bombers to attack civilian objectives far behind the front. The British Defence Requirements Committee decided as early as February 1934 that the ultimate potential enemy in any major war would be Germany. The British in the spring of 1938 were hoping to build 8,000 military aircraft in the year beginning April 1939, and this goal was later achieved and surpassed. They had expected to build only 4,000 military aircraft in the year April 1938 to April 1939 but they were far ahead of schedule by January 1939, and their key secret defense weapon, the Radar Project, had made gigantic strides since 1935. The British leaders and experts were concerned about their air defenses, but they had not lost sight of a possible aerial offensive against the civilian population of Germany. The ratio of fighters to bombers in the autumn of 1938 program of Air Minister Sir Kingsley Wood was 1,1.7. The construction of medium bombers had been discontinued, and the emphasis was solely on heavy bombers capable of attacking distant objectives. The British leaders admitted that defensive preparation of British civilian centres to meet German retaliation bombing was insufficient to dispel anxiety during the final months before the outbreak of World War II. Nevertheless, they were convinced that they were reasonably secure against successful German retaliation, and hence the strategy for the bombardment of the German civilian masses was developed with single-minded energy. Mussolini frightened by Halifax and Chamberlain it is not surprising that the sudden and unexpected increase in military power made the British leaders more aggressive in attitude, and this was reflected in their conversations with the Italian leaders. It is interesting to compare the British and Italian records of these talks. Two of the principal conversations included Chamberlain, Halifax, Mussolini, and Chano, one included Halifax and Chano, and one included Chamberlain and Mussolini. The first conversation of the four leaders took place at Mussolini's office in the Palazzo Venezia in Rome on the afternoon of January 11, 1939. The British record noted that Mussolini pledged Italy to a policy of peace for internal reasons, and for the general stability of Europe. The Italian leader asserted that a new war could destroy civilization, and he deplored the failure of the four Munich powers to cooperate more closely to preserve peace. 
He reminded Chamberlain and Halifax that he had envisaged close cooperation when he proposed a four-power pact of consultation and friendship among Great Britain, France, Italy and Germany in 1933. He favoured the limitation of arms. The Jewish question was discussed, and Mussolini stated his personal opinion that the best solution would be for all Jews to come under the laws of a sovereign Jewish state, although they need not all live there. Mussolini was concerned about the British attitude toward Germany. Chamberlain declared that he had considered the possibility of conversations with the Germans toward the end of 1938, but that he had changed his mind. He claimed that he had reconsidered because he was disappointed in the German attitude. A conversation took place between Halifax and Chano on the morning of January 12, 1939, at the office of the Italian Foreign Minister in the Palazzo Chigi. This conversation was devoted entirely to problems connected with the Spanish Civil War. Chano gave Halifax assurances that Italy intended to withdraw her volunteers from Spain, and that she did not intend to establish military bases in that country. Mussolini, Chano, Chamberlain and Halifax met at the Palazzo Venezia again on the afternoon of January 12, 1939. Franco-Italian relations were on the agenda. The Italian leaders insisted that the mysterious recent demonstrations against France in the Italian Chamber of Deputies on November 30, 1938, were entirely spontaneous. They blamed the French for much of the recent tension between Italy and France, which had culminated in this incident. Chamberlain turned the discussion to Germany. He claimed to be impressed by rumors of sinister German intentions. He had heard that Germany was planning to establish an independent Ukraine, and to attack Great Britain, France, Poland and the Soviet Union. Mussolini assured the British leaders that German armaments were defensive, and that Hitler had no plans for an independent Ukraine or for attacks on the various countries which Chamberlain had mentioned. He added that Germany desired peace. Chamberlain disagreed. He declared that German arms were more than sufficient to deal with attacks from countries immediately adjacent to Germany, and that hence the Germans must be harboring aggressive plans. He claimed that Great Britain, on the other hand, was merely concerned with defending herself from the German menace. He defended the extremists of the British Conservative Party, and he denied that anyone, including Churchill, advocated a British military offensive against Germany. The British and Italian leaders agreed that it would be difficult to guarantee the Czechs, and the British mentioned a guarantee formula which the French had previously rejected. This formula stipulated no aid to the Czechs unless three of the four Munich powers agreed that aggression had taken place. Mussolini mentioned a series of requirements, including the need for stable conditions within the Czech state, which would have to be met before a guarantee could be considered. The conversation concluded with comments about the British general election planned for the autumn of 1940 and the Rome International Exposition scheduled for 1942. Mussolini was much concerned about plans for the Rome Exposition, and Chamberlain made the obvious remark that the British would like to participate. Chamberlain and Mussolini discussed the general situation, following a dinner 198 at the British Embassy on the evening of Friday, January 13. 1939. Chamberlain told Mussolini that he distrusted Hitler, and that he remained unconvinced by Mussolini's arguments that the German armament program was defensive in scope. He hoped to make Mussolini uneasy by referring to a rumor that Germany had launched special military preparations in the region near the Italian frontier. He assured Mussolini categorically that Great Britain and France, in contrast to 1938, were now prepared to fight Germany. The Italian record of these conversations corresponded closely to the British record in the matter of topics, but there were decisive differences of emphasis and factual points. The Italians gave German Ambassador Mackensen a copy of their record of the January 11, 1939, conversation on January 12, and Mackensen forwarded the information to Hitler at once. Mussolini told the British leaders that the Anglo Italian Pact of April 16, 1938, was an essential factor in the conduct of Italian policy. He said that Italy's association with Germany in the Axis was also important, but he emphasized that this association was not of an exclusive nature, de natura esclusiva. He added that Italy had no direct ambitions, 
Amizione di Retta, in Spain. Chamberlain thanked Mussolini for his assurance that peace was essential for the consolidation of Italy, and he added that he and Halifax had never doubted the goodwill of Mussolini. He contrasted his attitudes toward Italy and toward Germany, and he complained that he had seen no signs of German friendship toward Great Britain since Munich. Mussolini promised that he would make an effort to improve Franco-Italian relations. He hoped that this would be possible after the end of the Spanish War. Chamberlain complained of feverish armament in Germany, and alleged German offensive plans. Mussolini, in denying that such plans existed, placed primary emphasis on the point that German defensive requirements should be considered in relation to the Russian armament campaign. It is significant that there is no mention of this point in the British record. The Red Army had been vastly increased in recent months and an attempt was underway to replace recently purged Red Army officers with officers from the reserves, and with officers from the training schools in the younger Cotters. The incorporation of reserve units in the Red Army in late 1938 had increased the Russian peacetime army to two million men, which was nearly triple the number of peacetime German soldiers. A Supreme War Council directed by Stalin had been created in 1938 to supervise the War Council headed by People's Commissar of Defense Varashilov. The Red Army and Red Air Force were under Varashilov and the Red Fleet was under a separate command. The new council under Stalin was intended to coordinate the commands in a program of preparation for war. The Krasnaya Zvezda, Red Star, on the morning of January 11, 1939, demanded the victory of communism over the entire world. These were public facts available to everyone, but the British leaders preferred to believe that Stalin's arrest of 20,000 officers had banned the danger of communism. Their prejudice against communism prompted them to belittle Soviet power. The British considered Mussolini's comments about their own complacency toward the Russian threat too insignificant to be included in their record of the conversations at Rome. The British also neglected another major point made by Mussolini. The Italian leader could understand British concern about rumours suggesting an impending attack on their own country or on neighbouring France. He could not appreciate their apparent concern about the welfare of the Soviet leadership. Mussolini denied that Hitler had plans for the dismemberment of Russia, but he could not refrain from commenting that the end of communism in Russia would be a blessing for the Russian people. This remark did not impress the British leaders. Mussolini swore that he knew with absolute certainty that Hitler had no hostile plans against the West. Mussolini also was surprised that Chamberlain was predicting trouble between Germany and Poland. He shared the optimism of Hitler that an understanding between Germany and Poland could be attained. Polish Foreign Minister Beck had recently visited Hitler, and the German Foreign Minister was scheduled to visit Beck at Warsaw in a few days. The Italian leader was unaware that Polish Ambassador Ryczynski in London had requested British support against Germany in December 1938, or that Halifax had expressed a desire to support Poland at Danzig as early as September 1938. Mussolini warned Chamberlain not to be influenced by anti-national socialist propaganda. Chamberlain stridently denied Mussolini's claims about German defensive needs, and he insisted that Russia did not have the strength to be a menace to anyone. One is reminded here of the statement of Anthony Eden in March 1935 that the Soviet Union would not be in a position to wage a war of aggression for 50 years. Mussolini was amazed by Chamberlain's remark, and he repeated that Germany had good reason to fear a hostile coalition of overwhelming strength. The Italian leader used every possible argument to cope with Chamberlain's anti-German phobia. He cited the Siegfried Line, along the German frontier with France and Belgium, as an indication of the defensive nature of German armament. Chamberlain insisted that German armament was far too impressive, and he suggested that Hitler should speak publicly of his desire for peace, if he was truly peaceful. This suggestion astonished Mussolini, and he inquired if Chamberlain was unaware of Hitler's New Year declaration of January 1, 1939, in which the German leader had professed a fervent desire for the perpetuation of European peace. Mussolini repeated that the current scope of German armament was fully justified by the existing situation. He wished to be helpful in allaying Chamberlain's alleged fear of German intentions. 
he was willing to cooperate with Chamberlain in organizing a conference for qualitative disarmament as soon as the war in Spain had ended. Chamberlain displayed no interest in this proposal. Mussolini referred to the inner instability of the Czech state, the failure of the Czechs to dissolve their ties with Russia or to adopt a policy of neutrality, and the fact that the new Czech borders in many directions had not received their final definition on the ground by international border commissions. The Italian record was emphatic in stating that Chamberlain agreed with Mussolini's remarks about the Czechs. The Italian record also shows that Mussolini was disappointed by Chamberlain's attitude. The visit was successful from the British perspective, but unsuccessful from the Italian standpoint. The British leaders had hoped to intimidate Mussolini, and to discourage him from supporting Hitler if and when war came. They were successful in this effort, although this diplomatic success was cancelled in 1940 because of the unexpected fall of France. The Italians, on the other hand, had hoped that their assurances would prompt the British to adopt a more tolerant attitude toward Germany and a more cooperative policy toward the settlement of current European problems. They were fully disappointed in this expectation. It was evident that British hostility toward Germany was implacable. Mussolini discussed the situation with German Ambassador Mackensen at the British Embassy reception on the evening of January 13, 1939. He said that the results of the visit were meagre, and he complained that the British had made him feel like a lawyer in one of their courts when he had attempted to explain German armaments and German foreign policy. He left no doubt in Mackensen's mind that the British leaders were ready to find Germany guilty of every crime. The Germans received further information about the Rome visit from Italian Ambassador Adolico in Berlin on January 17, 1939. This included an excellent condensed summary of the conversation of January 11, 1939. It was followed by a report from Mackensen, which contained an account of the conversation of Chamberlain, Halifax, Mussolini and Chano on January 12, 1939. The Germans learned that their armament program provided the main topic of discussion. Mackensen also discovered that Chamberlain had been clever in making table talk propaganda with Mussolini. Chamberlain referred to Italy and Great Britain as imperial powers, with colonies overseas, in contrast to Germany, a mere continental nation. This was satisfactory to Hitler, who had no desire to hoist the German flag in distant parts. It was evident to Mussolini that Germany was threatened by a possible British attack. The British leaders were in full motion against Germany many weeks before their public switch in policy after the German occupation of Prague in March 1939. It is for this reason that the Rome conversations stand out so sharply in the diplomatic history of 1939. Mussolini knew that war would be a disaster, and he hoped that Hitler would be able to avoid it. He made it clear to the Germans that his efforts to allay British prejudice against them had failed. He hoped to play a constructive role in helping to avoid an unnecessary war, but he recognized that his first obligation to his own people was to keep Italy out, of a disastrous Anglo-German conflict. It was for this reason that he had been careful not to offend his British guests, and he explained this to the Germans. The suggestion of Churchill that Mussolini 116 was contemptuous of British military strength at this time was inaccurate. Mussolini was sufficiently wise to fear British military power and to recognize the vulnerable position of his own country. Mussolini's decision for war against Great Britain in June 1940 does not alter this fact. He resisted pressure to enter the war during its early months despite a British blockade on Italian trade. The German victories over Great Britain in Norway and France in 1940 altered the situation, and Mussolini entered a war which he believed was nearly finished in order to give his country a voice at the peace conference. He never would have taken this action had it not been for the amazing German victories of 1940 over superior Allied forces.